This is the man in black, here to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Tonight, as we premiere our new Saturday evening series on the air, Miss Agnes Moorhead returns to our stage to appear in The Study in Terror by Lucille Fletcher, called Sorry, Wrong Number. This story of a woman who accidentally overheard a conversation with death and who strove frantically to prevent murder from claiming an innocent victim is being repeated by popular request as tonight's tale of suspense. If you've been with us before, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with the story, Sorry, Wrong Number, and the performance of Miss Agnes Moorhead. We again hope to keep you in suspense. Operator, I've been dialing Murray Hill 70093 now for the last three quarters of an hour, and the line is always busy. I don't see how it could be busy that long. Will you try it for me, please? I will be glad to try that number for you. One moment, please. I don't see how it could be busy all this time. It's my husband's office. He's working late tonight, and I'm all alone here in the house. My health is very poor, and I've been feeling so nervous all day. Ringing Murray Hill 70093. <sighs> Hello? 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 Is, is Mr. Stevenson there? Hello? 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 Hello, George? Yes, sir. This is George speaking. Hello? Who's this? What number am I calling, please? I'm here with our client. Oh, good. Is everything okay? Is the coast clear for tonight? Yeah, George. He says the coast is clear for tonight. <laughs> okay, okay. Where are you now? In a phone boat. Don't worry. Everything's okay. Very well. You know the address. Yeah, yeah, I know. At 11 o'clock, the private patrolman goes around to the bar on 2nd Avenue for a beer. That's right, at 11 o'clock. I will make sure that all the lights downstairs are out. There should be only one light visible from the street. Yeah, yeah, I know. At 11.15, a train crosses the bridge. Makes a noise in case her window is open and she should scream. Oh, hello. What number is this, please? Okay, I understand, I tell you. That's 11.15, the train. Yeah. Do you remember everything else, George? Yeah, yeah. I make it quick. As little blood as possible. <laughs> because our client does not wish to make us suffer long. That's right. You'll use a knife? Yes, yeah, a knife will be okay. And afterwards, I removed the rings and the bracelets and the jewelry in the bureau drawer because our client wishes it to look like simple robbery. Don't worry. Everything's okay. I never... Oh! Oh, how awful! How unspeakably awful! Oh! The operator. Oh, Your call, please. Operator, I've just been cut off. I'm sorry, what number were you calling? Why, it was supposed to be Murray Hill 70093, but it wasn't. Some wires must have got crossed. I was cut into a wrong number, and I, I've i just heard the most dreadful thing, something about a, a murder, and, Operator, you simply have to retrace that call at once. I beg your pardon. May I help you? Oh, I know it was a wrong number, and I had no business listening, but these two men, they were cold-blooded fiends. They were going to murder somebody, some poor innocent woman who was all alone in a house near a bridge, and we've got to stop them. We've got to. Uh, what number were you calling, Well, please? that doesn't matter. This was a wrong number, and you don't it for me, and we've got to find out what it was immediately. What number did you call? Oh, why are you so stupid? Wh what time is it? Uh, do you mean to tell me you can't find out what that number was just now? 
I'll connect you with the chief officer. Oh, I think it's perfectly shameful. Now, look. Look, it was obviously a case of some little slip of the finger. I, I told you to try Murray Hill 70093 for me. You dialed it, but your finger must have slipped, and I was connected with some other number. And I could hear them, but they couldn't hear me. Now, I, I simply fail to see why you couldn't make that same mistake again on purpose. Why you couldn't try to dial Murray Hill 70093 in the same sort of careless way. Murray Hill 70093? Yes. Yeah. I'll try to get it for you. Oh, thank you. I am sorry. Murray Hill 70093 is busy. I will call you in 20 Operator. Minutes. Operator. 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 Your call, please. You didn't try to get that wrong number at all. I asked you explicitly, and all you did was dial correctly. I'm sorry. What number are you calling? Well, can't you for once forget what number I'm calling and do something for me? Now, I want to trace that call. It's my civic duty, and it's your civic duty to trace that call and apprehend those dangerous killers. And if you won't... I will connect you with the chief operator. Please. Oh, Oh, dear... This is the chief operator. Oh, uh, chief operator, I want you to trace a call, a telephone call immediately. I don't know where it came from or who was making it, but it's absolutely necessary that it be tracked down because it was about a murder that someone's planning, a terrible, cold-blooded murder of a poor, innocent woman tonight at 11.15. I see. Well, can you trace it for me? Can you track down those men? I'm not certain. It depends. Well, it depends on what? It depends on whether the call is still going on. If it's a live call, we can trace it on the equipment. If it's been disconnected, we can't. Disconnect? If the parties have stopped talking to each other. Oh, but of course, they must have stopped talking to each other by now. That was at least five minutes ago, and they didn't sound like the type who would make a long call. Well, I can try tracing it. May I have your name, please? Mrs. Stevenson. Mrs. Albert Stevenson. But listen... And your telephone number, please. Plaza 42295. But if you go on wasting all this time... Why do you want this call traced, please? What? I don't... Well, no reason. I I mean, I merely felt very strongly that something ought to be done about it. These men sounded like killers. They're dangerous. They're going to murder this woman at 11.15 tonight. I thought the police ought to know. Have you reported this to the police? Well, no, not yet. You want this call checked purely as a private individual? Yes, yes, but meanwhile, I... I'm sorry, Mrs. Stevenson, but I'm afraid we couldn't make this check for you and trace the call just in your say-so as a private individual. We'd have to have something more efficient. Oh, for heaven's sake. You mean to tell me I can't report that there's going to be a murder without getting tied up? and all this red tape. Why, it's perfectly idiotic. Well, all right, I'll call the police. Thank you. I'm sure that would be the best way to do it. It's ridiculous. Perfectly ridiculous. I can't see why you have to go to all this trouble. Oh. Your call, please. The police department. Get me the police department, please. Thank you. Oh, dear. Do you have to dial? Can't you ring them direct? Ringing the police department. Rent. Police station, precinct 43, Sergeant Martin speaking. Police department, uh, uh, this is Mrs. Stevenson, Mrs. Albert Smythe Stevenson of 53 North Sutton Place. I'm calling up to report a murder. I mean, the murder hasn't been committed yet, but I just overheard plans for it over the telephone, over a wrong number that the operator gave me. I've been trying to trace down the call myself, but everybody is so stupid, and I guess in the end you're the only people who can do anything. Yes, ma'am. It was a perfectly definite murder. I heard their plans distinctly. Uh, two men were talking, and they were going to murder some woman at 11.15 tonight. She lived in a house near a bridge. Uh, are you listening to me? Huh? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. And there was a private patrolman on the street. He was going to go around for a beer on 2nd Avenue, and there was some third man, a client, who was paying to have this poor woman murdered. They were going to t- take her rings and bracelets and, and, and use a knife. Well, it's it unnerved me dreadfully, and I'm not well, and I'm just I so nervous. Uh, when was all this, ma'am? About eight minutes ago. 
Oh, then, then you can do something. You do understand. What is your name, ma'am? Uh, Mrs. Stevenson. Mrs. Elbert Stevenson. And your address? 53 North Sutton Place. 53 North Sutton Place. That's near a bridge. The Queensboro Bridge, you know. And, and, and we have a private patrolman on our street. And second... And uh, what was the number you were calling? Murray Hill 70093. But that wasn't the number I overheard. I mean, Murray Hill 7093 is my husband's office. He's working late tonight, and I was trying to reach him to ask him to come home. I'm an invalid, you know, and it's the maiden night off, and I hate to be alone, even though he says I'm perfectly safe as long as I have the telephone right beside my bed. Well, we'll look into it, Mrs. Stevenson, and see if we can check it with the telephone. But the telephone company said they couldn't check the call if the parties had stopped talking. I've already taken care of that. Oh, you have? Yes, and personally, I feel you ought to do something far more immediate and drastic than just check the call. What good does checking the call do if they stop talking? By the time you tracked it down, they'll already have committed the murder. Well, we'll take care of it, don't you worry. Well, I'd say the whole thing calls for a search, a complete and thorough search of the whole city. Now, I'm very near the bridge, and I'm not far from 2nd Avenue, and I know I'd feel a whole lot better if you sent around a radio car to this neighborhood at once. And what makes you think the murder is going to be committed in your neighborhood, ma'am? Well, I... Oh, I don't know. Only the coincidence is so horrible. 2nd Avenue, is the patrolman, the bridge... 2nd Avenue is a very long street, ma'am, and you know how many bridges there are in the city of New York yes, alone. Yes, I, I know... Not to mention Brooklyn, Staten Island, Queens, and the Bronx. I know that. How do you know there isn't some little house on Staten Island on some little 2nd Avenue you've never even heard about? Well, how do you know they're even talking about New York at all? But I heard the call in the New York dialing system. Maybe it was a long-distance call you overheard. Oh, don't. Telephones are funny things. Look, lady, why don't you look at it this way? Supposing you hadn't broken in on that telephone call. What? Supposing you'd got your husband the way you always do. You wouldn't be so upset, would you? Well, no, I suppose not. Only it sounded so inhuman, so cold-blooded. A lot of murders are plotted in this city every day, ma'am. We manage to prevent almost all of them. Well... But a clue of this kind is so vague. Isn't much more use to us than no clue at all. But surely you... Unless, of course, you have some reason for thinking this call was phony and... That someone may be planning to murder you. Me? Oh, oh no. No, I hardly think so. I, I, I mean, why should anybody? I'm alone all day and night. I see nobody except my maid, Eloise, and she's a big girl. She weighs 200 pounds. She's too lazy to bring up my breakfast tray. And the only other person is my husband, Albert. He's crazy about me. He just adores me. He went on me hand and foot. He scarcely left my side since I took sick well 12 years ago. Well, then there's nothing for you to worry about. Now, if you'll just leave the rest of this to us, we'll take care but of it. But what will you do? It's so late. It's nearly 11 now. We'll take care of it, Well, will you broadcast it all over the city and send out squads and warn your radio cars to watch out, especially in suspicious neighborhoods like mine? Lady, I said we'd take care of it. But... Just now, I've got a couple of other matters here on my desk that require immediate attention. Good night, ma'am, and thank you. Oh, you, you <laughs> idiot. Oh, now why did I hang up the phone like that? He'll think I am a fool. Oh, why doesn't Albert come home? Why doesn't he? Why doesn't he? Oh. Oh. So nervous. Call, please. Operator, for heaven's sake, will you ring that Murray Hill 7093 number again? I can't think what's keeping him so long. I will try it for you. Well, try, try. I won't see why you do I'm sorry. Oh. Murray Hill 70093 is busy. I will I can you hear it. Minutes. You don't have to tell me. I know it's busy. Oh. If I could only get out of this bed for a little while. If I could get a breath of fresh air, just lean out of the window and see the street. <laughs> Hello, Albert? Hello? 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 Oh, what's the matter with this phone? Hello? Hello? Oh. Hello? Hello? Oh, for heaven's sake, who is this? Hello? Oh, hello? Oh, I'm trying to call me. Your call, please. Hello, operator. I don't know what's the matter with this telephone tonight, but it's positively driving me crazy. I've never seen such inefficient, miserable service. Now, now, look. 
<laughs> I'm an invalid, and I'm very nervous, and I'm not supposed to be annoyed. But if this keeps on much longer... There seems to be the trouble, please. Well, everything's wrong. I haven't had one bit of satisfaction out of one call I've made this evening. The whole world could be murdered for all you people care. And now my phone keeps ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing every five seconds or so, and when I pick it up, there's no one there. I'm sorry. If you will hang up, I will test it for you. I don't want you to test it for me. I want you to put that call through, whatever it is, at once. I'm afraid I cannot do you that. You can't! And why? Why, may I ask? The dial system is automatic. <gasps> if someone is trying to dial your number, there is no way to check it without the call is coming through the system or not. Unless the person who is trying to reach you complains to a particular operator. Well, of all the stupid. And meanwhile, I've got to sit here in my bed suffering every time that phone rings, imagining everything. I will try to check the trouble for well, you. Check it, check it. That's all anybody can do. Oh, what's the use of talking to you? You're so stupid. Oh, I fix her of all the incidents. How dare she speak to me like that? How dare she? Call the operator. Oh, oh what if it takes so long? Oh. Your call, please. Young woman, I don't know your name, but there are ways of finding you out. And I'm going to report you to your superiors for the most unpardonable rudeness and insolence that's ever been my privilege. Give me the business office at once. You may dial that number direct. Dial it direct? I'll do no such thing. I don't even know the number. The number is in the directory. Or you may secure it by dialing information. Listen here, you... Oh, what's the use? Oh, dear. Oh, for heaven's sake, I'm going out of my mind, out of my... Hello? Hello? Stop ringing me, do you hear? Answer me, who is this? You realize you're driving me crazy? Who oh, is calling me? What are you doing it for? Now stop it, stop it, stop it. Hello, hello, if you don't stop ringing me, I'm going to call the police. You hear the police? <laughs> oh, if Albert would only come home. Oh, let it ring. Let it go on ringing. It's a trick of some kind. I won't answer. I won't, I won't. I won't even if it goes on ringing all night. Oh, you ring. Go ahead and ring. Oh. <laughs> now, now, what's the matter? Why do they stop ringing all of a sudden? Oh, what time is it? Where did I put that clock? Oh, here it is. Five to eleven. Oh, they decided something. They're sure I'm home. They heard my voice answer them just now. That's why they've been ringing me. Why no one has answered me. Call the operator again. Oh. Oh, where is she? Why doesn't she answer? Why doesn't she answer? Oh, please. Your call, please. Where were you just now? Why didn't you answer at once? Give me the police department. Oh, oh she's sorry. I'm sorry, the line is busy. I will call busy, you. Busy, but that's impossible. The police department can't be busy. There must be other lines available. The line is busy. I will try to get them for you later. No, no, I've got to speak to them now, or it may be too late. I've got to talk to someone. What number do you wish to speak to? Please? I don't know, but there must be someone to protect people beside the police department. A, a, a detective agency? A... You will find agencies listed in the classified directory. But I don't have a classified. I mean, I'm, I'm too nervous to look it up, and I, I don't know how to use it. I'll connect you with information. Perhaps she will be able to help you. No, no. Oh, you're being spiteful, aren't you? You don't care, do you, what happens to me? I could die, and you wouldn't care. <laughs> Oh, stop it, stop it, stop it. I can't stand anymore. Hello, what do you want? Stop ringing, will you? Stop it. Hello, is this Plaza 42295? Yes, yes, I'm... I'm sorry, this this is Plaza 42295. This is Western Union. I have a telegram oh. here for Mrs. Albert Stevenson. Is there anyone there to receive the message? I'm... Hi, Mrs. Stevenson. The telegram is as follows. Mrs. Albert Stevenson, 53 North Sutton Place, New York, New York. Darling, terribly sorry. Try to get you for last hour, but lying busy. Leaving for Boston 11 p.m. tonight on urgent business. Back tomorrow afternoon. Keep happy. Love, sign Albert. Oh, no. Do you wish us to deliver a copy of the message? <laughs> no, no, thank you. Thank you, madam. Good night. Good night. Oh, no. No, I, I don't believe it. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. Now when he knows I'll be all alone. It, it, it's some trick. Some finished trick. Oh, I, oh, oh, 
mind some tricks. Why does not she... Your call, please. Operator, try that Murray Hill 7093 number for me just once more, please. You may dial that number direct. Oh... Somewhere in the 70s. It's a very small, private, and exclusive hospital where I had my appendix out two years ago. Henshley. Uh, H-E-N... One moment, please. Please hurry. And please, what is the time? You may find out the time by dialing Meridian 71211. Oh, for heaven's sake, I've no time to be dialing. The number of Henshley Hospital is Butterfield 70105. Butterfield 70105. You. Seven. Oh... Oh, hi. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. good evening. The nurse's registry. Who was it you wish to speak to? I want the nurse's registry at once. I want a trained nurse. I want to hire immediately for the night. I see. And what is the nature of the case, madam? Nerves. I'm very nervous. I, I need soothing and companionship. You see, my husband is away, and I'm... Have you been recommended to us by any doctor in particular, ma'am? No, but I really don't see why all this catechizing is necessary. I just want a trained nurse. I was a patient in your hospital two years ago, and after all, I do expect to pay this person for attending me. We quite understand that, madam. But these are war times, you know. Well, I... Registered nurses are very scarce just now, and our superintendent has asked us to send people out only on cases with a physician in charge feels that it is absolutely necessary. Well, it is absolutely necessary. I'm a sick woman. I'm, I'm very upset, very. I'm alone in this house, and I'm an invalid, and tonight I overheard a telephone conversation that upset me dreadfully. In fact, if someone doesn't come at once, I'm afraid I'll go out of my mind. I see. Well, I'll speak to Miss Phillips as soon as she comes in. Miss, and what is your name? Miss Phillips, and when do you expect her in? Well, I really couldn't say. She went out to supper at 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock? But it's not 11 yet. Oh, Oh, my clock had stopped. I thought it was running down. What time is it? Uh, just 15 minutes past 11. What? What was that? What was... What then? That... That click just now in my own telephone as though someone had lifted the receiver off the hook of the extension telephone downstairs. Well, I didn't hear it, madam. Now, about... But the... I did. There's someone in this house. Someone downstairs in the kitchen, and they're... They're listening to me now. They're... I won't forget how... I won't let them hear me. I'll be quiet, and they'll see. Oh, but if I don't call someone now while well, they're still down there, there'll be no time. Oh, oh, I've got to find somebody. Oh, I've got to find somebody. Your call, please. Operator. Operator, I'm in desperate trouble. I, I... I'm sorry. I cannot hear you. Please speak louder. I don't dare. I... There's someone listening. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry. But you've got to hear me. Oh, please, you've got to help me. There's someone in this house, someone who's going to murder me, and you've got to get in touch with me. Oh, there it is. There it is. Did you hear it? He's put it down. He's put down the extension phone. He's coming up. He's coming up the stairs. Give me the police department. The police department. The police department, give it to me. One moment, please. I will connect I you. Can, I can hear him. I can hear her. 
I've got the wrong number. Don't worry. Everything's okay. And so closes Sorry, Wrong Number, starring Agnes Moorhead. Tonight's tale of Suspense. suspense with us again next Saturday when we'll have another starring Hollywood cast headed by Miss Dolores Costello with Martin Koslick, Ian Wolfe, and George Zuko. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin, the musical director, and Lucille Fletcher, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. The entire country is waiting in suspense for the answer to this important question. Will the United States Cadet Nurse Corps reach its goal of enrolling 65,000 student nurses before the end of 1943? For if it doesn't, this country faces the prospect of needless suffering and loss of life at a time when our full health and energy are needed to win the war. What are you girls from 17 or 18 to 35 going to do about it? If you're a high school graduate in good health, you're eligible for a scholarship which will pay you all your expenses while you're learning to be of service to your fellow man. Not only will you receive a personal spending allowance of $15 a month for the first nine months in training, $20 a month for the following 21 months, and then $30 a month until graduation, but you will, in addition to this personal allowance, receive allowances for room, board, health and laboratory fees, books, and other incidental expenses. This is your chance to do something for yourself while you're doing something big for your country. You're needed now, so write immediately to the U.S. Cadet Nurses Corps, Box 88, New York, or to any nursing school of your choice, and they will furnish you with all the essential information. You are needed now, so act now. This is... Now, Roma Wines present... Suspense. Tonight, Black Path of Fear, starring Brian Donlevy. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, Right now, a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you... Suspense! This is the Man in Black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, who tonight from Hollywood bring you as star, Mr. Brian Donlevy. And so, with the performance of Mr. Donlevy as Bill Scott in the Cornell Woolrich bestseller, 
the black path of fear. We again hope to keep you in suspense. It was our first day in Havana. We'd taken a hack, an open, horse-drawn carriage, and spent the afternoon driving around to see the sights. She was always crazy about Jade. So, in Chinatown, we stopped in a little curiosity shop the driver steered us to. We bought a few gadgets there and started back towards the main part of the town. It was getting dark, and she snuggled up close to me in the carriage. And... It's been a wonderful day, Scotty. Yeah. I was scared at first. A couple of times I thought I saw him in the crowds there, Chinatown. I guess it was just my imagination. Sure it was. He wouldn't try any rough stuff this far from his home base. He may be a little Caesar around the nightclubs back in Florida, but here in Cuba, he's just another alien who'd better not get caught packing a rod. He said he'd get me if I ever left him, no matter where I went. Well, he sent us a radiogram wishing us luck. Yes, that's what worries me. He didn't say which kind of luck. I thought so. Hey, What's this, driver? A Sloppy Joe, senor. Big attraction of Havana. <laughs> of course. Sloppy Joe's. <laughs> Want to go in, darling? Why not? We can only die once. So I paid the coachman, and we went into Sloppy Joe's. The place was jammed to the sidewalk line and so noisy you couldn't hear yourself think. It was like a football scrimmage when you moved and like sardines in a can when you stood still. Then suddenly the crowd divided in front of us like the Red Sea and a little photographer came through using an old-fashioned tripod for a battering ram. He set up his camera and pointed it in our direction. Ah, the senor and the lady would like a picture for to show their friends back in the estate. No, oh, no. Oh, please, Scotty. We've never had a picture taken together. <laughs> together? With 40,000 people jammed up against us on all sides? Oh, well, it's that maybe you can't to my studio, Calle Barrios. Calle Barrios is not far. No, nah, no, nah, go on, shoot it here. Go ahead. Oh, oh, make pause, please. Uh, oh, mucho love, si como no. Eso es. Hold it. No. That is all. I have the picture. Mm. Well, he's taking us now, darling. Oh, come on, honey. Everybody's looking at it. Don't rush me, Scotty. Huh? Give me time. What is it? Why are you so limpy? You've got... I knew we wouldn't make it. What do we care? Part of a night's better than none at all. Eve! Just stay with me a minute. It won't take long. Darling, what happened? What happened? Scotty, that was the first picture we ever had taken together. Huh? Let me know how it turns out. Eve. Eve, darling. She's dead. Well, she doesn't move anymore. Somebody do something, will you? She's been knifed right here in my arms. <laughs> in Sloppy Joe's. Murder that is to start a man twisting and turning down the black path of fear. Brian Donlevy is our star this evening. You have heard him in the prologue to tonight's tale of Suspense. In Havana, one gathering place of fashionable people is the charming Pan American Club. A dinner party is in progress, and the Cuban host has just risen to return a compliment which has been paid him by a guest from the United States. Lifting his glass, he says, Thank you, my friends. Thank you also for telling us about the perfect climate and soil of California, from which come these delightful Roma wines. Now we can understand how such perfection is possible, such magnificent quality as we enjoy in Roma wines. Well, such praise of Roma wines in foreign lands can only mean that they are truly magnificent in quality. But remember, you here in the United States can enjoy these distinguished wines at remarkably low cost. Only pennies a glass. Roma wines bring you a unique combination of California's perfect soil and climate, age-old winemaking skill, plus modern tests and controls, which make Roma so constant in quality, so uniformly fine. Discover for yourself the delightful flavor and goodness which have made Roma wines America's largest selling wines. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. 
And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Mr. Brian Donlevy, who in the person of Bill Scott continues his narrative of The Black Path of Fear. Tonight's tale of suspense. Havana is a fast town for anything. Love, life, and death, too. A minute ago, I'd been half of a honeymoon couple getting their first picture snapped by a little Cuban photographer and sloppy Joes. Now... I was alone with a corpse in an empty saloon. But that didn't go on for long either. There were cops there in half a minute, and finally a detective. This woman is dead. Yeah, I know. You were the man with her? I was the man with her. Your name? Scott, Bill Scott. Mr. Scott, how long have you been in Havana? Four hours. You quarreled with this girl here in this bar? No, no. You were traveling together? Yes, that's right. Her name on her tourist card is Mrs. Edward Espanelli. Yeah. Where is Mr. Espanelli? Not where I'd like him to be, which is roasting. You are not being very cooperative, Mr. Scott. Okay, okay, I'll tell you the whole story. She was a singer in a nightclub in Tampa, Florida. Spinelli owned the nightclub. He was a killer. He gave her the choice between getting killed and marrying him. Ah. So she married him. And how did you meet her? I worked for Spinelli, Spinelli too. I, I drove his car. Mm. You are not a chauffeur by profession, are you, Mr. Scott? No, no. I took the job to get her away from him. Is there anything wrong in that? He murder weapon, this knife. What do you know about it? What are you driving at? Is this your knife, Mr. Scott? No, but it's a pretty close match. I bought one just like it this afternoon in a curiosity shop. Wait a minute, I'll show you. I've got it in my pocket right there. Wait, I've got it. Wait a minute. Don't get so excited. All right, it's in that pocket right there. Fish it out yourself if you want to. There is no knife here. But there's got to be. It was a knife with a jade handle, like this one, with a monkey carved on it, but the monkey on the one I bought was holding its hands over its ears. There were three of them in the shop. You know, the type, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. I only know that you bought a knife this afternoon, that you no longer have a knife and that the knife has been used to stop this woman. But it's not the same knife, I tell you. I can prove it. Give me a chance to prove it, will you? All right, Mr. Scott. I will give you a chance. <laughs> So we went back to the shop where I'd bought the knife, back to Chinatown. Inspector Acosta, that was the Cuban detective's name, questioned the old duck who sold it to me. You remember this man buying something in here this afternoon, Viejo? Uh, yes. Uh, gentleman buy knife. Ornamental knife. Uh, knife with jade handle. Describe the jade handle. Oh, uh, jade handle have monkey. We know that. Describe the monkey. Oh, uh, pretty sure... Oh, monkey hiding eyes. So, see no evil. You're crazy. What's the matter with you? What are you trying to do to me? I bought the one holding its ears. You know it. Theo Chin, this man's life may depend on what you are saying. But you are absolutely sure. Come by trees. First one is sold to this gentleman. Other still got. Uh, can show you. Can lie in your teeth. Listen, Acosta. So what if he shows you the set with that one missing? He's probably got a hundred sets in the storeroom. Well, only one set imported. Uh, can show customs invoices. Uh-huh. How did uh, this man and this woman act when they came into the shop? Oh, uh, really act scared. Very scared. I told you, she was afraid Spinelli was going to have her bumped off. Well, he did it. And this guy has been paid to frame me. Can't you see that? I am sorry, Mr. Scott, but I must place you under arrest. For the murder of Mrs. Eve Spanelli. As we threaded our way back through Chinatown in the police car, I thought the whole thing over. I came to a decision. The car fitted in the narrow lane like a cork in a bottle. If it should come to a halt in front of the door of a building. And finally it did. Just that. I bolted. They came after me fast. Oh! The door I ducked into opened into a pitch black hallway. I groped around till I found a flight of stairs and I started climbing. Up! Up, Rachel! Go ahead and shoot! I ducked back in the shadows, turned the knob of the nearest door, and tossed my hat over at the foot of the roof ladder to make it look as if I'd lost, lost it while climbing. I backed through the door into a room. In the dark room, I stood very still and listened. They were separating the case the roof along the block. 
I was safe for a few minutes anyway. Try to figure out where I was. A room. A dark room. I strained my eyes into the blackness. Then something cold and metallic found the side of my neck. It was the business edge of a knife. Blade. A light snapped on. Bueno. I, uh, no hablo espanol. No te mueva. Oh, take it easy. Take it easy, will you? I can't talk your language. Put that knife down, will you? Te quiero estar aquí. Polizai. Verstehen Understand? Comprende? Look, out there on the stairs, I don't know how to say it. Polizia. They're after me. Cops. Cops? Why didn't you say so before? I hate cops. Oh, you talk English? I ought to have been in enough of your jails to take out naturalization papers. Hey, get over here. I do what I can for you. They're coming back. I better get out of here. Don't be a fool. There's 20 of them down in the street now. They sure must want you bad, Chico. They say I killed my girl. They say wrong? They say very wrong. Another man took her away from you? No. I took her away from another man. Ah, then any fool of a policeman knows you did not kill her. You never kill what does not belong to you. Only what does. You tell them that. Oh, here comes Petey. Quickly. Get into the cot there. Cover yourself up. What? But... Do as I tell you. Take off that shirt. What? Don't stop for the buttons. Tear it off. Well... Now then, face the wall. Wait a minute. What are you doing? Keep perfectly still. Don't rub against the covers. Now, don't move. Dispense, senor. Ha visto usted un hombre alto, macizo americano? No he visto a nadie. ¿Quién es ese? Mi hombre, mi marido. Llamoslo. Está muy enfermo. Vuela. Vuela. Sí, vuela. Fui a la cuarentena. Es verdad, Fiorella, vámonos. Pues sí, señor, buenas noches. Buenas noches. What was all that about? Shh. What are, what are all these red spots on me? I put them there with lipstick. Huh? I told the cops you were my husband. You have smallpox. <laughs> And they believed it? Why not? I showed them the quarantine sign on the door. Manolito, that was my man. He died of smallpox in this room. Huh? Oh, do not be alarmed. It has been disinfected. Oh. oh, say, thanks. But why did you go to bat for me like that anyway? Uh, different reasons. Flowers on a grave, I guess. Flower? What do you mean? It's hard to explain. It's my way of doing something for somebody that's not around anymore, I guess. It's the only way I have. I do not know any other way. You see... I know what it is to lose someone you love, too. Just like you. Manolito? He got smallpox in jail. Then he come back here to me. To die. Hey, what is your name, Wapo? Bill Scott. A Scott? No, no, no. Scott with an S. It's too hard to say. I call you Wapo. Wapo? That means handsome. Huh. Well, thanks. What'll I call you? Around this neighborhood, they call me Medianoche. Media... It means midnight. Hmm. Try it that way. Okay, midnight. They call me that because now I always hang around late by myself since he's gone. Well, midnight, I don't know what to say to you except thanks. The nada. Flowers on a grave. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess I'd better get going. What do you want to throw away all my hard work for? Hmm? They spot you at the next corner. Well, I can't hang around here for the rest of the night. What's the matter with it here? You know, if I could only get hold of that photographer. Photographer? Yeah, I was a photographer in Sloppy Joe's. He was snapping a picture of us just when it happened. Oh, you think... Maybe in this picture is the man who killed your sweetheart? Yeah, I'm pretty sure of it. Uh, think, Wapo. What do you remember about this photographer? Oh, he was just a typical cheap photographer of tourists. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He said something about having a studio somewhere near Sloppy's. Uh, Calle Barrios? That's it, Calle B Barrios. Look, do you know this guy? A sailors go there with the girls to get their pictures taken. Hmm. His name is Pepe Campos. I've got to get that picture, Midnight. I'll have to risk One it. One momentito. I first get you some other clothes. Huh? Here. I think this fit you. What? Where? Manolito was one big sailor. 
And now listen. I tell you how to get from here over to the Calle Barrios, so maybe the police don't see you. You go down to the mouth of the alley. You turn to the right. That is San here. Just a few steps from there. <laughs> It was so dark, I I almost had to feel my way along the streets. Suddenly, out of nowhere, came a voice. There were two of them there, keeping the alley covered. I looked back the way I had come. Someone was coming toward me through the blackness. I waited there, paralyzed. ¿Qué tal, marinero? Uh, what? Are you lonesome? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, you want a drink, sister? Well, look, walk close to me like this. Huh? Now, now, lean up closer. Get your face up under mine, honey. Mm-hmm. That's it. Give me a little more affection. <laughs> That's the stuff. Now, look, walk down this way with me, just past the corner. You said it, big boy. You said it. What do you want to drink, honey? You said it. <laughs> That's good. Here's the turn. Goodbye, sister. Chip, get! Chip, get! Chip, get! Chip, get! I was afraid of yelling. I'd attract the cops, so I took off down the street, and then I ducked into the alley to catch my breath. I looked up. There was a sign on the shop. Campos Retratos y Fotografias. At first, I didn't get it. Then, all of a sudden, I knew... I was there. I opened the door and walked in. Si, senor. Look, you took a, a picture this evening of, of me and a lady in Sloppy Joe's. I want that picture. Oh, no me recuerdo. I do not recall, senor. Now, look, there was trouble right afterwards. You know, a lot of noise, remember? Oh, si, si. I remember. Yeah. I am just developing the pictures I have taken today. You come with me. Huh. This is my dark room. The very latest equipment. Kodak. Yeah, 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 but where's that picture? Oh, right here. In the bath. Oh. Mm. Yeah. It's beginning to come through. Si, si. Yeah. Yeah, that's us. Oh, someone leans over the lady's shoulder, no? Yeah. Yeah, let's have some more light on the subject, will you? Si. Uh, this is someone you know, senor? Uh, it's someone I know, all right. His name is... Never mind the name, Scotty. I'll introduce myself. Spinelli. Stand over against the wall, Scotty. You too. Well, I'm glad you found this picture, Scotty. I was kind of nervous about having a thing like this floating around. You can understand my feelings. You surprised me, Spinelli. I didn't think you even had the guts to stab a woman in the back without your gorillas around to protect you. Don't make me angry, Scotty. I'm in a bad mood. I didn't know you were smart like you are either, Spinelli. I I apologize. You know, (laughs) that was a cute trick, hiring a cab driver to steer us into that shop in Chinatown. But what I still can't figure out is how you switched those knives. I didn't. I still have the knife you bought. I frisked it out of your pocket. Now I'm going to give it back to you. Would you like to see it first? There. It's pretty, ain't it? Eve always had an eye for jades. This is definitely the best of the three. It's a pity to spoil such a pretty knife, but the revolver... Ah, it makes too much noise. Yeah, I think I'll use the knife on you, too. I like things symmetrical. Like Romeo and Juliet, then. What's that? Don't move, Scotty. Wapo! Wapo, are you in here? <laughs> His sweetheart not dead an hour and already he has another. Midnight, get out of here quick. This man is a killer. Oh, I'm not afraid of you, big boy. Keep away from me and don't try any funny business. Oh, oh my hombre, he was just like you. He talk very mean. But he don't hurt me. Not one little bit. I don't only talk, big sister. I got a job to do here. I'll talk to you when I shut your boyfriend's trap for good. My boyfriend? Ha, are you kidding? Go ahead, finish him off. He took a powder on me. I come after him only to collect. Oh, undercover? <laughs> oh, Scotty, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> undercover? Hey, you are rich, huh? <laughs> you got big diamonds. 
Say, I like you, mister. Stop mooching around. Midnight, I tell you, this guy's a killer. Watch out. Ah, shut up. Say, huh? How about it, big boy? Come on. Stick around, baby. I can use talent like yours. <laughs> Kiss me, big boy. Later, later. Now, for I yell very loud. Hey, Make you... big trouble. You're pretty hot stuff, ain't you? You don't know the half of it, big boy, huh? Come here. <laughs> now, Bobo! Oh. Now, you jump! You have begun! You dirty little stool pigeon. Shut up, Spinelli. I've got the gun now. <laughs> Scotty, I was only throwing a scare into you. Why, I would have knocked you off right away if t- that's what I meant to do, wouldn't I? What's it worth to you to stay alive, Spinelli? Scotty, $100,000. In the bank right here in Havana. Just let me go over that table there. Check the bearer, no strings. Spinelli, I want Eve back again. 200000 Chicago account thrown in. 250000 that's a quarter of a million, Scotty. I want Eve. You can't bring the dead to life, Scotty. But you can be rich. Kill me and you get nothing but a murder rap. The picture don't show me sticking the knife in her. The knife don't mean anything. Chin and the driver will never talk. You're just fixing up a nice murder rap for yourself, Scotty. Shut up. Stand over under the light, Spinelli. Huh? I don't want to miss. Scotty. Don't do it, Scotty. Scotty. Ah! Win. That's the story, Inspector. I, I've come to give myself up for the murder of Ed Spinelli. Huh? What are you going to do about it, Inspector? About what? About what? About what I just told you, the murder. I don't speak English so good. I often miss hearing things that are said, especially when they are said too fast. All right, I can say it slower. I just killed a man named Ed Spinelli. My English stinks today. I don't understand. You don't understand? I said... I don't know what you said. If I should get word from the commissioner to hold a man named Scott for murder, that would be different. It would be in my language. Unless that should happen and it hasn't, please, would you mind not coming in here and mumbling in this English of yours that I don't understand? But, uh, uh, Senor Scott, yeah. this girl, this media noche. M- M- midnight? Oh, what about her? Do you know where she is? That girl, that woman. She's been raising Cain in my jail all night, all day yesterday. Well, what's she charged with? My foolish officers questioned her, and then they didn't know any better that they put down some charge other than the book. Senor Scott, huh? we have been stuck with her ever since. She's, she's like a hurricane. Well, I'll agree with you there. Senor Scott, yeah? if you have not enough to bail her out, I'll pay it out of my own pocket, anything to get her out. <laughs> Well, midnight. It's all over. Yes, Guapo. It is over. <laughs> Have you any idea where we're headed for? A sloppy juice. Hmm? The feet of an American in Havana walk always in the direction of a sloppy juice. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear it already. I... Uh... I'd like to ask you in for a drink tonight. No, Wapo. You go in alone. Oh, won't you just have one with me, please? No. Why not? There's someone waiting for you in there. Oh, that's crazy, Midnight. I don't know anybody in Havana except you. Someone is waiting for you in there, Wapo. How do you say flowers on a grave? No? Flowers on a grave. And sloppy joes. Love makes any place beautiful. Even a sloppy joes. Go on, Wapo. Buy her a drink at the bar and tell her how that picture you took together turned out. You promised you would, remember? How do you tell something to 
somebody that's dead? In your mind, Guapo. Where she will always be. Oh. I'll try and tell her, Midnight. I'll tell her about about you, too. No. No, she will be jealous. Oh, no, not when I tell her. Oh, you do not know women, Guapo. Well, maybe not. Well, I... Uh... <laughs> Adios, Guapo. Goodbye. Midnight. <laughs> And so closes The Black Path of Fear, starring Brian Donlevy. Tonight's study in... Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Have you discovered the secret of lovers of fine food? Namely, how good wine makes even the simplest, most inexpensive meals really exciting events. Well, the next time you serve any of the red meats, stews, fish, or poultry... Place on the table a well-chilled bottle of Roma California table wine. Delicious sauterne, hearty burgundy or tasty claret. You will be amazed at how much Roma wine, in bringing out all the appetizing goodness of even the simplest foods, adds to the pleasure of the meal. How it makes even a simple meal a feast. And remember, Roma wines cost you only pennies a glassful. So any home can afford the pleasure they give to everyday living. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Brian Donlevy. Our government has asked us to bring to the attention of women listeners a very important message. In spite of our wonderful victories on all the fighting fronts, we must remember that the war is by no means over or nearly over. Hundreds of thousands of women must get into war work this year. You are desperately needed, both because you are admirably fitted for these jobs and because you represent the only adequate source of labor to replace the men in the armed forces and in the heavy war industries. Go to the United States Employment Service office and ask for information about the kinds of full-time or part-time jobs for which you are best suited. Brian Dunleavy will soon be seen in the starring role of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's Technicolor production, An American Romance. Next Thursday, same time, Olivia de Havilland and Reginald Gardner will be your stars of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wines presents Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you the distinguished actor who has just won the New York Film Critics Award for his performance in Watch on the Rhine, Mr. Paul Lucas. The suspense play which stars Mr. Lucas and which is produced and directed by William Spear is called A World of Darkness. And so with the performance of Paul Lucas as the musician named Anton Rijak, to whom the world was a world of darkness, we again hope to keep you in 
Suspense. All patrol cars in J area, J for Johnson. All patrol cars in J area go to 325 West 52nd, 325 West 52, a theatrical rooming house, homicide. This is homicide. A young woman, staff. That is all. Okay, okay, okay. Is everybody here now? Yes, I think I've got all of them. Uh, there's Mrs. Collins, Mr. Farrell, Miss Walker, Mr. Gunther. Yes, they're all here, Lieutenant. Uh, you're the landlady, Mrs. Washburn, right? Well, if you want to put, be blunt about it. I'm afraid I'm a blunt man. Maybe it's the business I'm in. Last night, a girl was killed in this house. According to the coroner, it happened about two in the morning. She was killed in a particularly cold-blooded manner. Stabbed. And that's murder. There's no two ways about it. Now, you're intelligent people. You're all connected with the theater. No, I... not all. Not all. France is my sort of uh, caretaker, handyman. Yes, handyman. But not to do with that theater, that place of sin and abomination. Don't mind him. France has always been a little prejudiced. I know when the sword of righteousness is ready to strike. Where were you at two o'clock in the morning? I was in my room waiting. What were you waiting for? Now, look, don't you people realize what you're up against? Till you can account for your actions last night, you're all under suspicion of murder. What makes you so sure one of us did it? Oh, you were Miss Nancy Collins' fiance, is that right, Mr. Farrell? Yes. What were you doing last night? I was out walking. Anybody see you? I don't know. I, I don't think so. How do I know? What were you doing out walking around at 2 o'clock in the morning? Well, after what happened, I... Oh, uh-huh. what happened? Oh, nothing, nothing. I was upset, that's all. Why don't you tell him the truth, Daniel? The truth? What's the use of all this talking? It's not going to bring her back. What did you mean by that, Mrs. Collins? What truth? It's not my place to say. Daniel considers it a personal matter. It couldn't have had anything to do with what... Oh, I'm sure no one is concealing anything of the slightest importance. Everyone loved Nancy. Everyone. Please. Please. I know what you're getting around to. Why, Kay? That everyone loved her but me. That I hated her. But I didn't. Well, not enough to... to do a thing like that. Where were you at two this morning, Miss Walker? In my room. Can you prove that? No, of course I can't. That's the whole thing, don't you see? Now, listen, listen. Who's playing that piano? That's Mr. Rejack in the room across the hall. He's a musician. Does he live here? Yes. Why didn't you tell me? I thought you said everybody was here. No use talking to him. He doesn't even know about it. Will you please let me handle this? Really, Lieutenant, he couldn't tell you anything. You see, You get him in here, Haggerty. Go get him. Okay. Now, listen, you, you people have got an awful lot of explaining to do. None of you can prove where you were or what you were doing or why you were doing it. What about you, Mrs. Collins? You don't think... After all, I am poor Nancy's mother. Mrs. Collins, I'm just trying to get at the facts. You have the room next to Nancy. Didn't you even hear anything? No. I've had insomnia for years. I have to take a strong sedative every night. Here comes Mr. Rejack. Oh, Mr. Rejack, I... I'm sorry to disturb you, sir. I didn't realize that, uh, uh, That I was blind? Oh, it is no matter. I was waiting for you to send for me, officer. You... You knew the police were here? But of course. Oh, uh, Mrs. Washburn, has anyone seen anything of Carl yet this morning? No, not yet. Uh, uh, who is Carl, Mr. Rejack? My Belgian police dog, who guides me. He has wandered off somewhere. <laughs> Although I cannot say I blame him. It is not much fun being a companion only to a blind man. Oh, well, he, he'll come back. That kind of always does. Oh, I'm not worried. But now you wish to speak of the terrible thing that has happened to poor Nancy. Oh, you, you know about that? Unfortunately, yes. By the way, here is the key to her room. It was locked and you were obliged to force it, were you not? Oh, why, yes, but how, how did you... How do I have the key? And how do I know... You see, I'm a blind man. But there are many ways for a blind man to know many, many things. Yes, I I see. Uh, Poor Nancy. Poor child. How much do you know about that? Quite a bit, I'm afraid. I know how she was killed. I know why she was killed. And I know who killed her. (laughs) 
Tonight in our suspense theater, murder was unseen in the dark, but the crime was witnessed by a single human being with the eyes of night. Roma Wines is bringing you Paul Lucas as star of suspense in the Robert L. Richards story, A World of Darkness. You have heard the prologue for tonight's tale of suspense. Before we return to the scene of our drama, let me take a moment to offer a practical reminder. Sudden calls on your hospitality suggest the advantages of having several Roma wines always on hand. For smart and gracious entertaining, nothing can take the place of a glass of Roma wine, whether as an enjoyable beverage by itself or on the table with meals. And look how economical entertainment centered around good wine can be. Only a few cents a glass when you choose the largest selling wines of America, Roma Wines. Location of Roma wineries in favorite wine districts of California and Roma's vast experience and skill as winemakers explain why wine connoisseurs of other lands hail Roma wines and keenly enjoy them. So you know you are complimenting your guests' good taste when you serve Roma wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that Roma Wines bring back to our soundstage Mr. Paul Lucas in A World of Darkness, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. You think it is a great affliction to be bind. Yes, in a way it is. If he yields to it, it can make a man bitter and distort his mind. But if he struggles against it, there are merciful compensations. In time, he reaches out into the world again and finds he can perceive the meaning of the life around him without his eyes. A world of darkness becomes to him a place of utmost sensitivity to other things. To touch, to, to smell, but above all, to sound. The ticking of a watch, the, the, the rustle of clothing, the sound of breathing, or even the beat of a heart. I have only to focus my attention on a sound so distant or so slight as to be utterly imperceptible to anyone else. And to me, it is magnified and amplified a hundred times. Last night, though sitting in my room and confined in my eternal darkness, I heard what I could not see. And I was witness to a murder. The bells of Trinity had just run the three-quarter hour. They are at the lower extremity of the city, but I always like to listen for them. It was a quarter to midnight. I was about to go back to my piano. I had been working on a little composition of my own when I heard Nancy coming down the street from the direction of the theater. She was walking very fast. It was clear to me that she was disturbed about something, so I knew she would want to see me. I waited for her knock. Anton? Yes, Nancy, come in. <coughs> oh, you are troubled. What is it? How did you know? You know I can always tell these things. <laughs> See, even Carl knows. Oh, hello, Carl. He's so nice. You're both so nice. Carl and I. Huh? <laughs> you know he loves you, Nancy. I think he really does. Almost as much as he loves me. I know. Oh, I'm going to miss you both terribly. You are going away? Anton, I'm going to marry Danny Farrell. To... Mary? Yes, he's quitting the stage and he's going into the army. I'm going with him. That's what I want to tell you about. I see. Anton, you've always been so good to me. You've helped me so much and I... I've always felt that you liked me. More than that, Nancy. I'm very, very fond of you. Oh, Anton, you're the best friend I've ever had. But I'm nearly twice your age and... Blind. Oh, that doesn't matter. We've had some wonderful times together. Yes. 
And now you wish to talk to me because you are still not sure you have made the right decision, hmm? Yes. Now, to leave the stage now, just when you are having the first time such a wonderful success. Oh, it isn't that. I, I've always hated the stage. Hated it. Now, Nancy, now, you have a very great talent. You, you can't have a talent for anything you don't like. And you can't like anything you've had crammed down your throat ever since you were barely able to talk. Oh, it's your mother. She's counted on it all these years. She sacrificed everything for my career. Oh, Mother loves me in her way, but sometimes she's so strange. When I told her about Danny tonight, I I thought she was going to have a stroke or something. I've seen her angry before, but never like no, this. Oh, it will pass. Anton, for a minute she... She looked insane. I was frightened. Really frightened. Listen. What? Anton, what is it? Your mother, leaving her room. She will be coming down here to look for you. How do you know? The rustle of her satin, satin robe. I hear it often. Perhaps you better not speak any more just now of your little trouble. Oh, I shouldn't have bothered you. I know it must seem childish and no, silly no, to you. No, 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 Nancy, it is not for me. But perhaps your mother will not like it that you confide in others. But how could you know that Nancy? she... Nancy! You see? She is coming. Nancy! Yes, Mother? Oh, there you are. I thought you might be here. Good evening, Edna. Nancy, you really must come upstairs now. If I'm going to have your new dress ready for the equity party, I've got to cut it from the pattern tonight, and I want you to help me. Mother, I'm not going to the party. Why, Nancy, of course you are. It's very important. Mother, do we have to go through it all again? Nancy, dear, I'm sorry I lost my temper this evening. I know this seems like the only thing in the world that matters just now, love and all. But you simply can't walk out of the lead in a hit play and ever expect to be successful. I don't want to be successful. Can't you get that through your head? After I've slaved and skimped and planned all these years. You'll be all right, Mother. There'll be enough. I'll be all right. I'm not thinking of myself. I've never had a chance to think of myself. Only last week I drew every penny of my own savings and took it out an insurance policy on you. A hundred thousand dollars. So that you'd have something for your old age. You shouldn't have done that, Mother. And now you want to throw away everything I've done for that harebrained boy. But, Edna, if Nancy's in love... You keep out of this. Mother, please. Oh, I've watched you too, Anton Rejack. But I knew she wouldn't have anything to do with a blind man. Mother. You couldn't see her. But you could touch her, couldn't you? You could be in love with her. <laughs> well, I hope you see now what a fool you've made of yourself. You fool. You blind fool. Fool, fool, fool! Down, Carl. Quiet. He struck me. I'm sorry. You deserved it, Mother. I think you'd better go now, Edna. Nancy, I want you to come upstairs right away. We're going to cut out your new dress tonight. Oh, Anton, forgive me. No, it is nothing. I'm sorry I did what I did, but I was afraid she would become hysterical. Anton, I didn't know. Believe me, I didn't no, I know. No, it is nothing. You had better go up to her now. Yes. Oh, I'm afraid. Oh, but there is nothing to be afraid of. Yes. But I'm afraid. I could not sleep, although it was late. I tried to go back to my work, but my attention wandered. I could not keep from mind from what was going on in that room upstairs. I heard each sound as clearly as though the cause of it were there at my very side. Nancy was weeping. And against the sound of her tears, like an inexorable counterpoint, the scissors, the deliberate mechanical snipping and crunching of heavy dressmaker's shears, cutting material on a table. Then there was an interruption. Footsteps running up the stairs. The footsteps of Danny Farrell. 
I knew what would happen then. Mrs. Collins, you've got to listen. So I did not want to I'll listen. Up here. Nancy but Jones, for a moment, I did. Sammy, I don't know what to do. Well, it's about time you found out, isn't it? I shut my mind to it. I didn't want to hear anymore. There was to be another quarrel, another agonizing scene. And then presently I heard the steps again. Slow and heavy this time, coming down the stairs. They went towards the front door instead of to his own room. He was going out. I did not know what he might do. I went to my own door and as casually as I could, I opened it. Oh, hello, Aunt Anne. Why, hello, Danny. Were you going out? For a little walk. It's late. I guess it is. I am sorry, Danny. You know about it, do you? Yes, Nancy told me tonight. There was a scene with her mother again. But it will come out all right. Oh, no, it won't. Why? Nancy's changed her mind. Or rather, her mother's changed it for her. The poor child. Anton, Nancy's a lovely girl. She's the loveliest girl in the world. But she's weak. Oh, but we are all weak in one way or another. But she doesn't know what she does to people. She doesn't know the torture she puts people through. No. And I can't stand it any longer. If I can't have Nancy, I'll... I'll do something. I'll... Danny, now, it will be all right. It can't be all right. How do I know it won't go on like this after we're married? Oh, I'm crazy, I suppose, but... I, I know how these things are. Two young people in love cannot be kept apart by anyone or anything in this earth. No, Anton. I thought it over and over every way there is. It won't work. Oh, come in. Anton, I... Oh... I didn't know you were here, Danny. Okay. I just heard the news over at the theater. Congratulations. Thanks. I suppose I had to say that. You know I don't mean it, Danny. Please, Kay, I... I don't think you love her, Danny. I don't see how you could. Kay, I don't want to talk about it tonight. Are you afraid to talk to me, Danny? Are you? I'm sorry, Kay. Good night, Anton. Danny. Danny, listen to me. Danny! Oh, let him go. He's upset tonight. He's upset. He's upset. <laughs> Kay, Kay, stop it. Get hold of yourself. I love him. I love him. I can't let him go. Oh, but you must, don't you see? He's going to be married. Before she came along, he couldn't even think of anyone but me. Well, she planned it very nicely. Just the way she's planned everything else. She doesn't care how many lives she wrecks, including his. But it won't be so easy this Kay, time. Kay, Kay, you are talking foolishness. Listen, Anton. Before I'd let her get away with this, I'd kill her. So help me, I'd kill her. She left me at last. I paid no heed to where she went. I was disturbed and troubled. I sat in the darkness of my mind, thinking. Then I heard steps again. Those odd, dragging steps coming towards my door. Franz? Yes, Mr. Rejack. Did you want to see me, Franz? No. No, I was only listening. Listening? To what? Don't you hear it? The beating of the wings? They've been close about the house all evening. Oh, oh, have they? The time is very near. Are you a good man, Mr. Rejack? Now, I don't know, friends. I, I try to be. The black angel with the bright sword of righteousness and vengeance. Do you think we can escape him? Well, I, I hope so. No, no. Don't you know what goes on in this house? Haven't you seen them? With their painted lips, their tinkling rings and bracelets, and their vanity and their scoffing? Yes, yes, friends. Uh, uh, what have you in your bag there? Oh, here's my, my tools. Always I work. Work day and night. There's a dripping faucet up in Miss Collins' room. I have to fix it. Dripping faucet? Oh, yes. What's the matter, Mr. Redek? Did you think of something? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I was thinking that I must take Carl out for a walk. <laughs> Oh, oh, no, Carl, down, down, Hello down. there, Carl. He's a fine dog, eh? Franz. Yes, yes. Go along, do what I told you. It's late. Yes, yes. I do what I'm told. Remove out of the midst of Babylon and go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans. For this city will I humble to the dust and this house 
will I make a place of weeping and desolation. The moment the old man called my attention to the faucet, I had heard it. When I back, went back into my room, I, I still heard it. I heard the old man tinkering with the pipes. Then the dripping grew less and stopped. Then the shears began again. Those long, sharp scissors cutting the dress. I forced myself to return to my work and for a while I heard nothing more. Then I heard it. The dripping had begun again. But this time it was no longer water that was dripping. It was then that I knew. I sat frozen with horror. It was the most terrible sound I had ever heard in my life. At last I got up and took my cane and went to the door. Carl wished to go with me, but I closed the door on him. It was later, somehow, in my confusion that he slipped away. I started up the stairs. That terrible sound grew louder. It came from Nancy's room. I had just reached the top of the stairs. There was no way for anyone to leave Nancy's room except in my direction. It was then that I heard the telltale whisper. The murderer had passed me in the darkness. I went to Nancy's door. There was no need to go in. I knew what was there as surely as though I had seen it happen with the eyes I no longer have. For I could hear the steady dripping of her blood. I closed the door and locked it. I put the key in my pocket. I wished to make certain that the criminal would have no chance to return and cover up any evidence of the crime. Then I returned to my room to wait for you officers of the police to come. And now you would know as I knew why Nancy Collins died and who killed her. <laughs> Do all you people here confirm what Mr. Rejack says about your movements last night? Wait. What did you mean about the telltale whisper? Oh, what is the use of any longer pretending, Edna? You killed her. Now you must pay for it. No, no! Now, doubtless you have already found her fingerprints on the scissors with which Nancy has stepped. Oh, naturally, they were Mrs. Collins' scissors anyway. And I have a suspicion that you will find the insurance policy she took out on her daughter's life only last week that makes Edna Collins the beneficiary in the event of Nancy's death. No, no, I didn't do it. You better take her along, Haggerty. All right, come on. Mary. No, please, come wait a on. minute. Maybe I've been selfish, but I loved her. He's lying because he hates me for what I said. No, no, please. Well, Mr. Rejack, I guess several people owe you their thanks for this. And you owe me nothing. If it could only bring her back to life. Come in. We found Mr. Rejack's dog, ma'am, down in the cellar. Been there all night. Here, Carl. Carl, my poor old Carl. Here, Carl. <laughs> Carl, what's the matter? Where are you? <laughs> Grab him, somebody. Grab him. Pull it back. Back. You. Carl. Kill him. Carl, what's the matter? Don't you know me? Uh, Mr. Rejack, you, you say you shot your dog in your room before you went upstairs last night. Yes. Yes. You're certain? Well, but of course. And you say you did not go into Nancy Collins' room after you discovered the murder? No. No, I did not. Well, that's very strange, Mr. Rejack. Because your dog did. His coat is matted with her blood. I realize now that the dog must have followed me. I heard him whimper when I struck. Then somehow he disappeared. But before I locked the room, the beast must have fawned on her where she fell. Yes, I... I killed her. It is no matter now. She will marry no one now. Nor will I. Yet it is true I heard those things. 
Yes, most of them. You would be amazed what I can hear. Now, even from where I sit, I can hear the men at work at the place where they will take me. Although that place is many miles away. They are hammering on the scaffolding in preparation for me. And now they are clambering up, up on the platform. And now they are about to test that ingenious device that will snuff out my life. Listen. They spring the trap. And so closes A World of Darkness, presented by Roma Wines and starring Paul Lucas. Tonight's tale of Suspense. In just a moment, we'll hear again from Mr. Lucas. First, though, let's visit one of the great airports in our country. The afternoon clipper has just landed in the USA. A North American and his newly arrived visitor from south of the border are about to take a table at an airport cafe. Well, Elliot, I promised to return to your visit, and here I am. I'll try to make things as pleasant for you here as you made them for me in your beautiful home in Las Palmas. How about some wine before dinner, Carlos? Oh, thank you. Some sherry, perhaps? Certainly. Wait a minute. Oh, Elliot, can we get here that wonderful Roma wine we had the day you left my country? Well, of course, Carlos. Here we can have Roma wine anytime. To wine connoisseurs abroad, Roma wines are a rare treat because shipping now is difficult and duty is high. But here at home, you can enjoy these great wines as often as you like. For Roma wines of all types are made in our own California. Highly prized and high priced elsewhere, Roma wines here cost little enough to be served even at everyday family meals. And what a difference they make in meal enjoyment. Why don't you surprise your family tomorrow with delicious Roma California sherry? You never tasted finer. You don't need a special menu or special glasses either. Just chill the wine beforehand, and when your folks come home, pour them a delightful glass of Roma. Almost all wine dealers have complete assortments of Roma wines. They are America's largest selling wines. Ask for Roma, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. But before you buy wine, buy war bonds and stamps. This is Paul Lucas again, ladies and gentlemen. Germany murders her cripples. We protect ours, help them back to normal lives. And we fight the major cause of crippling, infantile paralysis. Every night from now till January 31st, sort out all the dimes you have. Then enlist them in the March of Dimes. Send your contribution to President Roosevelt at the White House. It's the American way. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Next Thursday, same time, your stars will be Virginia Bruce and Alan Jocelyn in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California presents... Suspense. Tonight, I Had an Alibi, starring Keenan Wynn. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests. To your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you Suspense. This is the Man in Black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, who tonight from Hollywood bring you as star, Mr. Keenan Wynn, who is soon to be seen in the Metro Golden Mayo production Between Two Women. Tonight, Mr. Wynn details for us the dramatic narrative of a gentleman who studied thoroughly the art of murder, and who, like certain others whose ventures are now and again recorded on the front pages of our newspapers, evolved his own formula for the perfect crime. And so with I Had an Alibi, and with the performance of Keenan Wynn, 
We again hope to keep you in suspense. Miss Lamson? Yes? Come in, come in. Sit down. Ever take dictation for a writer before? No. Well, that's okay. I've never written a novel before that I finished. I uh, hope you don't mind working in a place like this. I don't mind working anywhere that I'm paid to work. <laughs> oh, don't let that worry you. I came into quite a piece of change not long ago. Um, maybe you heard about it. Yes. Well, you're not exactly the talkative type, are you? I didn't think you'd have much time for talking, Mr. Eichner. <laughs> yeah, check. Eleven days to make my, uh, deadline. Uh, ready to start? Yes. Title. I Had an Alibi by Joseph Eichner. Oh, by the way, this will all be in the first person. Yes. <clears throat> Chapter one. I first met Belle Schaffner when I went to work for the Herald. She was a sob sister and a good one. I was a police reporter and, uh, no bum in the business myself. With Belle and me, it happened almost right away. We talked the same language, thought the same way, wanted the same things. We, we were that kind of a team. But for a while, there were a couple of notions in the back of my mind that I hadn't even told Belle. Because uh, sometimes a woman in love can be practical only just so far. It all came out one night in the office after I'd been there about six months. Hi, Sugar Puss. Busy? Uh-uh. Can I see? Eh, yeah, why not? Dimly through the gray curtain of fog, Alice saw the phantom figure. It was closer now. She tried to scream, but her throat... <laughs> Is Alice still having trouble with her throat? She's been trying to scream for two weeks now. Look, I know, I know. There's a the reason right there. City desk, Eichner. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's the address again? Okay, I'll go right down. Well, what did I tell you? President want to see you? Some guy carved up his wife. If I have to cover one more family brawl ends fatally for this sheet... Well, what's the matter? You like to write about murders, and here they pay you for it. Well, not the kind of money I want, they don't. Have you any idea what they pay a guy like James M. Cain? Mm, a James M. Cain girl never has any trouble screaming when she wants to. Hey, listen, Joe. You'll never write a decent book until you get down to something you know about. Well, this stuff sells, doesn't it? Agatha Christie sells. Leslie Charteris sells. Yeah, yeah, but that's not your racket, Joe. You've seen plenty of the real thing. Write about that. Stick to your trade. Oh, yeah. Well, look what it's got me. You just can't be a writer and a newspaper reporter at the same time, Belle. That's all. All right. Quit. <laughs> On what? Relief? Well, darling, it isn't leap year, but uh, I'll always support you. Oh, I, I can't even live on my own salary. How are we going to both live on yours? Oh, listen, Belle, you know how I am about you. Well, a girl always thinks she has ways of knowing. Oh, I've given you plenty of ways of knowing. But before we do anything like that, we've got to have money. Lots of money. We're that kind of people. And uh, there are ways. Like what? Well, like marriage, for instance. Oh, you're going to marry the boss's daughter, huh? Well, why not? If the boss has left her a million dollars, and uh, she has a bad cough... Well, I don't have a million dollars, but... <coughs> all right, you think I'm kidding. But they exist. You read about them in the papers all the time. That's right, you do. Well, what's that? Just a picture of a girl. Mm -hmm. and what about her? I'm supposed to go out and interview her tonight. It's a very, very sad story. Yeah? Uh-huh. She's got not one million dollars, but five. And she's an orphan. And she's got something the matter with her heart. So they only give her six months to live. And she's just come out here to spend her last days in the glorious sunshine of California. It's a very sad story. Yeah. You want the assignment, Romeo? It's yours. Hmm? Oh, uh, say, loan me a couple of dollars, will you, Belle? What? Poker? Oh, no, no, no. Flowers.
Tonight, for suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Mr. Keenan Wynn, whom you've heard in the prologue to I Had an Alibi, a radio play by Mindred Lord. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. And we have an interesting idea for you tonight from the keen and sensible mind of America's famed expert on parties and smart entertaining, Miss Elsa Maxwell. And we quote, Serving a nice table wine when friends come to dinner or with everyday meals is one of the smartest, most sensible, and truly moderate pleasures of which I know. And one which any family can regularly enjoy since the cost of delicious Roma Burgundy is very little. Just serve your Roma Burgundy well cooled. Enjoy it with any food and don't worry about special glasses. Any glasses available are perfectly correct. The goodness of the wine, the added enjoyment of your food, these are the things that count. Miss Maxwell expresses perfectly what we of Roma believe. In Roma, California Burgundy, in all Roma wines, you enjoy the glorious color, aroma, and flavor of superb, sun-ripe grapes. Our noted wineries, located in California's choicest vineyard areas, assure you of flavor and quality which are always good, never varying, always delightful. And so, Roma quality is preferred everywhere. And you are able to enjoy these fine Roma wines at modest prices, only pennies a glassful. Remember... More Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. R-O-M-A. Roma Wines. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage our star, Mr. Keenan Wynn, who, as one Joe Eichner, prepares to continue dictation on his first and only novel, I Had an Alibi, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. You're, uh, sure you don't mind coming here, Miss Lamson? No. Well, we'd better go on with the dictation. I've only got, uh, nine more days. I'm ready. Uh, chapter four. Belle Schaffner was a good sob sister, all right, even if she did have one weakness, which was me. The story she'd given me about the girl was the real McCoy. Her name was Linda Vale, and she did have five million dollars and just six months to live. I went out to her house that night. She was living in a big place in Beverly Hills that she'd taken over from some broken-down movie star. You know, swimming pool, tennis courts, riding stables, the works. And not a soul around. I'd been worried about that. I, I thought maybe she might be having a last fling and working at it 24 hours a day, you know, with a lot of nosy spongers hanging on to her all the time. There was just one light on in a room upstairs and a hall light. I went up to the door and knocked and... Waited. Yes, sir? Uh, I'd like to see Miss Vale, please. I'm sorry, sir, but Miss Vale has given orders that... Well, would you just give her these, please? I'll, I'll wait. Oh, very well, sir. A press card will break the ice with almost anyone, and I knew the flowers would do the rest. What a surprise. Pretty soon I heard steps and a voice. Sandra, the flowers are simply lovely, but who... Miss Vale? Yes? Well, my name is Joseph Eichner. Yeah, she was a nice enough kid and lonely. Because, like a lot of people on a spot like that, the thing she was afraid of most was having anybody pity her. That's the mistake that nearly everybody made. But not me. I played it for a switch. I'd figured every move for days ahead. Joe? Yes? What's the matter? Oh, nothing. You've been awfully subdued lately. You've always been so gay. Well, Linda, I... Well, I've got to go away. Go away? Linda, I've been trying to keep it from you, but... Well, gee, you, you must know how I feel about you and seeing you every day and knowing that... Oh, Joe. Well, it's not fair to you, Linda. And, well, I can't take it anymore. Joe. Yes? I don't want you to go. I don't want to. I don't want to, Linda, but... Then promise me. Promise me you won't leave me. 
Just with the little time that's left. Oh, Linda. For my sake. All right, Linda. For your sake. After that, it was quick and easy. Three days later, we went to see her doctor, the best heart specialist in California. Dr. Lawson, you must be frank with us. Doctor, we're in love. I see. And we want to be married. Look, doctor, if I could make Linda happier, if I could give her all the love and tenderness, well, isn't it just possible... My boy, all that medical science can do is go on the basis of experience. We can't make certain prophecies. But on the basis of experience, the prognosis for Linda remains unchanged. But, Doctor, once you told me that anything is possible... And I say it again, my dear. Anything is possible. That's enough for me, Joe. Yeah, me too. Do you, Joseph, take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife, to have and to hold in sickness and health, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, forsaking all others, until death do you part? I do. Do you, Linda, take this man to be your lawful wedded wife? baby. Oh, hello, Romeo. Oh, now, Belle, lay off, will you? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just nervous, I guess. Well, is anything wrong? Well, uh, that ex-husband of mine is loose again. Well, what of it? What of it? You remember the song and dance he led me the last time, don't you? All right, so he gets rough, you just haven't committed again, that's all. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Belle. No, please. I don't feel like... Well, what's the matter? Well, what do you think? Oh, now, Belle, you know I come around here as often as I can. Sure. Sometimes as often as twice a week. Well, I see you other places. Anyway, I, I can't help it. And then when I do come, well, gee, you might at least... All right. Skip it. How's the writing coming along? Oh, I don't know. I just can't seem to get started. So you're not even getting that done. Well, how can I get down to work when all I'm thinking about is... Joe. How long is this going to go on? Well, how do I know? It's bound to happen soon. That's what you said a year ago. A year ago. But, Belle, it's all set. She made out the will in my name and everything. All we have to do is wait. Just wait for the heart of hers to quit. That's all. Well, I'm tired of waiting. Now, what do you think of that? Well, what else can we do? If you mean what else can I do? There are a few guys around loose with five million bucks, too, you know. Oh, now, Belle. Oh, you... For all we know, she's liable to live to be a hundred. Now, that's impossible. A doctor said... Yes, that... and doctors have been wrong. Well, what do you want me to do about it? Well, you think you're a mystery writer. What do you mean by that? I mean, if you're supposed to be able to think up mysteries, start thinking one up. Oh. And don't think about it too long, either. Say, Bell. I mean it, Joe. Okay. Because I'm not going to wait like this forever. Okay. Well, that was when I first began to think about it. Then all of a sudden, I began writing again. Linda was a little surprised, but I kept right at it, and every so often I'd show her what I'd done. It was pretty terrible, but it didn't matter, because nobody but her was ever going to see it anyway. After about two weeks of this, I was ready. That night, I came out of the study and went into the drawing room. Working hard? Yeah. Uh, say, Linda... You want to do me a favor? Well, of course I do. Well, uh, you know the place in my story where Lillian pretends to commit suicide and leaves the note? Uh-huh. Look, I suddenly thought, why not have the note reproduced right in the book as, as though we're in her own handwriting? You know, uh, Exhibit A, you know, along with the map of the grounds and so on, hmm? Well, that would be good. Yeah. Only, of course, it's got to be in a woman's handwriting. Do you want to write it for me? You mean my handwriting's going to come out in a book? Oh, how exciting. Well, it sure is if I can get a publisher, and I think I've got a nibble. Here, uh, you can write it on your own stationery. Right. I'll, I'll cut that letterhead off at the top later. All right. What does it say? Uh, darling. Darling? You, uh, you, you know I can't go on like this. Huh? It's, it's got to end sometime. It's got to end. And some time. Uh, it will be easier for both of us if I end it now. If 
I end it now. Please try to forgive me and uh, sign it L. L? Wouldn't you sign it? Oh, no, no, you see, all Lillian's letters to Dick are signed L, remember? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. I remember now. There. Oh, thanks, darling. Is it all right? Oh, sure. It's perfect. Hello, Bell? Yeah. Now listen, baby, it's all set. Did you get the note? Oh, sure, sure. She wrote it tonight. Now, how soon can you leave for Palm Springs? Anytime. Tomorrow morning? All right. Now listen, when you check in down there, make plenty of fuss about it. I will. Uh, I'll leave here at exactly 9.30 tomorrow night. I'll stop at a couple of places, so you leave Palm Springs about uh, 15 minutes later, oh, 9.45. Okay. Better check your watch at Western Union. I'll do the same. Okay. Hey, be sure to bring plenty of stuff. Everything you can lay your hands oh, on. Oh, don't worry. I will. You remember the place, don't you remember? You know, the second turn after you leave Riverside. Well, how far is it about? Well, it's exactly halfway between the springs and here. Say, 60 miles. I'll be there. Okay, baby, tomorrow night. What time is it, Linda? Oh, it's just about 9.30. Well, I guess I'd better be going. Gee, darling, I hate to have to leave you this way on such short notice. Oh, it's all right, dear. I'll be going to sleep in a few minutes anyway. You know, I don't know why this guy has to see me in such a rush in Palm Springs of all places. But if he wants to publish my book... Well, of course, well, you have to go. Well, I'll be back tomorrow afternoon, uh, maybe even earlier. You won't worry, will you? No, I won't. Uh, doors under the terrace locked? Yep. Yeah, they're all right. You know, I know how nervous you are sometimes when I'm away for the evening. I think you're the one that's nervous. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I am at that. Well, good night, darling. Good night, Joe. Oh, uh, Saunders. Yes, sir? Come in, sir. Look, Saunders, I've got to drive down to Palm Springs tonight. Uh, oh, excuse me just a second. Linda? Yes? Linda, you'd better put the snap lock on your door from the inside, just in case. I've got the key. Oh, oh all right. There you are. Okay, darling, good night. Good night. Uh, Saunders, uh, let me see. Oh, yes. Uh, I wonder if you'd mind checking the doors from Mrs. Eichner's room onto the terrace to see if they're locked uh, from the outside. Good, sir. A little later when she's asleep so as not to disturb her. You know, she gets nervous sometimes when I'm not here. Yes, sir. Saunders, you won't forget, will you? Oh, no, sir. I shan't forget, sir. Uh, five gallons? Yes, sir. Say, uh, that ought to get me to Palm Springs. Oh, should easy. By the way, have you got a road map for Palm Springs? I think I got one inside here. Oh, thanks. Say, I don't suppose you'd cash a small check, would you? I missed the bank today. Well, the boss might, but uh, he ain't here. Well, I got identification, plenty of it. See, Joseph Eichner, license... Social Security card, mm. Joseph Eichner. Yes, yes, I see, son, I see. But unless the boss was here, I wouldn't cash a check for Henry Morgenthau. Bell? Joe. Hello, baby. Well, what's the matter? You're shaking all over. Oh, I don't know. Everything, I guess. Hmm? And I thought I saw that ex-husband of mine down in Palm Springs what? today. Now, what would he be doing down there? I don't... Oh, I must be seeing oh, things. Oh, no, sure you are. Oh, Joe. Joe, I'm scared just the same. Are you sure nobody's going to get nosy about this? Let him. It's a setup. The room's locked from the inside, and the butler knows it. Nobody could have done what's going to happen in that room tonight except Linda or me. I couldn't have done it because I couldn't be there in at Palm Springs with you at the same time, right? Oh, yeah, I and guess so. I've already left a trail to Palm Springs a mile wide. Did you get away all right? Yeah, off the back of the hotel. Nobody saw me. Everything else go okay? Oh, yeah. I got the maid in this afternoon and raised a fuss. Then I gave her five dollars and made her polish everything till she was blue in the face. She'll never forget it. <laughs> Swell. You got the stuff? Yeah, my big suitcase in the trunk rack. All packed in cotton. Okay, let's take a look at it. Here you are. 
Look at this. Mm -hmm. Glasses, mm -hmm. water pitcher, ashtrays, and look at this. I even got doorknobs. I unscrewed them with a nail file. Hey, what do you know? <laughs> Here's the one to the bathroom. And this little one's from the medicine cabinet. Uh -huh. And this one's the inside of the front door. Okay, I'll just put my fingerprints on them and you pack them back in cotton. Mm -hmm. Say, you're sure you can get this stuff back into your room all right? Oh, sure. Oh, you better hurry then. Yeah, I know. There. With my fingerprints on that doorknob, just let anybody try to prove I wasn't with you in Palm Springs tonight. Oh, I told you that when you got down to something real, you'd hit the jackpot. Remember? Yeah, and you know what this pot is worth, don't you? Five million dollars. <laughs> No hitches. I got back to town a little before two. I drove the car into a little side road about a half a mile up the canyon and walked back. I didn't meet anybody, and the places I passed were all dark. So was mine. I slipped through a hole of the hedge and crossed the lawn and went up onto the terrace. I checked to see if I had the suicide note in my pocket, and then I pulled on a pair of gloves and opened the terrace door with my key and went inside. The gun was in my overcoat pocket. It was hers. I had the flashlight in my hand. I went over to the bedside and I flashed it on just for a second. She was lying on her side, turned away from me. I put the gun against her temple and pulled the trigger. She didn't make a sound. I reached over to put the gun in her hand and then it hit me. Her hand was stiff and cold as ice. I flashed the light in her face. It was blue. While I was away, she'd had her heart attack at last. For the last three or four hours, she'd been dead. Well, for about ten seconds, I didn't know what to do. Then I realized I had to get out of there. Saunders might have heard the shot. Before, it wouldn't have mattered one way or the other because the coroner would have established the time of death anyway. But now it made all the difference in the world. I went out the terrace door and I locked it behind me. I across the grounds and I started walking up the canyon, walking, thinking, I, I don't know how long I walked, but what I was thinking was enough to drive me crazy. I'd planned the perfect suicide. I'd planned it so nobody could have fired that shot but Linda or me, and I had a perfect alibi. But now it had to be me that shot her, because any fool of a doctor could tell she'd been dead when that shot was fired. And then it came to me. What was the difference? Let the Palm Springs alibi go. Let them think the shooting was an accident. Let them think anything they wanted to. I had the money. And what can you do to a man for shooting a dead body? It was almost daylight when I got back to the room. The house was still dark, so Saunders hadn't heard anything. First, I burned that suicide note. Then I turned on the lights and unlocked the door. Then I fired another shot into the wall for Saunders again, just in case he was awake. Then I went over to the interhouse phone. Uh, hello? Saunders. Oh, oh, yes, sir. Saunders, there's been an accident. You better call the police. <clears throat> well, uh... Have you seen everything you want to, Lieutenant? Yep. Well, you're living kind of different than you used to when you were a police reporter downtown, huh, Joe? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, suppose you want to ask me some questions. Oh, a couple. I, uh, hear you were going to Palm Springs last night. Yeah, I was. I changed my mind. Who are you going to see down there? Anybody in particular? Oh, just a friend. It, uh, it wouldn't have been your old friend, Bell Schaffner, would it? Well, whatever, I didn't go. Uh, you'd have had time to go, though. Well, all right, but I didn't. Anyway, what's all that got to do oh, with Oh, nothing, it? nothing, nothing, just routine. So you came back here? Yeah, that's right. And what happened? Well, I came in the house, and I went up to the our bedroom, and I, I thought I heard a noise. I thought I saw a man moving around. Well, I was pretty jumpy, and I fired. How many shots? Two. And one of them hit your wife? One of them hit... What was my wife? All an accident, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You, uh... You come into quite a lot of money with her out of the way, don't you, Joe? Yeah, sure. What of it? Nothing. 
Only it's too bad you're not going to be able to spend it. <laughs> oh, nuts. What do you think you're going to do? Charge me with a murder for firing a shot into a corpse? No, but it could be a pretty spectacular little alibi for just on the spur of the moment, couldn't it? Alibi for what? For Belle Shaftner. What? Her throat was cut in Palm Springs last night, and your fingerprints are all over the place. It was her ex-husband who killed her, of course. But what's the difference now? Bella was right about one thing, though. You can't write a decent story unless it's something real. I know. The end. Well, Miss Lamson, we made it. Just. Yes. Do you believe it? Yes. <laughs> Gee, that's funny. Nobody else did. The judge, the jury, not even my own lawyer. Maybe they believe what I believe. But you ought to die for it anyway. <laughs> yeah, check. Uh, I got a date for that right now. Right, Warden? You ready, Agner? Yeah, yeah, let's go. And so closes I Had an Alibi, starring Keenan Wynn, tonight's tale of Suspense. Suspense is produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. The other day, Elsa Maxwell told us about a friend who had lived many years in wine-loving countries around the world. I gave him some of our delicious Roma California Burgundy at dinner, and he confessed to me that he thought it every bit as enjoyable as any he had ever had. So I say, you people who do not regularly serve Roma wine are missing one of the most delightful treats daily living can offer. It's so good, so smart, and yet so very simple. Take Miss Maxwell's advice. Enjoy Roma wine regularly. It's always good, unvaryingly fine in flavor and quality, and only pennies a glass. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. Roma. R-O-M-A. Roma Wines. Next Thursday, same time, Miss Nancy Kelly will be your star of... Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wines present Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salute! Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Man in Black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Laird Kriegar in a suspense play dealing with a maniacal hatred and with a mental drug of hypnotics. And so with narrative about Clarence and with the performance of Laird Kriegar, supported by Hans Conried as Bill, from whom we hear the narrative, we again hope to keep you in Suspense. I never wanted to kill anyone, not till he came along. I didn't even want to kill him at first. I kept thinking there must be some other way. If anybody had told me six months ago that I was capable of murder, I would have thought he was crazy. What I'm getting at is this. There are circumstances, people, that can make anybody want to commit murder. And he, he was one of those people. He brought the circumstances with him, a whole set of them. I never heard of the guy till one day last summer. We were having breakfast. My wife was looking over the morning mail. Bill, look at this. Postmark Calcutta. It must be from Clarence. Who's Clarence? He's my brother. You never told me you had a brother. Didn't I? 
Well, it's not so surprising. He's only my half-brother, and I haven't seen him since I was a child. He's never even written to me before. That's funny. Wonder why he decided to write now. I can't imagine. Well, what's he say? He's coming to America. What for? Now, Bill, don't be like that. Well, you're not going to ask him to stay with us, are you? Well, what else can I do? He says he's coming straight here from the boat. Well, so what? There are several first-class hotels in this town. Well, I'll just ask him kind of half-heartedly so he can refuse if he wants to. <laughs> Good girl. There's just one thing that worries me. What's that? He says at the end of the letter, I'm most anxious to meet your daughter, who it has been revealed to me closely resembles her grandmother. Well, Jeannie does look like the pictures of your mother at that. But how does he know? He couldn't even know we have a child. Unless... Unless what? Well, unless someone told him, or... Unless it was revealed to him in some mysterious way. I didn't like that. I didn't like it at all. If there's anything I hate, it's a fake. And if that guy with his wing collar and his high-toned accent didn't look like a fake, then nobody ever did. But he wasn't a fake. He didn't arrive at our house. He seemed to materialize in the middle of the living room. Well, Lillian, don't you recognize me? Why, why, yes, Clarence. How are you, Clarence? Uh, this is Bill, my husband. I know. I hope you'll forgive my rather unconventional entrance. As your doorbell is out of order, I didn't bother to push the button. Oh, hello. I didn't know the doorbell was out of order, Lillian. Neither did I. Well, won't you sit down, Clarence? Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, have a good trip? Excellent. But let's not dwell on the past. I have plans, Lillian. First of all, I intend to settle here in this town, permanently. How nice. I intend to resume my career in America where it left off 15 years ago. Oh. Your wife's look of distress, William, is owing to an unfortunate incident that occurred 15 years ago and made it uh, expedient for me to leave the country for a while. It was all a misunderstanding, Bill. I don't quite know what you're talking about. She's told you nothing about me? How strange. Well, only that you're a doctor and that... Doctor? What an inadequate word. It suggests a little man you call in when the baby gets whooping cough, doesn't it? Well, what's the matter with the little man I call in when the baby gets whooping cough? Well, he's, shall we say, limited. Huh. Yes, yes, that's the kindly word for it. The mind, William, the human mind, with all its strange powers for good and evil. That is my province. Clarence was a mental scientist. He had a small private hospital and... Oh, how drab. How unendurably drab you make it sound, Lillian. I penetrated deep into the mysteries of the human mind. And then I discovered a psychic power transcending the mere grey matter of the human brain. Clarence became interested in the occult. You mean that Indian faker stuff, going into trances and stuff like that? How crudely you put it, William. I'm sorry. Go on with your story. Well, I'll go on with it for you. You started using this mysterious East Hocus Pocus and your mental patients, and their relatives got sore, right? <laughs> your husband, Lillian, is a man of rare perception. Yeah. And now you're back from India with a new bag of tricks, and you're going to set up shop again. Precisely, William. Uh -huh. There's only one thing wrong with your statement, the tone of it. I intend to establish a small private sanitarium dedicated to the treatment of the mentally ill, and I shall continue my investigations into what your wife chooses to call the occult. Is that clear? Quite clear. Now then, Lillian, you will prepare the little room off William's study for me, the, the one with the dark green walls. Well, of, of course you're welcome to stay with us if you want to, Clarence, but the house is rather small and... Yes, yes, yes. It's fortunate that the house is small. I had counted on that. You seem to have counted on a great deal, Clarence. By the way, how'd you know that the room has green walls? Yes, and how did you know... My dear engaging kinsmen, all things are revealed to him who can survive the ordeal of true enlightenment. That is as much as I'm permitted to tell you at the present time. And now, will you be so good as to open the outside door? Your daughter is about to ring the doorbell, and it's out of order. Remember? But how did you... You didn't... Go and let her in, Lillian. I'm eager to meet Jeannie. 
here's what happened today. Sally Bates fell off the seesaw and Miss Thompson had to drive her home and then... Oh, I didn't know we had company. This is your Uncle Clarence from India, dear. Oh. Yes. She is the very image of her grandmother. Was that mother's mother? Yes, dear. Mama and Uncle Clarence had the same mother, but different fathers. Oh, then he's not really my uncle. He's only my half-uncle. I think, little genie, that you will find we have a great deal in common, nevertheless. You will be very close to your Uncle Clarence. Very close. What do you do those funny things with your eyes? Never mind, dear. Uncle Clarence is tired from his long journey. You come on upstairs. Mom will help you change for dinner. All right. See you later, Uncle Clarence. <laughs> What's so funny, Doctor? <laughs> oh, William, I do hope that my stay here won't be complicated by your rudeness. Why did you try to frighten Jeannie just now? My dear fellow, it's the very furthest thing from my wishes to frighten your child. It is essential to my plan for her that she have confidence in me. Now, look, get this straight, Clarence. You're welcome in this house as a guest because you're my wife's brother. Your yogi ideas, or whatever they are, are welcome only so long as you keep them to yourself. I quite intend to, William. That, too, is part of my plan. What is this plan you keep talking about? <laughs> For the time being, William, I will take your advice and keep that to myself. Tonight for Suspense, Roma Wines bring you a star, Mr. Laird Krigar, whom you have heard in the prologue to Narrative About Clarence by Dwight Hauser and Robert Tallman. Tonight's adventure in Suspense. Let's leave the scene of our play for a moment and take a little journey. We'll let a bottle of Roma wine serve as Aladdin's lamp. I touch the label and presto, we're all transported to that capital of gaiety, Havana, Cuba. And now we find ourselves in the charming Pan American Club. At a table nearby, an American has just voiced his delight at the uncommon beauty of the scene. Then his Cuban companion responds, You in America also have much that is uncommon to boast of. Such is this marvelous tasting wine we are enjoying this minute. To enjoy uncommon fine quality, Cuba imports this wine from your own distant California. It is your superb Roma wine. Now just realize what it means when other countries import Roma wines from such great distances. Such international esteem must mean that Roma wines are truly magnificent in quality. And then consider this. You here in America need pay no high import duty, no expensive shipping charges. For these fine Roma wines come from Roma's own wineries in the heart of the rich California wine grape districts. Because so many Americans do realize this good fortune, Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. So why deny yourself this taste delight? Try an inexpensive bottle of tangy, appetizing Roma sherry, or the hearty Roma burgundy, or any of the marvelously enjoyable Roma wines. But remember, these days, your favorite dealer may be temporarily out of the type you prefer. Then please try again. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage our star, Laird Krigar, with Hans Conried in Narrative About Clarence, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Well, you see now how I was beginning to feel about my dear half-brother-in-law, Clarence. At first, it was nothing but just pure hatred. I didn't have any cause yet for fear. And then came that day with little Jeannie. Doesn't take much imagination to know what happened before I got home. Mama, I'm all ready for school. Mama. Hello, Jeannie. Oh, hello, Uncle Clarence. Did you see Mama? Your mother's gone out for a while, but... Well, there's some good in everything, isn't there, Jeannie? This gives us a chance to get acquainted. Well, I'll be late for school. Oh, bother the school. I bet Sally Bates wouldn't worry about school if she had an uncle visiting her who'd come all the way from India. India? Do they really lie on beds of nails and all those things? <laughs> no. Those are just the fakirs. They do those stunts for money, like your circus performers over here. Well, I never saw anything like that at a circus. Did you ever see anything like this, Jeannie? It's just a ring, isn't it? Like a cat's eye. 
Oh, it makes me dizzy to look at it. If you look at it long enough, you'll see all the mysterious secrets of the East. I'm afraid to look again, Uncle Clarence. That light in it, like a cat's eye, scares me. Oh, come now. A big girl like you afraid in the broad daylight. Why do you do those funny things with your eyes? Perhaps because my eyes see so many wonderful things. Just as yours will, if you will only look at the ring. Is... is it magic? Perhaps. Look and see if it isn't. Look right in the center of the cat's eye. That's it. It... it makes me feel sleepy. That's the way it works. First you feel terribly, terribly sleepy. And then you see the most wonderful things. First you feel sleepy. And... and then... Jeannie, Jeannie, what's happened to you? You needn't shout, Mother. I can hear you quite well. Oh, thank heaven you're all right. She is all right, isn't she, Bill? Huh? Oh, sure, sure. Do you feel well enough to go to school, dear? I shan't be going back to that school, Mother. Miss Thompson bores me. What kind of talk is that? I think we'll get a doctor for you, young lady. Please, Father. I will let you know when I'm in need of medical assistance. Bill, she's not all right. She's... Just come outside with me, Mother. You go to sleep again now, Jeannie. Bill, her whole personality has changed. She speaks with that strange accent and a vocabulary like... Tell me, where was Clarence while you were getting that car out? Why, in his room, I suppose. You ever notice that ring he wears? Yes. It's a cat's eye, isn't it? Very well-defined cat's eye. Kind of ring you always see on professional hypnotists. It's dead easy to hypnotize a child, you know. But why would he want to hypnotize Jeannie? I don't know. All I'm interested in is, is getting him out of this house as soon as possible. I'm going in there and give him his walking papers right now. That won't be necessary, William. Clarence, we didn't hear you come in. Obviously not. William, I believe I remarked to you on a previous occasion that I hoped my stay here would not be complicated by your rudeness. It won't be, Clarence. Your stay here is at an end. Lillian, I want to talk with you alone. You can say anything you have to say to me in front of my husband, Clarence. I dare say... It is my wish, however, to speak with you alone. I've had enough. I'm sorry, Lillian. I don't care whether he's your brother or not. I'm telling him to get out of here and get out now. I'll call a taxi while you're packing, Clarence. The irate brother-in-law. What a tiresome exhibition. I'm surprised at a woman of your intelligence becoming involved with such a boor, Lillian. All right, you ask. No, don't. Don't do it, Bill. Clarence just doesn't understand. He's, he's been away for so long. I'm sick of hearing your excuses for him. The time's come for a showdown. No, William. The time has not come for a showdown. Not for a while yet. I will let you know when that time comes. You'll let me know? What? Bill, please. Let me explain to Clarence alone if he likes. I won't leave you alone with him. Oh, don't be melodramatic, William. I'll, I'll kill you, so help me. Bill, please, <laughs> please. All right, I, I'm sorry. I'll give you ten minutes, Clarence, no more. Ten minutes will be ample. I think Lillian and I can come to an excellent understanding in ten minutes. Those ten minutes seemed like an eternity. I could hear Lillian's voice speaking very quietly as if reasoning with him and his hateful, velvety accents replying. And then quite suddenly there seemed to be only one voice, Clarence's. I looked at my watch. The ten minutes were up. The door opened. Clarence stood there in the doorway... And he was laughing. <laughs> what have you done to her? What have you done? <laughs> Lillian was lying on the sofa, unconscious. Her eyes were rolled back hideously so that only the whites of them showed. She's not dead, William. Only thinking over our conversation. Bring her out of it, you hear me? Bring her out of it or I'll... What will you do, William? I'll kill you! You're not hurting me, William. <laughs> You're hurting her. I... What? Look at her. See how she writhes in agony. See how she clutches her throat. 
Oh, you win, Clarence. <laughs> of course. How could you hope with your poor, undeveloped, occidental mind to match wits against me, who have penetrated the deepest mysteries of the occult. Mysteries of the occult? You're nothing but a cheap hypnotist. Any vaudeville mind reader could do the things you do if he was sufficiently lacking in human decency. Be careful, William. I shouldn't like to have to punish you for your rudeness. What do you want of us? I'll give you anything I own if you'll just take it and go away. It's not so easy as all that, William. Because, you see... I want the lives of your wife and child. I knew then that he was insane. And that realization filled me with hope. It'd be quite simple to call in an alienist and have him committed to an asylum. When Lillian regained consciousness, she insisted on his staying as I expected. I humored her along, knowing she was acting on his hypnotic suggestions. I was reasonably certain he would do nothing violent that night. His was the slow, sadistic way of murder. When daylight came, I stole quietly out of the house. I dared not risk calling the asylum on our telephone for fear of being overheard. My wife and daughter were still peacefully sleeping when I returned. And now I slept too. Good morning. I'm uh, Dr. Miller of the State Institute. Yes, yes, I, I know. Come in, please, Doctor. Are you the person who put in the call about... Yeah, uh, yes, it would be better not to speak too loudly, Dr. Miller. We might be overheard and that might cause difficulties. Huh? Oh, yes, yes, I see. Well, uh, tell me about the uh, patient. I told him the whole story, word for word, as it had happened. I should have known better. When I'd finished... There was disbelief written all over his face. Mr. Gilchrist, I don't for a moment doubt that you have an unwelcome relative on your hands who is uh, probably emotionally highly unstable as well. But well, you... uh, isn't it possible that you're exaggerating certain aspects of the matter? I mean, Dr. You, uh... Miller, I ask you to examine the man and draw your own conclusions as to his sanity. I'll be glad to. Where is he now? I think William has probably been talking to you about me, Doctor. Oh, uh... <clears throat> uh, sit down, won't you? Thank you. Really, I must apologize for your being inconvenienced this way, Doctor. I try to keep an eye on William, but one must sleep, you know, and, well, occasionally he eludes me and gets out of the house. I suppose he's told you that I'm a hypnotist and that I wish to murder his wife and child. Why do you think he told me that? Well, it's always the same story. Well, why should I believe your story rather than Mr. Gilchrist's? Oh, mine is a little easier to believe, I should think. But if you wish further proof... Oh, uh, Lillian! Yes, Clarence? Come down here, will you? William's got out again and told that story. I'll be right down. Uh, and bring Jeannie with you. You dare bring my daughter into this? Uh, his daughter doesn't know you'll be tactful, won't you, Doctor? Yes, of course. Bill, what is the meaning of this? Lillian. Haven't we warned you time and again what might happen if you go out like that? Lillian, you don't know what you're saying. This man is your husband, madam? Yes. He's been under the care of a psychiatrist for several years now. What? He seemed to be getting better. I'm sure he's getting better. The doctor said we must expect little lapses. Oh, she doesn't know what she's saying, doctor. She's acting under his hypnotic suggestion. And, uh, this young lady? He hypnotized her, too. Is that true? I don't know what that means, hypnotize. Daddy's always saying it, but he never says what it means. Well, this seems to clear up the situation pretty thoroughly. If you have any further trouble, Mr. Gilchrist, uh, let me know. You, you think I'm crazy? No, I don't. I'm sure that your wife is quite right, Mr. Gilchrist. You're getting better every day. He was insane, and diabolically insane. I had to face the unalterable fact. There was only one way to cope with him, and that was to kill him. But I had to do it while my wife and daughter were out of the house. I couldn't risk facing with a gun. I didn't trust myself not to fall under his hypnotic spell. The way I decided on was, well, it was the best way I could think of. I, when I'd finished my preparations, I waited for Clarence. 
Ah, good evening, William. Clarence, for the last oh, time... Oh, William, I... William, I'm very tired, and I have a very busy day ahead of me tomorrow. I have no wish to repeat that very tiresome conversation with which you invariably begin, Clarence, for the last time. This is the last time, Clarence. Tonight, nothing will stop me. Tonight, I am going to kill you. Please, don't make another unnecessary scene, William. You know that trying to hurt me only hurts your wife. Oh, she's no longer hypnotized, Clarence. You stayed away too long. She and Jeannie are safely out of your reach now. What makes you so sure of that? Are you sure of anything anymore? Dr. Miller thought you were insane. Are you quite sure you're not? Huh. I'm crazy enough to know that I've got to kill you. Well, do it quietly, William. I'm going straight to bed and to sleep, and I don't want to be disturbed. Good night. Uh, uh, just a minute, Clarence. Yes? Maybe you'll win again. I don't know, but... Just in case you don't... Yes? Tell me. Why do you say you want to kill my wife and child? Because my mother meant more to me than anything in the world. She died in giving birth to this silly, shallow person you call your wife. I have hated her since the day she was born. And I hate the child because, having no right to life, she commits the sacrilege of inheriting my mother's beauty. They must both be destroyed, the murderer and the imposter. You are mad. Madder than I ever dreamed you were. Am I? Did I really say what you think you just heard me say? Or is it only part of your insanity? Think it over, William. Good night. I had everything ready. The heavy boards, the nail across the door, the cotton waste, and a gallon of benzene. The shutters over the window of his room I'd already nailed shut and barred. As I nailed the boards across the door, I felt as if I were driving nails into his cock. William! William, stop it! You don't know what you're doing! Lillian and Jeannie are upstairs. They're coming in the back way. William! Where are your great powers now, Clarence? William, you fool! Can the secrets of the East help you now? You're trapped, Clarence. You're out of your mind, William! In a moment, the whole house will be in flames. You'll be burnt alive. You don't know what you're doing when you're Listen, Clarence, listen. I'm striking the match now. You smell the smoke, Clarence? Ooh. Never mind. You will in a moment. <laughs> oh, I wish you could see the flames now, Clarence. Listen, They're roaring up the stairwell. You don't know what you're doing. It's you beautiful. Damn, you fool. I'll have to leave you now, Clarence. <laughs> it's getting too warm in here for me. But you should be used to the heat, though. After all those years in India. <laughs> and I laughed. I laughed. I... I guess the relief from all that tension. Well, that's the story, Doctor. Then I must have fainted or something from the smoke. I don't remember anything after that till till I woke up in this place. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about your wife and daughter? Oh, that's just it. I, I haven't seen them since that afternoon, and that's why I've got to get out of here. I've got to find them. Can't you understand yes, that? Yes, yes, yes. I can I, understand that very well. well. Will you talk to someone, the head of this place, and tell them that and let me out? I shouldn't be locked up here in an institution. Yes, yes, I, I'll uh, I, talk to him, Bill. That's a promise. I'll do it right now. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doc. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me, the head's office, uh, Dr... Dr. Crossman, you'll yeah. find him right through there. Thank you. Oh, uh, pardon me, uh, Dr. Crossman? Yes? Yeah. Oh, oh, how do you do, sir? Have you found my little sanitarium interesting? Yes, indeed. Uh, by the way, most unusual case. Uh, I've just been talking yes, to... Yes, I know. Uh, to, to poor William. Bill, that is, number 27. Yes. But uh, I'm sorry that you had to be inconvenienced that way, sir. We do our best to keep the garrulous patients well out of a visiting doctor's way, but accidents will happen. Oh, I'm glad I ran into him, Dr. Crossman. His story interests me very much. Uh, he doesn't strike me as a homicidal lunatic. No, he's not. This idea of his that he committed a murder is simply a fantasy. Are you absolutely sure of that? Of course. Because... Well, you see, I am Clarence, the wicked brother-in-law in his story. You? 
He began to develop these extraordinary symptoms during my stay at his home when I first returned from India. Parts of his story, you see, are quite accurate. I see. It's a pity, of course. He was doing quite nicely under treatment until his wife and child were burned to death so tragically in the fire that destroyed their home. I'm afraid that that event, on top of his previous delusions, unhinged him for good. And where were you during the fire, Dr. Crossman? Oh, I, I dined out that evening. When I returned, it was all over. Well, I certainly should write this case up as one of the most interesting I've ever run across. Oh, must you, Doctor? I mean, poor chap, I feel he's entitled at least to some privacy. Have you any personal reasons for wanting to keep this case quiet, sir? Yes, I have. You see this scar on my face? That's a burn, wasn't it? A very nasty burn, too. Precisely, Doctor. And a very nasty coincidence. And so closes narrative about Clarence starring Laird Trigar with Hans Conrad. Tonight's tale of suspense. Laird Trigar is currently being seen in the 20th Century Fox production, The Lodger. We sincerely hope you enjoyed the performance of Mr. Trigar and that of the whole cast tonight in our Roma suspense play. And here's a thought. To discover the enjoyment these suspense programs offer, you first had to sample one. And so you must first sample one of the many delicious Roma wines to discover for yourself their wonderful taste and quality. The excellence that makes Roma America's largest selling wines. You'll discover, as of other millions before you, that Roma wines are super quality, are super tasting, and are super easy on your pocketbook, too. Costing only pennies a glass. Why put off this taste treat another day? Be sure you get R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Laird Quigar. It is my very great pleasure to tell you that next week the star who will keep you in... Suspense will be Joseph Cotton. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Don't forget then next Monday, same time, for Joseph Cotton in... Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. The world toasts Roma, and Roma toasts the world. The wine for your table is Roma. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black. Here for Roma Wines to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, we are honored and happy to have with us one of the entertainment world's most distinguished gentlemen, Mr. Cary Grant. The suspense play which stars Cary Grant and which is produced and directed by William Spear is the exciting and tense bestseller by Cornell Woolrich called The Black Curtain. Suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series, Roma brings you tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so, with the Black Curtain and with the performance of Cary Grant, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! Again, or rather, life began again for me, I guess you'd say, that day, on that street. My head was pounding terribly. I could hear all the noise and the people milling around. Everything was a jumble at first. All right. Gangway there now. Let the doctor roll. I see that happen, Mr. Policeman. He was running. Boy, he really gave himself a clunk on the beat. All right, son. Now get back there. Everybody back oh, there. Oh, 
Oh, my Take head. Take it easy, fellow. His wallet fell out of his pocket, and a big boy grabbed it and ran away. He All went right, up... now, back, everybody. Let the doctor through. Give him no, air here. I'm okay. No, never mind, Doc. I'm okay. Seems to be not a much the matter with you, sir. No, I'm all right. Yes, I can talk to him now, Doc. Oh, go ahead, officer. Just a bad bump on the head, I think. That's right. We can walk all right, can't you? No, I think so. Ah, sure. Here, now let me brush you on. Huh? Thanks, thanks. Well, I'll be fine. Hey. hey, wait a minute. What am I doing with an overcoat? All on? right now, mister. Just so they got it on the blotter. What's your name? Where do you live? Uh, Townsend. Frank Townsend. 820 Rutherford Street. I uh, want a cigarette. You're still shaking. No, no, thanks. I don't smoke. Well, while we're getting back then, drop in at the receiving hospital if you want us to take you off. Yeah, I will. Hey, here's your hat, mister. I found it. Oh, thanks, That's kid. all. Now, come on. Move along. The guy's all right. Come on. Oh, well, thanks. I'm sorry about the fellow that got your wallet. Anyway, here's your cigar case, Mr. Townsend. Guy found it right alongside of you. Hey, now, wait a minute. This isn't my hat. D.N. Those aren't my initials, D.N. Sure, that's your hat. I seen it roll off you when you went down. Try it on. You see, it fits. Looks good. <sighs> but, but what am I doing with a cigar case? D.N. Same initials as the hat. Eh, don't you even know your own hat, mister? Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm trying to think. Where is this? What? This street. You're on Tillery Street. T- Tillery Street? What am I doing on Tillery Street? <laughs> All right, now, sir. My suggestion is that you go on home and go lie down. It's cold and starting to snow. No, no, please, wait a minute. Don't leave me. Tell me. What happened? Why, you slipped on this icy sidewalk. Fell down and hit your head good and hard on the curb. You're out for about 20 minutes and then you... Wait, wait, Ice on a sidewalk? Well, look at it. That street cleaning department ought to clear away the snow there, too. Snow and ice? Sure, why? Snow? In July? July? Oh, it's December. December 1943. 1943? Uh, you better go on home, son. Good night. 1943? December 1943. The last I remember was July 1940. Three years just gone. Amnesia. A black curtain comes down over your mind. That black curtain had been over mine for three years. Where had I been? Who had I been? I hadn't been Frank Townsend. I'd been someone else. D.N. Someone whose initials were D.N. I walked along Tillery Street thinking about it those three years. (laughs) I could have been married. I could have been a thief. I could have... Something made me turn around on the street for a moment. That was when I first saw him. Gray eyes. He'd been talking to the cop who took my name. He looked up as I did. And then he started to walk rapidly in my direction. I backed away instinctively. Something about him spelled trouble. He called to me as he hey, came forward. Hey, you, stop! Townsend! Instinctively, I knew I should run, get away from him. Hey, you. I looked back as I rounded the corner. He had a gun in his hand. He raised it. Then I turned, ran for my life. <laughs> What lay behind that black curtain which separated Townsend from his past? With this remarkable story, and with Hollywood's distinguished Cary Grant as our star, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, tonight assumes the sponsorship of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. This is the dinner hour at an exclusive yacht club in Latin America. And we discreetly eavesdrop on that gentleman and his lady there at the table. This has been a lovely dinner, Ramon. And only you would have thought to have such a delicious wine as the finale. It was so perfect. Is it truly a wine from California in North America? Yes, see? This is the noted Roma port of California in the United States. We were fortunate to have it tonight, for now, in time of war... On the occasional ships can bring us uh, Roma wines. I knew that you would... Fortunate? Yes. For Roma wines please the exacting tastes of wine lovers in many countries. And we in the United States are most fortunate of all. For we can enjoy any of those delicious wines from the famous Roma wineries located in choice wine districts throughout California 
at prices unbelievably small for wines of such distinguished character. Because we do not have to pay heavy shipping costs and duty, here at home in America, Roma wines cost only a few cents a glass. What's more, you'll find Roma California wines just around the corner at your favorite dealers. Right there, waiting for you now, the types of Roma wines you most enjoy. So if you haven't yet discovered the delight of Roma wine regularly with meals or when entertaining friends, make your first purchases of Roma tomorrow. R-O-M-A, Roma, America's largest selling wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Mr. Cary Grant and the Black Curtain. A story well calculated to keep you in suspense. Why was he following me? With a gun? What did Gray Eyes want with me? I must have done something. I beat it down the subway and hid. I had to think it all out carefully. I knew I was on the spot for something. Gray eyes meant business. What could it be? Who had I been during those last three years with that black curtain in front of them? Well, maybe I'd been a gangster and he was one of a mob that wanted to rub me out. I didn't know. No identification, my wallet stolen. Nothing in my pockets that would help. Just DN in the hat and DN on the cigar case. DN! My head was aching with worry. My stomach had panic in it. I had to find out who I'd been, what I'd done. But how? Where? Tillery Street. That's where I'd been when I woke up. Tillery Street. Well, maybe gray eyes would go back there, too, looking for me. But I had to take that chance. Tillery Street. Yes? Oh, good evening, Pop. Oh, oh, hello there. Couldn't see you under that hat at first. Oh, you, you know me? Sure. What can I get you, son? Oh, well, uh, you got an evening paper I could look at? Nope. Sorry, never read them. Too much trouble in the world these days, anyhow. Yeah. See, how you been? You haven't been around two or three weeks. Oh, well, I'll be kind of busy. Uh, look, Pop. Yeah? I made a bet with a guy that even though you see so many customers, you'd walk right up and give me my full name. Oh, well, I'm sorry I don't know it. I don't think I ever heard your name. Oh. But I know your girl. My girl? Mm Mm-hmm. You do, huh? Yeah. Well, now, maybe I can still win my bet if you'll give me her name. Gee, uh, I've heard you mention it. I'd know it if I heard it. What? Well, uh, see if I can steer you a little. Now, is it Mary? No. Alice? Lillian? Ah, Margaret. No. Wait a minute. Wait. I know. Ruth. That's it, Ruth. Ruth? Yeah. Well, sure, you got it. Now, now, what's Ruth's last name? Gee, I don't know her... I know where she lives, though. You do? Yeah, right across the street, the Tillery Apartments. Well, it's right. Uh Ah, but now, now, what apartment? What's the number of Ruth's apartment? Mm, 3C, apartment 3C. (laughs) Say, that's pretty good if I do say so. I was only there once, remember? The night I brought the sandwiches over... Well, uh, thanks. Uh... Will you win your bet, mister? Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I think I will. Uh, what's your name so I'll know it next time? Oh, I'll tell you tomorrow. I hope. So long. So long, Pop, thank you. I'll be... What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing, I... Just tying my shoe. I'd just been going to walk out when I saw him standing across the street, gray eyes again. I ducked down behind the store window and watched him. He looked over in my direction and then up and down the street. Oh, then he lit a cigarette and strolled down the corner. The minute he disappeared, I yanked the door open, dashed out, ran across the Tillery Apartments and went in. Who is it? Ruth? Yes? It's me. Dan! Oh, Danny, where have you been? Get in here. Oh, darling, it's really you. I thought you... Hello, Ruth. 
Oh, Danny, why did you come here? He's been around here twice today. He may be in the neighborhood right now, for all you know. Who? Oh, well, Flattery, of course. Uh, has he got gray eyes? What? Yeah. Did you ever see a detective that didn't? Oh, I see. Sure, sure. Danny, what's the matter with you? You're acting so strangely. Well, I... I just want to look at you. You seem so different, so far away. You haven't kissed me. Well, that's easily fixed. Oh, darling, where have you been for three weeks? All around. Miss me? You know I did. Oh, Danny, do you suppose... Do you think we could get away tonight? I've got $3,000 saved up. We could go to Mexico or South America. We could get married. Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Nearing tour the world. Daniel Nearing? Oh, yeah, and wife. Sounds plenty good to me. Oh, you'll never know how good. We'll get out of here tonight. I'll call up and tell them I'm quitting my job. I'll say I'm sick. All my stuff's here. Nothing's out there but a couple of uniforms. <laughs> I'll make Alma and Franklin a present of those. Uh, Alma and Franklin? Don't you bother your pretty head about those two charmers. Maybe they weren't glad when it happened. A couple of vultures. Bye-bye to them. Oh, with you back, Danny. Just think with my 3,000 we can... Oh, dear. Do you think you ought to quit your job? Absolutely, I think so. <laughs> I was never cut out to be a nurse anyway. Oh, I guess you weren't. Any more than uh, I was cut out... Any more than you were meant to be a secretary. Ah, that's right. <laughs> well, I never wanted to be a secretary. Just drifted into it, I guess. Kind of got on my nerves, especially toward the end. You know, the, uh, the boss was no cinch to work for. He certainly wasn't. He was a rat. The whole Dietrich bunch are mean, rotten. The whole family. Yeah, that's right. Well, except the old man. Uh, oh, yeah, the old man. I, I, I sort of liked him, didn't I? And he loves you, Danny. I think he wished you'd been his son. Poor old man. He's the only reason I've stuck around out there this long. How are things out there? Oh, they've been questioning all of us. They've laid off lately, though, since you... Oh, Danny, don't let's talk any more about it. You're back. That's the main thing. I just want to forget New Jericho and the whole... New Jericho, huh? Yes. Oh, Danny. Danny, if only it hadn't happened. What hadn't? You know what? Oh, Danny, what's going to become of you and me? I wish I knew. Danny, get away from that window. Leave that shade down. Look, he's down there. Who? Gray eyes. He's standing in front of the hydrant. He's coming in here, in the building. Oh, did he see you? Ruth, will you help me? What are you going to do? I'm going to give myself up. No, no, well, you... Well, it's better than getting shot at. What can they do to me? You crazy fool, they can send you to the chair. The chair? Well, what do you think happens to a man when he's guilty of murder? Murder? Ruth, listen to me. I'm not a murderer. If the whole world says I committed murder, I say I didn't. The me that's in me says I didn't. I never said you were, Danny. I always said you didn't do it. I hope you hadn't run away. So that's it. All right, Nearing. Open up. Why did you come here, Danny? Why? Ruth, wait. we got to get out of here. How about the fire escape shaft? Dumb waiter. Dumb waiter. Here. All right, get in. I'll stand on top and work the ropes. I don't think it can hold us both. It's got to. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Danny. Danny, what do we do? We're going back there to New Jericho. New Jericho. No, Danny, don't, please, for me. Got to. I've got to find out. We're going together. No. No, Danny, no. I've got the money. We can get out of here and we... Stop it. Danny, ouch. My arm. You're hurting me. From here on in, we're sticking together. You're going to take me back there. Back where it happened. All right, darling. You're crazy, but I'll go wherever you go. I can't lose you again. <laughs> On the train, Ruth and I said very little to each other. While I hid in the telephone booth at the Pennsylvania station, she bought us a couple of cheap overcoats. I sat hunched up in mine, thinking, thinking. Ruth had brought along the newspaper clippings. I looked at what they said for the 20th time, trying to see if there was anything there that would help me. Dietrich Slayer's Soth, it said. Secretary wanted in brutal slaying at suburban estate. Police are pressing the search for Daniel Nearing, secretary and the employer of the late John Dietrich, 58, member of a well-known local family who was shot and killed in the drawing room of his new Jericho estate on the morning of November the 7th. Nearing disappeared November the 7th, on the morning of which date he is known to have had a bitter quarrel with the deceased. 
This last was attested to at the inquest by Alma and Franklin Dietrich, widow and brother of the murdered man. Well, I had all the facts now. <laughs> Wanted for murder. And yet everything that was in me told me that no matter who I'd been, however many memories I'd lost, that I was no killer. That I couldn't have. I had to get into that Dietrich house and stand again in the room in which it had all happened. Maybe something would come back to me. Maybe there would be... Franklin just left. They drove down to the village. Did they say anything about you being out here on your day off? Yeah. Alma said something. But I said I had nothing to do in town. He came out to write some letters. Let's go, then. Oh, Danny, I'm scared. Please, let's not stay out here. You said you loved me. I do, Danny, I do. That's why I'm scared. They're only going to the village. They'll be back in half an hour at the most. Go on, open the door, Ruth. Hurry. I've got to see the inside, that room, the place where it happened. It's wrong, Danny. I'm telling you, you're wrong. You'll find now Open the door, Ruth. Quickly. All right. Now, let's have a look at that room. Please, Danny, please don't. Don't talk about it. Oh. So this is where I'm supposed to have murdered John Dietrich. Huh? Danny, please. Where was it? Show me exactly where it was, Ruth. I've got to know. It was there. Right there, he was standing by the grandfather's clock when... Oh, are you going crazy, Danny? If they get you, you'll hang. By the clock, huh? You still believe in me, don't you, Ruth? I believe you, Danny, but I'm scared. I love you. Ruth, wait a minute. What's that? Listen. It's only the old man. He's asleep in that room off there. Don't go in there, Danny. You'll wake him. I want to see him. No. No, don't, Danny. He can't help you. You know he's paralyzed and he can't talk. Turn on the light. I want to see him. There, you woke him. It's me, Mr. Dietrich. Ruth. Uh, this is Danny. You remember Danny, don't you? Hello, Mr. Dietrich. See how his eyes are shining? Yeah. Was he here when it happened? You know that, Danny. Why do you ask such funny questions? He's been in bed here for five years. That mirror. On the wall there. The clock. Look. You can see the grandfather's clock in the other room. What are you getting at, Danny? He could see it. The old man could see the murder through the mirror. Oh, if only he could talk. He can't talk. You scare me, Danny. He saw the man who killed John Dietrich. Look, look. He understands what I'm saying. He's blinking his eyes. Oh, stop torturing him, Danny. Can't you see what you're doing? He's trying to say something. Look. Look. His eyes are blinking. He's going to help me. Go outside and watch, Ruth. Go on. Now watch out at the entrance way. Be careful, Danny. Please, they'll be back any minute. All right, leave me alone with him. I'll call if I hear them coming. Look now, Mr. Dietrich. Don't be afraid. I'm going to ask you a question, and you're going to answer me. Are you trying to tell me something about the murder? Now, blink your eyes. Blink twice if you are. And that's it. Once. Twice. That's good. Did you see it happen? Here, in your mirror. Blink once if the answer is no. Twice if the answer is yes. Once. Twice. You did, huh? You saw it. Now then, is the murderer in this house? Danny. Danny, they're coming. Franklin and Alma, get out of here. Hide. Run, Danny, run. Is the murderer in this house? Blink once for no, twice for yes. Yes. In this house. Danny. Danny, they're coming. Wait, wait. I've almost got it. Now, Mr. Dietrich, was it me... Once for no, twice for yes. Was it me? Get out of here, Danny. Into the big room. Behind the curtain. I'll talk to them. All right. All right. Well, thanks, Mr. Dietrich. I'll be back. Ruth? Ruth, is that you in Father's room? Yes. Are you here alone? Why, yes. Why? Well, we thought we heard voices. What are you so jittery about, Ruth? I- I'm just tired, that's all. May I go to bed now? Father's still awake, Ruth. He'll go to sleep, all right. I'm going upstairs, Mrs. Dietrich, now. Good night, Ruth. And uh, take your flashlight with you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It was dark on the road tonight. Good night, Ruth. Good night. She's brought him back here with her. Him, I think. Who? 
Dan? Oh, Franklin. Take it easy. If he's here, we'll get him. After the evidence we gave against him at the hearing, I... Oh, I'm frightened. Let's get out of here fast. I'll go to the village for the police. Call the police. No, I'll do it. Hello? Hello? It's too late. It's dead. The wire is cut. Come on, we'll both drive to the village. Eh? But he may be waiting for us out by the car. Uh-uh. Oh. What? Yeah. What are you doing there, Franklin? I think I just might need my gun. Come along. The moment they left the house, I made for the old man's room. I called for Ruth, but she was gone. Maybe Franklin and Elma had caught her after she cut the telephone wire, but I couldn't wait. My life was hanging on minutes now. I shot the flashlight on the old man's face. Now, Mr. Dietrich, you're helping me fine. You know I'm trying to save my life, don't you? Now, the murderer. Was it me? Was it me who did it? Me, Danny Nearing. Blink once for no. Once. Once. Oh, you're sure. You're sure it wasn't me. Oh, you're smiling, Mr. Dietrich. Smiling. Now, it was somebody in this house. Then who was it? Oh, can't you make a sound? Help me, you've got to. Was it Elma? Twice for yes, once for no. Once. Not Elma. All right, then. Was it Franklin? Up with the hands, Mary. Up or you'll never go to trial. Franklin. Look, you've got to listen. You've got to. Shut up and drop that flashlight. Trying to kill the old man, too, huh? The murderer returns to the scene of his crime. Eh? You know I didn't kill him. Well, you tell that to the police. Elmo will have me in a couple of minutes. Where's your girlfriend, Ruth? She's not here. I don't know where she went. Never mind. They'll find her. You're a dead duck, Neary. You killed my brother and beat it. What'd you get out of it? I thought it was puzzled us. You killed your brother. And now you're going to kill me. Oh, you've gone nuts, too. Why should I kill my own brother, you idiot? To get his share of the estate and his wife, Alma, amongst other things. But you can't stop with killing me. Someone else knows the truth. The old man saw it in the mirror. Right. You'll have to kill your own father, too. The old man saw it? How, how do you know? He told me. Oh, you're lying. He can't talk. He can't even move. He can hear. And he can blink his eyes. Come over here and look. Now, look here. I don't... <laughs> Rose! He'll be all right. I heard him. He was going to kill you. Here's the gun, Danny. Take it. Oh, Rose, I shouldn't have. In another minute, I... I'm not sure it was, Franklin. Oh, then, darling, please, let's run for it. They'll be here in a second. It's your last chance. They'll all swear you did it. Not if I can be with the old man in another half minute. Mr. Dietrich. Mr. Dietrich. It's Danny again. No, Danny, don't. Don't. Quiet. Tell me, Mr. Dietrich. Was it Franklin? Did Franklin kill your son, John? Blink once if he did. He's afraid. Well, why are you afraid? Oh. Oh, it's this gun. Here. Yeah. Take the gun, Ruth. You take it. He's afraid. I'm not going to hurt you, Mr. Dietrich. What's the matter? Why don't you answer me? Who killed John Dietrich? It wasn't me. It wasn't Elma. It wasn't Franklin. But someone in the house. Was it? Ruth! Ruth! You! I told you. I told you not to come. Oh, I love you, Danny. I wanted you. I wouldn't have let them get you. Why? Why, Ruth? Why did you kill him? He was always after me. He wouldn't leave me alone. I hated him. Then that night he came at me, threatened me, said he'd kill me. If he couldn't have me, nobody could. He had a gun, and I got it away from him. It's... He hit the clock. He leaned against it. I thought he'd never fall down and die. It was the day you ran away, and I was crazy. They thought it was you. They started looking. I love you, Danny. I still love you. I begged you not to come back here. Ruth, put down that gun, Ruth. No. Stay back, Danny. Stay over there. Just want to look at you. I was hoping we could get away together. But you've been through enough, Danny. And all because of me. Now you're clear, Danny. And this is going to clear me. Darling. Oh, Ruth. Ruth!
Well, I guess that's about all there is to tell. I tried to put it all behind me. To resume my life where it left off over three years ago. <laughs> Sometimes when it gets toward evening, I go and walk along Tillery Street. <laughs> Once in a while, somebody, somebody I don't know, will say, hello, Danny. And I just say hello and walk on. <laughs> I don't want to find out anything anymore. I want it all to die away and be still. And it will. All except Ruth. Because somewhere behind that black curtain, I was loved. And love someone. We must have known a love that I'll never know again. And so closes The Black Curtain, starring Mr. Cary Grant. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Since the beginnings of history, people have enjoyed wine. Ages ago, our ancestors found that wine made any food taste better. Wine is a simple pleasure that anyone can enjoy. That is why Roma has devoted all its winemaking skill to producing wines of fine quality at a price that means you can enjoy them often, just a few cents a glass. Don't feel that you need fine crystal or a special occasion to serve Roma wines. Next time you have a quick supper... Serve Roma wine in plain tumblers with your spaghetti or cold meats. And notice how much more enjoyment and zest it adds to the meal. Serve Roma wine often, cool or chilled. You'll quickly discover why Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. Yes, Roma wines are true to type. Roma wines are faithful in flavor. Roma wines are sound of character. Roma wines are reasonable in cost. Made in California... For enjoyment throughout the world. Our thanks to Cary Grant for his suspenseful performance here tonight. And Mr. Grant wants us to say that he will be listening with you next week at the same hour to Mr. Robert Young in the story called The Night Reveals. Don't forget then, next week, same time, for Robert Young in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. Columbia's parade of outstanding thrillers produced by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. Notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Tonight's story by the noted American author T.S. Stribling deals with a crime of murder on an exotic and atmospheric island with ragged beggars who slept in a Hindu temple and awoke with gold in their pockets and a dead girl lying near them and with a strange and mystical entrance into the life of hereafter which was the experience of an American psychologist. For your suspenseful listening... We invite you to join us for A Passage to Benares. In Porto, Spain, in Trinidad, at half past five in the morning, Mr. Henry Pajoli, an American psychologist, stirred uneasily, became conscious of a splitting headache opened his eyes in bewilderment, and then, with a shock, saw where he was. He got up, arranged his clothing, 
He tried with his neat psychological mind to recapture his dream, to bottle up again the little smoking wisps that still floated about within his aching head. By seven o'clock, he had found his way back to the house of Mr. Lowe, his host in Port of Spain. Lowe was already about his coffee with an interested spoon poised above the morning paper. Ah, there you are. Good morning, Bargioli. I say, you are quiet. Didn't hear you get up at all. Have some breakfast? Oh, thanks. I have uh, been out for a breath of air. What's the news today? Well, the new governor will arrive in Trinidad on the 12th, and, uh, uh... Hello. Now the natives killed his wife. Tell me, Pajoli, as a psychologist, why do coolies kill their wives? Oh, for various reasons, I imagine. Let's hear some of the facts. Oh, I say this is a coincidence. Really putting on a show for you, Pajoli, on your first visit to Trinidad. How so? Well, you... You remember that wedding procession you and I watched last evening down, yeah. the, down at the Hindu temple? The temple? Oh, of course, the cream-colored little bride with the breastplates and the linked gold coins and the anklets and all the finery. Mm -hmm. And the bridegroom. What did you say his name was? Budman Lal? Yes. Well, do you know what's happened? Budman Lal is in jail this morning and his cream-colored little bride is dead with her throat cut. No. Do they think he did it? No doubt of it. That's why he's in jail now. He always seemed like a sensible fellow, too. One of our best patrons. Which only proves my contention, Pajoli. A bridegroom of only six or eight hours killing his wife without any reason at all. Oh, there's usually some reason for murder. Maybe. But I say, oh boy, you're, you're missing the point completely. How? Well, suppose you actually had gone and slept in the temple there last night. Mm -hmm. Wanted to, you know. Remember? And I said... No white man ever stays all night in a coolie temple. You remember? Yes, I remember. You said it simply isn't done. Well, if... If you had, Pajoli, I say, uh... That would have been a pretty kettle, wouldn't it? Yes. Yes. Well, I'm afraid I'll be mixed up in this. Both Mr. Lal and his uncle, Hira Das, are clients of mine. Old Hira Das has upwards of five million dollars in my bank. Hira Das... Didn't you tell me he built that temple where the murder took place? Yes. It's what the Hindus call a temple and rest house. Hiradas gives rice and tea to any traveler who comes in for the night. It's an Indian custom to help mendicant pilgrims. A rich Indian will build a temple and rest house just, just as you Americans erect libraries. Ah. What does it say there about the murder, though? Um, Budman Lal, nephew of the famous Mr. Hiradas was arrested early this morning at his home for the alleged murder of his wife, whom he married yesterday. The body was found at six o'clock this morning in the temple where the wedding ceremony took place. The temple attendants gave the alarm. The victim's head was severed completely from her body and all her jewelry was gone. Five coolie beggars who were asleep in the temple when the body was discovered were arrested. They all claimed ignorance of the crime but a search of their persons revealed that each beggar had a piece of the bride's jewelry and a coin from a necklace. Mr. Budman Lal and his wife were seen to enter the temple at about 11 last night for the Hindu rite of purification. Mr. Lal, who is a prominent curio dealer, declines to say anything further. Doesn't tell you very much, does it? Ah, oh, not much. What do you make of those beggars? Oh, that's simple enough. Those devils laid in wait inside the temple until the husband went out and left his wife. Then they murdered her and divided the spoil. Ah, but she had enough bangles and gee jaws to give a dozen to each man. Yes, yes, you're quite right, Pajoli. That's a fact. Why should they continue sleeping in the temple after they'd killed her if they did murder her? Well, why shouldn't they? They knew they'd be suspected and they couldn't get off the island without capture, so they thought they might, might as well lie down again and go back to sleep. Hmm. You may be right, Lowe, but that doesn't look like the solution to me. Well, I'm satisfied that's how it occurred. You mean the beggars killed her? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think so. I rather fancy that the actual murderer took the girl's jewelry and went about the temple thrusting a bangle and a coin in the pockets of each of the sleeping beggars to lay a false scent. Oh, come now. That, that's laying it on a bit too thick, Pajo. <laughs> My dear Lowe, that's the only possible explanation for the coins in the beggars' pockets. I say, oh boy, Ian, you've had lots of experience in these things. Come along with me and we'll go up and see Mr. Hira Daz and 
see if we can't help his nephew. I'll be glad to. But we'll go to the temple first. Then we'll call on Mr. Hyradas. <laughs> Well, here we are. In spite of the police guard at the door, the temple doesn't look sinister in the daylight. No, yeah, it just looks dirty. Yeah, let's go in and question the beggars. Hey, excuse me. Uh, did any of you fellows hear noises in this temple last night? Oh, much sleep, Saeed. No noise. Policeman Pancho's wake this morning makes it still here. What's your name? Shuda Chan, Saeed. When did you go to sleep last night? When I ate rice and tea, Saib. Mm hmm. Do you remember seeing Boudman Lal and his wife enter this building last night? Uh, yes, remember, Saib. Did you see them go out? Uh, no, Saib. No one remember go out. You were all asleep then, huh? Oh, all asleep, yeah, Saib. Did you have any dreams during your sleep? Hear any noises? Uh, I dream bad dreams, Saib. Huh? When policeman punched me awake this morning, I think dream has come true. And me, Sai. Me, too. Me. Did you all have bad dreams? Yes. All yeah, have bad all dreams. Have bad. Look here, Pajoli. I, I, I don't see where this is getting us. I do think we ought to be getting on to old Haradaz's house. No, I think we can now entirely discard the theory that the beggars murdered the girls. On what grounds? They told you nothing except that they all had bad dreams. That's the reason. They all had wild, fantastic dreams. That suggests that they were given some sort of opiate in their rice or tea last night. It's quite improbable that five ignorant coolies would have wit enough to concoct such a piece of evidence as that. Mm, that's a fact, but I don't believe a Trinidad court would admit such evidence. We're not looking for legal evidence. We're after some indication of a real criminal. Now I suggest that we get onto the house of Hira Das. Please come in, gentlemen. I've been expecting you. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you. A most mysterious murder in the life of my poor nephew will depend upon your exertions, gentlemen. Tell me, what do you think of the beggars that were found in the temple with the bangles and coins? Well, I'm afraid my judgment of the beggars will disappoint you, Mr. Hyradas. Huh? My theory is that they are innocent of the crime. Really? Why do you say that? Because they told me of dreams they had. And all their dreams were very nearly identical. You are not English, sir. No Englishman would have thought of that. No, I'm American with a backlash sprinkling of, uh, of Italian. My name's Pagioli. What is your profession, Mr. Pagioli? You are a detective? No, Mr. Das. I'm a psychologist. Ah. Oh. Your soul is at least groping after knowledge. However, it gropes as a blind worm, Mr. Poggioli, and we must find the criminal who committed this crime and thus restore my nephew, Boodman Lal, to liberty. You can imagine what a blow this has been to me after I arranged this marriage for my nephew. You did... arranged a marriage for a nephew who is in his 30s? Yes, Mr. Poggioli. Mm. I wanted him to avoid the pitfalls into which I fell. Ah. He was unmarried, and he'd already begun to add dollars to dollars. I did the same thing. And now, look at me. An empty old man in a foreign land. What good is this house where men of my own kind can't come and sit with me and when I have no grandchildren to romp and play? No. I've piled up dollars and pounds. I... I've eaten the world, Mr. Pajoli, and found it bitter. Now here I am, an outcast. And why don't you go back to India, Mr. Hyradas? Why, Mr. Pajoli, my mind is half English. If I should return to Benares, I'd walk about thinking what the temples cost. How much was the value of the stone set in the eye of Krishna's image? 
If I would ever be one with my own people again, Mr. Pajoli, I must leave this Western mind and body here in Trinidad. That's um, very interesting and moving, but uh, we were discussing your nephew, Budman Lal. Wait. In searching for the criminal, I would suggest you look for a moneyed man. Let me tell you my suspicions, and you can work out the details. What are they? I went out of the temple this morning to have the body of my poor murdered niece brought here to my villa for burial. I talked to the five beggars, and they told me there was a sixth sleeper in the temple last night. Was there indeed? Yes, Mr. Lowe, a white man. A white man? Yes, Mr. Lowe. All five of the coolies and my man, Guta, told me it was true. But, Mr. Hiradas, decapitation is not an American mode of murder. American? I... I was speaking generally. I mean a white man's method of murder. Uh, that is indicative in itself. I meant to call your attention to that point. It shows the white man was a highly educated man who had studied the mental habits of other peoples than his own. So he was enabled to give the crime an extraordinary resemblance to a Hindu crime. But what motive could a white man have? Possibly robbery, Mr. Pajoli. Or if he were a very intellectual man, he might have murdered the poor child by... Uh, Way of experiment. A murder for experiment? Yes, Mr. Lowe. To record the psychological reaction. Why? Oh, I, I can't entertain such a theory as that, Mr. Harrod. Oh, no. It is too far-fetched. However, it is worth investigating, is it not? Yes, yes. But I'll begin my investigations with the man Guka. By all means, Mr. Pajoli. And in your investigations, gentlemen, hire any assistance you may need. Draw on me for any amount. I want my nephew exonerated, and above all things, I want the real criminal apprehended and brought to the gallows. What do you think of that, Pajoli? White man in that temple. Ah, sounds like pure fiction to me to, to shield Bob and Lyle. You know, these fellows hang together like thieves. Say, it's a jolly good thing we didn't decide to sleep in the temple last night, isn't it? You know, in my opinion, Lowe, the actual criminal is Boodman Lyle. Ah, same here. I've thought so ever since I first saw the account in the paper. Somehow these fellows will chop their wives to pieces for no reason at all. Lowe, what do you know about Boodman Lyle? Well, he, he was born here and has always been a figure because of his rich uncle. Lived here all his life? Uh-huh. Except when he was in Oxford for six years. Oh, he was an Oxford man. Huh? Yes, yes. Uh, there you are. That's the trouble. I don't understand. What do you mean, Pajoli? I know that he fell in love with some English girl, but when old Hira Das chose a Hindu child for his wife, Budman couldn't refuse marriage. No man's going to quarrel with a $5 million legacy. And then he chose this ghastly method of getting rid of the child bride. Uh, I dare say you're right. I feel sure Bob Munlal killed the girl. George, I'm getting tired of walking. There's a cab. Let's hop it and ride the rest of the way. Hi, cabby. A cab. I see. Oh, hi. Well, aren't you coming? You know, I don't feel that I can conscientiously continue this investigation trying to clear a person whom I have every reason to believe guilty. But, man, don't leave me like this. At least come as far as police headquarters with me and explain your theory about Guka, the temple keeper, and the rice. Well, I... I thought I'd go back to your cottage and pack my things. Pack your things? Oh, your boat doesn't sail until Friday. Yes, I know, but there's a daily service to Curacao. It struck me to go there. Oh, but... no, come. You can't run off like that just when I've stirred up an interesting murder mystery for you to unravel. Why, Bajoli, you ought to appreciate my efforts as a host more than that. Well, all right, then. 
To the police station. Yes, sir. Chief Vickers, uh, this is my friend, Mr. Pajoli. Mr. Pajoli, Mr. Vickers is chief of Trinidad's police force. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, chief Vickers, I've, um, I've asked Mr. Pajoli's counsel in the Budman Lal murder case. And he's already developed a theory as to who is the actual murderer of Mrs. Budman Lal. So have I. Now, in this matter, Chief Vickers, I want to be perfectly frank with you. I'll admit we're in this case in the employer of Mr. Haradaz and are making an effort to clear his nephew, Budman Lal. We felt confident you'd use the skill of the police department of Port of Spain to work out a theory clearing Budman Lal just as readily as you would to convict him. Our department usually devotes its time to conviction and not to clearing criminals. Yes, yes, I, I know that. But if our theory will point out the actual murderer... What is your theory? Mr. Pajoli's deduction is based on the dreams of the men who were found in the temple. So Mr. Pajoli's deduction is based on dreams. It would be a remarkable coincidence, Mr. Vickers, if five men had lurid dreams simultaneously without some physical cause. It suggests strongly that their tea or rice was doped. Now, if you find out what soporific was used, then have your men search the sales record of the drugstores in the city to see who has lately bought such a drug. You will find the murderer. Uh-huh. How do you like Trinidad, Mr. Pajoli? I like it very much indeed. You've just arrived, haven't you? Yes. In uh, what university do you teach back in the States? Ohio State. A chair of criminal psychology in an ordinary state university? I'm not a professor. I'm simply a docent, and I haven't specialized on criminal psychology. I, I quiz on general psychology. You're not teaching now? No, this is my sabbatical year. You look young to have taught in the university six years, but then you Americans start young in your land of specialists. Now, are you, uh, Mr. Pajoli, I suppose you're wrapped up heart and soul in your psychology. I am. You'd uh, do anything in the world to advance yourself in the science. I rather think so. Especially keen on original research work. Ah, <laughs> that's what he is, Chief Vickers. Do you know what he asked me to do yesterday afternoon? <laughs> no, what, Mr. Lowe? Oh, I don't think we ought to burden Mr. Vickers with our household anecdotes. Oh, but I'm really curious. Just what did Mr. Pajoli ask you to do yesterday afternoon, Mr. Lowe? Oh, well, really nothing, nothing at all. It was just a little psychological experiment he wanted to do. And did he do it? Oh, no, 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 I wouldn't hear of it. Oh, as uh, unconventional as that? Oh, it was really nothing, nothing at all. I think I could guess your anecdote if I tried, gentlemen. About a half an hour ago, I received a telephone message from my man stationed at the temple to keep a lookout for you and Mr. Pajoli. A lookout for us? Yes, because one of the coolies under arrest told him that Mr. Pajoli slept in the temple last night. Oh, but that's not true. That's exactly what he didn't do. He suggested it to me, but I said no. You remember, Pajoli, you... You didn't do it. Did you, Pajoli? Did you? You see, he did. Gentlemen, I... I had a perfectly valid and important reason for sleeping in the temple last night, and so I... I can only ask your sympathetic attention to what I'm about to say. Go on. You remember, Lowe, you and I were down there watching a wedding procession. Well, just as the music stopped and the procession entered the building, suddenly it seemed to me as if... as if they'd vanished. Naturally, they'd gone into the building. Oh, no, no, I don't mean that. I'm afraid you won't understand what I do mean. That the whole procession had ceased to exist, melted into a nothingness. You see, that's really the idea in which the Hindus base their notion of heaven, oblivion, nothing. Yes, I've heard that before. Well, our medieval Gothic architecture was the conception of our Western heaven, and I thought perhaps the Indian architecture had somehow caught the motif of the Indian religion, you know, suggested nir nirvana. That's what amazed and intrigued me. That's why I wanted to sleep in the place. I wanted to see if I could further my shred of impression. Does that make any sense to you, Mr. Vickers? We are not interested why you went, Mr. Pajoli. We know a murder took place in the temple. <laughs> you don't... You can't think that I committed a horrible murder as an experiment. You intellectual chaps do some pretty weird things, Mr. Pajoli. Why, only the other day I was reading about two young oh, intellectuals. What? Yes, these fellows I read about also tried to turn an honest penny by their murder. I don't suppose you happened to notice yesterday that the little bride, Maila Ran, was almost covered with gold bangles and coins? Of course I noticed it. But I had nothing whatever to do with her. I, I, 
I did sleep in the temple. By the way, you say you slept on the rug just as the coolies did. Yes, I did. And you didn't wake up either, Mr. Pajola? No, no. Then did the child's murderer happen to put a coin and a bangle in your pockets just as he did the other sleepers in the temple? I don't know. I I haven't looked in my pockets since then. Then please do so now, Mr. Pajoli. Oh, yes. Here they are, Mr. Vickers. You don't happen to have any more, do you? No. I've already been through all my pockets and I haven't any more. Well, that's something. Of course, you might have expected just such a questioning as this and provided yourself with these two pieces of gold, but I doubt it. Somehow, I don't believe that you're an experienced enough man to think of such a thing. However, we shall see. I suppose you have no objection, Mr. Pajoli, to my accompanying you over to have a little search of your baggage in Mr. Lowe's cottage. Now then, Mr. Pajoli, be so kind as to open your trunk. Good heavens. Mm-hmm. Just as I thought. A trunk tray full of bangles and coins. I'll say one thing for you, though, Mr. Pajoli. Your nerve almost got you by. But you... You can't believe that I did it. No. You don't believe I did this, do you? I... I... I don't. In your trunk, Pajoli. If I did it, I was sleepwalking. God, to think that it's possible that right here in my own trunk... Well, we might as well start back, I suppose. This is all. I'll, I'll go back with you, Pajoli. I'll see you through. Somehow I can't. I, I won't believe you did it. Thanks. Thanks. You know, Pajoli, you set out to clear Boatman Lal and, well, dash it all, it looks as if you had. No, he didn't. Budman Lal was out of jail at least an hour before you fellows came into police headquarters to see me. Out? You mean that you turned him loose? Yes. How's that, Chief Vickers? Because, Mr. Lowe, he didn't go to the temple at all with his wife last night. He went down to Queen's Park Hotel and played billiards till one o'clock. He called up a few friends and proved that easily enough. My word, that, that leaves nobody but... Yes, Pagioli. I don't know anything about it. If I did commit the murder, I was asleep. I don't know anything about it. That's all I can say. I don't know anything about it. Perhaps a rest in jail will help restore your memory. Well, we'll see. Come now, Poggioli, old man. Don't be too downhearted. I promise you, I'll do everything I can. The case against Henry Pajoli having been duly tried by a jury of your peers who have been found guilty and by the powers invested in me, I herewith sentence you to be hanged by the neck until you are dead. To recall a lost dream is the most tantalizing task ever a human brain was driven to. But if I lie still long enough on this bunk, perhaps I can recapture the dream I had in the temple last night. Yes. Yes. It seems to me that the image on the altar moved, and suddenly the dome overhead was opened and left me staring upward into a vast abyss where I was alone in endless space, where all creatures and all matter that had ever been or ever would be were wrapped up in me, Parcioli. That was my dream. That's an odd thing. Six men dreaming the same dream in different terms. There must be a physical cause for such a phenomenon. Cause! I've got it! Vickers! Whoa! I have it! I've solved it! Get me out of here! I know who killed the girl! What is it, my friend? 
I know who murdered the bride. Old Hira Dutch did it. Now listen. Listen. Go tell Beckles to take the gold he found in my trunk and develop all the fingerprints on it. He'll find Hira Dutch's prints. Also tell him to follow out that opiate clue I gave him. He'll find Hira Dutch and a man to put the gold in my trunk. See if they don't find brass or steel filings in my room where the scoundrel sat and filed a new key. But they've already done that long ago. They have. But certainly. And old Hyradas confessed everything. Though why a rich old man like him should have murdered a pretty child is more than I can see. But why did he pick on me as a scapegoat? Oh, he explained that to the police. He said he picked on a white man so the police would make a thorough investigation and be sure to catch him. He did? Aye. But what I can't see is why the old boy wanted to be caught and hanged. Why didn't he commit suicide? Why? I know why. Because according to his religion, in that case his soul would have returned in the form of some beast. He wanted to be slain because he expects to be reborn instantly in Benares with little Maela Ran as his bride instead of his nephews. He hopes to be a great man with wife and children. All the things he was not here in Trinidad. Yes, yes, you must be right. Why didn't you come and tell me about Hiradas' confession the moment it occurred? What do you mean keeping me here when you know I'm an innocent man? Why didn't you tell me before this? Because I couldn't. Old Hiradas didn't confess until a month and ten days after you were hanged. So ends A Passage to Benares, T.S. Stribling's tale of mysterious death and death mysterious. This was tonight's story of... Suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. John Dietz was our guest director this evening. Tonight's radio drama was written by Carol Case and scored by Bernard Herman. Paul Stewart was Pajoli, Barry Kroger was Mr. Hira Das, and Horace Bram played Mr. Lowe. Others in the cast were Alan Hewitt and Guy Rep. Next week at this time, Columbia will bring you another selected story from the world's great literature of thrills, another study in suspense. This is Barry Kroger, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Roma Wines present. Suspense. Tonight, Actors' Blood, written and told to us by Ben Hecht and starring Frederick March. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you... Suspense! This is the Man in Black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California to raise the curtain on a presentation unique in these weekly half-hours of suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you a star of the first magnitude, Mr. Frederick March. And in person, one of America's foremost tellers of tales, Mr. Ben Hecht of Broadway and Hollywood, who will appear as actor and narrator in a suspense play dealing with the mysterious death and the twisted passions and loyalties of the world behind the footlights. And so with actors' blood and with the performance of Frederick March, supported by Ben Hecht, from whom we will hear the narrative in the author's own words, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Do you remember Maurice Tillieu? Probably not. 
Only students of the theater or people old enough to have applauded the heyday of Mrs. Leslie Carter and John Drew and the theatrical dilos of the Divine Sarah would be likely to remember. During the years I knew him, I saw him in harness but three times. Once in a revival, once at a benefit, and the third time was the occasion of the anecdote I've set out to relate. By that time, his only claim to fame was the fact that he was the father of Marcia Tilliou. On a summer night in 1927, Marcia made a final exit worthy of the Tilliou tradition. For weeks after it happened, old Tilliou went around like the ancient mariner, holding with his baleful eye and his mournful song whoever crossed upon his path. But after a while, he too seemed to drop out of sight in the wake of his glamorous daughter, and like her, was forgotten. Then late one night, as I was getting ready for bed, the bells of my apartment rang. Ben, I come with a message from the dead. Indeed. Well, come on in and tell me about it. Ben, do you believe in ghosts? I've got nothing against them. Good. I have just come from a miserable modern dress caricature of that greatest of the bard's plays, Macbeth. You will scarcely credit what these upstarts have done to Shakespeare's masterpiece. They haven't altered the text, have they? You recall the fourth scene of the third act? Oh, yes. The scene in which Banquo's ghost appears. Just so. In the folio edition of the play, the stage directions clearly read... The ghost of Banquo enters and sits in Macbeth's place. In the foul production which I have just witnessed, the ghost does no such thing. It is an empty chair to which Macbeth shrieks his guilty line. Thou canst not say I did it. Never shake thy gory locks at me. An invisible ghost, eh? That's not so illogical. Yeah, but what drama is there in it? How can we feel Macbeth's terror if it's an empty stool at which he shouts, Avaunt and quit my sight. Let the earth hide thee. Thy bones are mirrorless. Thy blood is cold. Thou hast no speculation in those eyes which thou dost glare with. The way you read those lines, sir, I have no trouble seeing this ghost. Thank you. Now listen. I am going to produce that scene in modern dress. It's not going to be an ambi pamby production such as the one I witnessed tonight. I am going to give a banquet at my home, and there is going to be a place set at the table for my daughter, Marcia. Now look, Maurice, I'm very fond of you. Ah, uh, you are wondering why, aren't you, my boy? <laughs> like Hamlet, I am but mad north northwest. Mm. The empty place at the table will be purely symbolic, I assure you. And no apparitions will appear, not to you and me at any rate. I cannot guarantee what my daughter's murderer will see there. Marsh's murderer will be there? They will all be there. All who loved her, all who hated her. And woe to the hand that shed this costly blood. Mm, but if you know who the murderer is, why don't you tell the police? Ah, the police? My daughter, sir, would not have wanted so crude and sordid an epilogue to her life story. Like her father before her and my parents before me, she had actor's blood in her veins. She shall be avenged, my friend. But it will be no affair of handcuffs and policemen. I'll not go whining on Marsha's behalf among the cigar butts and cuspidors in some precinct station. No, no. Her murderer shall be unmasked at a mighty banquet. On Friday next, at 8.30, curtain time, my friend. I'll see you there. Yes, yes, I'll be there. With Ben Hecht in person as the narrator of his own story, and with Frederick March as star, you have heard the prologue to Actor's Blood, tonight's tale of Suspense. And now, in this brief intermission, let us picture a scene beneath a radiant Caribbean moon at the fashionable Hotel Nacional de Cuba in Havana. An American dinner guest has just raised his glass in a toast to Havana, its traditions, its beauty, the superb dinner, and wine. 
his Cuban host replies, true, the traditions, the scenery, and the food you enjoy, they are Cuban. But the wine of which you speak so highly, that is of your country. It is the famed Roma wine made in your own California. Yes, it may surprise you that California produces Roma wines of such uniformly superb quality that they are imported by many foreign countries. But millions of Americans do know and enjoy the excellence of Roma wines daily with meals and when entertaining. These millions have made Roma America's largest selling wines. They know, too, that Roma wines are amazingly inexpensive, only pennies a glass, for wines of such distinguished character. That's because here in America, you pay no high import duty, no expensive shipping charges for Roma, wines that combine age-old winemaking skill with modern testing and quality control. So ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Mr. Ben Hecht, narrator and author of Actors' Blood, starring Frederick March. Tonight's tale of suspense. It rained on that Friday night. Thunder rolled in the sky. And the streets were full of that picnic-like confusion which storm brings to the city. Waiting under the hotel awning for a taxi, I turned over in my mind the strange invitation that had brought me out into this wild and stormy night. I was rather thrilled at the prospect of old Tilly's dinner, for his intention was plain, to assemble a company of suspects in the murder of his daughter, Marcia, and he was obviously going to climax the evening by some formal accusation of guilt. I knew pretty well who the suspects were, and I suppose I was one of them. Alfred O'Shea would be there, of course. Alfred O'Shea. The man who had written Marcia Tilliou's first successful play and their last. Broadway had its own private joke about the title of the last. It was called Forgotten Lady. It was after the final curtain of the last performance of Forgotten Lady that Alfred O'Shea chose to tell her. Marcia told the story at the time as a joke on herself. Hello, Marcia. Oh, why, darling, you waited for me in my dressing room. Like old times, I'm touched, really touched. Look, sweetheart, you're off stage now, so cut the Bernhardt. You know why I'm here. I do. All right, I'll say it again. I'll say it for the last time. I want a divorce. I want to marry Rena Kratznoff. I want to marry Rena Kratznoff. Oh, it's such a bad line. And from such a great playwright. No, dear Alfred. Not for her. It would be too belittling a successor. Can't you see, darling, after all we've been to each other, it's... Why, it's like Pygmalion wanting to trade in his beautiful Galatea for a wooden Indian. Then it's no dice, huh? No dice, Alfred. No divorce. Not as long as I live. Now, be a darling and help me out of this dress. Okay, Marcia, you've just made your own bargain. <laughs> you can come out from behind that screen now, Father. Uh, how did you know I was there? Your asthma, darling. I'm glad you're here. Even if you are a perfectly fiendish old eavesdropper. Here, you can unhook me since that swine refused to... I warned you against marrying that jackanapes of a playwright, Marshal. Oh, Father, you're saying I told you so. What I really wanted was to weep on your shoulder. Ouch! I'm sorry, sorry. Look here, Marsha. What are you going to do about this career of Now, yours? darling, please don't go into that old routine about my being the last scion of the royal family of the American theater. I'm nothing but a combination of your name and a playwright who specializes in shallow, brittle female leads that enable me to get applause by simply acting Marcia, myself. Marsh, I won't allow you to speak this way about yourself. You're a great artist. Oh. You've taken your place in the great tradition of the stage beside the immortal figures of Rachel, Siddons, Bernhardt, and Majeska. Marcia, let O'Shea go. He was never worthy of you. Play Juliet next season. 
Show them, show them you don't need a fashionable playwright and tailor-made parts to succeed. Show them you have actor's blood. Actor's blood, actor's blood. I'm sick of hearing about it. Just because you and Mother thought it was cute to stick me out there behind the footlights at the age of five. Because you never had any real life. You didn't see any reason why your daughter should have. I'm supposed to have actor's blood. All right, all right, all right. I'm only thinking of you, Marsha. Only of you. But that O'Shea is a hot-headed Irishman. He came very near to threatening your life when you refused to do as he asked. Good. I wish he would kill me. I'm sick of the whole rotten business. <laughs> Yes, O'Shea was a suspect. He would be at old Tilly's dinner. He would be seated across the table from the empty chair. And would he see a Banquo's ghost of Marsha Tilly? But O'Shea would be in a goodly company of suspects. Fritz von Klauber would be there for sure. Fritz von Klauber. Not a man I should have liked to have as an enemy that abnormally sensitive to insult. Von Klauber was possessed also of an impenetrable Prussian stupidity. His first American production was a play called Jubilee for Spring, and Marsha Tilly, who starred in it, it was the most sensational flop of the Broadway season. After the first night performance in the 21 Club, Marsha held her own private autopsy on Von Klauber's dead turkey. You see, darlings, Mr. Von Klauber, my esteemed producer, loves his turkey farm so much, he sometimes forgets he's on Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific, Marsha. How about that for my car? Sure, Walter. Anything at all, it's all yours. Exclusive. Marcia, Marcia, Marcia. Shh, shh. Von Klauber. He's over there at the next table. He's heard every word. Good. Let him hear. He's going to hear from me in the morning anyway when I start looking for a new producer. <laughs> uh... Go ahead, my sweet Marshal. Go ahead. Rag me in public. I could kill you for this. Do you hear me? I could kill you. Oh, you could, darling. Well, if my beloved husband doesn't do me in as he keeps threatening to do, perhaps I'll ask you to oblige. I may yet be spared the nuisance of doing the job myself. Marsha, I forbid you to talk like this. Sorry, Father. It must be the actor's blood cropping up again. Yes, Von Klauber would surely be present to Tilly's ghostly dinner. As I got into the taxi and gave the driver Tilio's address, my mind was still turning upon the terrible question, who killed Marsha Tilio? Third on my list of suspects was a character named Maury Stein. Maury Stein. A one-time racing tout and small-time gangster, Mar Maury turned his brilliant, if slightly frightening, talent to flesh peddling. That is to say, he was a theatrical agent. Marsha did two shows under his management, both of them flops. It wasn't her fault. There was no belittlement of the name Tilly. It was still an electric sign, but growing ghostly, slipping still aglow into the side streets of fame. Maury Stein was Marsha Tilly's last substitute for love. Maury, will you stop staring at that door? Let's get out of here. Oh, relax. This is a charming room. I like it here. Look, Chick, I said let's get out of here. Understand? Perfectly. I understand that Mrs. Maury Stein may come walking in that door. Perhaps she'll put two and two together about us. That'd make you sad, wouldn't it? Because you've signed over all your unscrupulously earned money to your good wife. Oh, just in case questions should be asked, you know. And if she gets any ideas, she may cut you off without a dime. And then Shut where... Up. You know, I've half a mind Did to... you hear what I said? Shut up! You know so much as that... Uh, pick up your coat, we're gone. Maury, you are a worm. A despicable, slimy little worm. Sister, nobody talks to Maury Stein like that and gets away with it, see? Nobody. There was to be one more opening night in Marsha Tilly's career. And ironically enough, the three men she had cause to fear most of all her enemies were doing the honors. O'Shea had written it, Von Klauber was the producer, and Maury Stein had put up the money. I arrived backstage at the Broadhurst at 8.20 to find the three of them in hysterics. Ten minutes to curtain time and no Marsha. 
I found old Tilly who was sitting in a dressing room, nursing a sprained ankle and very upset. Then, then I'm worried. For the first time, I'm really worried about Marsha. What's the matter? I, I don't know. We've been calling her hotel since six o'clock. She refuses to answer the phone. Ben, go over there. You're the only one she'll listen to. No Tilly who has ever missed a performance, and Marsha of all people must not be the first. It's those villains out there who've done this. Spreading insidious poison like Iago. Tearing at her heart with their fangs until she's afraid to go on. Go, Ben. Try to reason with her. Okay, Pop. I'll do my best to bring her back. I trotted the three blocks to Marsha's hotel. The clerk at the desk met me with a dead pan. Nope, Mr. Hack. Miss Tilly, who hasn't come down yet. No key in her box. I took the elevator up. I turned left and walked down the corridor. I knocked on the door. No answer. Tried the knob. Door opened. And then it all added up. Yes, it added up to a gaudy room in shambles. Mirrors smashed, perfume bottles shattered. The portrait of Marcia is Pirette, cut to ribbons. And finally it added up to Marcia herself. Cold and white and terribly beautiful. Lying there on the bed with three round bullet holes in a neat triangle just over the heart. There was no mistaking it. Marcia Tillieu was dead, murdered. That was the sum total of the addition I was doing in my head as I rode in a taxi the 20 blocks from my hotel to old Tilio's house on West 84th Street. Maybe I added it up wrong, but I felt sure I hadn't. I was even more certain when I saw old Tilio standing there at the head of the table to greet the guests he had assembled in the promise of revealing the identity of Marsh's murderer. Promptly at 8.30, he made his entrance. He had brought a stranger into the room with him. Well, thank you. Thank you, all of you, for waiting so patiently. I trust you found your mutual company not too tiresome. <clears throat> I should like to introduce my guest of honor. May I present Mr. Carl Schuttler of the uh, district attorney's office. Now, if, if you will all be seated, the place cards are plainly marked. Please, please do not... Disarrange them. Thank you, Alfred. Well, I see one short. And who, may I ask, is that empty place for? Banco's gold? That, my dear Mr. Van Glauber, is for a beloved guest known to all of you. Beloved guest, huh? Well, let's see now. <laughs> well, well, hey, listen to this. This seat has indeed been reserved for one uh, known to all of us. Who is it? It's been reserved for Marcia Tillio. What a Oh, please, I'd like to change my place. <laughs> well, yeah, down, down. Marcia was never... She was too sensible to play ghost. <laughs> I... I am an old actor. With the audience seated and the curtain up, I find it hard to wait. Art is long, but time is fleeting. And there is one who bids me speak. Love, hear thou. How desolate the heart is ever calling, ever unanswered, and the dark rain falling, then as now. You are wondering if I really believe my daughter Marcia is present in this galaxy of her friends. It may be the wandering wits of an old man, but I see her sitting there, tragic and beautiful. About her the sound of rain and of sweet bells jangling out of tune. Forgive me. You, you have not come here tonight to hear a doting father spread his miseries before you, but for a sterner business, which from your courtesy, your attentiveness, I feel sure you have guessed. Mr. Schuttler asked me to tell him this matter privately, but I refuse. For you are all her friends, her honorable friends, and I wanted you present. Who killed my daughter? Who took her life? There, there's the question. I have the answer. Yes, Mr. Schuttler, the murderer is here. 
He sits here among us now at my table. Shall I lock the door now, Mr. Tilly? Yes, yes, yes lock, lock the door. door. Lock it tight. Leave no chance for escape. <laughs> it's too late now. No power in heaven or earth can save him. All right, Mr. Tilly, the door's locked. My friends, is this not like a play? Your face is waiting for the name. The name of Iscariot the Judas. <clears throat> That's it, that's it. Clear your throat. Spit it, squirm. Look about you. Who knows? The villain may be right beside you. And who knows but that you may be his next victim. Uh, Mr. Tilly... Yeah, I, I keep my promise, Mr. Shooter. I have the proof, all of them. Enough to send the murderer from this table to the gallows. The one who killed Marsha is looking at me now. Ah. The blood on his hands. The terror in his eyes. I'll tell you his name. His name is... He's killing you! Everybody stay where you are! Not that! Not that! A knife! A knife! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Billio! Where are you? He's killing me! He's killing... A dagger handle protruded from old Tilio's crimson shirt front. His eyes were closed. We carried him into the next room and waited outside while the doctor worked over him. Uh, Mr. Hecht? I'm Ben Hecht, doctor. Oh. Will you come in, please? He's asking for you. Doctor, is he... Uh, and I some... pierced the heart. He hasn't much longer. Uh, uh, ben. Ben, is that, is that you, Ben? Yes, it's me. Who did it? Uh, here, lean over so I can see your face. Uh, there, Satisfied? Let me fill out of my pocket. Wait, wait, wait. What, what is that? Why, it's a letter. I must have tucked it into the pocket of this suit the last time I wore it. Wait, wait, what, what's in that letter, Ben? I don't know. I haven't even opened it. Oh, that, that's Marshall's handwriting. A letter from the dead. Open it, Ben. Read it to me. Look, you mustn't excite yourself. I... When, when was that letter mailed? It's uh, postmarked the 10th. It must have been the day before... Yeah, read, you... read the letter, Ben. All right. What, what does it say, Ben? Read it. Ah, uh, why well, it says, um, dear Ben, hmm, this is to remind you of the opening at the Broadhurst tonight. I uh, hope you will be there because, um, I sincerely believe that this is one of the greatest roles I have ever played, and, and I'm so anxious to make good in it because of Father's faith in me. She, she cared. She really cared. What I thought. Sure she did. She'd have been proud of your performance in there this evening, too, Pop. You were great. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Doctor, doctor. Oh, yes, yes, what? Oh. Well, that's that. He was quite an actor in his day, wasn't he? Yes, quite an actor. How is he? How is he doing? Huh? What did he say? Did he say anything? He's dead. I've got a letter here that will explain everything. It's a pity I didn't find it sooner. I haven't had this dinner suit on since the night of Marsh's opening. It fell out of my pocket when I leaned over the bed in there. It was written by Marsha Tillyu the day she died. It says, Ben, I'm bored, tired, hurt, sick, full of nasty things. I'd stay a while longer... But death seems easier and simpler than life. What are a few pills, more or less, to one who has swallowed so much? Take care of father. He liked you the best for the last time, Marsha. Suicide. It's a suicide note. But what about the bullet? Can't you guess? The old man worshipped her. She was his star. But stars don't commit suicide. Only failures do that. So he fired three bullets into her dead body, slashed the painting, 
and wrecked the place to make it look like a crime of passion. He must have been mad as a hatter. No, he was sane. I think he really saw her as murdered by all of us, her so-called friends who had let her down when she needed them most. You realize that that old barnstormer was playing his death scene from the moment he came into this room tonight? He'd rehearsed it in his bedroom for days, sharpening away at Macbeth's old toad stabber. He had his lines down pat. He staged his elaborate set scene this evening and killed himself in such a way that we'd all be raked over the coals, not only for Marsh's murder, but for his own as well. Well, it was a lovely piece of old-fashioned miming, but as fruitless a drama as I ever had the misfortune to witness. You're right, O'Shea. The plot was full of holes. We could have helped him a lot with the construction, but it was a great last night... And so closes Actors' Blood, written and narrated by Ben Hecht and starring Frederick March. Tonight's study in Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Have you discovered, as thousands have, how much Roma wines add to the enjoyment of your meals? How their superb flavor makes special occasion feasts out of everyday meals? Well, find out for yourself. Start off the meal with that delightful appetizer, Roma California Sherry. Then place on the table a well-chilled bottle of Roma California Table Wine. Delicate Sauterne, hearty Burgundy, or tart, tasty Claret. You'll be amazed at the tremendous difference Roma wine makes in the enjoyment of your foods. Don't overlook this easy, inexpensive way to add thrilling, extra enjoyment of everyday living. Remember, Roma wines cost only pennies a glass. Take a tip from the millions who enjoy Roma wines at meals when entertaining. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Mr. Brian Donlevy, a star of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salute, your health and your. Roma Toast the World. The wine for your table is Roma, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, Roma brings you as star Mr. Peter Lorre. The suspense play which stars Mr. Lorre and which is produced and directed by William Spear is called Back for Christmas. In this series, Roma brings you tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so with Back for Christmas and with the performance of Peter Lorre, We again hope to keep you in suspense. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride a one with you. Yes, Marie. What on earth are you doing down here in the cellar? Oh, uh, just doing a little digging. And why, may I ask, have you chosen this day of all days to dig up the cellar floor? Oh, I thought because the weather has been so damp, this would be a good time to plant that little <laughs> devil's garden I told you about. Devil's garden? Whatever nonsense is that? <laughs> Don't you remember that was my little joke about it? You see, uh, I've managed to get hold of the spores of several unclassified wild orchids. 
In a wild state, they bloom under damp masses of leaf mold. The South American Indians call them devil flowers because they appear to bloom under the ground. Well, I'm sure the South American Indians will be very interested if you succeed in growing these ridiculous flowers under the cellar floor. <laughs> Whom else it will interest, I can't imagine. Oh, what the... Terrible smell. Oh, that's the leaf mold. Uh, chemically identical with the earth blanket they grow under in their wild state. And I want to get these started before we close the house. Do you realize that we're sailing for America a week from today and you've made no mm. arrangements whatever? Unless you call digging a hole in the cellar making arrangements. I certainly don't. Devil's garden, indeed. <laughs> Sometimes I think you're going soft in the head, Hubert. Oh, I, I suppose it is inconsiderate of me, you see. And I've been wanting to try this experiment for a long time, but uh, with all those lectures and seminars at the university, there, there never seemed to, uh, to be enough time. Well, there certainly isn't any time for it now. I suppose you've forgotten I made an appointment for you at the barber's this afternoon. Oh, oh must I shave my beard off, Hermione? I thought we'd been through all that. Of course oh. you must. They don't wear beards in America. Bad enough you're speaking with that accent. They'll probably think we're Germans as it is. Oh, I should think it would be quite easy just to explain it. I'm Swiss. Now, Hubert, don't be argumentative. Oh. Go and get your jacket on and do as I tell you. Yes, Hermione. And don't forget to take your umbrella. It looks like rain. Yes, Hermione. And don't look so put upon, Hubert. Someone has to plan things in this house. Never even get to the university in time for your lectures, much less make arrangements for a trip to America. I know, but, but what about my specimens? There'll be plenty of time to plant your precious devil's garden when we get home from America. We're not going to be gone forever, you know. We'll be back here for Christmas. Yes, of course. Back for Christmas. I'd forgotten. We'll try to remember it. And if you can't do that, just do as I tell you. I've been making the plans in this house for 20 years. And mm. if there's any digging to be done... I'll manage that as well. You understand, Hubert? Yes, Hermione. Good. Now, you have just uh, 20 minutes to clean up this mess down here and keep your appointment at the barber's. And when you're finished there, I want you to come straight home. All right. Oh, oh, oh. I, I wanted to stop at Miss Markham's and pick up some books I ordered. Well, all right. But don't loiter there the whole afternoon mulling over those old books the way you usually do. Now hurry and clear up this rubbish. Get rid of that smelly stuff. And no more digging, mind you. No more digging. I'll show her. I'll have my devil's garden, and if I... No more digging, eh? No more digging. Oh, 15 men on a dead man's chest. Yoo-hoo! Yoo-hoo! And a bottle. Good evening, sir. Oh, good evening, Miss Markham. Why, it is Professor Schumacher, isn't it? <laughs> Do you like me better this way? You look ever so much younger without the beard. Twenty years at least. Twenty years. Oh, you'll be glad to know those books you ordered have finally arrived. Twenty... Oh, yes, the books. Let me see. The, phyt the phytotomy of phalloid gametophytes mm -hmm. and uh, coniferous shrubs of North America. Those are the very ones you ordered, good. aren't they? <laughs> yes, thank you. You're very kind, Miss Markham. Why kind, Professor Schumacher? Well, not, not many young ladies in bookshops would go out of their way to look up rare books for an old professor of botany. Why, you're not old, Professor Schumacher. Really, you look... What do I look like? And besides, I adore botany. It's my particular hobby. Oh, really? You've never told me that before, Miss Markham. Well, I was afraid to. You <laughs> looked so imposing with the beard and all. No. <laughs> Oh, uh, Miss Markham, uh, forgive me if, if this sounds foolish, but since talking with you today, I, I feel that shaving off my beard is the most important thing I've done for 20 years. Oh, yes. it is. I, I, I'm sure it is. For 20 I'm, I'm so sorry that I've been so distant with you all this time. Oh, there were times when I almost spoke up. Oh, really? Times when you came in here, tired after a day with your students at the university. You seemed so alone. The way I'm alone in the world. Alone? I'd like to have asked you to stay a while and talk with me, but some way or other, I... I always wound up giving you your change and letting you go on your way. Say you... you're alone in the world? Since my father died. Oh, Miss, uh, Miss Markham, did, did you never think of marrying? My father was a very remarkable man. I never found anyone who seemed to measure up to what he led me to expect of men. Uh, Miss Markham... Oh. <laughs> 
It's been so long since anyone called me by my first name. I'd like you to, if you want to. It's Marion. Marion? Oh, how nice. And, and yours? Well, uh, Hubertus. <laughs> but, but in English, Hubert sounds better, huh? How long have you been alone, Hubert? Alone? I knew you were a widower, of course. I, widow. The first time I saw you. A widower? I can always tell. There's, there's a certain sadness in a man's eyes. Hmm. A sweet sadness, I think, when, when he's been married and then a lost... A widower. I never thought of it in quite that way. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have been talking like this, I suppose. But I've often wondered what she must have been like. Your wife, I mean. Hermione? <laughs> Not an easy woman to forget. Very strong. Always managing things. The house, my wardrobe, my friends. Even when we dined at a restaurant, she even then ordered my food. She was always managing things. Her whole life managed herself to death. Poor woman. She must have loved you very much. But she needn't have put herself out so. It's plain to see you don't need things managed for you. No. You need companionship, I think. Someone sympathetic with your work. But the last thing on earth you need is a manager. How well you put it. The last thing on earth. Operator. Operator, are you there? I'm still waiting on that call to Salisbury. Well, put them on quickly. Hello. Is this Paul Holton, sons? It's Mrs. Hubert Schumacher. Did you receive my letter? Good. Now remember, we'll be back for Christmas and I want the job done without fail. What's that? No. No, I'm sure he doesn't suspect anything. Send it to me in New York as I instructed you, addressed in my name, of course. Yes. I've already put them in the mail. You'll get them tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, here you are, Hubert. Where have you been? Oh, backstairs. I dismissed the servants. Dismissed the servants? Mm-hmm. But I've asked some friends of mine into a farewell lunch and go and tell them it's a mistake. Well, uh, I'm afraid it's too late now. They've packed and gone. You have messed things up properly. How many times have I told you to leave things to me? I make the plans around here. Yes, Hermione. You have to do better than this when I plan the trip home or we'll never in the world be back for Christmas. Back for Christmas. Back for Christmas. Must you keep saying that? Why not? We are coming back for Christmas, aren't we? Oh, well, supposing I, I were offered a professorship in one of those wealthy American universities. Nonsense. Americans care nothing for botany. Well, Luther Burbank was an American, wasn't That's he? That's different. What have you ever done except muck around in the dirt with a lot of roots and tubers? Well, they asked me to lecture, didn't uh, they? All right, all right. Now, there's no use getting yourself in a state about this, Hubert. No doubt this extra money will come in very handy when we arrive back... Back for, for Christmas. Christmas, I Precisely. Know. No good to make a joke of it. Heaven knows where you'd be today if I hadn't got a sense of time. Yes, Hermione. And as you've been so foolish as to dismiss the servants, you may empty the ashtrays and straighten up this room while we're waiting for the guests to arrive. <clears throat> I'm going in to have my bath. Call me when they get here. Marion? It's Hubert. No, no, darling, no, nothing is wrong. Oh, my plans are the same, uh, unless, unless you have changed. No? Oh, we'll meet in New York, then, and be married there. Oh, I I'll explain to you why later. Y you just have to trust me. Yes. <laughs> yes, my darling. Hubert? Oh, I'm so sorry, I can't talk any longer. Ye yes, I'll meet you in New York, without fail. I'll be the same, my liebchen. Were you talking on the phone just uh, now? Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, Hermione. Whoever was it? Oh, <laughs> Freddy, Freddy Sinclair. But didn't I hear you say something about meeting somebody in New York? Uh, why, yes. <laughs> Freddy said he might possibly get over there before we even leave. And, and I said, of course, we'd meet him there if he decided to go. <laughs> that seems very peculiar. But then all of your friends are peculiar. <laughs> yes, Hermione. And just look at your jacket. Have you been digging in that cellar again? Yes, Hermione. Well, there's no need for it. You can't possibly get that devil's garden thing finished before we sail for America. Go and change your clothes before the guests arrive. Oh, never mind. I see somebody coming up the walk now. Go and let them in. Yes. Uh, Hubert. Yes? Look out the window. 
There's Professor and Mrs. Goodenow, but who's that with them? Well, who... Uh, <laughs> Precisely. Freddie Sinclair. Peculiar, you should have been talking to him on the phone not three minutes ago, and now here he is. <laughs> yes, isn't it? <laughs> oh, but then, as you see, Hermione, all of my friends are peculiar. Not half so peculiar as you. <laughs> Digging in the cellar the very day we leave for America. Just look at yourself. And now that I think of it... Yes? Oh, never mind. Uh, go and let them in. Oh, uh, you were going to ask me something, Hermione, about... Uh... The hole I'm digging in a cellar. Good heavens, stop rolling your eyes about that way. One would think you were digging a grave down there instead of a storage bin. Yes, Hermione. What's that? I said yes, Hermione. Father, open the door and please stop saying yes, Hermione. I think, my dear, I have said it for the last time. <laughs> professor of botany, his loving wife, and an oblong pit in the cellar, just the right size for his botanical specimens, his devil's garden. With these ingredients for a story of a perfect crime, Back for Christmas by John Collier and starring Peter Lorre, the Roma Wine Company closes the curtain for a moment on another breathless study in suspense. In this brief intermission in the play, it's pleasant to think about the holidays. Not everyone celebrates the holidays against a background of snow and pine trees. Somewhere south of the Gulf and the Caribbean, in a gracious home surrounded by palm trees and the warm sun, you might find holiday dinners ending this way. One moment, please. Our North American guest wishes to propose a toast. Yes, mis amigos. I drink a toast in gratitude to you for your gracious hospitality and the enjoyment you've given me, an American so far from home. It is only a fair exchange, my friend. This wine in which you drink your toast, it brings enjoyment to us from your country, from America. It is Roma wine made in your own California. Yes, and when you choose the wine for your holiday table, remember this. Only a few wines are so fine that many countries of the world import them. And among these greatly enjoyable wines are the wines of Roma. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Yet here in America we are truly fortunate. For we may buy Roma wines at a very low cost. Since we don't have to pay import duty or costly shipping charges. So serve Roma wine with pride on any and all holiday occasions. Serve Roma too for everyday dinners. You can afford to. Ask your dealer tomorrow for your favorite Roma wine, America's largest selling wine. But before you buy wine, buy war bonds. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our sound stage Mr. Peter Lorre in Act Two of Back for Christmas, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. For Christmas. Hermione was so positive we would be back for Christmas. That last afternoon, pouring tea out for a few friends who had come in to say a last minute farewells, she kept reiterating it. Now, mind you, Hermione, don't let those Americans lure your husband with one of their fat university jobs. <laughs> we absolutely <laughs> must have you with us for Christmas. He shall be back, I promise you. Well, it's not absolutely certain, of course. <laughs> you, but now, what do you mean, it's not certain? Of course it's certain. After all, you was old boy, you've contracted to lecture for only three months. Oh, that's quite right, but then, uh, of course, anything may happen. You, but adores being unpredictable. Now, what other man would decide the day, the very day, mind you, before leaving for America to dig a great hole in the floor of the cellar. In the cellar? <laughs> yes. He's going to put some unclassified wild orchids down there. A devil's garden, if you please. It sounds so mysterious. That's Hubert, though. It's really quite simple, however, once you find out what he's up to. Now, take that telephone call he put through to you a few minutes ago, Freddy. Uh, <coughs> me? Of course. 
Lord. <coughs> now, Hubert wanted to surprise me about your plan to meet us in New York next month. Wasn't that why he called? To ask you not to mention it? But my dear Hermione, Hubert couldn't possibly have telephoned me within the past hour. I've been walking in the park since three. He didn't telephone you? Well, how could he? Just for my going to America. No, 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 no. Come, Freddy, come. You may as well confess. <laughs> Hermione has just found me out again. But Hubert's old chap, I really do You see what a poor liar Hubert makes. He's red as a beetroot. <laughs> Aren't you ashamed of yourself, Professor? Stringing oh. poor Hermione along like that. And as for you, Freddy, I'm furious you said nothing to us about going to America. But, but look here, old girl. I've been trying to tell everyone here oh, that I'm... Oh, stop the nonsense. The game's gone on long enough. Besides, we must start getting ready. Now, it was marvellous of all of you to come in to say goodbye. And don't worry about Hubert's little jokes. I will bring him back for Christmas. You may rely on it. <laughs> They all believed her. For years, she had been promising me for dinner parties, garden parties, committees, and the promises had always been kept. This time, they would not be. I had seen to that. The servants were gone for good. The farewells all said. I had time to the minute how long it would take to fill in a hole in a cellar. My devil's garden. Upstairs in her bedroom, I undressed and put on my old bathrobe, and then I I opened the door into Hermione's room. Oh, uh, uh Hermione, uh, have you a moment to spare? Of course, dear. I'm just finished. Oh, then, uh, will you come in here for a moment, please? There's, uh, something rather extraordinary here. Oh, good heavens, you! What are you lounging about in that filthy old bathroom oh. for? I told you to put it into the furnace. Oh, I'll do it. I'll do it today. Yes, really, I will. I promise. Well, high time. Now, what is it you want to show me? Oh, here, here, in the bathroom. Uh, just look, who in the world do you suppose dropped a gold chain down the bathtub drain? Nobody has, of course. Nobody wears such a thing. Then what is it doing in here? I don't see anything. Well, uh, look. I'll hold this flashlight here for you. If you if you lean right over, you can see it shining. It's deep down. Oh, such a lot of nonsense. Just as well. Well, I don't see it, Hubert. Oh, go on looking, Hermione, in just a moment. Hubert, I absolutely refuse to... Hubert, what are you doing? Take your hands off my neck. I will, Hermione. Just as soon as I've finished the arrangements for my trip to America. What are you talking about? You thought you were the only one who could plan things, didn't you? Didn't you, Hermione, huh? Oh. Well, I've been making some plans of my own this past week. In exactly two minutes and 16 seconds, you'll be dead. What? You see? You see, I have planned it very accurately. You'll never get away with it. Oh, I thought you would say that, Hermione, but I will get away with it. You won't mind the smell of the leaf mold down in a cellar when I take you down there today? <laughs> yes, that is where you are going, Hermione. Oh. Right into my devil's garden that annoyed you so much. My friends all expect me back for Christmas. They do. If they don't hear from me, they'll start asking questions. No, they won't. Because you'll write them letters, Hermione, on the typewriter, as you always do. They'll be signed H in that neat, correcting way. You always sign your notes to your friends. Yeah. Let me up now. No! It won't work, Hubert. You were never any good at planning. Oh, things. but I have changed. I have learned from watching you all these years. The lecture people in America. They'll expect you to be traveling with your wife. I will be traveling with my wife. But not my present wife, Hermione. Hubert! It won't work, I tell you. That pit you dug in the cellar? Oh, it will work. It'll serve its purpose well. Hubert! No, no, I'm sorry, dear. This thing has to be done exactly as planned. <gasps> you have just five seconds to say your prayers. Hubert, you must listen. The cellar, it... Don't do it, Hubert! Let her Oh, uh, uh, Stuart? Yes, sir? 
Oh, uh, my wife, she's in this post. She, she'll be taking her meals in our stateroom. For the whole voyage, sir? Yes, for the whole voyage. I trust your wife is feeling better this morning, Professor Schumacher. A, a little. Uh, not yet well enough to leave her cabin. Oh, what a shame. Oh, Professor Schumacher. Yes? Here's a copy of the radiogram you sent for your wife last evening. Oh, thank you. I'll just check it over. Oh, but, but look. Look here. Why? What's the matter? Did the typist make a mistake? No. No. <laughs> it's nothing important. She, she can correct it later. <laughs> a feeling that Hermione had been leaning over my shoulder again, correcting what I had written as she always did. I had written a radiogram to Professor Goodenough and his wife. Haven't been out of my cabin the whole beastly trip, Hubert well. Now, doubt, we'll be back for Christmas. But the operator had left out the W and, and it read, no... Doubt will be back for Christmas. Exactly what Hermione would have written. Well, the rest of the trip was uneventful. Marion and I met in New York just as we had planned. Just as we had planned. Oh, uh, uh, Professor and Mrs. Schumacher, uh, we have reservations, I believe. Oh, yes, we've been expecting you, sir. Boy, take Professor and Mrs. Schumacher's luggage up to their suite. You know, Mrs. Schumacher, you're quite a surprise. Oh? Your letter reserving the rooms was so thorough. I was expecting an older, more forbidding sort of person, oh. frankly, ma'am. <laughs> no. As a matter of fact, we're just married, but I... My letter reserving the rooms. Oh, oh, I wrote the letter, my dear, and, and I signed it Mrs. Hubert Schumacher. <laughs> Just a joke. What a cunning old fox you are, Hubert. <laughs> now that I think of it, I... Oh, uh, I almost I forgot. Have... There's a letter for you, Mrs. Schumacher. That's peculiar. I wonder who on oh, earth... Oh, well, we'll soon find out in good time. Come along, darling. Oh, we are keeping the boy waiting. Come oh. Nothing like a cold, brisk shower to put a man to rights. <laughs> Hubert, this letter. Oh, yes, the letter. Oh, uh, dry my hair, will you, darling? Please. It seems to be a bill of some sort from a building contractor in, in Salisbury. Oh, really? Oh, bother. Dry your own hair. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Uh, uh, let's see this bill or whatever it is. It's very puzzling. Hubert, you were a widower, weren't you? I mean, mm. Hermione isn't still alive. Am I? Good heavens, no. <laughs> well, let me read that. Mm-hmm. Dear madame, this is to acknowledge your order to g together with the keys to your house in Launston Place. How a man had no difficulty in finding the place where your husband had begun the excavation in a cellar, but apparently he changed his mind at the last moment and filled it in again. What is it, Hubert? How a man will begin digging tomorrow and, and their job will be completed in ample time for your surprise. Christmas present to your husband. We are happy to be conspirators with you in this thoughtful gesture and hope that Professor Schumacher will be pleased at the results of our work on his devil's garden. Very truly yours, Paul Old Sons Contractors. What does it mean, Hubert? means, means that Hermione was right. I will be back for Christmas. I will be back for Christmas. I will back for Christmas. Back for Christmas. Yes, Hermione. And so closes Back for Christmas. Starring Mr. Peter Lorre, tonight's tale of Suspense.
In just a moment, we shall hear again from Mr. Lorry. But first, just a word that seems appropriate. One of the world's oldest customs is the Christmas toast, and traditionally down through centuries of war and peace, the Christmas toast has been drunk in wine. This year, when the glasses are filled and raised once again, we know that in every home the toast will be to a speedy victory and a speedy return of those we love. And before we set the wine glasses down, let us all resolve to do everything within our power to help make that toast come true. Let us resolve to help supply the weapons of war by buying even more and more war bonds. Let us resolve to face our own inconveniences without complaining. And above all, let us resolve that when this war is at last over, each of us will exert all our effort to see that future Christmases truly express peace on earth, goodwill to men. This thought, together with our very best wishes of the season, is the Roma Wine Company's Christmas message for you, its friends, here in America and throughout the world. This is Peter Lorre. Thank you for listening to our suspense play this evening, and I know you're looking forward to next week's show as I am. It is called uh, Finishing School, and its subtitle might be the famous quotation, The female of the species is more deadly than the male. Don't forget, then, next Thursday, same time, for Margot, Elsa Lanchester, Janet Beecher, and a distinguished all-feminine cast in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Roma Wines present... Suspense. Tonight, Dateline, Lisbon, starring John Hodiak. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live. To your happiness and entertaining guests. To your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant. As Roma Wines bring you... Suspense! This is the man in black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, who tonight from Hollywood bring you a star, the rising new film personality, whose performance you admired in Lifeboat, and whom you will soon be seeing co-starring with Lana Turner in MGM's Marriage is a Private Affair, Mr. John Hodiak. For our suspense play this evening, we ask you to project time into the not-too-distant future, and so with... Dateline Lisbon, and with the performance of John Hodiak as William Baldwin, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Your name? William Baldwin. Occupation? I was a foreign correspondent. At the time, that is, of the murder with which you were charged? Around that time, yes. I see. Now, Mr. Baldwin, would you be good enough to tell the court where you were on October the 5th, 1944? I was in Lisbon, Portugal. Can't you be more specific? Look, when you say I was in Lisbon during the invasion, you've told most of your story right there. You know the place. Yes, we know it. I should say that at one time or another during the course of the war, most of us here had occasion to pass through that port. That was the big way station, all right. The neutral terminal for the boys who worked for the Allies, those lined up with the Axis. You'd see a crowd from the Soviet, anxious to get back to the Eastern Front and the sound of the Internationale. You'd see right behind them, maybe, a delegation of Nazis, glad to be away from any front and sick of the horse whistle song. The lads from London with their briefcases and striped trousers and ruled Britannia very clear in their ears. They were there, too. So were the guys from Warsaw. The clothes getting a little threadbare, but the Polonaise sounding as fresh and strong as it did four years before. And the French, not the Vichyites, 
but the ones who might be at the very next table, the free ones, who never stop hearing La Marseillaise. Brass hats, underground agents, refugees, and heels. That was Lisbon. It was about five or six in the evening when I walked into the lobby of the Hotel de Gama. You know the place, right in the center of town. Anyway, I happened to glance up and I saw this girl standing about midway on that big marble staircase that leads down from the mezzanine. She had a Leica camera up to her face and was drawing a bead on the whole lobby. No, no, pare, senorita. Suddenly, a little fella yelled up to her to stop. And as he did, a fat guy standing at the desk whipped around. He spotted the girl, too. The next second, he was the scaredest-looking character I'd ever seen. He whirled back, away from the camera, but she'd already clicked the shutter. In another second, I got a shock myself. The girl lowered the camera from her face and... Yeah, it had to be her. She came down the staircase, winding up the film in the Leica, then started across the lobby, and I was sure it was Terry. I hadn't seen her since I'd left New York. But you couldn't mistake that stride, not even after all those years. I walked across the lobby, but the little guy, the one who yelled, had a head start. If you say so, senor, but I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. Ah, American! Three thousand pardons, uh, missus. <laughs> <laughs> I simply wish to apologize for my outburst. Clearly, it was... Outburst? I, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, senor, but I don't get it, even in English. It was when you were on the staircase he yelled at you. At me? But what on earth for? I don't think he wanted you to take that picture. Are you serious? Why should... No. Hello, Terry. Bill Baldwin, it must be... Twelve years. I, I didn't mean that. I meant... Since I've even heard about you. I've heard about you, though. You've been doing all right. I've been busy. Terry Moore covers the Verma front. Terry Moore turns candid camera on allied leaders. Terry Moore shoots Parade Magazine Picture of the Week. You've been getting more publicity than Hitler. Mm -hmm. I work for a better concern. Bill, what on earth are you doing here? There's so much... Uh, We're being rude to your little friend. Oh, Oh, excuse me, senor. Uh, You objected to my taking the picture? Oh, no, missus, not at all. Uh, That is the point I wish to clear up. Oh, permit me. I am Don Luis Fernando Sanchez Jesus de la Castellano Cristobar. The third. How do you do? But my friends call me Mosca. I can understand why. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Mrs., I I should very much like to buy that picture. Buy it? Precisely. Well, that won't be necessary. I happen to have a developing outfit upstairs in my room. I'll run you off a copy myself. That's in case you can't wait till you see it in the magazine. The magazine? Uh, This picture you took, will you be published? Oh, yes. Simply a shot to display the, well, the color of the city, the hotel. Oh, I see. Uh... Mrs., uh, this may at first appear to be a somewhat extraordinary request. The fact is, I am a great admirer of your work, oh. and I, I wondered if perhaps... You could have the original, the negative. Uh, well, yes, senor, I did have that in mind. Oh, do not be concerned. I'm quite prepared to go as high as, uh, let us say, uh, $5,000 in cash. Oh. oh, come now. Well, then let us say ten. What is this, a rib? Oh, no, Mrs. It is an offer. $10,000? You know something, senor? You're insane. But I'm not, and I'll take it. Wait a second, Terry. I don't think I'd do that. Uh, Forgive me, but my proposition was the Mrs. Only. Uh, You could uh, put it more plainly. Now, listen. You don't think he wants to pay a silly price like that for just a good view of the lobby? He could get that on one of those penny postcards around here. I don't care what he wants it for. All I know... Yeah, you don't care what he wants it for because you don't even know what's in it. For all you know, you've got the hottest picture of your whole career right in that camera of yours. Uh, Mrs., it is necessary that we complete the trade without any further discussion. Mm, $10,000 in exchange for the negative. Uh, that is correct. If you don't mind, senor, perhaps I had better think it over for a while. Oh, I'm afraid that will not be possible. The offer is good only now. Then, uh, adios, senor. Well, let us trust you are making no mistake. Hasta la vista, Mrs. Uh, buenas noches, senor. Well, was that stupid enough to suit you? Ten thousand dollars right down the drain. How would you like to make fifty? What? I said, how'd you like to make fifty thousand dollars? Hmm? There's another guy around here who'd go for that negative. A fat fellow. He was standing over there by the desk, right in the center of your camera when you clicked the shutter. I never saw I any... I did. And I saw him try to dodge. 
From where I was standing, it looked like a $50,000 dodge, too. Why, you rock. <laughs> you were holding out for a bigger price, a bigger cut for you, I suppose. Do you believe that? Oh, I don't know. After all, I haven't much to go on, have I? Twelve years is a long time. How do I know what you're like now? What you've become? I mentioned the fat man, Terry, because I think that picture's more important than you'll be willing to believe. Bill, listen to me. I want to know what happened to you. Your articles, your pieces about Europe, they just stopped. So did your letters. Well, there's something you've got to understand, Terry. Your pardon, please. Senorita Moore? Yes, I'm Terry Moore. Yes, you are wanted at the front desk, please. Front desk? What for? I do not know, Senorita. If you will follow me. I uh, want me to hold your camera? <laughs> Thanks, but I think I'll feel better taking care of it myself. <laughs> okay, Terry. Hurry back. I'll be right here waiting for you. I'd been standing there about a minute, gentlemen, when I looked up and saw the fat guy. He stepped out of one of the lobby phone booths and headed for the cocktail lounge. I didn't want to lose track of him, so I followed him. Pretty soon out came Terry. She had a funny look on her face. Okay, so you're right, and I hope you're satisfied. What happened? Get a better offer? Yes, my life. Your life? In return for leaving my camera on the third floor fire escape within the next 20 minutes, I shall be permitted to go on living. Otherwise... Uh, no, don't sit down. Who told you all that? I don't know. That's a silly remark. You don't know. The call was waiting for me at the desk. It was somebody on the other end of the telephone. Oh. Excuse me. My friend. You at the table. Stone deaf. And am Tisch dort. Gestatten Sie? Well, how did you learn to speak? Yeah. Yeah, well. Mind if we join you? The I speak kind English. Sound like the voice on the telephone? How can I tell if he doesn't speak English? What did he say? He said he doesn't speak English. Oh. Wait a second. Excuse me, pal, but I'd like you to meet the young lady you talked to on the phone. She, uh... Now, können Sie nicht sehen, dass ich beschäftigt You better speak English. Every time she hears German, she goes to pieces. Creates a terrific scene. You will be good enough to leave me alone. I do not wish your company. Thank you. What about that, Terry? I'm pretty sure that's it. Good. Have a seat. Oh, that's all right. Don't get up here, uh... Uh, I don't believe I caught your name. Look, if you do not leave at once, I shall call the manager. I'll be glad to do it for you. <laughs> you know, my friend, now that I've got a good look at you, I can't help feeling I've seen you before somewhere. Yes. Yes, I was thinking the same thing. Medias Foyland, you are very much mistaken. Oh, not with photographs, I'm not. I've studied too many of them. And that's where I've seen you, in a photograph. Now, uh, let me tell you something. You have never seen me before. That's my advice Except to you. Except that there's something different. The clothes, I think. The white collar. The... Yes. You're the... right, Terry. The civilian clothes. I've got them spotted, too. And not in a photograph. I'm going by a man I've seen a hundred times. At the head of a parade on a dais in a public square. Now, uh, listen. In the back seat of an open touring car with guards on either side. You are a fool. I tell you for a fact, you are a fool. You see, I used to cover Poland for a number of American papers. And you granted me an interview once. Bill, he isn't... The general, no, yes. Uh, general von Klaus, one of the most prolific executioners the Fuhrer ever had. <sighs> what stupid people you must be. Why did you not stop when I advised you? Don't you see? There's nothing I can do now except take the Fräulein's camera and kill the two of you. Now look, I happen to have a gun, too, so you can put that thing away. Anyway, you're not crazy enough to kill us here. No, senor. He is not that crazy. Mosca. You will please put the gun away. But I must... You have... will put the gun out of sight. So, you will now follow me from this room. No. No, I will not leave these people and permit them to... Why do you want to bring everyone to this table? Do you wish a special spotlight for yourself? Oh, no, listen to me. I am the one in danger. I am the one in charge. You will do as I tell you to do. Or you won't get him out of Europe? You see? You see? He knows. All right, all right. Shut the mouth. What are you charging him, Mosca? Every cent he ever stole? <laughs> it's worth it, you know. If the Poles knew this character was here, they'd tear him limb from limb. You talk a great deal, senor. Von Klaus, you will please get up from the chair. You must understand that nothing can be accomplished so long as we are here. 
shall continue our negotiations with these charming people at some other time and place. At the German embassy, let's say? No, no, <laughs> I... How would you like that, Head General? My friends, you first must get to the embassy. <laughs> Again, Mrs. Hasta la vista, and adios, señor. The German embassy, Bill. But he's a Nazi, a big one. That's right, and he's also taking it on a lamb. The final squeeze is about to begin, and the general's deserting his post. The Germans would kill him as soon as the Poles. Yes, that's why he can't afford to have us talk. And Moscow can't afford to lose his feet. Oh, Bill, what'll we do? You heard what he said. He'll be watching every exit for the rest of the night. Good. Meanwhile, we'll go dancing. Dancing? Yep. Across the floor to that door on the other side of the band. And we're going to slip through that door up the service stairs and into your room. My room? That's right. And you're going to develop the general's picture. Tonight for Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you a star, Mr. John Hodiak, whom you have heard in the prologue to Dateline Lisbon by Harold Medford. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Yes, it is true that our own wonderful vineyard country in California produces in Roma wines that discriminating people in many foreign lands esteem as an imported delicacy. Yet you here at home can enjoy these distinguished Roma wines for mere pennies a glassful. Daily with your meals or when entertaining or any time, you can delight yourself and your guests with the wonderful taste that comes from age-old winemaking traditions perfected by modern knowledge. For a treat you are certain to enjoy, place on the table with dinner tomorrow night a cool bottle of hearty, rich red Roma California Burgundy. It doesn't matter what the meal is or what kind of glasses you use to serve Roma. It's good in any glass with any meal. Your family, your guests, will find new pleasure in even the simplest foods... For Roma wine makes any meal a feast at only pennies a glass. Try it yourself tomorrow. Ask your dealer for R-O-M-A, Roma wine. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our sound stage Mr. John Hodiak as William Baldwin a man on trial before a jury of his peers in Dateline, Lisbon. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. You were testifying, Mr. Baldwin, that you and the young lady started up for her room. That's right. The rear way, up the service stairs. I see. Mr. Baldwin, since you've already admitted the murder, are you sure there's a need for such detail? I wanted you to have your record straight. There isn't much more of it, though. Very well. And so you got the girl up to her room, eh? Yes. I remember very clearly. We stepped into her room. I shoved the bolt across the door. She switched on the light. And she went straight for her developing stuff. A tray, an MQ tube, the hypo, the usual paraphernalia, and went to work. I knew what was in her mind. She was going to develop that picture and get out of there as fast as she possibly could. She was scared, I guess. Then while I stood there watching her, she stopped. For about half a minute, stared into space. Bill. What is it, Terry? You haven't said anything about... going home, going back to America. You've been over here so long, I... Yeah. Say, uh, you'll want those lights off when you start to develop that thing, won't you? Yes. Well, give me the signal when you're ready, huh? I I think I'm ready now. Okay. Bill, there's something I've got... What's that? What's what? That noise, then. Oh, I was just trying the door to be sure it was locked. (laughs) A little jumpy, aren't you? I wouldn't be. There's not a soul who can get to you, Terry. So just relax. Uh, You were asking me something. Yes, Bill. What are you doing here? In Lisbon? Yes. I'm waiting... I've been waiting for months. You mean to get home? I can't go back to America, Terry. I'm on the list. I was surprised you didn't know that. Oh, no. Yeah, I've been waiting for a chance to escape. Your hunch is right. 
I stayed over here too long. I lost the feel of my country and the sense of what she was. And when they got around to repatriating the correspondence, I elected to stay behind. I'd been inoculated, Terry. I had the germ. So help me, I went for that spiel about the new order of things. But you could... You don't mean you worked for them. I worked for them. There were a thousand things a guy in my position could help him with. And now that the heat's on, now that the walls are beginning to melt, you're making your getaway. That's right. Before the courts come to session and the sentences are handed out. A traitor. A coward. You and Von Klaus, you're cowards, both of you. You're two of a kind. Yeah, we ought to make fine traveling companions. South America, I imagine. Oh, uh, he and Mosca don't know it yet, but that's how it's going to work. You see, the way I look at it, if Mosca can arrange an escape for Von Klaus, he can certainly arrange one for me. You got the money to pay for it, huh? No, but I've got the picture. Your picture. If that thing's published and if the story gets out, the Senor's Underground Railroad is dead. He'll make a deal for that picture, all right. Let's not worry about that. No, Bill. Surely you understand I'm going to tell this story, every part of it. Oh, I was afraid you'd feel that way. I'll have to make sure you don't. Oh, I see. All right. But you're not going to get this. Terry, get away from that picture. The door. Somebody's opened the door. How about win? The picture. Do you have it? When Klaus. It's safe, General. And put away. You'll find the light switch there by the door, left side. And Mosca. But that door was locked. How did you open it? We didn't, Mrs. We opened this door. The closet. Then you were there all the time. You were listening. Uh, we were there when you entered the room. And you've already heard my proposition. What do you say, Mosca? Is it a deal? But of course, senor. Of course. And now, if you will turn over the photograph. <laughs> yes, senor? You get the photograph when I'm on my way with Von Klaus with the right kind of passport and tickets. Well, incidentally, how soon can you get me those? I'm in something of a rush. Uh... I understand, senor. Uh, would tomorrow... Let's I'd... say tonight, in about 30 minutes, in the lobby. Look, why the hesitation? It's very simple. I've got the photograph and I've got a gun. What'll it be? You, uh, must know the answer, senor. It is a deal. Okay. You can leave now. I've got some work to do. Very well. It shall be as you say, senor. 30 minutes from now, in the lobby. Von Klaus? Uh, there is just one thing unsettled. Yes? The Fräulein. Now, for the sake of security of all, I must insist she be silenced at once. You don't have to insist. I'm taking care of it myself. Now, you understand, Herr Baldwin. In my present situation, I must be very sure of things. Yeah, sure. Meanwhile, I told you to clear out of here. Not till the Fräulein is silent. Don't be stupid. This isn't a time for that or the place either. We can't... No... Then why did you select this time, senor? And also select this place. Yeah. We heard you only a minute ago, preparing to shoot this girl. No. Then why do you delay her, Baldwin? Why do you not proceed? That gun again? Come on, General, put it away. For what reason? What does it matter whose weapon we use? And, uh, why don't you make me put it away? She has no weapon. Bill. <laughs> he has no weapon. I think you better make sure. Go on, he is covered. Your arms, senor. Hold them away, so. There's nothing there. And now I like to know, Herr Baldwin, how you expected to kill the Fräulein if you did not have a gun. Very simple. He did not expect to kill her. Nothing in that pocket. Then why did he say... He... Why? Huh. Because he heard the noise from the closet and he knew that we were here. You remember the moment, Mrs., he said he was trying the door? He knew we had guessed you would come to this room. He knew we were here to finish you both. He was playing for time. He was bluffing. And about the Nazis, about escaping. Lies, a stupid fable to hold us off. Is that not so, senor? Is not everything I say the truth, huh? You're an awfully little guy to talk so big. Oh, I can't afford to talk big, senor. I am sure now that you have no gun. You are, huh? What's that? What? What is it? What are you doing? Go. Turn the loose of him, uh, Let I'll fire. Go of me. That's it. Oh. Just face Von Klaus. Oh. There. Yeah. You see, right in his hand. There's my gun, senor. Okay, General, go on and fire. No, 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 wait. Go on. And the way I'm lined up now, your bullet will go straight through Mosca first. Stop moving, Mosca. He will seize the gun. He will... Oh, no. Oh. Uh, now listen to me. 
Listen, I'll say to you now, Baldwin, if you do not release him in exactly five minutes, I shall shoot the Fräulein dead. Go on. Oh. Meanwhile, I'll work on Mosca. It'll take not quite more than five minutes to strangle him. And you'll have plenty of time to fire. Oh. But the chances are great you'll hit him. Are you and he's your only means of escape. Change your hands from his throat. Your one single lifeline, von Klaus. Oh, buddy. He's the only guy who knows the ropes and his time is running out. Now, wait, wait, listen. We can make some arrangement. All right. All right, von Klaus, put your gun on the table. We'll go on from there. No, it's gun, no. Your no, life's I... going fast, von Klaus. The one man who can save your neck's getting pretty limp. Put your gun on the table. Whatever else you listen. Marnie, what is it? Your prize. How much? Oh, my God, stop. There. It's on the table now. Let him go, Baldwin. Please let him go. Terry, the gun. Yes. Here, Bill. Here it is. Thanks. Uh... He'll be okay in a minute. But the gun, what are you? Never mind that. Just tell me your full name. I, uh, I, I do not understand what... Answer the question. What's your full name? Maximilian Reinhardt von Klaus. Occupation? Uh, what do you know? Occupation, I said. What's your occupation? I, uh, am, uh, I was a divisional commander of police for the district of Warsaw in Poland. At the time, that is, of the slaughter. The, uh, slaughter? The mass executions of May 9th in the year 1940. When your men at your order went into the homes of those who weren't cooperative enough and machine gunned the women and children. What, 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 what is this? You're standing trial for murder. Standing trial for... You are mad! There can be no trial, there's no judge. I'm no... the judge, von Klaus, and those two the jury, Terry Moore and Mosca. But uh, our arrangements, you said, I, if I put the gun on I'd the table... I'd turn loose of your little pal. Well, I did. That was our only arrangement. And now I want to know how you plead, guilty or not guilty, for the execution of those families. Those families? How, how would I know those families? You wouldn't know, but I would. That's been my business all these years, gathering the names of victims... Keeping records on murderers like you. Baldwin, wait, wait, give me a chance. A chance? Those Poles didn't even have a trial. You had them shot in cold blood without even passing sentence. But you're getting all of that, von Klaus. You're really getting the works. But you must understand those measures are... Look, I will show you. It's a, it's a matter of administration. Did you or did you not have those people killed? I'm trying to explain to you it was military expediency, the entire procedure. It's, it's part of the war. It had to be done, I'll tell you. In that. other words, you did. Yes, but the... That's all I wanted to hear. Your verdict, Terry, what is it? Uh, 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 I say the uh, man is uh, uh, guilty. Moscow's not able to vote right now, so I'll have to do it for no. him. And I say you're guilty, von Klaus. So for the crime of multiple murder, I sentence you to death. No. And may no, God have please. mercy on your soul. No. Gentlemen of the jury, the commission of murder has been very plainly established. So in the case of the world democracies versus the defendant William Baldwin, what will your verdict be? Your Honor, we find the defendant guilty. And direct that he be freed at once to receive the court's commendation. Thank you, gentlemen. In view of the somewhat irregular circumstances, we see no reason to dissent. There is, however, a question. We know, of course, that this Moscow has been in prison since the collapse of the Axis powers. But that picture, Mr. Baldwin, Terry Moore's photograph of von Klaus, whatever became of that? Oh, <laughs> well, uh, ever since we've been married, it's the one thing I don't dare mention. She's pretty touchy about it. Yes, but you did develop it finally. Oh, sure, and it was... Uh... <laughs> Well, sir, the thing was just a blur. And so closes Dateline Lisbon, starring John Hodiak. Tonight's study in... Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. If you are one who does not yet know how much and how delightfully Roma wines can add to your meals, well, let me urge you not to miss out any longer on such a treat as this. 
There's nothing complicated about it. Just get and serve Roma wine with meals or any time in any kind of glass you wish. Try the many different kinds of Roma wine until you find those you like best of all. Try Roma California Sherry with its wonderful nut-like flavor as an appetizer. Then, hearty Roma Burgundy or the deliciously delicate Roma Sauterne with the meal. These superb wines make even the simplest meal a feast. Yet, they cost you only pennies a glassful. Get some tomorrow. And if your dealer is temporarily out of Roma, please try again soon. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. Our government wishes us to pass along to you an important reminder. Winter is just around the corner, a winter in which every kind of fuel for home heating will be extremely scarce. It is to your essential interest to ensure fuel savings right now. Arrange for your fuel supply immediately. Check all your heating equipment now. If possible, protect yourself against loss of heat by seeing to proper insulation, storm sash, and weather stripping. If you don't prepare now for heavier weather, you may be in for a cold, uncomfortable winter. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Mr. Reginald Gardiner as star of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Roma Wines present... Suspense! This evening, The Dead of the Night, starring Robert Cummings. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you... Suspense! This is the man in black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California who tonight from Hollywood bring you in his first appearance in a radio drama since his enlistment as United States Army Air Force flight instructor, one of the screen's favorite young players, Mr. Robert Cummings. And so with the strange events which befell the young Californian named Jimmy Barton in The Dead of the Night, and with the performance of Robert Cummings, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Helen and I had never been apart since our folks died. Never before that summer when I got a job up at Lake Arrowhead. She was supposed to go with me, wait on tables or something. It was to be our vacation. But at the last minute, she decided to stay in L.A. She figured her boyfriend, Steve, might be coming home on a furlough. I should have known better. My sister was such a kid. But I let her talk me into it. And I left her there alone. That was the beginning of the whole thing. That's when she met him. Phil Armstrong. If I hadn't gone away that summer, I guess Phil would be alive today. All during the time that I was gone, Helen didn't write much, and what letters I did get didn't seem natural. So I was anxious to finish my job and get home. I expected her to be at the bus station, but she wasn't. And when I got to the apartment, I could hear someone moving inside. 
The door was locked, so I knocked. Ellen? Who is it? It's me. Jimmy? Yeah, open the door. Oh, Jimmy. Just a minute. <laughs> Hi, honey. Since when have you taken to locking the door in the date? Helen, what did you do to yourself, your face? Were you in an accident? I, I fell, Jimmy. I fell and I hurt myself. Well, your eyes swollen shut. Let me look at it. Jimmy, I have something to tell you. So, what, what, what are these suitcases doing here? You and I are going away, Jimmy. We've got to get out of here. I, I, I packed everything. We're going no place till you tell me what this is all about. Well, Jimmy, while you were gone, I got married. Married? You mean Steve was here on his furlough? No, Jimmy. Not to Steve. Not... But you were engaged to him. Yes, I know. I got a letter from him right after you left. He married someone he met where he was stationed. Oh, Helen. Gee, I... I was pretty upset, Jimmy, and, and that's when I met Phil Armstrong. Oh, but gee, I think you might have... I don't even know the guy. No, neither did I. I was unhappy. Well, you just don't go off and marry someone you don't know. Well, that's what I did, Jimmy. Now we've got to get out of here. Huh? Well, but why? Because there's been trouble. What kind of trouble? I'm afraid, Jimmy. It's terrible. He, he takes something. I don't know what. But sometimes he's... He's crazy. Helen. Yes? Your face. You didn't fall. No. He did that. I'll... I'll kill him. He'll kill you. That's what I mean. That's why we've got to get away. Oh, well, you can get a divorce, can't you? He threatened me if I even tried to get one. Who will put him under a peace bond. We'll... Well, what good would a peace bond be, Jimmy, if he killed one of us? So I let her talk me into running away. I guess I shouldn't have, but I knew that if I saw him after what he'd done to her... Well, anyhow, I saved my salary and I had some gas coupons. We didn't know where we were going, but we started out. I don't know what he'll do when he finds I've gone. Helen, don't you think we ought to go to the police? Oh, I'm afraid, Jimmy. I know him. I know what he'd do if he found out we'd reported him. But they'd protect us, Helen. They'd protect us. But what if he got to us before they got to him? And she looked so frightened, I thought it best to let her do it her way. We got to Santa Monica that night, and we stopped at a motel near the water. Well, a week slipped by, and Helen seemed to be forgetting. She didn't jump every time someone knocked at the door, and she began to get a nice tan. I managed to get a job. It was at McGuffey's Potluck Gallery at one of the shooting concessions on the pier. Then one night late, as I came home from work, I heard voices coming from our apartment. I knew who it was, and I knew that from what Helen had told me, it would be foolish for me to go in unarmed. So I ran back to the shooting concession. It didn't take long, but when I got back, the lights were out. And the sound of voices was gone. I, I tried the door. It was very dark. And then I my foot struck something soft and heavy on the floor. I snapped on the switch, and the room was flooded with light. And I looked down into a dead man's face. <laughs> Tonight for Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you a star, Mr. Robert Cummings, whom you've heard in the prologue to The Dead of the Night by Mel Dinelli. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Yes, it is true that our own wonderful vineyard country in California produces in Roma... Wines that discriminating people in many foreign lands esteem as an imported delicacy. Yet you here at home can enjoy these distinguished Roma wines for mere pennies a glassful. Daily with your meals or when entertaining or any time, you can delight yourself and your guests with a wonderful taste that comes from age-old winemaking traditions perfected by modern knowledge. For a treat you are certain to enjoy, place on the table with dinner tomorrow night. A cool bottle of hearty, rich red Roma California Burgundy. It doesn't matter what the meal is or what kind of glasses you use to serve Roma. It's good in any glass with any meal. Your family, your guests, will find new pleasure in even the simplest foods. For Roma wine makes any meal a feast at only pennies a glass. Try it yourself tomorrow. Ask your dealer for R-O-M-A, Roma wine. 
remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Robert Cummings, who, as young Jimmy Barton, resumes his narrative concerning the death of a brother-in-law in the dead of the night, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. It's funny how in the biggest, the most important, the most terrifying moments of your whole life, you remember little tiny insignificant things. I remember that I set my alarm. It was to go off at five o'clock. I'd set it to wake me up that afternoon. And a bird started to chatter outside as I stood there shivering with cold and terror, looking down at that dead man's face. Although I'd never seen him alive, I knew this was Phil, her husband. There was a deep gash over his eye, and the blood still flowed from it onto the floor. I stepped over him, and I ran into the bedroom. Helen! Helen! But there was no one in the bedroom, nor in the kitchen. And then I heard the front door open. Jimmy! Close that door, Helen. Oh, Jimmy! Close it, do you hear me? Be quiet. Turn the lights out. Be quiet, I tell you. Oh, Jimmy, what have I let you in for? Stay where you are. Don't move, Helen. Who is it? I don't know. Keep quiet. Jimmy! Oh, Jimmy! It's Mrs. Gordon. Is she... She's going to unlock the door. Oh, uh, just a minute, Mrs. Gordon. I'm, uh, I'll get something on. Jimmy, what's going on in there? All the tents fit for cleaning. You, uh, just some friends of mine, Mrs. Gordon. They were they were having a party. Uh, they're, they're gone now. Jimmy Barton, you should be ashamed of yourself. Now open this door. I want to talk to you. Well, I, I'm not dressed. I, I was uh, taking a shower. Well, slip something on. Well, I, I'm tired. I, I, I just was going to bed. Jimmy, I told you I wanted to talk to you. Now will you open this door? She has a pass key, Jimmy. All right. All right, Mrs. Gordon. Uh, just let me get some clothes on. I'll give you two minutes. I didn't know what to do. I knew she was determined to come in. Mrs. Gordon was a nosy old woman. She meant well. She'd taken it upon herself to mother Helen and me. She was always coming into the apartment with her pots of jam and her bowls of soup. I knew no matter what I said, nothing would stop her. What do we do, Jimmy? We got about a minute left. Helen. Take him by the feet. Oh, no. Helen, take him by the feet. It's no use. It's no use. We started half dragging, half carrying him towards the bedroom. The rugs slipping along the floor as we moved. We, we'd just gotten into the bedroom, and then... Time's up, Jimmy. And as long as your good mother isn't here to look after you, I'm going to myself. We can't leave him here. She might come into the bedroom. Quick, the bathroom. Jimmy, where are you? What if she comes in here? Pull back those shower curtains. Oh, Jimmy, we can't. Don't argue. Pull them back. Jimmy, I, I, I can't get his legs in. Shh. Here, I'll, I'll double them up. There. Pull the curtains together, quick. Jimmy, what's been going on in here? Why, look at my rugs. Has there been a fire? Uh, ju just a minute, Mrs. Gordon. Jimmy, what's on this floor? And on this gas heater? Is this floor? Jimmy, Jimmy. Get me a razor out of the medicine chest. Here. What are you going to do? Never mind. You stay here. I'm coming, Mrs. Gordon. Well, just as I suspected. You've been frightened. And you've hurt yourself. Now let me see your hand. Oh, it, it isn't bad, Mrs. Gordon. Oh, no wonder you didn't want me to come in. Where's Helen? Uh, she, she's out. Uh, she, she hasn't been here all evening. Well, let's look at that hand. Oh, it isn't bad, Mrs. Gordon, really. You let me see that hand. Oh, there. Why, Jimmy, this is a bad gash. Have you disinfected it? Yes, yes, I have. Well, let me bandage it for oh, you. But this, this towel's all right. It's not all right. Where are your bandages and things? In the bathroom? No, no. I, I mean, I, I don't have any. Now, you're just saying that, Jimmy Barton, because you don't want to be bandaged. You're not fooling me. I'm going right into the bathroom and get No, some... not the bath. <laughs> I mean, I, mean, I don't, don't have any. Well, I'll just see for myself. No, no, Mrs. Gordon... Jimmy, why, you drip blood all over this floor. Here, let's look in this medicine closet. Uh-huh, there, I knew it. Here's some tape and some gauze, too. Mrs. Gordon, can't, can't we j just do this in the living room? Uh... No, we'll do it right here. Now, here's some alcohol. Come on, put your hand over here. We, 
We stood there, and she bandaged me, and I kept wondering where Helen had gone. And then I saw the shower curtain move slightly, and I knew. For a moment, I thought Mrs. Gordon had seen it, too. Jimmy! Just look at that shower curtain. Y- yes. Goodness, you smid that with blood, too. Well, I'd better clean things up for you before Helen gets home. Why, you'll scare the life out well, of her. I'll it. clean it up, Mrs. Gordon. You've done enough. Thanks very much for taking care of this hand. Well, all right. If you don't want me to. Now, you'd better get some sleep. I'll see you in the morning. Good night, Jimmy. <laughs> Good night, Mrs. Gordon. Oh, Jimmy. Helen. I had to hide something. It was terrible. I, I know. It was the only thing it could do. Jimmy! Yes? Jimmy, I forgot to tell you that I'm having some painting done tomorrow. So you'll have to be out of here early. It's hard enough getting painters these days without making them wait for the tenants to get up, you know. Yeah, uh, all right, Mrs. Gordon. I'll, I'll be out first thing in the morning. Mm-hmm. Well, good night. Good night. I would have to get him out of here. Yeah. Where will we take him? I don't know. I've got to think. Here, Helen, you try and get some rest. Jimmy, let me go to the police. Let me tell them that... that... I did it. Let me tell them what he was. They won't do anything to me. No, no. You try and rest. What time is it? About six. Six. We've got two hours before the painters get here. What are we going to do, Jimmy? Let's see. There's a car. No one will see us if we take him through the service porch into the garage. Then what? I don't know, but that'll get him out of here anyway. I think I can do it alone, Helen. Listen, Jimmy, we're in this mess because of me. I'm going to help you. I'll be ready in a minute. When I went into the bathroom, the shower curtains were standing open. His legs had slipped from their cramped position and they'd pushed themselves into the room. He sat there with his head twisted down and his chin digging into his chest. I took a washcloth and I... It was awful. I wiped the blood off his face, just in case anyone saw us. They might think he was just sick. I tried to lift him, but I slipped. And his head made a hollow sound as it thumped down on the shower floor. Helen, help me get him into the luggage compartment of the car. Where are we going, Jimmy? Helen, won't you please stay in the apartment, please? No, no, I couldn't. I'm going with you. Helen, haven't you done enough? I'm going with you. Too late now to wish that I hadn't... Where we go? To the pier, the Santa Monica Pier. Beyond the concessions, you can drive a car on the end there. Lucky it's so foggy. Yeah. What time is it? Uh, uh, five of seven. We'll have to act fast. This fog will be clearing soon. It'll be harder to get him out of this car. Now... You stay here. I can manage this alone this time. Oh, I'll help you, Jimmy. You stay here, do you hear me? All right, call me if you need me. I'll go around the back. Keep your eyes open. Yeah. Jimmy. What? Someone's coming. Who is it? I can't see. Jimmy, it's a policeman. What? It's a policeman. Jimmy. Oh, it's all right. I know him. It's Red Davis. He's the beach patrolman. uh, Hello, Red. Ah. When do you get your sleep? Didn't you close up after that swing ship dance last night? <laughs> yeah, Red, but I couldn't seem to remember if I'd locked up the old shooting gallery, so I came over this morning to have a look around. <laughs> I see. Oh, I'm sorry. This is my sister. Uh, Red, this is... Uh, Helen, this is Red Davis. How do you do? Hello. So you're an early riser, too, huh? Yes, I... Well, the fog's clearing up. It looks like we're going to get some sun today for a change, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess I'll be getting back. I think I'll try and catch a few more hours sleep. Well, so long. Yeah, so long. Oh, oh say, say, Jimmy. Yeah? Say, Jimmy, uh, I have to take my wife over to the nursery today to pick up some plants and stuff, you know, and I don't have a trunk on my car. I wonder if you'd let me have yours. Oh, I, uh, well, you have I... to drive me over to Malibu this afternoon, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah, I'd for- forgotten. I've well, got... you can drive her over in my car. How's that? Well, you see... <laughs> that brother of yours thinks I'll wreck that beautiful car. <laughs> is. Oh, it isn't that, Red. <laughs> okay, then I'll be over about noon, and I'll leave my car for you till I get back, huh? Well, I won't be home at noon, Red. I'm... All right, I'll meet you at the entrance to the pier. How's that? Oh, all right, Red. Well... So long. Yeah. So long. Why'd you say you'd meet him, Jimmy? 
If I didn't, he'll go over to the apartment looking for us. And you don't want any policemen over there, do you? Oh. Oh, no. No, of course not. We've got to get out of here fast. As we drove along the ocean, the fog cleared up rapidly. It was almost 8 o'clock and some kids were already out on the beach playing around. Then I saw a group of early picnickers. They were unloading their blankets, umbrellas and things. I guess it was from them I got the idea. From seeing them. Jimmy, your gas is pretty near on empty. Yeah. You got any more coupons? No, they're all used up. We're going to have to do something soon. I know, Jimmy. We can't go back to the motel with the painters there. And we can't leave him in the car. Red's liable to see us and pin us down to using it. There's only one place left. Where, Jimmy? Helen, listen. I'm going to let you out of this car. Oh. You can't help me with what I've got to do now. No, Jimmy, I'm staying. Don't here. argue, Helen. I'm not leaving you, Jimmy. Get out of this car, do you hear me? No. I haven't time Jimmy. to argue with you. Please. Now get I, out. I won't do it, Jimmy. Yes, I... you will if I have to push you out. Jimmy, you're hurting me. There. Now go back to the motel. Get off that running board, Helen. I can't leave you alone, Jimmy. I want to help I'm you. I'm not blaming you for killing him, Helen, but now you've got to help me do as I say. What, Jimmy, what? I don't blame you for what you did. He deserved it. But now you've got to help me handle things. Jimmy, you've got to let me... Goodbye, go. Helen. Jimmy! Oh, Jimmy, don't leave me! Jimmy! I watched her out of the mirror. She kept calling me. I drove on as fast as I could. I knew what I had to do when I was one chance in a million. But I had to take it. And I didn't want her to be part of it. I could keep him on the beach that whole day. Then maybe I'd be able to get rid of him when night fell. I wanted to drive further along, but I was afraid I'd run out of gas. So, I settled for a deserted strip of beach not far from the motel. I had my swimming shorts and a blanket and a towel in the car. And I got out. I looked around carefully. And then I opened the luggage compartment. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. But I... I started taking his clothes off. I managed to get my shorts onto him. Lucky we were pretty near the same size. And then I... And I closed the door. And I went out onto the beach and I spread my blanket out on the sand. And then I went back... Went back for him. When there were no cars in sight, I, I carried him over where I'd spread my blanket. And I placed him onto it, face down, with his hands folded over his head, as though he were just sunbathing. Then I... I spread my towel out a short distance from him, and I, I laid down on it. And I, I tried to look relaxed. People didn't start to arrive until about, about an hour later. And gradually, little groups of sunbathers started to form. He and I, we looked no different from the others. No one paid any attention to us. I was beginning to feel that everything was going to be easy once it was dark again. But... Jimmy! I've been looking all over for you. What? I... Oh, hello, Mrs. Gordon. Where's Helen? Isn't she in the apartment? No. What time did you go out this morning? Uh, I, I couldn't sleep. Oh, and... Didn't Helen come in at all last night? Oh, yes, yes, she did, but she, she left early, too. Said she was going into Los Angeles. Oh, my. I was so worried about her. Well, the painters came, Jimmy, and everything's a mess. I think I'll sit down here with you a while. Huh. You're not with anyone, are you? No. No, I'm not. Goodness, I wish I'd brought along some oil. Looks like it's going to be a hot day. <laughs> you know, these days that start off foggy are very deceiving. Yeah. Yeah, they, they are. <laughs> this is a real treat for me, Jimmy. I never get out on the beach. I think I'll have a nice day of rest for a change. Later we can get some sandwiches. <laughs> the treat's on me. Well, uh, Mrs. Gordon, <laughs> no, I, I hadn't planned on spending the day at the beach. Oh, uh, it'll be good for you, Jimmy. Not healthy for a boy your age to be working all night and sleeping all day. But, Mrs. Gordon, you see, I... Jimmy, uh, do you know that man over there? Which one? Why, that one right there. What? No, I, I, I don't know him. Well, he's lying so still. His back's going to get an awful burn. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you suppose he's asleep? It isn't good to sleep in the sun, you know. Uh, Mrs. Gordon, uh, do you think that the painters will be finished by this afternoon? Huh? Oh, well, uh, well I hope so. My, a person can get an awful burn in a day like this. You know, someone ought to speak to him. Uh, Mrs. Gordon, wouldn't you li like to go for a walk? Oh, I'm not one for walking. You go ahead if you like. Well, I... Come on, Dick, pitch it over here. Oh, those kids. You children, stop that. 
You're getting sand all over me. Oh, sorry, No lady. need to play here. There's a playground over by the pier. Now you just get away from here. Don't pay no attention to her. She don't own the beach. Pitch it over here. Oh, well, coming at you. Uh-oh. You hit that guy on the pizza. There. Now see what they've done. They've hit that poor man. Now they'll get what's coming to them. Uh, Mrs. Gordon, sure you don't want to go up and get some sandwiches or something? I I'll just stay Not here and... until I see those two hoodlums get what they deserve. Shh. Why, oh, gee, I'm sorry, mister. Could we have her ball? Now, look at that. Ball's right in the crook of his arm. He's pretending he's asleep. He's not going to hand it to them, but just wait till they reach for it. <laughs> He'll give them something besides their ball, all right. Oh, what are you waiting for, Dickie? It's our ball. Just take it. Oh, hey, mister, uh, could we have... Go on, take it. Here, I'll get it. Thanks, mister. <laughs> I got... What's the matter? Gee, he's cold. What'd you say? He's cold, lady. His arm's like ice. I just touched it. You probably hurt him. A little ball like this couldn't hurt anybody. Well, nevertheless, it did. Here. Now, let's have a look. And then she started moving toward him. I knew it was useless to try and stop her. And then she reached over and put her hand on his back. And suddenly she was screaming. Oh, oh, Jimmy! He needed it! This is dead! Dead, no, dead. Before long, there was a crowd of people around us, and someone called the police. I wanted to run, but I knew that would be the wrong thing to do, so I just stayed there, numb-like, watching things. When the police came, they started questioning everybody. Mrs. Gordon was first. Why, why, he'd been, he'd been there all morning. I came early, and he was here already, just like that, you know, with his face down, just like he was... Was there somewhere. anyone else around when you arrived? Around? Yes, Jimmy was here. He was here all alone with him. Uh, weren't you, Jimmy? Y yes, yes, I, I was. Yes, you see, he was. Doesn't uh, uh, anyone know this man? Do you know him? I told you kids to keep away from here now. Did you hear me? We discovered him, didn't we? If it hadn't been for us. Yeah, uh, and you don't even know a clue when you see one. Look at his fingernails. What's huh? that? Oh, the child's right, officer. What's that? Now, just look for yourself. Let me see that. Yes. Uh, it looks like powder, something flaky. Are you, uh, you sure none of you people around here recognize him? Recognize him? Well, I I've never seen him. Uh, oh! Officer! Huh? Why, that blanket he's lying on. Why, it's from my motel. See, it's stamped right under where you moved his hand. Oh! Oh, dear. Look for yourself. See? It says, Seaside Motor Captain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And the, you're sure he wasn't registered? Why, well, I'm positive. Is there anyone else around here from your hotel? From your <gasps> motel? Jimmy, look. Jimmy! Here comes Helen. Look, she's crying. Mrs. Gordon, I ask if there was anybody around here from your motel. Huh? What's that? Oh, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, Jimmy Barton here. And that girl. You see, she's his sister. They've been with us for several weeks. Jimmy? Yes. What have you got to say, Jimmy? And suddenly everyone was looking at me. And at Helen as she ran towards us. And like a fool, I started to run too. In Helen's direction to ward her off. I didn't get far, however. Someone caught me by the arm. Jimmy! Jimmy, I've been looking all over for you. Don't say anything, Helen. Let me do the talking. Don't say anything. But Jimmy, when you forced me out of the car this morning, you said you didn't blame me for having killed Helen, him. Helen, be still. Don't. Jimmy, I didn't kill him. I thought you had. I was helping you get rid of him because I thought you'd done it. I'm sorry, kid. Helen. Helen, are, are you telling the truth? I swear it, Jimmy. Phil and I were quarreling. He'd been taking something again. He was like crazy. And this guy, Phil? And I knew there'd be trouble when you came home from work. So I got out the back way and I went looking for you on the pier. When I couldn't find you, I went back to the motel and, and I, I found him on the floor. I thought you... But, Helen, why didn't you say so? You didn't give me a chance, Jimmy. You just took it for granted that I did well, it. Who, who did kill him, Helen? That's what I'm trying to tell you. Nobody killed him. What are you talking about? I went to the motel a while ago to wait for you. While I was there, I remembered about Phil last night. How strangely he'd acted, and how he hadn't been able to walk straight, and how he'd almost fallen several times while we were quarreling. And, and, and then I saw the gas heater, Jimmy. There was a sharp edge on the top of it with, with blood on it. He must have fallen. He must have. Oh, but, Helen, we've no way of proving but that. There was something else, Jimmy. Yeah, what? The wall above the heater was scratched, as though someone had clutched at it to save himself from falling. There might be fingerprints. There might be. Oh, no, that's no... Wait a minute. Plaster! Plaster! Hey, Red! That flaky stuff you found under his fingernails. 
That might have been plaster. And it was. Well, that's about it. Everything checked back at the motel and the autopsy showed he was full of dope. But I guess it was really Mrs. Gordon who saved our necks for us. Besides talking so loud and so long that they'd probably acquitted us just to get rid of us, she did dig up a witness who'd heard Helen and Phil quarreling and who'd seen Helen leave alone after he threatened her. Well, everything's all right now. Helen and I are beginning to forget. But it's, uh, it's Mrs. Gordon who's making quite a nuisance of herself on the beach these days as she goes along poking all the sunbathers and asking if they're, they're sure they're all right. <laughs> And so closes The Dead of the Night, starring Robert Cummings. Tonight's study in... Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. If you are one who does not yet know how much and how delightfully Roma wines can add to your meals, well, let me urge you not to miss out any longer on such a treat as this. There's nothing complicated about it. Just get and serve Roma wine with meals or any time in any kind of glass you wish. Try the many different kinds of Roma wine until you find those you like best of all. Try Roma California Sherry with its wonderful nut-like flavor as an appetizer. Then hearty Roma Burgundy or the deliciously delicate Roma Sauterne with the meal. These superb wines make even the simplest meal a feast. Yet they cost you only pennies a glassful. Get some tomorrow. And if your dealer is temporarily out of Roma, please try again soon. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Mr. Charles Lawton as star of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Presents Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you a star, Mr. Gene Kelly, in a suspense play that tells of fear and suspicion and dangerous adventure on the long highway from California to New York. And so with Death Went Along for the Ride and with the performance of Gene Kelly as a man named George Javery, we again hope to keep you in Suspense. Brown to 314? Yes, sir. Uh, I want a room. The name, sir? George Javery, but uh, I haven't got a reservation. Oh? Well, I think we can fix you up, Mr. Javery, if you'll sign, please. Uh, sure. <coughs> Excuse me, friend. Yes? I couldn't help hearing your name, Javery, hmm? Well, that's right. In the relation to Frank Javery of Cincinnati? Well, mm. not that I know of. Oh. <laughs> kind of a funny name. No offense, you understand, but I just thought, you know. Sure, I, I know. Been doing quite a lot of traveling, haven't you, Mr. Javery? Huh? <clears throat> I see all them stickers on your bags. Oh, oh, yes, I've been out of the country. Room 610, 450 a day. Will that be all right, Mr. Javery? Sure. <laughs> you, uh, gonna stay in Reno very long? I'm just overnight. Going east? Uh huh. You uh, driving? Yeah. Say, what do you want to know? Uh, thought I'd tip you off to a good place to eat, see? <clears throat> you uh, like steaks? <laughs> when I can get them. Better stop at Harry's place, then. Best steaks between here and Chicago. 
Here's the address. I wrote it down for another fellow this morning, but he left before I could give it to him. Oh, well, well, thanks. You, uh, driving back east alone? Yes. Say, uh, what did you say your name was? <laughs> I didn't, but it's Brown. Steve Brown. Well, look, Mr. Brown, if you want a free ride east, why don't oh, you just... Hey, no, no, no. I'm heading up to Portland, see? Oh, well, well, have a good trip, Mr. Brown. Same to you, Mr. Jaffer. Thanks. Don't forget to stop at Harry's place, Mr. Jaffer. I think you'll find it a very interesting spot. Very interesting. Jabry. What is it? Did you notice a fellow with only one arm? Oh, no, where? I didn't think you did. He said he was a friend of yours. But don't have nothing to do with him, Mr. Jabry. He's no friend of yours. He's no friend of anybody. Don't have nothing to do with him. Oh, here's your drink, Mr. Jabry. Thanks. Oh, did your friend find you, Mr. Jabry? What friend? A uh, one-armed fellow. He was looking for you. He said I should keep my eye out for you. A one-armed fr- uh, one man, Mr. Javery? Why, no, there's no guest at the hotel that answers that description. I tell you, I seen him coming out of your room, Mr. Javery. I don't know how he got in there, but I seen him coming out. You heard me, I'm checking out. If there's anything wrong... Oh, no, there's nothing wrong. I'm just checking out, that's all. But at three o'clock in the morning... Look, I, I said I'm checking out. Now, now, please get my bags out to the car. <laughs> Just put him in the back of the car. Yes, sir. Now, look, kid, for the last time, do you know? I don't know nothing, Mr. Jeffrey, honest. I don't know nothing. Okay, okay, here. Gee, th- look, here he comes now. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Thanks, Mr. Jeffrey. You, uh, going east, mister? Oh. Oh, it's you, huh? Say, what's the big idea? What big idea? Now, listen to me, my one-armed friend. I can't help having one arm, mister. All right, all right. But what's the idea of following me around? You've been following me ever since I got here. Oh, but I'm sorry about that, mister. So am I. Now, what about it? Well, you see, I'm kind of down on my luck, so I'm hitchhiking. I got to get east, and I heard you were going east, so... Oh. You are going east, ain't you, mister? Well, yes. Yes, I am. Do you mind if I come along a piece? Oh, all right, hop in. Say, uh, there's one thing you haven't explained to me yet. Uh, what's that? What were you doing in my room? Hitchhiking? I was never in your room. The bellboy said he saw you come out. I don't know what he said, but I was never in your room. Oh. Well, it's kind of late to start driving, I guess. I don't mind. I am used to night work. Oh. Say, uh, I don't think I got your name. Jones. One arm Jones, they call me mostly. You traveling far, Mr. Jones? Uh, as far as St. Louis. Uh huh. Have you been in San Francisco lately? No. No, I came by way of San Diego. Why do you ask, Mr. Javery? Oh, nothing. I thought I might have seen it. Uh, what's the matter? How did you know my name? Your name? <laughs> That's an old hitchhiker's gag. Hang around a hotel lobby and find out who's who and maybe where's heading, see? Yeah. See, there doesn't seem to be much traffic tonight, does there? No. Are you looking for something? Oh, just reaching for a cigar. Get your hand out of your pocket. I, I was... Get only... it out, I said. You don't have to pull a gun no. out. No. All right, Mr. Jones. Come on, let's have it. What's your game? Game? Yeah, your game. Come on, spill it. I don't get it. Neither do I. I suppose you haven't been tailing me ever since I checked into that hotel. Well, I I explained about the hitch. Get out. Out of the car? You heard me. Okay. But, Mr. Javer... What? Don't be too surprised if you see me again sometime. Good night, Mr. Javery. <laughs> Tonight for Suspense, Roma Wines bring you a star, Mr. Gene Kelly, whom you have heard in the prologue to Death Went Along for the Ride by Henry Denker and Ralph Berkey. Tonight's adventure in Suspense. In this brief intermission in the play, let's imagine we're listening to a conversation taking place at the smart Coral Beach and Tennis Club in Bermuda. 
An American about to depart for the States thanks his Bermudian friend for the gracious hospitality shown him, and in particular for the especially enjoyable wine his friend served. He remarks how much he'd like to be able to get some of that same wine at home. The Bermudian chuckles as he says, but my friend, that wine you enjoyed so much, it comes from the great wine districts of your own California. It is Roma wine. Yes, friends, many Americans are still not aware that Roma wines are so highly rated in many foreign lands that they are imported to be enjoyed as rare luxuries. But here in America, we can still enjoy these superb Roma wines as a daily pleasure, well within reach of the most modest purse, with no high import duty, no expensive shipping costs included. That's why Roma wines cost you so little. Have you been overlooking the enjoyment these richly satisfying Roma wines offer? As a delectable beverage at any time? As the addition that can make any meal an occasion? As a sure-to-be appreciated offering to your guests when you entertain? You get some idea of the great worth of these fine Roma wines when you learn Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. I'll spell the name for you. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage our star, Gene Kelly, as George Javery, in Death Went Along for the Ride, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. All right, put him up. Come on, get him up and step out in front of those headlights where I can see you. Come on, before I let you... Shoot, mister. Well, I'll... What do you want? Not to get shot right now. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I... Kind of jumpy, aren't you? Yeah, maybe. Uh, were you going into this joint here? Well, I was. <laughs> well, come on, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. <laughs> I think I earned it at that. Well, howdy, folks. Good to see somebody out kind of late, eh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, black coffee, huh? How about you? The same, I guess. Look, uh, I'm sorry I frightened you. Say, what's your name? Eileen. Eileen Harrison. What's yours? George Javery. Say, uh, what are you doing walking along a million miles from no place at this time of night? <laughs> I started driving east in the $50 jalopy yesterday like a fool. It just fell apart on me. I was coming in here to phone or something. Oh, how far east are you going? Greenwich, Connecticut. I'm going to New York myself. Uh, you're welcome. I mean, if... Well, I... Oh, oh, look, if you don't like me, you can always get out and start to walk again. What have you got to lose? <laughs> well, all right. Thanks. And I could use a little company right now. Here you are. Piece of pie? Piece of pie, bud? Huh? Oh, oh, no. How about a hamburger? We got good hamburgers, you know. We got... No, no, no. Just be quiet a minute, will you? Be quiet? Yeah. What's the matter? Shh. Shut up, another two of you. Sure, anything you say. Say, what's the matter with you? I'm listening for something, that's all. What? There he comes. Hey, where are you going? That wasn't it. You know, what's going on, bud? You hot or something? No, there's a car out there. It's been following me for the last 200 miles. Yeah? How'd you know? I know it. I took a side road. He did, too. I tried to duck him, and he hung on. He kept following me. I, I'm sure that... Listen. Listen, that must be it now. No, he, he's not coming in. He's waiting. For what? Me. Look. Look, Eileen, here are the keys to the car. Go out and drive it up the side entrance. I'll be waiting at the door. All right, No, but... no. Go ahead. He won't hurt you. Hurry. Okay. Hey, mister, you ain't in trouble, are you? I don't want no trouble, no, in my keep your shirt on. You'll be all right. Here. Don't you want your change? No, I'll keep it. Hop in. I'll slide over. Thanks. Look back now, baby. Seriously, that other car following us. I don't think so. Say, look, pal, I don't want to be nosy, but... Uh, Eileen, I, I wouldn't kid you. I don't know what it is. Is anyone following us? No, I don't think so. Uh-oh. Oh, uh, lights. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean it's someone following us. No? How fast are we going now? About 60. All right, watch. Hey, please be 
careful. George. I'll be careful. Is he coming? Uh huh. I think he's gaining on us. Yeah, I thought so. Well, we'll see how much this guy wants to play. He had a pretty big car, you know. Yeah, I know. Is he still gaining? He's closing up pretty fast. Oh, I can't stand this much longer, and I'm going to do something about it. What are you going to do? I'm going to pull to one side, slam on the brakes, and see what happens. But, George! I'll force him into the ditch if I have to. It's what he's trying to do to us. Hang on. George! Let's get out of here. He... He must have been killed. Yeah. Did you see him as we hit? Just for a second. You notice anything about him? Not much. Well, I did. He was a man with only one arm. This is that Harry's place that guy told me about. You sure you like steak? Who doesn't? Well, this is the place for you, then. Finest steaks the side of Chicago, they tell me. Come on. A table for two, sir? Uh, yeah, please. Right this way. Well, I like the whole thing to monster this. Right here. Here's a nice table right by the window. That's fine, thanks. And, madame? Thank you. Uh, two steaks, please. Uh, both medium rare. All right? Yes, right. sir. Thank you, sir. George, to get back to our little problem. Our little problem? All right, so it's your problem and I'm stuck with it. Are you sure you don't have any enemies? Well, how could I? I've been out of the country for over a year. I didn't have any when I left. Well, could there be any connection with that work you were doing with the Chinese government? <laughs> oh, not a chance. I, I uh, Well, look, I don't know any secret plans, and I have no agent X-9. And, well, all that's out. Well, maybe it's all just a coincidence. Oh, sure. A one-armed guy tags me all over Reno, and then says he's a poor hitchhiker. Then he acts like he's trying to pull a stick up, and then a hundred miles beyond where I've dropped him, he shows up in a big Cadillac. Just a coincidence. Call for Mr. Javery. George. Telephone for Mr. Javery. Call for George Javery. Yeah. Another coincidence. What do you suppose? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. George, don't. Come on, we'll both go answer it. Uh, are you Mr. Javery? Yeah. Well, that's good. They've been trying to reach you all day. All day? Yes, this is about the tenth call we've had for you. Uh, the phone booth is right this way. One little coincidence after another. Calling me all day at a joint I've never been in before in my life. George, don't answer it. Now, look, you just keep an eye out while I'm in the booth. All right. Uh, oh, <laughs> pardon me. Why, of course. Hello. 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 Can I help you, sir? Why, yes, I had a call on this wire. But... I'm sorry, but your party seems to have disconnected. Did you call them? Uh, no, 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 forget it. What was it, George? Come on, let's go out to the car. Well, what was it? I don't know. Whoever it was, as soon as I answered, they hung up. Come on, come on, there's a guy following us. The guy I bumped into at the phone booth. Oh, that's what that phone call was for. Get in the car, quick. Here he comes. Oh, oh, Mr. Javery. George, he's pointing something. It's a camera. Thanks, Mr. Javery. Hey, what's the idea of taking pictures of me? It's a hobby. I'll send you a print at the morgue. Of old Chicago. Yeah, a little too bright. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, we present direct from 10 weeks run in New York, the world famed sharpshooter, Professor Glittenheimer. <laughs> George, he's good. I saw his act in Hollywood. He's quite a comedian. Well, that's swell. A little comedy had come in handy now. Oh, George, you promised me. Come on, relax. Okay. Oh, <laughs> he shoots with the light bulbs, and whether he hits them or not, they always break. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, blindfolded. <laughs> 
He didn't even aim at it. Sure, that's the point. Later, he's going to shoot straight up and the bulge in the back of him will break. Right, <laughs> and now over my shoulder, the left shoulder. No, no, the right shoulder. That's hard I am. It's funny, isn't it? Yeah. George, your glass, it's shattered. Come on, Eileen, we're leaving. Please, ladies and gentlemen, please. The performance will continue. Keep your seat, please. Oh, please, please wait, sir. Don't leave. I, I'm terribly sorry. Won't you stay and finish your dinner? Uh, please, sir, our, our apologies. A most regrettable accident. Yeah? Only it wasn't. Wasn't? Wasn't an accident. That comic up there shoots blank cartridges. Well, of course, but... Yes, and what broke my glass was a bullet. And it didn't come from the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Good old Bear Mountain Bridge. Well, we're almost there. Yep. With any luck, we ought to be in New York by 10 o'clock. And the way you've been driving, I don't see how anyone could have followed us. Oh, why do you think I was driving that way? Gee, it's a beautiful night. Look at that moon. Yeah. Let's stop a minute. Why? Oh, I don't know. Just to look down at the water. All right. It's been a long time since I've seen the old Hudson River. I guess I'd better turn off the lights. I'm not sure I'm allowed to stop in the middle of the bridge. Come over here by the rail, George. Gosh, isn't it lovely? Yeah, yeah, it really is. Oh, look at that boat down there. It looks, it looks a little. I wonder how far it is down to that water from here. Oh, I guess about 150 feet or so. I'm awfully glad you decided to come this way. Why did you? Oh, it's less traffic and not as many cars as on the George Washington Bridge or the tunnel. And, well, it's less chance of being spotted. You still thinking of that? That's kind of hard to forget, isn't it? Just the same, I wish you would. It's not doing... Uh, look, look. What? It's a car, and it looks like it's going to pull up behind us. George, you don't uh, no, think... I, I don't know, but if some monkey's looking for trouble, he's going to get it because I've had enough. What are you going to do? Now, look, I'll crouch down in front of the car here where he can't see me. He'll pull up behind us so his headlights will be on us if he's up to anything funny. Now, he's beginning to pull over now. Now, look, okay, okay, you talk to him, stall him, then we'll see. All right, but George... Hey, don't you know you're not allowed to stop in the middle of the bridge? Why? I just stopped a minute to look at the water. You alone? Why, yes. Oh, I thought I saw a man standing here with you just now. No. There's the California plates on your car, ain't there? Yes, I, I just drove through from the coast. Oh. You pick up any hitchhikers on the way? Uh, anybody that looks like this? Like what? Like the guy in this picture. Well, that's the picture someone took it. I thought so. All right, sister, where is he? Right here, bud. George, look out, he's got a gun. Why, you... Now, let's see how good you are without a gun. George, the railing, he's trying to throw you over. He's dead! Come on, kid, let's go. Well, we made it. Home at last. Home? This is the Bancroft Hotel. It's the only home I ever had in New York. Boy, take these bags. Now, sir, if you leave the key, I'll have your car garage for you. Yeah, sure. Here you are. Thank you. George, I could go home, you know. What? Travel out to Connecticut this time of night? <laughs> it isn't that far. Come on, you get a good night's rest right here. Then you can catch an early train in the morning. Well, all right. Yes, sir. You'll uh, wish a room then, sir? Uh, two rooms, please. Yes, sir. Will you sign here, please? Mm-hmm. Thank you, Mr. J... Oh, Mr. George Javery. What about it? N nothing, sir. Only uh, we have your reservations. Reservation? But I, I... Oh, I get it. Another coincidence. Sir? Uh, skip it. George. Eileen, uh, look, uh, maybe you're right. You, you better go on home. George, you're coming home with me. I I'm sorry, Eileen, but this is journey's end and I'm going to see it through. Well, then, so am I. Eileen... Please, George. Okay. Okay, come on. Well. What do you know? What? Our friend, sitting over there by that post. The man who took the picture? Yeah, yeah. 
Last act coming up. Oh, clerk. Yes, sir. Uh, what room do I have? 706, sir. Oh, that's fine. The lady? Yes, sir. Room 614 for her. Front boy. This way, Mr. Javery. Going up? Six, please. George, shouldn't you call the police or something? And tell them what? Oh, I... I don't know. Now, look, honey, you get a good night's sleep, I'll be okay. I mean, after all, this is New York. Six out. Good night, darling. Good night. Seven. It's right this way, sir, to the left. Here we are, sir. Just put the bags over there, son. Uh, will that be all, sir? Yeah, here you are. Thank you, sir. Hello, George Javery. <coughs> Took you longer than I expected. Brown, a man I met in Reno. What are you doing here? Waiting for you. And the name ain't Brown, that's Javery. Javery? Yeah, George Javery. <laughs> Javery, I can't think you thank you enough for what you've done for me. What I've done for you? Sure, you've been a great help. All right, let's have it. Look, Javery, you've come to the end of the road. But I think you're entitled to know why. <coughs> you don't know me, do you? I'm Bill Malone. Oh, Scarface Malone. Yeah, only I don't have scars anymore, see? That's the point. Took me two years and a lot of pain to get a new face. And I didn't get it just to look good in a coffin. Know what I mean? No, I'm afraid I don't. After a guy in my business has been away for a year or two, he's not always welcome back, see? And he generally finds out about it with a bullet in the back. That's why you struck me as a good idea. Oh, I did, did I? Yeah. I don't believe in taking chances, see? The boys thought I was coming east under the name of George Javery. Oh. So the one-armed guy and all the rest... No, he was one of my boys. And you were kind of rough with him, Mr. Javery. Well, he wasn't exactly playing beanbag himself. Jerry, he wouldn't hurt you. I just sent him to tell you so I'd have a line on where you were. After you dusted him off, it was just a break for me that you went to that steakhouse. Otherwise, I might have lost you. A candid cameraman, too, I suppose. Yeah. After I lost Jerry, I figured I wouldn't take any chances. Send a picture around to the boys. Like the guy that took a pot at you in Chicago. And the guy you tossed over the bridge. The boys that were out to get me, see? Only they didn't know all the time it was you. No chances, know what I mean? Yeah, only I can't exactly say I'm glad to have been of service. So if you drop that gun, I'll go. Not yet, Javery. There's just one thing more you can do. Yeah? Stand over by that window. What for? Stand over there and drop your hands. The boys wouldn't quite understand it if you had your hands up. The boys? Yeah, the ones I've been telling you about. When I pull up that shade, they're going to take a pot shot at me through that window. When they do, they'll get me. Only it'll be you. They'll never know the difference. Now, over to that window. They know you're already here, so move. You uh, don't mind if I sort of stroll, do you? After all, this is a surprise. Come on. Over to that window. And if I don't? I'll plug you. And if I do? You see, Malone, that's the trouble with your system. No incentive. You know what I... Don't make a move. George, is anything wrong? George! Get over there in that corner. Don't hurt her, Malone. He's going to lock the door, that's all. Taking no chances, see? Then here's some light so you can see what you're doing. What are you... George! George! Oh, George! Oh, Oh, it's all right, Arlene. It's all right, darling. Well, there lies our nemesis. The late Mr. Scarface Malone. Otherwise known as the guy who never took chances. But he's dead. Yeah, yeah, smart guy. But he made just one mistake. He forgot that the door is right in line of fire with a window. George, what are you going to do? I'm going to call the police and explain this little drama to them. After all, I think it's about time people stop taking pot shots at your future husband. Don't you? <laughs> Thank you. 
And so closes Death Went Along for the Ride, starring Gene Kelly. Tonight's tale of suspense. Mr. Kelly appeared through courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of The White Cliffs of Dover. When entertaining guests at your home, are you able to go into your Roma wine cellar and say, which would you prefer, this delightful sherry or this sweeter, heavier port? Whichever of these or any others of the many equally fine Roma California wines you offered your guests, they would find you had poured a world of satisfaction into their glasses. If you are not one of the millions already enjoying these good Roma wines, don't put off this great treat another day. You'll be surprised at the tiny cost your Roma wine dealer will ask for such great enjoyment. Only pennies a glass by actual check. Now you can boast of your own private wine cellar, your private Roma wine cellar. And then, inspired by the great qualities of Roma wines, you'll add your voice to the swelling international chorus that says, Roma wines are truly magnificent. Let me repeat the name, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Gene Kelly. I hope you enjoyed our suspense show this evening. I always feel that it's a pleasure and privilege for me to appear here because most of us who act for a living consider this to be radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Next week, I know you will want to be listening when your star will be Mr. Orson Welles, who will appear in the Dark Tower a play written by those two very distinguished gentlemen, Alexander Wolcott and George S. Kaufman. And now just one more word. Fellow Americans, the attack for victory is on. You help make the victory more certain and bring it sooner when you buy more war bonds. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Orson Welles in... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is the Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is Miss Mary Astor, one of Hollywood's most charming and resourceful actresses, and a lady who is no stranger to the art of keeping audiences in suspense. Ask anyone who saw her in the Maltese Falcon or across the Pacific. The story called In Fear and Trembling by J. Donald Wilson is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with In Fear and Trembling and Miss Mary Astor's performance, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. At the edge of the cliff, overlooking the sea, sits a grey stone mansion, weather beaten by the storms of several decades. To this mansion, Gilbert Durant brought his bride, Lucia. Uh, That was four years ago. Gilbert and Lucia were quite happy until a year ago, when Lucia's half-sister Beverly came to live with them. Gradually, something began to happen. Lucia felt it, felt that some insidious horror was beginning to gnaw at her happiness. She began to know that Gilbert's ardor was beginning to cool. He became more absorbed in his writing. Then she felt the cold clamminess of the great stone structure creeping about her, clutching at her heart. Anyone who saw her could tell that fear was growing in her mind, a fear of something which she could not or would not explain. One evening, Lucia, having excused herself at dinner, tossed on her bed in a fretful sleep. No. Don't. Don't. Get away from me. Ah! Ah! 
Mrs. Durant! Mrs. Durant, what's wrong? Oh, Benson, come in. Oh. What on earth is wrong? Why were you screaming? Oh, Benson, I, I must have been dreaming. It was horrible. You're white as a ghost and shaking like a leaf. Yes, I know. Oh, Mrs. Benson, I can't stand it. It's driving me mad. That makes the fourth or fifth time I've dreamed the same thing, the same in every detail. I've never heard you scream before. No. Oh, that's probably because... What? Oh, it always comes a little closer to me. Tonight it almost reached me. It? What do you mean? I don't know what it is. It's a figure. A human figure, but I can't tell whether it's a man or a woman. It comes through that door and walks slowly across the room with its arms outstretched, reaching for me. Are you sure you were dreaming? Now that I think of it, it isn't like a dream. An ordinary dream. Its reality seems to carry over even after I'm awake. Well, that's what's made you so ill. This dream, if it is a dream, means something? Is that what you think? It's a, a premonition? Perhaps. What time is it? Nine o'clock. Where's Gilbert? Your husband went horseback riding over an hour ago. Did he go alone? Your sister went with him. Beverly? Why didn't he ask me to go? Well, you've not been yourself lately. Not been feeling well. Yes, yes, of course. Well, if you're feeling better, I'll go back to my room. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I'll be all right. Thank you, Miss Benson. Good night. Good night, ma'am. Beverly. Gilbert. <laughs> Lucia lay there for a while, staring wild-eyed at the patch of moonlight on the bedroom door, listening, waiting. Then, as the clock struck half-past ten, the door opened, and a figure stepped into the room and moved noiselessly through the moonlight to Lucia's bed. Suddenly, Lucia opened her eyes. Gilbert, don't, don't! Lucia, what's wrong with you? What are you doing in my room? I just wanted to know how you felt. How long have you been standing there? Oh, just a few seconds. I, I was dreaming, I guess. I, when I woke up, you startled me. Why were you yelling, don't, don't? I don't know. I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> I talked with Dr. Handy about you today. I told him how run down you were, and he suggested that I get a tonic for you. I'll drop in at the drugstore on my way home tomorrow evening. Uh, a tonic? Yes. What? Well, what is it? Oh, I don't remember. Something, something in strychnine. Strychnine? Yes, he said it would give you an appetite. Where have you been, Gil? Oh, I've been riding. Nice moonlight night. Very pleasant. Did Beverly enjoy it? Yes, yeah, she's an excellent rider. I've decided to buy that filly from Thompson. I'm going over there tomorrow afternoon. Is Beverly going with you? Yes. She's a good judge of horseflesh. Why? Nothing. I just asked. Well, good night, Lucia. See you at breakfast? Uh, yes. Good night. Something, something, and strychnine. Something, something, and strychnine. Lucia jumps from her bed, rushes down to the library, snaps on the light and steps to the shelf holding the encyclopedia. She runs her fingers down the long line of books, L-M-N-O-P-R, and then she stops. And stares. The S to T is missing. Then she sees it on the desk, the missing volume. She rushes to the desk and stares down at the open page. Yes. Yes, that's it. Strychnine. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Beverly, I'll leave the deal entirely up to you. Up to me? Oh, Gil, that's not fair. Why not? Well, suppose she turns out to be a lemon. I don't think she will. Because you're going to have the job of training her. Oh, you certainly flatter me. <laughs> Not in the least. Oh, good morning, Lucia. I just realized what time it was. You'll be leaving in a few minutes. Yes, it's nine this very minute. I'll step on it. Uh, more coffee, Beverly? No, thanks. How do you feel, Lucia? Uh, better. Much better. You better eat something. No, no, I can't. At least some coffee. Yes, I'll have some coffee. I've got to run. See you later, Lucia. Yes, Gil. And I'll see you this afternoon at 2, Beverly. Yes, I'll meet you in town at 2. Oh, Gil, don't forget Lucia's medicine. No, I won't. Goodbye, Lucia. Are you meeting Gil in town, Beverly? <laughs> yes, he wants me to decide on that filly he's interested in. Where did you learn so much about horses? Ooh, 
seems to be natural. Why don't you get interested in horses, Lucia? Why should I? What are you interested in? Well, I am interested in a few things. My husband in particular. <laughs> you don't act interested in anything. Really? Well, if you'll take my advice, you'll snap out of this coma and get some pep. Does Gil like women with pep? No man cares about a woman who sits around and mopes. I think you're a hypochondriac. Do you? You should do something about it. I intend to. I intend to do something about it. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Get out, do things. Play games, golf, tennis, swim, and ride. Maybe this medicine will fix you up. You know all about it, do you? What is it? Oh, I don't know. It's a, a tonic, a, a builder-upper. I wish I could believe that. But at least you can try it. Won't hurt you. No? I wonder... Come in, Dr. Handy. Well, Lucia, why did you call me out here? What's wrong? I just couldn't make it into town. Oh, oh it can't be as bad as all that. Did Gilbert talk to you about me yesterday? Mm, I saw Gil for a few moments at the club during lunch. Said you were run down. Did you give him a prescription for me? Oh, never do that until I've examined the patient. You didn't give him a prescription? Well, no. What did you suggest for me? Oh, I don't know. Mentioned a few tonics he might get for you. Smoke of beef iron and wine and cherry and egg and... Uh, oh, I don't remember what else. And you mentioned nothing specifically. I don't think so. I see. Now, what seems to be wrong with you, Lucia? I don't know exactly, but something has been happening to me that... Well, frankly, I'm afraid I'm losing my mind. <laughs> we all feel that way at times. I'm serious. Things happen to me in the night. What sort of thing? At first, I thought they were just nightmares, but when you have a nightmare, you wake up and the fear is gone. You realize the truth. But this vision that comes to me haunts me through the waking hours as well. Vision? Something, I think it's a person, comes through my bedroom door, comes toward my bed with outstretched arms as though it intends to strangle me. Each time, it comes a little closer. And my fear is that eventually it will get to me before I wake up. See. Always dream the same dream? If it is a dream, yes. And who is the person? I don't know. You don't think it's really a dream? No. I think it's a premonition. Hmm. Have you any basis for such a fear in real life? Is there someone or something that you're afraid of? Doctor, I'm convinced they're not dreams, that I'm not asleep. Oh, nonsense. I'm positive they're not mere dreams. Well, I think it's all due to your rundown condition. You probably don't sleep as soundly as you should, so you transfer sounds in the night to dreams and nightmares. That's exactly what I mean. If I'm only half asleep, I may be transferring actual movements and sounds into dreams. In other words, if someone slams a door in the night, I may half hear it and attribute it to a dream. Yeah. All right. All right. But then perhaps I'm not dreaming, don't you see? Hmm. I think you'd better come into town and have a thorough physical... You mean a checkup by a psychiatrist? Oh, I may have someone help me. It's the usual thing, you know. Oh, oh don't hurt me. I'm so proud. No, 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 no. <laughs> Everything's going to be all right. I'm afraid. Afraid that, that I'm going to die. That someone is trying to kill me. Oh, you're not going to die. That's ridiculous. I'll call you and make an appointment. <laughs> That's better. Very well. In the meantime, try not to think about it. Keep your mind on the brighter side. Yes. I'll try. All afternoon and on into the evening, that awful gnawing of jealousy and fear occupy every moment. Gil and Beverly. How could they do such a thing? And how far will they go to get you out of the way, Lucia? Will they stop even at murder? <laughs> Sleep, Lucia? No, I'm not asleep. How are you feeling? I, I seem to have developed a headache. Have you eaten anything today? No, I didn't care for anything. Well, this will help you. Better take a dose now. I'll measure it for you. What is it? Well, it's the tonic. Did Dr. Handy prescribe it? Yes. 
Yes, he did. Where's Beverly? Down in the library. Did you buy the horse? Yes, Beverly thought she was a fine animal. I didn't know Beverly knew so much about horses. She's a horsewoman after my own heart. Is she? Rides like the wind, too. She had intended to go home tomorrow. Is she staying on? She's got to. I wouldn't think of her leaving now. Why not? Well, for one thing, she's going to train the horse. And what else? Why, nothing else. Here, take this. It's a little bitter, but you'll get used to it. Gil! Go ahead, it won't hurt you. I don't want it. And why not? It has poison in it. I suppose it does have a little, yes. But only enough to act as a tonic. I don't want it. I won't take it. Are you going to act like a child? Take it and quit arguing. I won't, I won't. Take it, swallow it down. I can't take it. You're impossible, Lucy. I'm afraid. You need this medicine, but you're so confoundedly (laughs) stubborn you'd rather sit around and mope all day. Very well, there it is. You can take it or not. I'm disgusted trying to help you pull out of this. Good night. No, 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 no. Wait, Gil. I'll take it. I'll take it. I don't care whether you do or not. There. I've taken it. (coughs) Terribly bitter. Well, that's more like it. Now take another dose around 11. Gil, where's Mrs. Benson? Why, I told her she could have the night off. Thought she might like to spend the evening in town. You, You let her off? Yes, she's been sticking pretty close lately. Yes. Yes, she has. Good night. Good night, Bertrand. What's wrong, Gil? You look upset. I am. Lucia didn't want to take it. No? Why not? She's afraid of medicine. What are you going to do? She finally took a dose of it. But if I know her, she'll never take another drop. She's got to take it, Gil. You've got to figure out a way to make her take it. It can't be disguised. It's too bitter. Try something else. I'll try and coax her into it again. Isn't there something that tastes more pleasant or, or something you could put in milk or orange juice? Mm, I don't know. Well, I'll find something. Of course you will. You've got to. She's... Wait a minute. There's someone listening outside the door. Oh. Oh, sir. Well, Benson, what are you doing standing here in the dark? Why... I was just going upstairs to see if Mr. Durant wanted anything before I went out. I see. Now, by the way, I'm staying home for a couple of days, and I thought that since you've been staying so close to the job, you'd welcome a few days' leave. Leave? Why, yes. But Mrs. Durant may prefer that I stay. I think you'd better take a little rest yourself. You needn't come back till Friday. But I... I don't need a rest. You come back Friday. Yes. Very well, sir. But that night, for once, the good Mrs. Benson disobeys orders. A few minutes before 12, she returns to the mansion. No lights are burning. So she makes her way quietly through the back entrance, slips up the stairs, and taps lightly on Lucia's bedroom door. Mrs. Durant? Mrs. Durant? Then she turns the knob, opens the door, and snaps on the light. Mrs. Durant? Are you here? Then Benson steps quickly toward the bed. The bed is empty, but a horrible sight meets her eyes. Blood. Blood all over the bed. Get me the police department. All right, Mrs. Benson. Now, just calm down and tell us what happened this evening. Well, earlier in the evening, Mr. Durant told me that I could have the night off since I'd been staying close to Mrs. Durant for some time. And then later he said he decided to let me off until Friday. I didn't want to go, but he insisted. Was there anyone else in the house? Yes, Mrs. Durant's half-sister, Beverly. Did you leave the house? Yes, but I sneaked up the back stairs and told Mrs. Durant I'd be back about midnight. Hmm. If you had till Friday, why did you come back at midnight? Because... We were both frightened. Of what? Well, Mrs. Durant had been having premonitions that someone was trying to kill her. Who was trying to kill her? She didn't know, but she was terribly frightened. Is that all? No. Her husband tried to get her to take some medicine he had brought home. She refused, and he got angry. How do you know he was angry? I... I heard him talking about it to Beverly. They were in the library. And he told Beverly that Lucia was stubborn. 
Beverly said that he'd have to think of some other way. Did Mrs. Durant suspect her husband and Beverly of trying to do away with her? Yes. Yes, she did. She was convinced that Mr. Durant and Beverly were in love and wanted her out of the way. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, so you came back tonight because you anticipated that something was going to happen. Yes. The house was dark, so I came up the back stairs, knocked on her door. When I got no answer, I came in, turned on the lights, saw she was gone, and then I saw the bed all covered with blood. <laughs> she wouldn't take the poison, so they did it another way. That's what they planned in the library. Where are they now? Any idea? Well, they didn't expect me back tonight, so they're probably gone to dispose of the body, intending to come back here and clean the place up later. I see. Anybody else know about Mrs. Durant's fears? Yes. She talked to Dr. Handy. I called him right after phoning the police and told him about it. He knows. Dr. Handy, Captain Drake. What in the world is the meaning of this? From all indications, Mrs. Durant has been murdered and the body disposed of. Doctor, I understand Mrs. Durant told you that she was afraid that something was going to happen to her, that she was going to die. Who told you that? Mrs. Benson here. I see. Well, she did call me in this morning. She'd been having strange dreams. Premonitions, she called them. I called them hallucinations. Who'd she think it was? Well, she couldn't tell whether it was a man or a woman, but someone was always approaching her bed with outstretched arms, trying to choke her. Do you think it was more than a dream? She was a sort of hypochondriac. I, I asked her to come into town where I could give her a thorough examination. I didn't take her story too seriously, but... This certainly puts a different slant on the entire picture. Yes. We haven't found the body, but I have men out looking now. We'll find it. Here's Mr. Durant and his sister-in-law. They found them about half a mile down the beach. Oh, how are you, Durant? What in the world goes on here? What's wrong, Doctor? Take a look at that bed. Good Lord. What happened? Lucia. What? Where is she? We thought you might enlighten us on that point. What do you mean? Where is she? It's... Is Lucia dead? Oh, Gil, what, what... What happened? We think your wife has been murdered. Murdered? But I, what are you doing here, Mrs. Benson? I thought you were gone until Friday. Why did you tell her to go until Friday? Why, I, I thought she needed to rest. She'd been having long hours. Wh where is Lucia? Where have you and your sister-in-law been? Why, I slipped upstairs and saw Lucia was asleep, so we decided to take a little ride down the beach. It was still early. Mm-hmm. Didn't take... Anything with you? Certainly not. What do you mean by that? What would we take? I don't know. I just ask. Did you two try to get Lucia to take some medicine? No. Wait a minute, Beverly. That won't do any good. Yes, we did. Lucia was run down and needed a tonic. But she refused to take medicine. Why did she refuse? I don't know. Maybe she was afraid of being poisoned. Poisoned? But why should I want to poison her? Lucia was my wife. How long has your sister-in-law, Beverly, been here with you? Well, I don't know. Quite some time. Just a minute. Uh, are you inferring that, that Gil and I... I'm not inferring anything. I merely ask you a question. Oh, Gil, tell him that... Just a moment, Beverly. Mrs. Benson, what have you been saying? What did you tell them? I told them the truth. You think I planned to kill Lucia, is that it? Yes, you and this woman. You're out of your mind. You tried to get her to take some medicine. She knew you were in love with her sister and that you were trying to poison her. And how did she come to that conclusion? She had premonition. That means nothing. And besides, I heard you talking, you and Beverly, planning the whole thing. What? She's lying. I heard you. And when you realized Lucia wouldn't take the medicine, Beverly said you'd have to think of some other way. Some other way to what? To get rid of her. To kill her. There must be some... Dr. Handy, you know better than this. Do you think I had a reason back of wanting to know about various medicines? Well, no, no, I didn't. Not at the time, but now... Now what? Well, I'm sorry to say it all adds up to something suspicious. Seems more than just coincidental. Do you, Do you think I killed Lucia? Look about you. Look at the room. What else am I to think? What was the tonic you tried to give your wife? It had strychnine in it. That right, Durant? Oh, yes. It was one of the things Dr. Handy mentioned. It was uh, uh, iron, quinine, and strychnine. Did you mention that, Doctor? Well, I suppose I did. It's commonly known tonic. Did you add anything else to it, Durant? Certainly not. How about it, Sergeant? What's the report? Well, the bottle contained iron, quinine, and strychnine, and a heavy content of arsenic. Arsenic? Well, but that isn't possible. I put nothing in it. Where would I get arsenic? It was in there just the same. Doctor, this isn't true. You know it isn't. I hate to say it, Gil. 
But the evidence looks bad for you. Benson knows what this is all about. She's lying. She knows Gil wouldn't do such a thing. She's back of it all. Why? I don't know. But believe me, I'll find out if I have... That'll do, that'll do. Under the circumstances, I think you'd all better come down to headquarters so we can keep you separated. Come on. And no more talking. After 48 hours, hours of relentless grilling, endless questioning, Gil and Beverly are released on a writ of habeas corpus. Weeks go by, and Lucia's body has not been discovered, so the district attorney makes a public announcement that no murder charges can be preferred against them due to lack of corpus delicti, the failure to produce the body, Lucia's body. Then one evening, Beverly and Gil talk in the library. Beverly, I... I want you to know how wonderful I think you've been. You stuck right beside me, never lost your nerve, and, well, you're one girl in a million. Oh, thanks, Gil, but it isn't over yet. They won't stop their search for Lucia's body, and and if they find it, we haven't a chance. I know, but what can we do about it? Well, why couldn't we leave the country? Together? Not necessarily. They'd be sure to follow us. But we could go separately in, in different ways and... And meet someplace later on? Is that what you mean? Yes, but I mean. It seems a bit mad. It would be equal to an out and out confession. Oh, but Gil, if they find Lucia's body, we haven't a chance. It's too strong against us. We could never come back, Beverly. What of it? I don't want to die, Gil. And I don't want anything to happen to you. Beverly, I. Oh, I don't know what to say. I'm frightened, Gil. I can't stay here with such horrible fear hanging over me. I'll go mad. If you don't go, then I will. I'll leave tonight. Please, Beverly, I need you more than ever now. Please don't go. Don't worry, Gilbert. She won't leave you. Lucia. Oh, sure. Heavens, Lucia. I won't let her leave you. I'll see that you both go together. And stay together for a long, long time. Lucia, what? Lucia. We thought you were dead. Disappointed, aren't you? Where have you been? What are you going to do with that gun? You thought I was dead. Well, I'm not. I'm live enough to pull this trigger. I've been hiding for weeks. And I've been behind those curtains for the last 20 minutes. I heard every word. Now I know you're in love with each other. Now I know you wanted to do away with me. In love? Beverly and I... From the day she came here, she took you away from me. I did not. We never thought of such a thing, never. Never entered our mind. Why lie about it? You've let your imagination run away with you, Lucia. You're insane. You think so? Well, if I am, it's your fault. Yours and Beverly's. You've driven me insane, both of you. I had a plan to get even with you to make you pay for what you've done, but it failed. What plan? You see, I didn't know about the law of corpus delicti, but I do now. And this time there will be a body. Two bodies. Yours and Beverly's. You're a suspicious-minded devil, Lucia. I, I plan to trap you on a murder charge. My murder. But it's going to be your murder now. You were convinced that Beverly and I were in love? Of course. I never needed a dream nor a premonition. I cut myself and smeared blood on the bed and disappeared. When I found they couldn't touch you without the corpus delicti, I came back to kill you. Lucia, you fool, you vicious-minded fool. I'm going to tell you something. And go ahead and shoot me if you will. Lucia, not until now, this very moment, has the thought of loving Beverly ever occurred to me. You never loved Beverly? No. But I can tell you this, Lucia. Now that I've seen you as you really are, I could never love you again, never. Gail. Wait, Beverly. But I... I, I was sure I, I was convinced that you would ever... You were sure only because your warped, jealous mind convinced you that there was something between us. You mean I... You've I, certainly made a sorry mess of your life, Lucia. Then I... All I've done is... killed your love. Oh, Gil. Yes, Lucia. And you've no one to blame. No one but your own miserable self. <laughs> Lucia! Don't, Lucia! Oh, Gil! Gil! Yes, yes, Beverly. But it's... It's probably the best thing for her. And for us. <laughs> And so closes, in fear and trembling, 
Starring Metro-Golden-Mayor's Mary Astor. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. The broadcast originated in Columbia Square in Hollywood. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday, when another of the screen's lovelier leading ladies, Geraldine Fitzgerald, will star in the uneasy drama called Will You Walk Into My Parlor? William Spear, the producer, Ted Bliss, the director, Matt Gluskin, the musical director, Lucian Morrowick, the composer, and J. Donald Wilson, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Nancy Kelly. Right over there, Miss Jeremy, second booth. Thank you. You got five minutes. Hello, Angel. Oh, Frank. Yeah, there, Angel. Take it easy. We, we don't have much time. Oh, but to have to talk to you like this through an iron screen, not even to be able to touch you. When That's I... the way it is, Angel, when a guy's been... Frank. Frank, I know you didn't do it. I know you didn't. Of course I didn't, Angel, but just one of those things, circumstantial evidence. Oh, but there must be something. Uh -uh. I was pretty optimistic during the trial because I knew I didn't do it, I guess, but now that I look back on it, they had enough coincidence pieced together to convict a dozen innocent men. Frank. Oh, Frank, how can you be so calm? How can you... There's one thing I want you to know. I want to be sure you didn't believe any of that gossip about my running around with her. Oh, of course she I She was didn't. a star. I was a producer. I needed her for my next picture. Lorna Moore was a big name in pictures, but you knew I'd been seeing her. I even told you how I'd quarreled with her. Oh, Frank, Frank, I know. Frank, how much more time is there? Two or three more minutes. No, 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 I mean... Oh, November the 16th. Six weeks. Yeah. Frank, I'm going to do something. What can you do, Angel? Don't you realize there's a murderer running around loose? Some man who's free and having fun and going out with girls. I'm going to find him. Well, how could you find him? The police tried for weeks. They didn't try. All they wanted was to convict you. Uh-uh. But it is nice to hear you say it, Angel, because... What? Because it makes me know you really did love me. Oh, Frank. You see, there are things you can face when you're like this you, you didn't dare talk about or even think about before. I always loved you, Eve, I, but you were so much younger and, and full of ambition. Oh, Frank, don't. I'm sorry, Angel. I wish I could have done things for you. There won't be much left for you now. You know how it is in this business. You spend it as fast Frank, as you make stop. Please, please stop. Oh, I'm a heel. Forgive me, Angel. But it's wonderful to know how you do feel. Frank... Frank, I'm not going to let this thing happen. There must be something. There must be some clue somewhere. Well, don't you think the police... Something the police didn't know. Something you saw when you were up there and, and didn't tell them. I couldn't have very well told them anything about that when my whole defense was that I hadn't been up there. But there wasn't anything, nothing important. Oh, but there must have been something. Whoever, whoever was there before you, wh whoever did it, must have left some trace. Well, there was her address book. Her, her... Yeah, uh, I stuck it in my pocket because, well, it, it was open at the letter J and my name was in it. It was a silly thing to do, but it's in the little secret drawer in my desk. Oh, Frank, why didn't you tell somebody sooner? Well, what was the use? If I told him I'd been up there... Oh, yes. There, there, there was another little thing. I, I hadn't thought... Frank, A what, smell. What? Oh, a what? what? What kind Cigar of... Cigar smoke. Your time's up, Miss Jeremy. Frank, all right. I'll write every day. All right, Miss Jeremy. Goodbye. So long, Angel. October 5th. 
Frank, darling, I found the little address book where you said it was. It's not much to go on. There are hundreds of names. But under the J's, there are only three others besides yours. I'm going after them one at a time. Tomorrow, I'm going down to see Lieutenant Trout of the Homicide Bureau. He always seemed to me one of the few who tried to be fair. And I might need help. Oh, darling, I know it isn't much, but you must keep on hoping. Something will happen if only because I love you so desperately. Oh. What's your angle, Mrs. Jeremy? M my angle? Yeah. Why are you doing all this? But, but he's my husband. I love oh, him. Oh, look, Mrs. Jeremy, the cops around this town aren't exactly dummies, you know. We know what you were like before you married. All right, Dick Tracy. A person can change, can't they? Oh, sure they can. A cop just hates to have anyone think they can make a sucker out of him. You know how it is. Well, you can skip the apologies if that's where they're supposed to be. Sure. Now, what do you want me to do? Well, what kind of evidence would I have to have? How specific would it have... What, to uh, upset a first-degree murder rap? Or well, something in writing. That's not so easy. Have you got a suspect in mind? Some particular person? No, not yet. But you might have. Well, there's one other thing. It's an old, old trick, but it's still good. What's that? Uh, did you ever see one of these things? No, I don't think so. Here, talk into this little gadget here. Well, what, what'll I say? Oh, anything. Just talk. <sighs> Lieutenant Trout is one of the most chivalrous gentlemen I've ever met. <laughs> You're quite a realist, aren't you? <laughs> Yeah, now listen. Lieutenant Trout is one of the most chivalrous gentlemen I've ever met. See? A, a dictaphone. Yeah, think it might come in handy. Well, it it might. October seventh, darling Trout has installed a dictaphone in my new apartment. It's only a room, really. And, of course, I've changed my name to Evelyn Jarvis and my appearance. I don't think that even you, my darling, would recognize me now. The phone numbers are a dead end so far. The first was a dressmaker and the next a man who's definitely been in the South Pacific for over a year. But there's one more, a Jerry Jordan. I'm going to call him this afternoon. Oh, my darling, I miss you. I miss you so much. Is this Mr. Jerry Jordan? Yes. <laughs> well, I finally found you. Can you guess who this is? Well, I'm afraid I'm not very good at that. Oh, all right. I suppose I'll have to tell you. This is uh, Evelyn Jarvis. Oh? Well, don't you know who I am? No, I'm sorry. I don't, Miss Jarvis. Well, this is embarrassing. Didn't you get the letter? No, what letter? Oh, my goodness. Well, you see, a, a very good friend of yours, who's also a very good friend of mine, wrote you a letter about me. Or at least he said he would. I see. And I'll give you one other clue. I'm, uh, I'm from out of town. Now can you guess? You wouldn't be from San Francisco, would you? Well... Uh... <laughs> Ed Thornton, eh? <laughs> you always did have a terrible memory for anything but phone numbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I didn't mean to bother you, but Ed said to be sure and look you up. Well, uh, where are you staying? Oh, I managed to find a little place. Well, lucky you. Uh, have you got any plans for dinner? Why, uh, well, I hadn't really thought... Say, better still, have you got any plans for right now? <laughs> well, really, Mr. No, Jordan. no, seriously. By the time we've had a drink and gotten acquainted, you'll be ready for dinner anyway. Oh, no, no. Ah, I... now you wouldn't want Ed Thornton to know you were acting that way, would you? You just jump in a taxi and tell him to take you to the Brown Derby on Vine Street. I'll be waiting right there. Uh, well, I... And, uh, knowing Ed the way I do, I, I'm dying to meet you. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, from what I know, I'm sort of anxious to meet you. Just a quick P.S. I'm going to meet him now at the Brown Derby. 
Mr. Jerry Jordan. And I have a hunch he's it. I don't know why. I'll remember what you said about cigar smoke. And yet, although I've got a hunch, it, it makes me feel a little shaky to be going there. He's... Well, he's got such a nice voice to be a murderer. <laughs> so that's what he says about me, eh? As a fine pal. <laughs> I'll say one thing for Ed. He may be an awful liar, but he sure has swell taste. Well, which proves he's no liar. <laughs> but tell me, Jerry, is this the Brown Derby? I, I mean, the one you hear about? Yeah, uh, this is it. Well, are there any people, you know, famous people here now? Well, it's a little early, but... Oh, well, you know, I've, I've always thought it was awfully silly, really, to be impressed by movie stars. Still, Hollywood must be sort of an exciting town to live in. I, hmm? I mean, from some of the things I hear that, that go oh, on. Oh, <laughs> that's mostly newspaper talk. Hollywood's just like any other town. They have their regular quota of divorces and fist fights. Oh, and, and murders. Oh. You mean that Lorna Moore business? Well, I, I read something about it. Yes, that uh, that was a genuine tragedy, all right. I don't, I don't suppose you knew her. Well, as a matter of fact, Lorna was one of the few celebrities I did know. Oh, really? What was she like? Well, Lorna was a long ways from being the sweet little thing she seemed to be on the screen. Oh, but murder would... Well... Yes, I suppose nothing really excuses that. Well, anyway, they, they got the man who did it. Frank Jeremy? Yes, I guess they did. You mean you don't think that... Oh, the case looked good enough. You can't always tell about those things, though. Any number of people might have done it. I, I'm afraid little Lorna's life was kind of a mess. Well, Jerry, were you... Mixed up with Lorna? <laughs> no, oh, no. But, but didn't the police... I, I mean, I should think with a woman like that, all of her friends... They nabbed Jeremy so quick, they didn't even question anyone else. Anyway, I was out of town when it happened. Oh, uh... Jerry, may I have a cigarette? I'm sorry. I, I don't use them. I, I'll get you some, however. I only smoke cigars. I, what, what, did you, what did you say? I said, I only smoke cigars. Darling, don't you see? His name in her book, and he admits he knew her in the cigars. I'm positive. Now, if I can win his confidence, get him up to my apartment near that dictaphone. Oh, I know I can do it. We've still got four weeks, darling, and, and I'll have to be awfully careful. He's clever and, and he's intelligent. Imagine a man who can carry a thing like that on his conscience and, and still be so, so terribly nice and, and courteous and, and thoughtful. But I'm going to win for you, darling. Hello, Jerry. Hello. You been waiting long? Not very. Jerry, is something the matter? I don't know, darling. Look, why do we always have to meet here? Why can't I pick you up at your place? I don't even know where it is. Sometimes it's almost as though you were, well, keeping some sort of a secret from me. <laughs> Isn't it a woman's privilege to have secrets? Don't talk like that, darling. Oh, Jerry, Jerry, you, you must know by now I, I couldn't have any secrets from you. <laughs> Oh, I'm a fine one to talk, I guess. The fact is, I've been holding out on you, darling. I don't live in that hotel. I live in a place out in Beverly Hills with about 30 rooms and a swimming pool a block long. I've got more money than I know what to do with. Oh? Oh, darling, I... I feel like a dog about it now, but I... I didn't want you to know at first. Oh, until you were sure I didn't care about money. Is that it? Yes, dear. Try to forgive me, will you? Oh, my poor darling. Will you? Of course I will. I do. And, and Jerry. Yes? About those secrets of mine. Suppose there were some things I couldn't tell you yet. Would that matter? Not if I was sure you would tell me someday. Jerry, I promise you that someday I will tell you. Frank, darling, I know the delay must be torture to you, but you must understand how careful I've got to be. I've got to have the positive, living truth on that dictaphone. I haven't been able to get him up here yet, but 
We've still got ten days, and I have a feeling it's going to be soon. Very soon. So don't worry, darling. I miss you. Who is it? Sarge, Harry. Oh, w wait a minute. What, Jerry? Darling, I had to. It, it's been almost a week, and I... Well, how did you find this place? Why do you think I didn't tell you where it was if I didn't have reasons? Let me in, please. I've got to talk to you. I... All right. Darling, Ed Thornton arrived in town last night. Oh. He came to see me. Oh? He's never heard of you. He doesn't know anybody by the name of Evelyn Jarvis or anyone that even looks like you. Is that what you came up here to tell me? Darling, darling, I don't care what it is. Only please, please. Jerry. Jerry. Oh, darling. I want you so much. Oh, Jerry. Jerry, my darling. I want you to go away with me tonight. I want you to marry me. You... You what? I want you to marry me. But first... Oh, my darling, I've waited so long. There's something... Something I've got to tell you. No, Jerry. No, Jerry, don't. I've got to. And then you can tell me whatever it is. And we can start even. If you still want to. Jerry, do we of us have to tell anything? Does that matter now? I've got to, Evelyn. I, I can't keep it any longer. Not the way I feel about, about you. Jerry. I've... I've killed someone. I'm a murderer. Who? Lorna Moore. And another man is going to die for it. <laughs> Jerry. Oh, no, my Jerry. Listen to me. It doesn't matter. I don't care what you've done. Jerry, I love you. Do you know that? I love you. Can you still... I've loved you from the beginning. It didn't matter then and it doesn't matter now. Darling, what do you mean, it didn't matter then... Did you... Yes, I knew. Do you know who I am? Who? I'm Eve Jeremy. The wife of the man who's going to die for it. His wife? Yes. Now you know. And you're willing to let him die? Oh, he deserves to die for the things he's done. He'd have probably killed her anyway I if you hadn't. I knew he was seeing her. He was a beast, Jerry. I knew from the beginning it was a mistake. He beat me. He beat me and he tortured me. I, I can't even tell you some of the things he... When... When does it happen? The 16th. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Does that matter to you? I'd let 50 men die to get you, darling. That's why I haven't seen you. That's why I haven't seen you. I was waiting until... We could be in Argentina tomorrow night. I'll pack. I can get plane tickets tonight from a friend. I don't have to change, do I? Oh, you look lovely. I'll, I'll just throw a couple of things in a bag. Nobody will know about this place anyway. Make it quick, though. And it's a perfectly logical time for me to go away for a while. Hurry, baby, hurry. I'm already now. How do I look? Oh, you look beautiful, darling. Oh, wait. What? Oh, I ought to write a note to him. Your husband? Yes. Just to keep us both in the clear. He won't get it until just before... What are you going to say? Well, you can read it if you want to. No, no. Here, I'll mail it for you. No, I'll just stick it in my handbag. I'll mail it at the airport. Are you ready? Yes. Come on, Jerry. Well, good evening, Mrs. Jeremy. Uh, oh, hello. You, uh, taking a little trip? Wouldn't you if you were me? Sure, I know how you feel. You, uh, in a hurry? Sort of. My, my friend here was going to run me down to the airport. Lieutenant Trout... Mr. Jordan. Well, I won't keep you but a minute, and then I'll give you a fast trip down there in a squad car. Want to step inside a minute? All right. Your uh, friend here know what you've been doing? In in a way. Hmm. Any luck with our little gadget? What little gadget? Oh, a, a, a dictaphone. Lieutenant Trout thought... Oh, you thought, Mrs. Jeremy. All right. I thought. Mind if I turn it on? No, go ahead. There's nothing... Hmm. Oh. I can't keep it any longer. Not the way I feel now about you. Oh, Jerry, don't I? I've killed someone. I'm a murderer. Who? Lorna Moore. And another man is going to die for it. <laughs> well, 
guess that's about all we need to know, isn't it? Only you wouldn't have needed the apple. Or the snake. <laughs> <laughs> It just doesn't seem possible. Back here in our own home, out here on our own terrace again, everything just the way it was. Yeah. Do you remember do you remember when we first took the place, how happy we were, and, and how the agent took us out on this terrace and asked us if it would be <laughs> too high up, if, if we were afraid of high places? Mm-hmm. Frank, is something bothering you? Well, Eve... Oh, tell me, darling... Oh, I know you've been through so much. When I think that today you might have... Now, look, Angel, I haven't had a kick coming. You, you saved my life. Oh, darling. And I know what the answer is anyway, but it would only prey on my mind if I didn't talk to you about it. And there shouldn't be anything like that between us ever, should there? Well, of course not, darling. What is it? I... I have a record here. What record? That the police took off your dictaphone. Oh, well, Frank, I... want to play I... it back for you, Angel. I'll put it on the phonograph here oh, but, on the terrace. Oh, but, Frank, please, dear, All I... right, Angel, I know. <laughs> Jerry. Oh, my Jerry, listen to me. It doesn't matter. I don't care what you've done. Jerry, I love you. Do you know that? I love you. Can you still... I've loved you from the beginning. It didn't matter then, and it doesn't matter now. Darling, what do you mean didn't matter then. Did you... Yes, I knew. You know who I am? Who? I'm Eve Jeremy, the wife of the man who's going to die for it. His wife? Yes. Now you know. And you're... Is... Is that all? That was the end of the record. That was all that was recorded. <laughs> oh, it's all Frank. right, Angel. It's all right. I, I know. Oh, Frank, don't you see I had to play it that way? Don't you see I had to make him think that's so I could save you? Sure, I know, Angel. I just wanted to hear you say it, I guess. Please, Angel, I understand. Do, do, do you really? Why, of course I do. I'm a heel, Angel. Oh, darling. Listen, it's all over now. I'll tell you, let's celebrate. All right, let's. I'll go down and get us some wine, champagne or something. Oh, that'd be wonderful. I'll go now, only... <laughs> what, darling? Well, just getting out of the clink, I don't have any money. Do you? Oh, of course, darling. Right there in my handbag. Where? Oh. Oh, sure. Sure, you've got plenty. Say, here's a letter. A, a letter? Yeah, and it's addressed to me. A letter? A, a, a letter? Oh, Frank. Well, you must Frank, have forgotten don't. to... Frank. No, Frank. No, no Frank, no. No, Frank, I, I didn't... I, I, I can explain just how, Frank. I... Please, Frank. Angel! Trout, homicide. Trout. Trout, this is Frank Jeremy. A terrible thing's just happened. What? My wife. Suicide. Nerves, I guess. She jumped off the terrace before I could stop her. It's 14 stories. Was suicide, was it? She gave me a note in her own handwriting just before. Oh. Well, of course, if the note says so. It does, all right. Hmm. Well, the case is closed. Here, I'll, I'll read it to you. It says... Frank, my darling, I've been wrong all the time. I've failed you utterly. Now I can't even bear the thought of facing you. When you read this, I will be gone. This is farewell forever. Signed, Eve. And so closes Eve, starring Nancy Kelly. Tonight's study in Suspense. 
Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. And now, further to intrigue you, we of Suspense present a special preview of our next exciting tale. And here it is, a tantalizing glimpse of our next adventure in Suspense. Warden Graves. Yes, Miss Rhodes. Sit down, won't you? Thank you. I hate to disturb you like this, but I've traveled clear across the country. They wouldn't give me the information over the phone. I know. You know what this visit is all about, Warden. To some extent, yes. You think one of our prisoners, Tom Nixon, has escaped. He has escaped. I'm as sure of it as, as I'm sure of sitting here now. I saw him at large in New York City two days ago. You knew Tom Nixon well, Miss Rhodes? Knew him? Well, he was my mother's murderer. My mother was Mrs. George Rhodes of Huntington, Long Island. She ran a boarding house there. He killed her on September 18th, 1933. We have all the records of the crime, Miss Rhodes. Tom was mother's chief boarder for ten years. <laughs> know him? Why, I sat opposite him at dinner table from the time I was a girl of 15. I knew him as well as I knew mother. I'd, I'd know him anyway. I see. And now he's at large. He's free. Somehow or other, he's, he's escaped this place. Maybe you're not aware of it. Maybe even his fellow prisoners aren't aware of it. But he's wormed his way out. And he's after me. He's after oh, me. Oh, now, my dear young lady. Warden Graves. Ten years ago, when mother was found murdered, I knew it couldn't have been anyone but Tom. I testified against him. I was the chief, practically the only witness at the trial. And when they sentenced him here for life, he swore to kill me. He swore in the open court to get even with me. For ten years, I've lived in deadly fear. I've watched the newspapers for prison breaks. I've moved from house to house, made few friends. He's hung over me like a shadow. Even though I told myself he was locked up here, locked up here forever. And now it, it's come. And where exactly did you see the prisoner, Miss Rose? There's just the point. That's why I know he's after me. I saw him in my own apartment house. Well. He has a job there, running the elevator at night. That's what makes it so horrible. I've never married Warden Graves. I live all alone in a small three-room penthouse on the 18th floor of an office building. The other night, about a week ago, I came home alone from the movies. After midnight, the big marble lobby of my building was deserted. Except in a far corner near the elevator with his back toward me, there was a man down on his hands and knees, scrubbing the floor. Good evening. Evening. Well, where is everybody? Isn't the elevator working tonight? You want to go up in the elevator, Mum? Certainly. I'll be right with you. Okay, Mum. What floor? I was in the elevator, and he had started to ascend before I really saw him. It was Tom. His hair had turned white, and there was a horrible stoop to his shoulders. But everything about him, the crook of his head, his high, thin, bony nose, the hollow cheekbones were all the same. And then he turned and stared at me. I could see those deadly, pale, cold eyes, those heavy eyebrows, still black, that familiar, quiet, sarcastic mouth. What floor, Mum? Oh, oh, my floor. Uh, yes, the penthouse, please. Penthouse? Where's that, on the roof? Yes, on the roof, please. Eighteenth floor. Okay. Warden Graves. It was being like... It was like being in a cage with a wild beast. He kept watching me, peering at me furtively as the elevator moved with agonizing slowness up and up past the floors. I shrunk back, averting my face. The light in the car was dim. My only hope was that he did not recognize me. Here's your floor, miss. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. You can go back down. I, I don't need anything, thank you. What's the matter? Forgotten your door key? No. No, it's just... It, it's right in my bag. I'll find it in a minute. You want me to let you in? Let me in? No. No, good Lord. I got pass keys to all the doors. It's no trouble. No, thanks, but I... No, no. No, I, I have it right here. Good night. <laughs> 
And so until our next performance, when you will hear the rest of this exciting tale, we keep you in... Suspense! This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our distinguished star this evening is the stage and screen favorite, Mr. Paul Lucas, whose performance is in The Lady Vanishes, and in the stage production, The Watch on the Rhine, you will recall with pleasure. Tonight's tale of suspense is a story by John Dixon Carr, Fire, Burn, and Cauldron Bubble. If you've been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so with Fire Burn and Cauldron Bubble and the performance of Paul Lucas and the other members of our company, we again hope to keep you in... Drury Lane Theatre presents the distinguished American actor, Myron Willard, in Shakespeare's Macbeth, with magic effects especially designed by Ludwig von Arnheim. historic Drury Lane Theatre, a relic of old London. On this site, in the cramped and crooked lanes of Aldwych, there has been a playhouse since Nell Gwynne sold oranges in the pit. The present theatre, though modernized, is heavy and darkened with time. By daylight, it is a dinginess of red plush seats, haunted by old ghosts. But at night, when the lights bloom for some new production... When the murmur of a crowd fills the carpeted aisles and the orchestra begins to tune up, it is kindled with that strange magic before the rise of the curtain. Oh, it's this way, sir. E12 and 13. Program. Pocket. Thank you. No, madam. This is row E. Your seat for G4. And backstage, where nerves crawl and there is a tendency to scream, the three witches of the play are huddled around the peephole in the curtain, looking out into the audience. They are hideous-looking creatures, these witches. In gray rags like cobwebs. But as they speak. Oh, dear, I am scared. Don't let it bother you, darling. You can't even see the audience when the floats are on. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing except the size of the take at the box office. You won't even have to worry about that tonight. Look out there. You two are shaking as much as I am. Now don't pretend. All right, all right. Everybody's jumpy on first nights. What I can't understand is why they want to use young girls as witches. 
And then make us talk in cracked voices as though we were 80. Double, double, toil and trouble. Fire, burn, and cauldron bubble. Oh, oh, what's that? Say, dear darling, it's only one of the ghost effects. You've been hearing it for weeks at rehearsals. I will say this for Marin Willard, as an actor and a manager, too. He's the first one who's ever had a real professional magician to do the ghost effects of this ham show. Oh, are they, Celia? Look there. Where? Out in the audience in the second puffer box on the left-hand side. Oh. Don't you see the woman who's just coming in? Yes, I can see her. Not a bad-looking bit of goods for her age. What about her? But that's Marcia Blair. Marcia Blair? You don't mean you've never heard of her. I can't say I have either if it comes to that. Move over, Ivy. Give us a squint. Marcia Blair used to be Mr. Willard's leading lady. She was a very great actress 15 years ago. Oh, 15 years ago. She's had a terribly romantic history. Well, she's made lots of money and retired from the stage. Then she married some horrible no good and... Did you see that tall, gray-haired man standing beside her? Well, he doesn't look much like a no good. That's not the man I mean, Celia. That's Howard White, her second husband. Oh. They say he loved her for years and followed her about and practically worshipped her. But she was married to this no good and wouldn't get a divorce. Then the no good died, I suppose. So Marcia Blair and her faithful Howard got married. Yes. I remember reading in the paper that they've been married one year tonight. I... I expect they're very happy. Well, I'd be happy, too, if I had a mink coat and a string of pearls like that. Well, you've got to admit she's beautiful. All right, Katie, if you say so. I used to go and see her act when I was a little girl. She she was kind of an idol. I wonder what they're saying to each other up in that box now. I wonder what they're saying. I wish you wouldn't be so uneasy. Nothing can happen to you here. You're uneasy yourself, Howard. Yes, I suppose I am a little. Howard, I know I shouldn't be talking like this on our first anniversary. But that's what worries me. What if Barry isn't dead? What if he isn't dead? Oh, listen to me, darling. Your late husband, heaven condemn his soul, died in New York more than a year ago. We have proof of that. Well, then who wrote those letters to me? I don't know, dear. Somebody playing a joke on you. Joke? If you marry him, Marsha, you won't be alive a year from then. Joke. But you're married to me, my dear, and you are alive. Shall I quote you something from another play, Howard? Well? The Ides of March are come. I, Caesar, but not gone. And it's still two hours. Two hours to the time we were actually married. Oh, look here, dear. This is carrying an obsession too far. It would be just like Barry to wait until the last moment. Just to make it worse. You knew him. Yes, I knew him. He was a genius. I suppose so. As a mere businessman, I never quite understood this theatrical temperament. Oh. Except yours, of course. Barry was a greater actor than Myron Willard will ever be. Barry could play anything, from a cockney to King Lear. His skill at makeup wasn't merely good. It was terrifying. Oh, Howard, I am frightened. Suppose he's managed to get close to us tonight and, and yet we can't see him. Well, the music started, Marcia. I, I shall have to go. Must you go, Howard? Really? If I break this appointment with Ferndale, dear, the deal will be called off. And since I haven't got too much backing anyway, I... All right, dear. I understand. Go ahead. Unless you wanted to come with me. And Miss Myron's opening tonight? Oh, I couldn't do that. I tell you, you'll be perfectly safe here, dear. Of course, Howard. I know that. You're in full view of 3,000 people. Nobody could attack you. The only door to this box is guarded. Outside that door will be Miss Fenton, who's devoted to you, and the chauffeur who's even more devoted to you. What could happen, dear? Nothing, of course. And I'd prefer to be alone anyway. Yes, I rather guess oh, that. Oh, please, dear. It's just that I can't endure anybody being with me when I'm watching a great play. But that doesn't include you, darling. Then, if you'll accept these, madam, in honor of our first anniversary... Oh, Howard... Well, they're lovely. Of course I'll accept them. And here's a program. Got everything else you need? Yes. Yes, I think so. I just opened the door to the passage to make sure our watchdogs are on guard. Yes, they're out there, all right. Good night, Marcia. See you in an hour or two. Good night, Howard. And good luck. 
Miss Fenton, Bradley. Yes, Mr. White. Yes, sir, anything wrong? Miss Fenton, you've been my wife's companion secretary for five or six years. Yes, Mr. White, and I've loved every minute of it. And you, Bradley, you haven't been my chauffeur for quite so long, but they tell me you're an ex-wrestler. That's right, sir. Champion of the Shoreditch Athletic Club. And in my prime, though I says it shouldn't, as good a man as ever climbed through the ropes. Now, you know your instructions, Bradley. You trust me, sir. Nobody gets into this here box tonight unless it's over my dead body. Nothing must happen, do you understand? Nothing. Please, you're as white as paper. As for you, Miss Fenton, I'm afraid it's a little awkward. I know I ought to ask you to go in and join Marcia, but... Oh, you needn't apologize, Mr. White. I know she doesn't want company. She'll be leaning forward with her elbows on the box rail, just as she always does. She isn't merely watching a play. She's acting, Lady Macbeth. Every line, every gesture... Oh, and I don't mean to disturb her. You you won't leave this door, either of you. You trust me, sir. If... Oh, no. Oh, anything wrong, Bradley? It is a very rummy-looking cove coming along the passage, sir, wearing a big black cloak with a red lining. Well, that man, Bradley, that's only Herr von Arnheim. He's a professional magician and escape artist. I was just wondering... Excuse me. Don't worry, Mr. White. We'll look after her. Von Arnheim. I say Von Arnheim. Thou canst not say I did it. Never shake the gory locks at me. I <laughs> beg your pardon. And I beg yours, my friend. I was merely quoting a line from the play. You are not leaving the theater. Surely not walking out on Macbeth. I'm afraid I have got to. Oh, that's a pity, my friend. You will miss some of my best effects, to say nothing of Shakespeare's. <laughs> when Banco's ghost appears at the table. I don't want to hear any more about ghosts, thanks. Banco's or anybody else's. I imagine you mean your wife's late husband. You've heard about it then? Yes, your wife has told me a good deal. She seemed to think that in my profession I might have some charm over demons or spell against ghosts. You know, Van Arnhem, in a muddled kind of way, that's what I've been wondering myself. No, unfortunately, no. I am all too human. But your problem interests me. And I confess it worries me. What is you? What about me? As I understand it... Her first husband was a half-mad American actor who later went completely mad and died in New York. His, uh... Oh, what's the word I want? Our obsession? Uh, that's it, obsession. His obsession was Marcia Blair's eyes. Yes, always her eyes. They seemed to hypnotize him. It is not new, you know. You'll find the same motive, the eyes of a beautiful woman, all through the works of Edgar Allan Poe. Then, as I understand it, after this man's death... She began to receive a series of letters. Foul letters. Apparently written by him and threatening her with some rather horrible form of death if she married you. I tell you, Barry Lake is dead. He can't get up out of his coffin. Oh, getting out of coffins, my friend, is not so difficult. I have done it myself. Oh, please stop joking, Van Arnheim. You don't happen to be dead. True. There is that small difference. Um, is your wife here in the theater tonight? Yes. She wouldn't have come here except that it's Marin Willard's first night. We haven't seen Marin, either of us, in years. She's back there in box D. Mm, so I hear. Uh, I was hoping uh, that you might invite me to share the box. Uh, look here, old man. I, I don't want to seem inhospitable, but... Uh, she doesn't want company? Well, that's about it. Well, then walk back a little distance with me, this way. So that you can see the stage from the back of the dress circle. Now, the orchestra has stopped and they'll ring up in a moment. There. Look at it. Look at what? The stage man. The lights have gone out. All except the dim yellow footlights shining at the curtain. The last cough, the last murmur, the last rustle of program dies away in one vast breathing hush. The curtain goes up. Let go of my arm, Von Arnheim. I, I've got to leave. Now, what are the stage directions? A desert place. Thunder and lightning. Enter three witches. <laughs> I beg your pardon, Von Arnheim. Do no, you speak? No, it was nothing.
London newspapers for that year, 1936, you may read how Myron Willard triumphed at Drury Lane as Macbeth. But tonight, as the clock ticks on, there is another drama in the dimly lighted corridor outside Box D. There sits Miss Louise Fenton, Marcia Blair's companion secretary. Beside her, burly and broken-nosed, is Big Jim Bradley, the ex-wrestler. And when more than half an hour has passed... There's the applause, Jim. That was for the end of the first act. Yes, I hear it. Nothing's happened. And take my word for it, nothing's going to happen. Oh, she's such a likable person, Jim. And I think one of our greatest Shakespearean actresses. Well, I don't much care for this Shakespeare business, Miss... You give me a good movie with gangsters in it. It's my style. Oh, you don't understand, Jim. I've seen her as Juliet, as Rosalind, as Portia, in our own drawing room without any props. I've heard her as Lady Macbeth, too. <laughs> you should see her eyes. Her uh, eyes, Miss? Yes, you should see her eyes when she delivers that speech. The raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal end. Hey, Miss, look there. Well, what is it? That foreign-looking cove in the black cape coming along the passage now. Easy. I beg your pardon. You are Miss Louise Fenton, aren't you? Uh, yes, my name is Fenton. What is it? I am looking for Arnheim, a friend of Mr. White's. And I must see Marcia Blair at once. No, you don't, Governor. You're not going in there. Why not? Because nobody goes in there. Not if it was the king himself. That's orders. Now, listen to me, both of you. When the lights went on, I happened to be looking at Box D from the other side of the theater. And I think yes. there is something wrong. But there can't be anything wrong. Jim Bradley and I have been sitting here the whole time. Except, of course... Except when? Well, except when I went in there for a few seconds. You went in there, Miss Fenton? May I ask when that was? Well, it was after Mr. White had gone and just before the play started. I went in to ask if she wanted anything. She said she didn't, so I came out again. And Bradley's been with me all the time, except when he went to get a drink of water up the corridor. That's as true as gospel, Captain. One moment and listen to me. Marcia Blair is leaning forward across the railing of the box. Oh, but that's nothing, Herr von Arnheim. That's the way she always is. Does she always fall forward with her arms held straight out and her head down on her arms? You better be careful, miss. It's a trick. Trick? Why not open the door and see for yourselves? Would that do any harm? No, I... I suppose it wouldn't, but... Oh, there must be some mistake. We haven't heard a sound from in there. There couldn't be anything wrong. You open the door, Miss Fenton. I'm going to hold tight to this gentleman just in case. <laughs> Quiet, please. Quiet. What is it, Miss? Oh. Walk in there with me, both of you. Please go carefully, as though nothing were wrong. <clears throat> we don't want to attract attention. Now. <clears throat> oh, help on, on I? There's... Blood all over her face. Yes. And don't begin screaming again, Miss Fenton, when I tell you she's dead. Bradley? Uh, yes, sir? Pick Miss Blair's body up and carry her out into the corridor. In another minute, we'll have the whole theater wanting to know what's wrong. All right, sir. You win. But what about the people in the other boxes? Won't they see? They've gone down to the bar to get a drink. They won't see anything. Hurry. Uh, uh, she ain't no lightweight, the poor lady ain't. Uh, steady, does it? Uh, uh. Hold the door open. Uh, that's got it. Now, close the door. Shall I put her down on the floor, Governor? Yes, better do that. I never took those threats seriously. That's what I blame myself for. And if something did happen, well, I, I thought he'd attack her. I never thought he'd hide away across the theater and fire a shot. And you were quite right, Miss Fenton. Marcia Blair was not shot. She... She wasn't shot. No. Take a look at the wound. Oh, I can't look at it. She was stabbed. Stabbed through the right eye oh. with a narrow, sharp blade which entered her brain and killed her instantly. Not a pretty death, but a quick one. You seem to know a lot about this, Governor. Perhaps I do, my friend. And perhaps I can guess a lot more. You mean somebody stood out there and threw a knife at her? Like a ready music hall turn? No, I don't mean that either. There's no knife in the wound and none in the box. The murderer took it away. Took it away? Exactly. Herr von Arnheim, please wait. You're not saying someone climbed up from outside, 20 or 30 feet from the floor, and stabbed poor Marcia in full sight of 3,000 people? That, Miss Fenton, is what the evidence seems to indicate. But it's impossible. Yet it happened. There is Marcia Blair's body. 
What's this? Oh, it's the warning bell for the second act. People will be coming back here anyway, any minute. What are we going to do? <laughs> Magical effects by Ludwig van Arnheim. Very few persons knew that there is a dead woman in the theater. But at the end of the play, it is a different story. The crowd files out past a cordon of police. The lights are extinguished. The great theater is dark and mumbling with echoes. See the stage now? Only the battens or overhead lights pour down a pale blaze on two men who stand grotesquely against the background of Dunsinane Castle. One of these men is Howard White, very near collapse. The other is Myron Willard himself, still wearing his makeup still wearing helmet and chain mail. And when Willard speaks... Howard! Howard White! Confounded man, can't you hear what I'm saying? Oh, excuse me, madam. I think this is all almost finished. Oh, not that I'm blaming you, old man. <laughs> Thank you, madam. It's traditional, you know, that Macbeth's an unlucky play. But up to the very end, I thought I'd never done better. Eleven curtain calls. No, twelve. Uh, how did you like my tomorrow and tomorrow speech? Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, madam. I'm afraid I didn't hear it. Oh, I... Yes, poor old Marcia. She'd have hated to die like that. Marcia was proud of her eyes. Always nearsighted as an owl, but too vain to wear glasses. Uh, there's Von Arnheim looking at us from under the castle archway. Von Arnheim! Did you call me, my friend? You're rather difficult to recognize under all that Macbeth makeup. Yes, I was just thinking the same thing. Uh, never mind that. Uh, where are the police now? At the moment, Mr. Willard, the police are in your dressing room. They are using you for questioning. Uh, no reception tonight, of course. No, but I thought you might be interested in two items of information that police have just discovered. Well, uh, go on. We had a fairly full house tonight, I believe. Fairly full. Every seat was reserved. Reserved, yes, but not occupied. I don't follow you. One box on the ground floor, box E, to be exact, was empty. Reserved and paid for, but empty. And box E, oddly enough, was just underneath the one occupied by Marcia Blair. Well, all the same, I still don't see quite what you're... Now, our next item of information comes from an usher. An outside eye seat in the stores, very close to that empty box, was occupied by a very curious stranger who arrived late in the dark and slipped out again by a nearby exit a few minutes afterwards. Just one moment, Van Arnheim. Are you saying this stranger climbed up and attacked Marcia in full view of the audience? No, my friend. The murderer did not approach from that direction. Then he must have reached Marcia through the door, guarded by Bradley and Miss Fenton? No, not from that direction either. Confound it, man. It must have been one way or the other. Not necessarily. Well, tell me, how. Don't you think I've got enough troubles already without this nightmare on top of it? Help on Arnheim. Help on Arnheim. Oh, you must take it easy, Miss Fenton. You must not excite yourself. Have the police been... Yes. Pres Look, you've got to help me. They won't believe me. They won't believe the young lady, sir, and that's a fact. I tried to help her all I can, but there's things I can swear to and things I can't. You see, I did go into that box. Oh, just for a couple of seconds, I admit it. But no other person went in or could have got in. So they say, or at least they're hinting that I killed her. But I swear I never touched her. Who was questioning you, Miss Fenton? Inspector Grimes or Sergeant Blake? I'm 
Well, I, I'm not sure. The sergeant, I think. Then I shouldn't worry if I were you. Inspector Grimes knows better. He's guessed, in fact, exactly what I have guessed. You seem on rather familiar terms with the police, my friend. I am, Mr. Willard. I am. Anyone who practices escapes from handcuffs, sacks, chests... And stage boxes, perhaps. Stage boxes, if you insist. Excuse me. Isn't that Inspector Grimes in the wings now? Yes, and he's nodding his head. Then I can tell you, I think, what you want to know. Well, if you do happen to know anything, it's your duty to speak up. Poor well, Marcia seems to have had some ridiculous idea that her former husband, Barry Lake, was still alive. Her fears weren't justified, of course, and she wasn't killed by any dead husband. I beg your pardon. Her fears were justified, though not quite in the way she believed. And she was killed by her husband. Then Barry Lake is still alive. No, Barry Lake is dead. Well, you don't mean Marcia was really killed by a ghost. No. I mean she was killed by her devoted second husband, Mr. Howard White. Do you know you hear what they say? That's not true. It's a slanderous statement. I, I'll have you in court for it. I, everybody knows how devoted I was to Marcia. Your devotion, my friend, was devotion to her money. And your business affairs have been shaky for a long time. That's not true and you can't prove it. Marcia Blyer was inclined to be, shall we say, a little close-fisted with money. That's true anyway. It's she a lie, a lie. willing to marry him, but Mr. Howard White knew he'd never touch a penny unless he killed her. He wrote the letters himself. Herr von Arnheim, he can't be guilty. She was alive after he left the box. He wasn't anywhere near her when she died. Perfectly correct, Miss Fenton. He wasn't there and yet he killed her. Exactly. But you and Bradley can supply the clue that will hang him. Uh, me, sir? I don't know nothing. No, I don't either. I think you do if you'll put your mind to it. Do you remember what Howard White said to her just before he left the box? Uh, yes, he said, Good night, Marcia. See you in an hour or two. And she answered, Good night and good luck. No, I mean just before that. I... Well, there wasn't anything. <laughs> you see? It's a slanderous statement without any proof. It's an insult to my position on the stock exchange. Wait. I do remember something rather queer. Think, Miss Fenton, think. He said to Marcia jokingly, if you'll accept these, madam, in honor of our first anniversary. And Marcia said, Howard, they're lovely. Of course I'll accept them. That's right, sir. He did say it. And what do you think he was referring to, Miss Fenton? What was he asking her to accept? Well, I imagined it was flowers, a corsage or something like that. Did you see any flowers in the box or pinned to Marcia Blair's gown? No. Well, come to think of it, I didn't. Then what did he give her? Uh, don't look at me, sir. Now, here is a woman who is very nearsighted, yet refuses to wear glasses. But she can accept a pair Opera of... Opera glasses. Miss Lie, you can't prove it. Uh, hold on, sir. Go. You better stay here, Governor. Thank you, Bradley. But the place is surrounded with police. But I still don't understand. Now, what happens when you lift opera glasses to your eyes and they are not in focus? You turn the little wheel in the middle to bring them into focus. For Marcia Blair, it was deadly. You mean the, the glasses had something... Yes, they were specially constructed glasses, Miss Fenton. They were invented by a French criminal years ago. That little wheel is a little trigger. It releases the spring of a sharp, thin blade which strikes through the eyes into the brain. Oh, don't, please. You can't prove it. Marcia Blair died instantly. The glasses torn from her eye by their own weight dropped over the box rail to the carpeted aisle below. The only witnesses who might have noticed would have been the people in the box just underneath. And that box was empty? By arrangement, yes. Even if anybody did see them fall, Howard White was prepared to remove the evidence instantly. You haven't forgotten the curious stranger. Curious stranger? I mean, the man who slipped in after it was dark, took an aisle seat just under the box, oh. and slipped out again a few minutes later. It's a pack of lies from start to finish. You can't prove a word of it. I beg your pardon, my friend. Didn't you see Inspector Grimes not to me a moment ago? Well, you are going to hang my friend for one of the neatest and cruelest crimes in my experience. The police have just found those opera glasses with a neat set of fingerprints in the side pocket of your motor car. And so ends Fireburn and Cauldron Bubble. Starring the distinguished actor, Paul Lucas. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. This is your narrator, Ted Osborne, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday. Same time, when Nancy Coleman stars in Fear Paints a Picture. 
William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer, conductor, Robert Salmon, studio technician, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. So with five canaries in the room and the performances of Ona Munson as Anita, Osa Masson as Fifi, and with Lee Bowman as Ronald Denham, who tells the story, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. The trouble was, you see, that a whole apartment vanished. It's true. A flat disappeared straight out of that apartment house. And the dead man disappeared with it. No, I'm not crazy. And in spite of what they said, I hadn't taken too many drinks. You see, I was getting married to Anita in another two weeks. And Jimmy Westlake gave a bachelor party for me. Oh, hang it, it's a situation that might have happened to you. The party was at the old Cap and Bells Club on Lower Fifth Avenue. And it wasn't a brawl. Jimmy Westlake was in the chair, I admit. But nothing could have been more quiet, more dignified. <laughs> oh, man. The myself from Armitage, Parley-Boo. Oh, man. The myself from Armitage, Parley-Boo. Oh, man. The myself from Armitage. Quiet, you fellas. Quiet. Pipe down, can't you? Wait a minute. The chairman wants to say something. Break Gentlemen. Down. Gentlemen, this is a solemn occasion. If those dopes over there will kindly get away from the piano and sit down at the table, I have another toast to propose. Excuse me, Mr. Wesley. Excuse me, please, sir. Yes, Uncle Cato. What is it? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Wesley, but you ain't going to bust the glasses on this toast, is you? And why shouldn't we bust the glasses, Uncle Cato? Why shouldn't we bust the glasses? Oh, but Mr. Wesley, if you keep on busting the glasses, there ain't going to be no glasses left. Well, in that sad eventuality, Uncle Cato, we will simply start busting the plates. Isn't that fair enough, boys? Oh, look, Jimmy, don't you think you'd better tone the gang down a little? Be quiet, Ron. You're only the group. Yeah, I know, Jimmy, but... Gentlemen, I regret to tell you this, but the protesting voice you just heard was that of our guest of honor, Ronald Denham. Now, we all know Ron, and we all like him. But I am sorry to say he is not himself. Where now is the terror of nightclubs, the chorus girl's friend? I say it to his face, he is sober. But we like him just the same. Friends, guests, and bachelors, I give you the groom. The groom! Gentlemen, don't bust the glasses. Hey, come on, Ron. Come on, say a few words. That's right, Ron. Get up. Come on. Now, look, boys, I thank you for all the good words, and I don't want to be a wet blanket on the party, but it's nearly midnight, and I've got to get home early. Oh, oh, 
Yeah, Don't yeah, you yeah. understand, boys? I'm a reformed character. Yeah, how's uh, Fifi Latour? Yeah. I haven't seen Fifi for over years. She doesn't mean anything to me anymore. He thinks he doth protest too much. Oh, oh now look, look, I'm marrying the sweetest girl in the world. But Anita's a little, well, straight laced. Oh, yeah. You know how it is. Now, what's more, there's my Uncle Rufus. Uncle Rufus. <laughs> Uncle Rufus. Quiet! Quiet! Anita and Uncle Rufus. Uh, Anita and Uncle Rufus have apartments in the same building as I have. And what's more, they're on the same floor, and that's not all. Tom Evans, the fellow I share my hey, flat with. wait a minute. With. Where is Tom Evans tonight? What's the matter with him? Tom works for Uncle Rufus, and he doesn't drink. Oh, he works for hey, Uncle Rufus. Hey, hey, fellas. Fellas. He takes a drink. Oh, he works wait. for Uncle Rufus. Quiet, you baboons. Quiet. He's a broker, and he's never in sink. Now, wait a minute. Will, will you put yourselves in my place? My girl and my uncle and my best friend, Tom Evans, are all expecting me to come home from this party in an ash cart. Sure. And I'm going to fool him. Oh, is that so? Oh, and I have a heart, can't you? This Uncle Rufus must be a pretty tough egg, isn't he? Oh, he's all right, but after his first million dollars, it went to his head. <laughs> Has he got any human weaknesses? Yes, he keeps canaries. Oh, oh no, not the kind of canaries you're thinking. I mean the kind that go tweet-tweet in cages. <laughs> oh, what's the use? What do you say, gentlemen? Shall we allow this pure in heart to wind his way home? He's got a great for the bride, though. That's right, Ron. Can you, as a chivalrous gentleman, Gentlemen, refuse to drink to the bride? You can't, and you know you can't. Uncle Cato. Yes, sir, Mr. Westlake. Get a beer mug from the sideboard there. Fill it with champagne. Oh, now, wait a minute, Jim. One more drink won't hurt you, Shirley. Just one little drink. Well, no, I suppose not. Fill it up, Uncle Cato. All right, I'll have one more drink, just in honor of the occasion. But that's all, do you understand? That's absolutely all. Yes, sir. 098 Park Avenue. Hey, 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 mister, mister. Hmm? Come on, wake up. Hmm? Uh, what's wrong? Well, you're home, mister. This is the apartment house. Oh, yeah. Yes, of yeah. course. All right. Thanks. Here we go. Easy now. Are you sure you're all right? Yeah. Yes, I... I'm all right. I... I've been to a bachelor party. Yeah, sure, I know. Well, take it easy now. I can't see straight. The whole street's going around. The funny part is, I only had a couple of drinks. They... They must have put something in that last... Well, it's none of my business, mister, but I wouldn't tell that to the missus if I was you. It's absolutely true. Oh, sure, sure. I know, I... And I haven't got a missus. Not yet. On my word of honor, I'm a reformed character. I have nothing to do with any woman except... Ronald Denham. As I live and breathe, it is Ronald Denham. Fifi Latour. Oh, Cherie, how good it is to see you. I look everywhere for you. I cry my eyes out, but I don't find you. What are you doing here? I live here, Fifi. I moved. I... Oh, you tried to get away from me, yes? Yes. Uh, no, no, I, I mean... Well, here's your money, driver. Good night. Oh, good night, sir. You're friend of yours, lady. You better take care of him. I'd take care of him. Yes, you bet you. My poor Ron. I forgive you this time, because you've been on the rassle-dassle and you need someone to take care of you. You live in this building, yes? Yes, fifth floor, I... Oh, good. I take you to your apartment. No. No, no. You say no, eh? And why not? Because you mustn't go in there. Oh. Oh, there's an hour woman. What? Oh, yes? Well, if, yes. The, the fact is, Fifi, I'm going to get married. Married? Oh, for heaven's sake, Fifi, don't make a scene in the middle of the street. Oh, you break my heart, eh? Right in the middle of Park Avenue, you take my heart and you break it bang, bang. Fifi, please. Now I tell you what you do. You will take me to your apartment this very minute. No, definitely no. You will give me one cigarette and one brandy. You will tell me what this means. Oh, I warn you, by golly, I start screaming so they can hear me at City Hall. I can't do it, Fifi. All right, then I start screaming. No, wait a minute. Oh, of all the times in the world you had to pick this. Do I go along, Cherie? Yes or no? Well, if I do take you, Fifi, will you promise to be good? Cherie, I am always good. You won't kick up a row or start banging at doors. Oh, if Anita heard of this. Anita? And who is she? Oh, never mind. I'm too groggy to argue. Come on. <laughs> A 
remember going into that building. Dim religious light, deep carpets, an automatic elevator that you work yourself. I remember stepping into that elevator because the floor creaked. I remember pressing the button for the fifth floor. I took Fifi with me and I took her into what the champagne told me was my own flat. Maybe you think that's funny, but it won't be funny much longer. Either the door of the flat was unlocked or my key fitted it. Anyway, I, I remember stumbling through the little hall inside, getting a light on and into the living room. I remember sitting back in an easy chair, thanking the Lord I was home. Mind if I take my coat off, Cherie? Look, Fifi, couldn't you just go home? I want to talk to you, Cherie. And this is one very nice flat. I like it. Thanks a lot. You and Tom Evans, you have good taste in furniture. We didn't choose the furniture, Fifi. This girl of yours chose it, I suppose? No, it comes with the flat. Oh, you mean? Well, these are furnished flats. They're all furnished exactly alike, except for the personal things you bring yourself. Like that picture on the wall behind me. What picture, Cherie? The painting of the clipper ship over there. <laughs> but, Cherie, <laughs> your eyes are funny and you cannot see straight. There's no picture on that wall. Wait a minute. What's wrong? Why you jump up? We we don't own any bronze bookends. And the, the lampshades are different. And, Fifi, we're in the wrong flat. Oh, well, then that explains everything. Explains what? It explains about the canary birds. What canary birds? When we first come in here, I think I hear a lot of birds sing. And I think, ooh la la, this is a funny taste for Ron Denham and Tom Evans. But then... Uncle Rufus. Great Scott. Uncle Rufus. This uncle of yours, he keep canary birds? Yes, five of them. But this isn't his flat. I know his flat as well as I know my own. Where'd you hear the singing? Behind that door over there, where I point. That ought to be the door to the dining room. But... What was that? Oh, it is a car backfire. Maybe yes. Maybe no, unless they keep cars in dining rooms. That was a gun. It came from the dining room. Yeah, I think so. Quick, let's get out of here. Oh, no, we don't. I've been pushed around tonight till I'm good and mad, and I'm just about crazy enough to find out what this is all about. You're not going to open that door. You just watch me. There's a light in that room anyway. How you know? Look under the sill of the door. Not a very bright light, but... Ron, don't do it. Stand back now while I get the door open. Dining room. Not Uncle Rufus. And five canary birds. Five canaries in cages, all in a line. Where in Satan's name are we? Oh, sure, I don't know. Whose flat is this? Who except Uncle Rufus would keep five canaries? I tell you one thing, though. And then I go out of here. Well? There's somebody watching us. Where? That swing door to the kitchen is partly open. But don't look. How the devil can I see it if I don't look? There's somebody standing behind it. I see the light shine on his eye. Quiet, Fifi. Hello there. Hello there. The door move a little more. He's pushing it. Oh, excuse me, sir. We didn't mean to barge in here. We're not burglars or anything like that. We got into the wrong flat, that's all. I want to apologize if we... Straight out through the door, flat on his face. What's the matter with him? Why don't he move? I've got an idea, Fifi. It's because he's dead. He was a little fat man with eyeglasses and a spade-shaped beard. He looked foreign somehow. And there was a bullet hole over his heart. You ask me what happened then? I don't know. Fifi turned and ran. At least I think she did. I bent over the man to make sure he was dead. And then something hit me. As though it hadn't been enough of a nightmare already, I... I could hear that blackjack strike the back of my skull. And everything exploded. I couldn't get my breath, and I, I seemed to be swimming in dark water. The next voice I heard wasn't Fifi's at all. It, it was Anita's. And... Ron. Ron Denham. Oh. Oh, my head. Oh, Lord, my, my head. Well, I'm not at all surprised. What's, 
What's that, Anita? I can't hear you. I said I'm not at all surprised. Of all the disgraceful, dissolute objects I ever saw. Anita, where am I? Oh, darling, as though you didn't know. But, uh, but I don't know. My head feels like a, like a printing press in full blast. Well, you're out in the main hall, dear, on the fifth floor, sitting on the stairs beside the elevator shaft. That's true. But how did I get here? Oh, now, really, Ron. I, I must have been carried here. That's it. By your drunken friends at the club? Well, I don't doubt it in the least. No, Anita. No, you don't understand. I left that party early. I was cold sober. But the low hounds wanted to see me come home in bad shape. So they could... So they, they put something in my glass. Oh, naturally, Ron. Whiskey or champagne? Oh, no, Anita. I mean a drug of some kind. I was dizzy when I got here. Just as I was getting out of the taxi, I met... Well, go on, dear. Whom did you meet? Uh, uh, nobody, Anita. Nobody at all. I came up here to what I thought was my own flat, but it, it wasn't my flat. It was somebody else's. There were a lot of canaries singing and a dead man with a bullet hole in his chest. And... <laughs> well, this sounds pretty crazy, doesn't it? Yes, dear, it certainly does. Yeah, but it's true. <laughs> oh, Ron, I suppose I've got to forgive you. I always do forgive you. Now run along like a good boy and sleep it off. Hmm? Listen, Anita. There's a dead man in one of these flats. A dead man? In which flat? Well, that's just it. I don't know. You're not saying it's on this floor. Yes, I definitely remember pressing the button for the fifth floor. Suppose you listen to me, dear. Now don't make faces and rumple your hair. Just listen. There are only two other apartments on this floor. One is your uncle. It wasn't I... his. I'll swear to that. Well, and the other is mine. You don't think I'm hiding a dead man? No, it wasn't your flat either. Well, then where is it, darling? A whole flat can't vanish and take the dead man along, can it? No. But I'll tell you something else, Anita. I've seen that man's face somewhere before. Well, whose face? The dead man's. Thick eyeglasses, square black beard, something foreign about it. I, I've seen him, or, or I've seen his picture, or... Oh, Ron, please. What's wrong? It's the elevator. Somebody's coming up. Oh, please don't let people see you. Your hat smashed in and your tie's untied and you, you look like nothing on earth. Well, look here, Anita. If it comes to that, what are you doing out in the hall in negligee and pajamas? Well, I wanted to make sure you got home safely. Ron, the elevator, it's Tom Evans and your Uncle Rufus. All right, I can take it. But your uncle can't. Now, don't say anything to him about this dead man. Promise me. Hold on, I've got it. Pierre Duroc. Who? Pierre Duroc. That's the dead man's name. He... year of 1938, the prospect of a European war is so remote as not to be worth serious consideration. Excuse me, sir, but isn't that a little strong? Now, don't argue with me, Evans. No, sir. You may tell my secretary to... Look here. What's this? Well, now look, Uncle Rufus. Oh, I can't stand any more of this. I'm fed up. Well, I don't blame you, my dear. Has this nephew of mine been annoying you again? Oh, no, of course not, but please don't pay any attention to him. He's... He's drunk. For the last time, I am not drunk. I just want to ask Uncle Rufus, before I go completely nuts, whether he hasn't heard of Pierre Duroc. What's that, Ronald? What'd you say? Pierre Duroc, the French millionaire. Well, what about him? He's the man who always deals in cash on the line. Spot cash, even if it's a million. I saw his picture in the paper. He's in New York to put through a business deal with you, isn't oh, he? Oh, indeed, Ronald. Well, you show a commendable interest in my affairs. That's what you want me to do, isn't it? Well, I believe Duroc does want to buy some property I own, but uh, he hasn't approached me and I haven't approached him. It's a bad business. Uh, why have you developed this sudden interest in Duroc? Because he's dead. Dead? Somebody shot him in a room full of canaries and then slugged me over the head. Do you believe me, Evans? If your uncle will excuse me, old man, I don't see any reason not to believe you. Where's the body? Well, that's the trouble. Ron claims he found it in a flat that doesn't exist. Listen. What's that? It sounded like somebody running upstairs in the devil of a hurry. Well, maybe it's the dead man. Well, as a matter of fact, it's the night porter. He's the one who can tell us. Tell us what? Well, maybe I did get off at a different floor, but that flat's got to be somewhere in this building. Pearson! Oh, just a minute. Pearson! I'm very sorry, sir. 
I can't stop now. Please stand aside. I've got to go upstairs and get the manager. Why, Pearson? Is anything wrong? Well, Mr. Evans... Speak up, man. Is anything wrong? It's the police, sir. We found a dead man in the palm garden downstairs. Now do you believe me? You will oblige me, all of you, if you remain quiet and allow me to deal with this. Uh, What does this man look like, Pearson? Uh, He's a foreign-looking gentleman, sir. Never saw him before. He doesn't live in the building. Well, then how did he get to the palm garden? Uh, Well, sir, that's what we don't know. He certainly wasn't there when I looked in half an hour ago. But I went back to the palm garden just by chance, and there he was in a wicker chair with the singing birds in cages all around him. Birds again? Oh, be quiet, Ronald. He'd, uh, He'd been shot, sir, the... Police think he was brought down in the service elevator from somewhere upstairs. Why do they think that? Because they found a revolver in that elevator and a little paper band of the, the kind that goes around banknotes. If they could tell where the dead man came from... You can tell us where he came from. Huh? I, I can, sir. Yes, you've been in most of the flats in this building, haven't you? I've been inside all of them, sir. Why? Well, would you recognize any given flat if I described it? Oh, well, uh, yes, sir, certainly, but... Uh... Well, then, for the love of Mike, think... Who lives in a flat with five canary cages in the dining room? Ronald, are you out of your mind? In case you don't happen to remember, you're describing my place. No, it, it was like your place, but it wasn't at all the same. Oriental prints on the walls. In the living room, uh, bronze bookends and, and bronze lamps. Uh, dragon patterns on the lampshades. There was a, a queer kind of clock on the mantelpiece, shaped like a figure of Father Time. And what's the matter with you, Pearson? Uh, nothing, sir. But uh, you're sure you saw all that? Yes, of course I'm sure. Why not? Because I'm sorry, sir, but you couldn't have seen it. What do you mean I couldn't have seen it? I did see it. Who lives in the blasted place? Nobody. Well, you mean the flat's vacant? Uh, No, sir. I mean, there's no such flat in the whole building. And that's the position I was in when the police took us down to that palm garden to see the body. I never did like the palm garden much. It's a big, dimly lighted hollow of a place with bird cages beside the palms and an artificial goldfish pond in the middle. I liked it even less at three o'clock in the morning with a dead man looking at me from his chair. They sent us in one at a time. I was first to see the homicide squad officer. And there was Inspector Braddock, a big, sleepy-looking hulk with a hat like a pirate, sitting on a bench throwing pebbles at that pond. Back would go his arm, and a pebble would hit the water. Back would go his arm, and a pebble would hit the water. And that's all you got to tell me, Mr. Dunham? Yeah, that's all, Inspector. It happens to be true. Oh, I believe you. After all, son, we've got corroboration. Corroboration from whom? From your other girlfriend, Fifi Latour. But Fifi's not here. She ran out of here as soon as Duroc's body fell through that door. Yes, but she didn't run far. A cop wondered why she was running and brought her back. Where's Fifi now? In that room there, talking to your official girlfriend. Oh, that's fine. That's beautiful. The one thing I didn't tell Anita. Why don't you wake up? Wake up? How? This isn't post office any longer. It's murder. And one of that gang out there shot Pierre Duroc. Are you serious? Serious. Sure, I'm serious. This is as clever and slick and mean a trick as ever went on the blotter. Pierre Duroc was one of the goats. You were the other. This uncle of yours is a fairly important guy, isn't he? Wait a minute. Just exactly what are you saying about the old boy? I'm saying he gets lots of publicity. This hobby of his, keeping dicky birds, must be pretty well known. Yes, I suppose so. All right. So if Duroc came to visit your uncle tonight... You say, if Duroc came to visit my uncle. What you're forgetting, son, is that Duroc's an important man, too. He's a visiting foreigner, capital letters, and the department's got to keep an eye on him. The Rock did go to visit your uncle tonight, and he was carrying $20,000 in cash. What are you intimating? Murder. Inspector Braddock. Yes, Sergeant? That crowd out there is raising cane, especially the old man and the French gal. Shall I let him in? Yeah, you can let him in now. <laughs> no. No, more than an hour. Sitting in an ante room without even hearing why we're here. I tell you, Evans, it is intolerable. It's all right, sir. They probably know what they're doing. You think so, my friend? But I still don't know why I'm here. How very interesting, Miss Latour. Such extreme absent-mindedness. Well, perhaps Ron could tell you why you're here. Oh, listen, Anita, I can explain everything. Can you explain the disappearing apartment? Well, that's better. I 
I'd like, if you don't mind, to have a little quiet here. Now, which one of you is Mr. Rufus Denham? I am Rufus Denham, sir. Rufus Denham of Denham and Company. Can there be any doubt whatever about that? No, but I thought I'd ask. I was just telling your nephew, Mr. Denham, that Pierre Duroc came here tonight to see you. To see me, Inspector? That's right. <laughs> I can only characterize that statement, sir, as a flat and downright lie. I've never met that man. I didn't say you met him. I said he came here to see you. Duroc wanted to buy some property from you, didn't he? Well, well, I suppose he did. And Duroc always paid spot cash, didn't he? Mm, yes, I believe so. Just one more question. I imagine you've got a secretary. Yes, naturally I've got a secretary. Miss Helen Gardner. What about her? Somebody posing as your secretary telephoned Duroc at the Metropolis Hotel and spoke to him in very good French. Well, Inspector, don't stop there. Go on. This person, pretending to represent Rufus Dunham, asked Duroc to come here with the money and said they could settle the deal immediately. Don't you see the trick now? Don't you see Duroc was lured into a dummy apartment? A dummy apartment? What does this man mean? I'll tell you. All the flats are furnished exactly alike except for personal things. Pictures, books, lampshades, ornaments. Is that correct? Yes, of course it is. The murderer didn't dare use Rufus Dunham's real flat. But the murderer could always decorate an imitation flat. So that Pierre de Roc would be deceived when he saw... Five canary birds. That's it, son. But what was the idea? A very neat swindle. Look at de Roc's body now. Oh, I can't look at it. Look at his thick glasses. Well, the man was half blind. This so-called secretary, disguised, would meet de Roc in an imitation flat. De Roc would hand over the money and get forged title deeds in return. When the rock had gone, the flat could be put right again and no evidence left. But uh, something went wrong. That's huh? right. Something went wrong. The rock suspected. And it had to be killed. Right again. Inspector Braddock, who is the murderer? Can't you guess? Cream, I think I know how it all happened. Do you, Miss Latour? Well, it's very smart of you. Uh, this poor Ronald of mine, he is at a bachelor party. They do not think that he will be home until daylight. Um, but he get reformed and come home early. He blunders straight into that flat in time to interrupt... In time to interrupt the murder, yes. Afterwards, when you were supposed to run away... But I did run away! Sure, Miss Latour, I'm admitting you did. Then why do you look at me as though I didn't? Afterwards, as I was saying, the murderer had to hit Ronald Denham over the head and drag him out in the hall. Turok's body was brought down here along with the canary cages that had been borrowed from here. And the dummy flat was set right again. Uh, just one moment, Inspector Raddock. I, I'm not disputing anything you say, but... Uh, well, sir, what's on your mind? The murderer. What about the murderer? Well, all this. Uh, wouldn't it have been much too heavy a job for a woman? Who said the murderer was a woman? Well, didn't you? I don't think I did. I said the murderer was somebody who planned a swindle. And you still don't see it, any of you, because you can't find the dummy flat. Well, no, and I can't find it myself. That's one question you've got to answer here and now. Where in Satan's name did I go? Whose flat was I in? Your own. What? My, my own? Naturally. If you'd been cold sober, you might have made a mistake. But your instinct brought you home to your own flat. And the only possible murderer is the man who shares that flat with you. The man who thought you'd be away until daylight. The man who knows enough about Dunham's business affairs to plan this swindle against Duroc. Look out, Inspector Braddock. Grab him, Sergeant. Thomas Evans, I arrest you for the murder of Pierre Duroc. Good Lord, Evans. Well, that's about all there is to the story. Anita and I were married last week. She's a wonderful girl. I tried to talk her into our staying on in my old flat, but she said she just have, had to have an apartment which didn't have such a habit of disappearing. But we're very happy. We agree about everything, don't we, dear? Oh, practically everything, darling. But I still don't think it was cute of Fifi to send up three dozen canaries for a wedding present. <laughs> So closes Five Canaries in the Room, starring Ona Munson, Lee Bowman, and Osa Masson. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday, when our suspense play will be Last Night by Cornell Woolrich. 
and will star more of your Hollywood favorites. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin and Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wines presents Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. The Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, welcomes you again to this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you as stars Miss Ida Lupino, currently being seen in Warner Brothers' In Our Time, and Mr. Vincent Price of 20th Century Fox, soon to be seen in the Daryl F. Zanuck production, Wilson. For the appearance of these two distinguished screen personalities, Lucille Fletcher has written a suspense play that deals with brooding anxiety and sharpening suspicion played against the severe and forbidding background of the late Victorian era. And so with Hugh in C minor and with the performances of Ida Lupino and Vincent Price, we again hope to keep you in suspense. April 1st, 1900. Dear Bessie, this is just to let you know that I arrived in Pilotsville. Lizzie met me at the station. She's heartbroken about Papa's bankruptcy and for some reason feels that it's up to me to remedy the family situation. I told her I'd been offered a job, but she swept away that idea in horror. A girl with your looks, Amanda Peabody, doesn't have to get a job. There are too many rich husbands floating around for that. Furthermore, she says she has a rich husband already picked out for me right here in Pilotsville. Don't you remember? I told you about him at Christmas time. He's a Mr. Evans, rich as Croesus, charming, cultured, a lonely widower with two dear little children. And besides that, he's just your type, a real intellectual. You should hear him play the pipe organ. And you know, Bessie, I've met so few interesting men lately. And all you'd have to do is lift your little finger. Mr. Evans. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Chumley. How delightful to see you here. I'd like you to meet my sister. Mr. Evans, my sister, Amanda Peabody. Delighted, I'm sure. It's a lovely party, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Miss Peabody. Have you just come to Pilotsville? Yes. Uh, she's down from New York visiting me after the whirl of the hectic social season. Oh, indeed. <laughs> well, I'm afraid our Pilotsville society must seem a bit dull to you, Miss Peabody. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. It's charming. I've enjoyed everything so much tonight. Your beautiful house, the music... I hear you're going to play for us, Mr. Evans. Oh, a bit. Do you care for organ music, Miss Peabody? Very much. I never miss a church recital. But what a luxury it must be to have your own pipe organ right here in the house. I'm afraid I couldn't do without it. It's my hobby, you know. Bach, Buxtehude, César Frank. Don't you adore their work? Oh, Amanda's very musical. You should hear her render the burning of Rome. (laughs) Yes. And the delightful thing, of course, about having a pipe organ in the house is that it's everywhere. To sit at a keyboard and hear the walls, the ceilings, the floors vibrate. You see, Miss Peabody, I've had the pipes installed all over the house. Under this floor, for example, are all the choir stops. Up in the bedroom walls are the stops for the swell manual. In the great uh, 32-foot pedal stops, the giant diapasons are underneath the staircase. 
My children sleep next door to the echo chamber. <laughs> so you see, we live like angels here in a paradise of music. How thrilling. Now, ladies, come upstairs to the second floor landing, won't you? And I'll show you the console. It was made for me in Vienna. April 7th, 1900. And Bessie, dear, to tell you the truth, I really find him fascinating. I wish you could hear him play. It sweeps you off your feet. There is such wildness to it, and at the same time, such dignity. And to hear the sound all through that marvelous house, rolling through those gorgeous rooms with their beautiful tapestries and potted palms, I could sit and listen to him all night. You have the most amazing eyes, Miss Peabody. What are you thinking about? The music. Oh, please don't stop. It's so beautiful. Well, you seem to be as mad about music as I am. Your sister says you play too. <laughs> oh, no, only a little. My appreciation of it is all inside, I'm afraid. That's plenty. If one can't play, it's better just to enjoy the music of others. I can't bear this sentimental drumming, can you? I shouldn't think you would enjoy it. The idiotic tunes people play nowadays. Give me the old stern classics. They have strength and power. Give me something with life to it. Something that will flood the whole house with sound. Marvelous. Uh, you're a very unusual girl, Miss Peabody. Quite unlike the run of girls here and down here at Pilotsville. Yes, in what way? Oh, it's rather hard to explain. Uh, some more tea, Amanda. No, thank you. A muffin? No, thank you. You have an excellent cook, Mr. Evans. Please, please call me Theodore. You know you promised. Theodore? Amanda. And your house is beautifully run, too. You must have an excellent housekeeper. Everything always looks so charming and quiet. I haven't even heard a peep out of your children. My children? Oh, yes, the children have been away at school. You have two, haven't you? Yes, Daphne and David. What sweet names. Ordinarily, I don't approve of schools for young children, but you see, they were rather overwrought. After Mrs. Evans passed on... Oh, I can well understand. They were almost morbidly devoted to their mother, and then, of course, the unfortunate circumstances of her death, but... <laughs> I suppose your sister, Mrs. Chumley, has told you all about that. No, not very much, except your wife was killed in a street accident, wasn't she? Yes, in Philadelphia, a brewery wagon and four horses ran her down. Oh, how terrible. It's something I don't like to think about very often. Poor, beautiful Margaret. Well, it's like a nightmare, Amanda, and I still can't feel reconciled, but... Well, what I was driving at was the children. They were in school when she died, and by some malicious stroke of fate, there was an epidemic of scarlet fever raging up there. The authorities wouldn't lift the quarantine and let them out for her funeral. Oh, poor little things. Yes, it upset them dreadfully. In fact, I sometimes fear it's left a mark on them which may endure all their lives. Why, what do you mean? They suffer from delusions. Delusions about her. They think that in some way she is linked. Her soul is imprisoned in the organ pipes. How horrible. I wish I could do something about it. It's a frightful notion, but they won't... They don't let me play when they're at home. That echo chamber in particular next door to their bedroom. Yes? You know, it's nothing but an empty sealed room with a few wires. Of course, it's all because they never saw her dead. But they have a notion that she's, well, somehow hidden there. How ghastly. They really think that, do they? Children can think up such very strange things in their little minds... Can't they? Tonight for suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as stars Miss Ida Lupino and Mr. Vincent Price, whom you have heard in the prologue to Fugue in C Minor. Tonight's tale of suspense. Let us look in on another scene for a moment. A smart dinner party at the internationally famous Hotel de Nacional de Cuba in Havana. One of the guests, a world-traveled American, sets down his wine glass and remarks that a truly fine wine always carries the unmistakable flavor of the particular vineyards from which it comes. Well, then laughs his Cuban host, you must be homesick for California right now. 
for the wine you are enjoying so much is from America, from California. It is Roma wine. Yes, it's true. Our own wonderful vineyard country in California produces in Roma wines that discriminating people in other lands esteem as an imported delicacy. Yet you here at home can enjoy these distinguished Roma wines for mere pennies a glassful. You pay none of the expensive overseas shipping charges and duties. Daily with your meals or when entertaining or any time, you can delight yourself with the wonderful flavor that comes from age-old winemaking traditions perfected by modern quality controls and tests. Yes, only pennies a glassful for a treat you are certain to enjoy. For remember, Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. Roma, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our sound stage Ida Lupino as Amanda Peabody and Vincent Price as Theodore Evans in Fugue in C Minor. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! April 18th. I met the children today, Bessie, for the first time. It was a shock. They're strange little creatures, utterly unlike their father. The girl is about 11 and the boy 8. They were both dressed in deep mourning. Their large grey eyes seemed strained with terror. They listened and trembled at every sound. This is Miss Peabody, children. She's a very good friend of mine. Now I want you both to shake hands with her. Oh, come now, Daphne. You can at least tell Miss Peabody how old you are. Oh, no. Please don't press her. I know when I was a little girl, I hated people to talk about my age. I'd much rather hear about, well, about school. We're not going back there, no matter what anybody says. David. That's all right. Then you didn't like school. No. And Mommy didn't like it either. She cried when we went away. Oh. But your mama wanted you to be educated, didn't she? She wanted you to grow up and be intelligent people, didn't she? Well, didn't she, Daphne? Who are you? You may call me Aunt Amanda. I'm a friend of your papa's. Do you know where my mama is? Your mama? Well, your mama's in heaven, dear. No, she's not. Then where is she, dear? Please, please don't start them off, Amanda. It's too upsetting. Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music, like old times. You remember when your mother was alive? We all used to play together. David, you with your cornet and Daphne at the violin... And Mama at the piano. Well, Miss Peabody plays the piano, too. And she's promised to play Narcissus, Mama's favorite piece. Well? Well, perhaps some other time, Theodore, when they don't feel so strange. I tell you, I've humored them to death. Now, come, David. There's your cornet on the mantelpiece. And Daphne? No. I insist. Look, now, I'll start the melody on the organ. David, you come in with your cornet obligato in the third measure. Daphne, you can follow me. That funny noise. What note? Oh, you mean that? Oh, that's just a cipher. A wire must have stuck somewhere. One of the pipe valves. It's Mama. That's where Mama is. She's calling for us. Oh, don't be silly. I'll just hit the key a few times and it'll stop. You've heard these ciphers before, haven't you, Miss Peabody? Well, I don't know much about pipe organs. It's a common technical occurrence, but very annoying, of course. What is she doing in there? Why doesn't it stop? That's where she is. She's in the pipe and she can't get out. Daphne, stop that nonsense. Oh, hush, dear. Your papa will fix it. No, he won't. He can't. She won't let him because he killed her. Daphne. Daphne, what did you say? <laughs> oh, she didn't mean it, I'm sure. The poor little thing's hysterical. We should never have tried to persuade them. Oh, man. Just because they never looked upon her face, because they never saw her lying there in the coffin. Oh, hush, hush. My own children believe that I am a murderer. Theodore, you're making them both sick. So I, I who loved their mother so much, who was so devoted for 12 years, do I look like a murderer, Amanda? Do I? No. There it is again. It's Mama. It's Mama. Shh, dear. I'll take them upstairs for you, Theodore, while you try and fix it.
April 24th. Oh, Bessie, those poor little children, we took them out to the cemetery today to show them her grave. A marble angel guarded it. It was planted with pure white tulips. How final it was and peaceful. And yet they began to tremble again the moment we set foot inside the house. Poor Theodore. The man is nearly out of his mind. What can he do? I keep asking myself that question. She died in Philadelphia, you say? Yes, on May 15th, just a little less than a year ago. You weren't with her? No, she went there to take a piano lesson. There was a new teacher she'd heard about. She was always so self-conscious about her technique. But she never reached his studio. They notified me at midnight from the city morgue. And no one in Philadelphia saw her? No one except the attendants at the morgue, of course, and the people who picked her up after the collision. It was such a brutal accident. Did there be no one from among them who could speak to the children, explain to them? Oh, no. Oh, it's so horrible, so sordid. Oh, I know, my dear. I hate to make you suffer. But if we could find some way, if they could just believe. When you brought her back here to Pilotsville, there was a funeral. Yes. And was there anybody then who saw her? Oh, no, I couldn't bear it, Amanda. I, I didn't think at the time she'd been so beautiful. Her lovely, sweet, gentle face and her eyes. The horses had completely trembled. Oh. Even if the children had been able to come home, I wouldn't have let them look... The coffin was sealed when I left Philadelphia. I didn't want to see her again myself. But there was a funeral. People came. There were flowers, an undertaker. Yes? Well, if they could believe that, if there was one witness, perhaps my own sister Lizzie. Amanda? Of course there was a funeral. The finest funeral in town. A snow-white hearse and 25 coaches. Everybody sent flowers. The casket wasn't open, but I've been to lots of funerals where they don't open the casket. And from what I understand, she was pretty badly mangled. But it was a beautiful funeral. Mr. Evans played the organ himself, the finest selections. All the sweet old pieces his wife liked. There was Narcissus and Mighty Life of Rose and Goodbye Forever. the way it was. So you see, David, my sister, Mrs. Chomley, was there. Yes, but how did she know it was Mama? Oh, David. Uh, she didn't see Mama, did she? Well, nobody saw your poor Mama, dear. She wouldn't have wanted anyone to see her. Mommy wasn't there. She talks to us every night. She tells us to look for her. Where, dear? In the pipes. But, David, your Mama's dead. She's been dead for nearly a year. Now, you she... saw her grave out in the cemetery. She's happy and at rest. Why doesn't Papas give us a key? If he'd only let us have it, we could look for her. What key, dear? The keys to the pipes. There's a little door just underneath the stairs. That's where they... That's where the big pipes are. And inside it's all dark. But where are the... But there are... There are tunnels. There's a little room... That's where she's hiding. That's where Mommy is. Oh. That's where Mommy is. Oh, David, darling, now look, come here. No, I hate you. But why do you hate me? Why don't you let me help you? Because... Because what? Because you... you like him. Him? Papa, you're going to marry him, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, you are. The Venus says you are. You're going to marry him. Then you'll send us back to school. There'll be no one left to help Mama. Poor Mama will never be left out. Oh, I hate you. I hate you. David, what are you doing here? David, did you strike Miss Peabody? He's sick, Theodore. I'm sure he's very sick. Now go to your room at once. Oh, those dreadful children. I tell you, Amanda, they'll ruin whatever happiness we might have. Theodore, I love you very much. But I couldn't marry you. Not with that child's cry ringing in my head. We've got to help them. Give them that key. Let them go and look in the room where the pipes are. Then they'll see for themselves that there's no ghost. Key? Who told you about a key to that room? The children. The children? Amanda, I'm going to tell you something. Something I've tempered, never told to a living soul. It, it may frighten you. Yes. Margaret was going mad when she died. 
Oh. No one knew it but me. It ran in her family. I discovered it long after we were married, after the children were born. Otherwise, I'd never have... And now you think the children? I'm afraid so. It was peopling of sound she had, just like them, a fear of the dead's returning. She used to play... What's that? It sounds like the organ. But the motor isn't on. The console was locked when I left. Someone's trying to play. No one but me can touch that instrument. It's forbidden in this house and the servants are out. Unless those children... Come upstairs, Amanda. Theodore. Why, there's no one here. No one at the keyboard. The organ's playing itself. That's impossible. The motor's not going. The motor? Yes, it sets the bellows going. There's no air in the pipes unless it's on. No air to make the pipes speak. It's impossible, I tell you. Perhaps the children found the key and got in. The key? No, no, no. The key's here in my pocket. There's no other way in. No. Theodore, open that door. Go in there and see what's happening, please. No. Theodore. I won't give in. I I won't be a prey to it. Do you hear? I, I won't. I, I won't. I won't. Stop now. Yes. It was probably really nothing but the wind. Theodore, give me the key. I'm not afraid. Are you saying that I am? I don't know. But I'll be fair with you, Theodore. I couldn't marry you and live here with that any more than your children can. What do you mean? Rip out those pipes. Rip out the whole pipe organ. Give it to a church, but don't keep it here. Get rid of it's the pipe worth... organ? Yes. But I couldn't. The whole house was built around it. It's been the very soul and spirit of this home. It's been the curse, you mean. Theodore, I know I'd go mad, too, if I had to listen to it night and day. It's so hollow. To think of those pipes so huge down there in the darkness. I'd begin to hear things, too. Oh, Be quiet. Be quiet. Come outside. We'll take a walk. No. No, give me the key. Give me the key. It's hysterical, Amanda. I'm sorry I've overburdened you. Why don't you want to go in there? Is it because you know something? You did something? What do you mean? Did you kill her? Very well, Amanda. Here's the key. If that's the way you trust me, we'll go down and look around together. Come now, Amanda. I'm sorry, Theodore. It slipped out. It was a dreadful thing to say. It's all right, I understand. Yet it hurts a little. I've trusted you so completely, Amanda. Theodore. Yes, Amanda. Let's not go in there. I do trust you, darling. I, I believe everything you've told me. No. This little key. To think it should mean so much. Oh. Oh, black it is. Yes, pitch black. And cold. Where are the pipes? I can't see them. Come in further, Amanda. You'll see them as soon as your eyes grow accustomed to the darkness. The biggest pipes pack this well under the great staircase like giants. Where is I? I'm beginning to see them now. Shouldn't we go and get a candle? Oh, no, no. Go in a little further. Be careful. The floor is a maze of wires. Now stand there for a second. Theodore, don't leave me. I won't be long. I thought you said you weren't afraid. No, I'm not only... Where are you going? Just upstairs to play for you. Theodore! I'd like you to hear how the music sounds in the darkness. It's quite an experience being so close to the pipes... You know, narrow, suffocating, especially when I pay the great Passacaglia and Fugue of Bach. Oh, Theodore, please. I don't want to stay Perhaps here. Perhaps one of the Rheinberger symphonies or the great chorales of Cesar Frank. <laughs> Margaret, of course, preferred Narcissus. Margaret? Now, you're very gullible, Amanda. Then you did kill her. You killed her in this room. And you're going to kill me. Yes, yeah, simple, isn't it? But why? I don't why? know. One gets tired every now and then of mere music... Sometimes the classics demand competition. A scream, for example. There's something so exciting about pulling out all the stops and drowning out all human sound. Have you ever tried to match your voice, Miss Peabody, against the thunderous voice of Bach? It's most effective. And then when the struggle gets weaker, when the air is almost gone and you choke and gasp for breath to bring the music down softer, softer... Theodore, you're mad, you're mad! Come, Amanda, would you deny me that pleasure? No, I Help. promise you the concert Help. won't be too long. It takes about eight hours before the air gives out, but you know I could play for days. And don't worry about the children. I think you've convinced them about the ghost. What's that? Theodore! Someone shut the door. It's locked and the key's outside. Who's there? Let me out! Let me out! 
Theodore. Get away from me. Let me out, do you hear? Let me out. Let me out. I can't breathe. I'm suffocating. It's so dark. I can't breathe. Let me out, please. Please. I can't breathe. I can't. No. No, no. I can't. I can't. Let, let me out. I can't breathe. I... I shall be coming home in a few days, Bessie. I still can't sleep at night. I still hear that laughter. Still hear that cornet playing its unearthly music. And Theodore Evans once more lies dead at my feet. It was his heart, Bessie. He died of fright. In those few moments, he anticipated the hideous fate he had meted out to so many. And I might have died there if he had not gone so quickly. But the children hated me. They wanted to kill us both. Those terrible, pathetic children. What horrors they must have sensed in that charnel house. There were other women beside his wife. The police found them all buried and stuffed away into unused parts of the pipe organ. Bessie, I was in that pipe room alone with him for four hours before that door creaked open. There they stood, and I shall never forget their faces or the things they said. All right, Miss Peabody. You can come out now if you're really sorry. I'm sorry. Are you sure he's quite dead? Yes, he's dead. We were right all the time, weren't we, Miss Peabody? Yes, you were right. Now, will you come and help us find Mama? And so closes Fugue in C Minor, starring Miss Ida Lupino and Vincent Price. Tonight's tale of... Suspense! Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Of all the rich treasures man gets from the earth and mother nature, none has been more highly esteemed than wine. Good, delicious wine. And if you are one who does not yet know how much and how delightfully Roma wines add to your meals... Well, let me urge you not to miss out any longer on such a treat as this. There's nothing complicated about it. Just get and serve Roma wine with any meal or any time in any kind of glass you wish. Serve it chilled. Try the many different kinds of Roma wine until you find those you like best of all. Try Roma California Sherry with its wonderful nut-like flavor as an appetizer or ruby red Roma Burgundy or the deliciously delicate flavored Roma Sauterne. These superb wines cost you only pennies a glassful. And yet, they make even the simplest meal taste like a million dollars. Get some today. And if your dealer is temporarily out of Roma, please try again soon. You owe it to yourself to have and regularly enjoy R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Ida Lupino. Mr. Spear has just been telling me a little about next week's suspense show. The star will be Thomas Mitchell in the story about a man who had headaches, tried everything to cure them, finally went to a psychiatrist and found out that he was a murderer. Now, that certainly sounds like a broadcast we listeners won't want to miss. One more word. Don't forget to buy that war bond this week. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Thomas Mitchell and Donald Crisp in... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Now, Roma Wines present... Suspense. Tonight, John Barbie and Son, starring Thomas Mitchell. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you... Suspense! This is the Man in Black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, who tonight from Hollywood bring you as star, Mr. Thomas Mitchell, who will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox production, Captain Eddie. He appears this evening in a drama of desperate escape. And so with John Barbie and son, and with the performance of Thomas Mitchell, we again hope to keep you in suspense. I'm afraid, Mary. For the first time since you've been gone, I'm afraid. I'm going to have to break my promise, Mary. I've tried. I've kept him out of sight, like you told me. I did just like you used to do when you were here, Mary. But it was that kitten that wandered into the place today. Carl didn't mean any harm. What he did... He didn't mean to do. It was just that he'd never held one in his arms before. And now they're coming for him tonight. They'll take him away. They'll take him to the home. Oh, if I could somehow just put them off for one more night. Ah, Mary, it would be easier if you were here. (laughs) Carl, Carl, I, I told you to stay upstairs till I called you. Oh, no, no, no. You're to stay in your room. I'm not going to let them take you away. Maybe I'll think of something. I've got to think of something. Shh. Carl. Carl, they've come. No, don't, no, be still. Be still. Go back to your room. Hide yourself. Uh, one moment. Uh, here. Here. Take my hand. No, no. Come. Shh. Come with me. Come with me. You're to stay in your room and not make a sound. You're to be very quiet. Do you understand? If if you do as I say, I might be able to keep you here one more night. Coming. Mr. Barbie? Yes? I'm Mr. Wilt from the home. I've come for your son. I know, uh, but the boy is ill. We'll take care of him. Oh, uh, Far better than you can here alone with him. But I'm afraid it's something contagious. He's broke out in a a rash. Are you sure? Yes, yes, he's got some sort of red spots all over him. Well, I I wouldn't want to run the risk of infection. I mean for the others at the home, of course. Of course, that's what I mean, Mr. Wilk. Perhaps I'd better have a look at him. Oh, please, please, Mr. Wilk, the boy's asleep. We'll have to wake him. Uh, You don't understand, Mr. Wilk. He's miserable since he knows he has to go. Don't wake him. You have my sympathy, Mr. Barbie, but I have my orders. Well, uh, uh, if you could bring a doctor first thing in the morning, then you'd be sure of no one catching anything from him. Well, I I suppose that would be better. Yes. What about the neighbors? Oh, Oh, they won't know. They've never even seen him before today. If it hadn't been for that kitten... I can't go into that with you now, Mr. Barbie. No. The animal's dead. Yes. However, under the circumstances, it might be better if I brought the doctor back with me in the morning. (laughs) Thank you, Mr. Wilk. But the boy's not to leave the house. Do you understand? Yes, yes. We'll be here at nine sharp in the morning. Good night. Good night. No, 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 no. It's it's all right. It's all right. Now you you can stay one more night. Well, Carl, I promised your mother that I'd never let them take you away. That I'd do anything 
before I let them do that. What are we going to do? I know what happens to them at the home. I've seen them after they've been there a while. They'd be better off... Carl, how would you like to go away? Yes, yes, how would you like to go someplace where they'd never reach you? Yes, that would be better, Carl. That would be much better. Here comes a truck, Carl. Now listen carefully. You're to hide in the bushes by the side of the road here. I'm going to flag him. If he stops to pick me up, you're to climb in the back of the truck without him seeing you. You're not to make a sound. You're not to try to say anything and stay there until I call you to get out. Do you understand, Carl? Yes. Now get in the bushes. Hello. Any trouble? Uh, could you give me a ride to San Diego? Sure. Hop in. Oh, thank you. Oh, oh, oh just a moment. Yeah, something wrong? Uh, yes, my glasses. I seem to have lost my glasses. Oh, did you drop them? Yes, I, I'll find them. I had them a minute ago. Okay. Uh... Can you see out there? Uh, I'll take a look around back here. Want a flashlight? Oh, never mind. Uh, get in the back of the truck, Carl. Do you understand? Yes, uh, that's it. That's it. Uh, uh, I, I found them. Oh, good. Yes, right by the back of the truck here. Well, thanks for waiting. Lucky break. Yeah, tell you the truth, I... I don't usually stop for people, but it's so late, and you're a little, well... Uh, a little older than most you see on the highways. Oh, I, I, I didn't mean that, but uh, what's the matter? Do you have uh, car trouble? Uh, no, I, you know what transportation is in these days. I couldn't get a bus or a train. Yeah, yeah, I know. Lots of soldiers and defense workers in these parts have to consider them, you know. Oh, yes, of course, I know. Uh, 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 tell me, do you, uh, do you make this trip often? Oh, yeah, twice a week. Oh, I, I imagine you get pretty tired of it, don't you? Oh, no, I, I like being out in the open. Uh, yes, uh, Hey, uh, you hear that? Yes. I suppose he's getting restless. Oh, that you saw... What was that? Oh, that's my cat. What do you mean? Oh, I picked up a stray cat back in Pedro. Oh. Cute little kitten. I got a box fixed up for him in the back of the truck. You know, it gets pretty cold up here. A kitten? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's the matter? Oh, hey, uh, my, my billfold. I seem to have lost it. You have? Gee, when did that happen? I don't know. I guess I guess back where I dropped my glasses. I had it then. Oh, well, that's too bad, but uh, I can't go back, you know. Oh, no, no, no. I wouldn't expect you to. If you'll just let me out here, I'll catch another ride back. Well, okay. Uh, if I was on my own time. Oh, no, know. no, no. Thank you very much. It'll be all right. Okay. Good luck. I, I hope you find it. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, j just a moment. Yeah? Uh, the, the back end of your truck's open. Oh, it is? Oh, well, I'll... Uh, no, 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 no. Don't get out. I'll close it for you. Oh, thanks. Uh, get out. Get out, Carl. Run back from the road. Down the road. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, it's all right now. You can drive on. Oh, how's the kitten? Oh, huh? oh, he's all right. He's fine. You huh? can drive on now. Oh, well, thanks. So long. Long. <laughs> Carl, Carl, oh, 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 no, you don't have to hide anymore, sonny. He's gone now. Oh, you were a good boy, Carl. You did just like I asked you to. And you didn't, you didn't touch the kitten, did you? Come on now. We'll get other rides. We'll manage. Tonight for Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Mr. Thomas Mitchell, whom you have heard in the first act of Mel Dinelli's radio play, John Barbie and Son. Tonight's tale of Suspense. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Have you ever noticed the knack some women have for making their guests feel welcome, relaxed? Well, one such woman is the renowned hostess, Elsa Maxwell. And here's what she suggests you do the next time friends come to dinner. 
Flatter your guests and make that dinner more enjoyable by serving good Roma California wine. You'll find Roma's golden sauterne is delicious with all main dishes and particularly a delightful flavor mate with fish or fowl. Two point-free foods now more popular than ever. Just be sure you serve that good Roma sauterne well chilled. You'll enjoy the delightful bouquet, the superbly delicate flavor, and golden glory of this wine grower's masterpiece in any glassware. Distinctive Roma wines are grown in California's choicest vineyards. Beginning with choice wine grapes picked and gently pressed at the top of their flavor richness, then watched over and developed with all the ancient winemaker skill of Roma's famed wineries. The quality of Roma wines never varies. Always the same tempting flavor. Yet all this goodness is yours for only pennies a glass. No wonder more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. R-O-M-A. Roma Wines. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Mr. Thomas Mitchell, who resumes his role as father and fugitive in John Barbie and Son, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Well, it was a long walk, eh, Carl? But we'll get us a room now and get some rest. I'm going in alone. It's not good for us to be seen together. You wait here on this bench and you're not to talk to anyone. Not to anyone. Do you understand? I won't be long. Good evening, sir. I'd like to have a room, please. Oh, you're very lucky, sir. I've just had a single vacated. Oh, you haven't a double? Oh, I'm sorry, I haven't. I, I thought you were alone. Oh, uh, well, I am, but uh, I prefer a double bed. I'm afraid you're going to have trouble finding any kind of a room in San Diego, sir. We're lucky to have this one. Uh, yes, I'll take it. It'll be all right. All right, sign here, please. Yes. It's really not a small bed. It's three-quarter size. Here's your keys, sir. Oh, uh, that's fine. Thank you. Oh, uh, could you tell me... Is it on the ground floor? Huh? Why, no, it isn't. Oh. Had you wanted it on the ground floor? Uh, yes. Uh, you see, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm a little nervous about fires. Oh. Oh, well, there's a fire escape just down the hall from you. Oh. Oh, there is? Uh, that'll be all right, then. I've got to get... I mean, I'm, I, I'm going out for a while. I, I'll be back later. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh... Hmm. Did you hear that, Miss White? Yeah. Can't sleep in a single bed. Afraid of fires. <laughs> I'll tell you, you meet all kinds, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you certainly do. I'm right behind you, Carl. Yes, son. Nothing to be afraid of. You've never been on a fire escape before, have you? <laughs> it's fun, isn't it? It's only a little ways now. Here, here, take my arm. Ah, here we are. Now you stay back until I look in the window first. See if anyone's in the hallway. Huh? Ah, it's all right. I'm sure it's all right. Yes, it's all right. Come on. I'll help you through. Shh. Someone's coming. Stay out there, Carl. No, no, no. Stay out there on the fire escape. Don't make a sound. Hey. Oh. Uh, 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 oh, Mr. Wilson. Oh, good evening. Aren't you at the wrong end of the hallway, sir? Yes, I... Can't you find your room? Uh, uh, yes, but I, uh, I was just looking around. Oh, the fire escape. Yes, I... I, I see. You wanted to try it out, huh? Uh, well, uh, I'm a little nervous. I understand, sir. Would you like me to show you how to get out onto it? Oh, no, 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 thank you. I've been out there already. Oh, you have? Uh -huh. Well... You feel better about it, then? Yes, yes, thank you. Anything I can do for you, sir? Uh, uh, no, no, I, I, I'll be getting to my room now. Well, I guess we'd better close this window. It looks like a rain's uh, coming. Uh, no, no, I, 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 I'll close it. Okay, sir. Good night, Mr. Wilson. I hope you sleep well, sir. Uh, good night. It's all right. Come on, Carl. Careful now. Follow me, quickly.
Ah, there now. Hungry, Carl? Well, I'll get us something to eat. Then we'll have a good night's rest. Miss White. Yeah? I just found the old boy up in the hallway. He was trying out the fire escape. Can you beat it? When? <laughs> just now. Well, but how did he get up to his room? He didn't come back through the lobby. What? He didn't? No. I know I would have seen him. He must have used the fire escape then. Say, there's something funny going on around here. Hey, look, it's his room. Hmm? Office? Uh, no. Yeah, well, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Wilson, but we don't have meals sent up anymore. Uh, there's a cocktail lounge and a restaurant on the roof. Oh, it's really quite nice. And there's a terrace where you can step out and get a wonderful view of the entire city. Uh, yes, sir, you're welcome. Meals sent up. I guess he don't know there's a war on. That fire escape business puzzles me, and now he wants his meal sent up. Say, do you suppose he's got somebody up there with him? I don't know, but I'd certainly like to take a look at his room. And I think I will if he goes out. That's a good idea. Now, I won't be long, Carl. But you're not to make a sound while I'm gone. And if someone comes to the door, don't you answer it. And if someone starts to unlock it, you hide. Here, here. Hide here in this closet. You understand? Remember now, no noise. Do everything I tell you and everything will be all right. Yes, yes. I'll get you something to eat and I'll be right back. Going out again, Mr. Wilson? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, to get a little something to eat. Uh, have a nice dinner. <laughs> Thank you. Miss White. Yeah? Have Frank take the board. Let you and I go upstairs. We'll have a look around while he's gone. Okay, okay. Uh, Frank. Yes, ma'am? You saw the old man that just went out the door? Yes, ma'am. Well, we're going up to his room. If he comes back before we return, ring twice to warn us. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I have a feeling someone's in there. Well, if there is, they're not coming to the door. Not if he sneaked them into the hotel. Oh, yes, I suppose you're right. I guess I'd better unlock it. Hmm. Well, there's nothing unusual here. Look at this bundle of things, though. What do you mean? Well, here's a cap. Well, that looks like a boy's. Oh, still, it might be his. He wasn't wearing a cap when he came in. No, he wasn't. Uh, should I look in the closet? No, I don't think we need bother. If he did have someone in here, they're not here now. Well, I just think I'll take a look, as long as we're here. Oh. 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 Uh, that's Frank. Well, he couldn't have had his dinner that fast. Maybe Frank's made a mistake. I'll see. Uh, Frank? Yeah? All right, we'll be out. He says hmm? he's carrying a package. Must have brought something back to eat here in the room. Come on, Miss White. We'd better get out of here. Hey, we'd better go down the stairs. I think he'll be coming up in the elevator. Come on. <sighs> Miss White. What's the matter? You've walked off with the cap. <gasps> Great Scott, I have. Uh, uh, I didn't realize... Uh, well, uh, what do we do? Uh, shall I go back? No, 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 no. I don't think you'd better. No. He'll be up here any minute. Yeah. Well, maybe he won't miss it. And we can put it back if, if he goes out again. Yes, yes. Come yeah. on. <laughs> Yes, sir. Top floor. Thank you. Ah, here we are. Milk and... Uh, uh, Carl. Ca Carl, where are you? What are you doing in the closet, Carl? Was somebody here, Carl? Someone's been here. Where's your cap that was on the bed there? Who's here? Evening. I'd like to see the manager. He's not in. I'm in charge. Could I help you? I'm Detective Bourne. Oh, oh. We're checking hotels in the vicinity for a certain John Barbie. Have you anyone registered with that name? No, no, I don't believe I have. But uh, what kind of a looking man is he? Well, older man, about his 60s. 
Hey, wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. I, I have someone here who answers that description. He's been acting peculiar, too. But he's registered under the name of Wilson. Uh, here it is. John Wilson. He might be the one you're looking for, and I have a hunch he is. Is he in his room now? Yes, yes. He went up just a short time ago. I'd like to go up. Here's my badge. Oh. What's the room number? Uh, 408. Is it, uh, is it something serious? Yeah. Murder. trouble, but I think it'll be easier if he opens the door himself. Well, I I'll say that it's something about his moving to a double room. Yeah. Mr. Wilson? Oh, Mr. Wilson, I have another room I think you'd be interested in seeing. Well, I don't think anyone's there. Have you a pass key? Oh, yes, yes. Open the door. But, but That's I... all right. I have a gun. I'll stand back out of sight. There's no one here. Look back at the door. No. Here. here. Maybe the closet here. No. No, there's nobody here. Say, say, he must have had somebody with him after all. What do you mean? Well, he registered alone, and I suspected there was someone with him, but look, look, look on the dresser there. Two bottles of milk and two sandwiches. They haven't been touched, either. You must have left here in a hurry. Is there a fire escape on this floor? Oh, yes, there is. And I found him looking it over right after he moved in. Well, come on, let's have a look at it. Yes. Uh, right this way, please. Down the hall here. Look, the window's open. He must have gone out that way. Uh -huh. Let's have a look outside. No one down below. We must have just missed him. Look, Mr. Bowen. What is it? There's somebody up above. Somebody climbing in the window at the top of the fire escape. That's him. Come on. Wait, wait. It'll be quicker going up to the elevator. He can't get away. There's a cocktail lounge on the top floor. We'll catch him there. There's no place else for him to go. Careful now. Careful. Go through the window, Carl. Ah, that's the boy, Carl. They're following us. I know that. They'll always follow us. You've got to do everything I tell you now. You've got to understand. Come on. Um, uh, pardon me, sir. Yes? Is there a terrace room on the floor? Oh, yes, there is. You'll get a wonderful view of the city. It's, uh, it's straight ahead through the cocktail lounge. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, isn't it beautiful? Just look at the skyline. That's Coronado over there. Nice, isn't it, Carl? Carl... If they catch up with us, it means you'll have to go back to the home. You understand that, don't you? We promised your mother we would never let that happen, and we're not going to. Oh, look at that man over there. What? He's climbing up over the iron fence. Stay there. You better get back. Oh, somebody stop him. It isn't going to hurt much, Carl. It'll be quick. Say, look. Mr. Bobby. Mr. Bobby, don't. Uh, stay where you are. This is my affair. Now, Mr. Bobby. That isn't going to do anybody any good. Now... Just listen to me a moment. If you come a step closer... I won't, I won't. But listen to me. What do you want? Now, Mr. Bobby, don't jump. Come back with me. They'll go easy on you. You'll not take him back to that home. I know what happens to them there. Now, Mr. Bobby, you're ill. You don't know what you're doing. You're... Now, I, I, I listen... tell you not to come any closer. All right, all right, I won't. But listen now. I'll not you... listen to anything. I know what's best for my boy. I promised his mother, didn't I, son? What? Who are you talking to there, Mr. Barbie? Don't pay any attention to them, Carl. Why, he... He thinks the boy's there with him. Are you ready, Carl? You don't want to go back to that home, do you? Mr. Barbie. Now, there's nobody there with you. What? What did you say? I say there's nobody there with you. No, but... Ah... <laughs> What kind of a trick is this? Well, you're just imagining things. You're ill. Now, they'll go easy on you, I promise you that. There's nobody here with me? No. Your son's dead. And what you're going to do now won't help anything. Well, this is my son here by my side. No, no, Mr. Barbie. No one's by your side. Ah, this is a trick. Oh, I see it now. You are trying to confuse me to keep me busy talking so this man could sneak up behind me. Is that it? Mr. Barbie, 
Now, we're just trying to save your life. Now, come back. Come back away from that ledge and let us talk. No. No, I've had enough of your tricks. Are you ready, Carl? Oh! Oh, no, no, no. Don't let him. It won't hurt much, Carl. Oh, no. Take my hand, son. Take my hand. Oh! Oh, 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 my dear. Oh, that's terrible. Oh. Oh. May I... May I ask what he was wanted for? Murder. Murder? Yeah. He killed his son last night. The authorities are going to take the boy away to a home. And I guess his mind just snapped. It's probably better this way. Because he thought the boy was with him. Right to the end. <laughs> And so closes John Barbie and Son, starring Thomas Mitchell. Tonight's study in Suspense. Suspense is produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Before Mr. Mitchell returns to our microphone, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Genuine cordiality, unaffected simplicity. These are qualities that have made Miss Elsa Maxwell's hospitality famous the world over. In her own words... Friendliness and hospitality begin at home. And there's no better or simpler way than with a glass of distinctive Roma wine. I suggest Roma Toque, a most delightful wine, to be enjoyed any time, any place. Serve with coffee or dessert as a delightful finishing touch to your meals. Or set out Roma California Toque with cheese and crackers when friends drop in. Roma Toque is a velvety, flame-colored wine, moderately sweet, light, with a slightly nutty flavor. Be sure it's Roma Toque you serve. That's a mighty worthwhile idea, Miss Maxwell's. Try Roma Toque and the other Roma wines, too. You can depend on Roma wines to be always delicious, always pleasing to the palate, of unvarying fine quality. And the next time you use vermouth, sweet or dry, choose Roma Vermouth. Zestful, herb-flavored Roma vermouth is blended, mellowed, and developed with all the traditional wine-making skill of Roma wineries, yet surprisingly low-priced. Try Roma vermouth soon, will you? This is Thomas Mitchell. It's been a great pleasure to appear here tonight on Suspense, a program for which all actors have a unique regard. Next Thursday, my old friend Edward G. Robinson will be your star. Mr. Spears has been telling me a little about the story. Sounds like surely the most remarkable predicament a man ever got himself into over his wife. I'm sure you won't want to miss it. I know I won't. Night. Remember, next Thursday, same time, you will hear Mr. Edward G. Robinson as star of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California... For enjoyment throughout the world. CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wines presents Suspense. Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salute! Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black. Here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. To introduce this weekly half hour of... 
Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you Miss Faye Bainter, Mr. Ralph Morgan, and Mr. Dane Clark in a suspense play dealing with a mother and a son and a lodger who kept an appointment with death. And so, with Life Ends at Midnight, and with the performances of Faye Bainter as Mrs. Bates, of Dane Clark as her son Walter, and of Ralph Morgan as Mr. Chalmers, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Mom, it's your little sunny boy, Waller. You still remember my whistle, eh? Oh, yes, I... But what I... I didn't... Uh, know Never that... know when I'll turn up, eh, Mom? What's the matter? Do we have to stand here in the hall? Oh, no, no. Come in. I... It's just... Come in, Walter. Well, it's the same old crummy joint. I do my best to keep it clean, Walter. Yeah, I know. Regular old Mother Hubbard. Gonna have to clean up the whole south side before you get the magoo out of this flea bag. Oh... Boy, am I tired up all night in a stinking day coach full of snoring jerks and squalling babies. <sighs> babies are the worst. All they do is ball and slobber. You left Pittsburgh last night? One in the morning. Didn't sleep a wink. Yeah, look at my collar. But tomorrow is Monday. You have to be at work in the morning. Sure, I... What's the matter? You worried? Oh, no, no. I, I just... Don't just. Can't a guy come home and see his mother once in six months? That's a mother for you. You break your back. You sit up all night to see your mother for one day, and she tells you you have to be at work in the morning. How do you like that? Uh, well, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't miss you, so I just worried yeah, about... Yeah, 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 I know. Well, don't worry so much. It makes me nervous. Here, sit at the table, dear. You must be starved. Oh. All right. Now it's like coming home. Oh, my <laughs> baby. I'm so glad to see you. You did come just to see me, didn't you? Who else? Hattie Lamar? Well, of course you came <laughs> to see me. It's just that I always worry so about you, forget I it, mean. Forget it. Well, what's the eat? I was just making a chop for my lunch. That's all. There seems to be in the house right uh, now. It'll be enough for me. It'll be ready in a minute. Now tell me about yourself, your job. Never mind about me. How are you doing? Well, I try not to complain, Walter. Things are not easy. Prices high. Rent's going up all the time. Even on this old house. Honest, I don't know what I'm going to do if things don't... You uh, had some bonds Papa left you. You had about $2,000 bonds he left you. You still got Well, them? I'm trying to tell you, Walter, things haven't been easy. And... Always a poor mouth. Every time I see her, she's putting on a poor mouth. I'm just saying things aren't easy. And for me, do you think it's a picnic? I got enough trouble, and for what? For what? All year I work like crazy. For what? A man must work, Walter. A man must work, Walter. Ah. Yes, that's true. A man must work and live like a person. And not be afraid so that he can sleep without worrying about... About... About what? About a bell ringing at night, or a knock on the door in the morning, or someone touching you on the arm. Yes, it's a nice feeling and a free feeling to be able to walk down the street in the sun with your eyes meeting another man's without wondering if he. Shut up, shut up! I ain't in trouble against her. Stop mouthing at me. You're always mouthing at me. You haven't... You know what the judge said the last time, Walter? He uh... was nice. Now he gave you another chance. He saw you were really a good boy, and he gave you another chance. He got you a nice job, and you promised to... You must... Oh, you're all right, Walter. You didn't... A uh, meatball. A herring on a plate all your life. You're a tomcat in the garbage. You find a fish head and you say, Thank you, mister. You chew a fish good and you smile pretty. Well, not for me. You take a chance and you throw away the fish heads. You get one break and you're out of the garbage can for life. You throw a time clock and shiny pants. You're in a higher brackets and nobody gets you. Yeah, you're a mister with a future. You hold your nose when you walk from the day coach to your compartment. You leave the stinks behind in a port of dusty air in front of you, and that's for me. One break. One break, and you're as hot as a rocket shooting diamonds for sparks. Walter! You're a P-38 in a world full of flivers. A bucket, you two. Two gets you four. Walter! Good for one blonde to kick her and a kisser. Walter! It's all right. I took another chance. I try to run it up. No dice. I gotta make it good. Tomorrow morning, I gotta make it good. The books at the office will show it, and I gotta make it good. How much? Fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred dollars? By midnight tonight, fifteen hundred. If I miss that twelve twenty for Pittsburgh, it's all up. I, 
I, I might as well take gas. Fifteen hundred. By midnight tonight. Where am I going to get it, Walter? The bonds. You got the bonds, Papa. The bonds. How do you think I got you out of the last trouble? Bribes, bail, paying back every dime. Where do you think I got I'll it? I'll get ten years. You heard the judge last time. What can I do? What? Ten what? years in start. Ten years. There won't be no reform school oh, this time. Walter, oh, look, Walter. please. Please, Ma, please, get me the money. I'll, get it for me. I'll be good. I'll work hard. I won't give you no more trouble, but help me now. Please, Mama, please. Where, where can I get it, I... Walter? I have nothing left. <laughs> nothing. I don't care where you get it. It's your fault, and you got to help me. I only wanted to help you, yes. and now I'm going to... Yes. It is my fault. I've always protected you, but I, I can't protect you anymore. I'll give you the few dollars I have. Go away. It'll be enough to help you run away. That's all I can do. You're holding out on me. You're worrying about your old age. You're making yourself a cushy little... No. Oh. Oh, oh I, I, I'm sorry. I, I hope I'm not intruding. Who, who's this? Oh, Mr. Chalmers. This is Mr. Chalmers, Walter. He has the back bedroom. This... This is my son, Walter, Mr. Chalmers. How do you do, Mr. Bates? I feel that I know you very well. Your mother and I sit here in the kitchen sometimes over a cup of tea, and she talks about you for hours and hours. Yes, I can see why mother is so proud of you. How do you do, Mr. Bates? Yes, you're a fine-looking young man. Uh? Mrs. Bates, if you'll excuse me, I'm just going to the corner for my paper. I think that little man with the tiny mustache, <laughs> you know who I mean, the insurance agent... I think he might call again to collect. Please tell him to go away. You will do that for me, Mrs. Bates. Yes, Mr. Chalmers. Thank you, Mrs. Bates. Uh, tell him not to come back anymore. I don't want to pay any more on the policy. You remember I told you my nephew was very sick in Spokane? Yes, Mr. Chalmers. Well, the poor young man passed away. Yes. I was going to leave him a few dollars when I died. But now, well, I have no one left at all. And, well, a dollar a week... You'll tell that to the little man with the tiny mustache? Yes, Mr. Chalmers. Thank you, Mrs. Bates. Good day, Mr. Bates. Walter, I have $40 in the house for the rent. You can take that. Draw me a card when you get settled someplace. Let me know where you are. I'll send you some more as soon as I can get it. Maybe later I'll be able to straighten it out. Maybe later I'll be able to speak to your boss. I'll promise to pay back every dime. But you must go away. You must. Uh... Tell me something about Mr. Chalmers. He interests me very strangely. Walter! Don't be so nervous, Ma. We got plenty of time. We got till midnight. Tonight for suspense, Roma Wines bring you as stars Faye Bainter, Ralph Morgan, and Dane Clark. You have heard them in the prologue to our suspense play this evening, Robert Tallman's story, Life Ends at Midnight. Before we return to the scene of our play, let us journey in fancy to Havana and sit at a table in the gay restaurant Paris. At the next table, we see perhaps a farewell party given for an American visitor. The American is wondering how he'll be able to repay in his own country the hospitality shown him in Cuba. Reassuringly, his Cuban host might remark, Es muy fácil, amigo. Just be sure to serve wonderful Roma wine. It is wine imported by us from your own country. Roma wine. Indeed, Americans can well be proud that judges of fine wines in so many lands now acclaim the wines of California among the world's most enjoyable of all time. Of these truly superb wines, Roma wines are especially honored by the number of countries now importing them for enjoyment as rare luxuries. But Roma wines are not lacking in honors bestowed them here in America, because Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. If you aren't already one of the millions enjoying Roma wines regularly, as a delicious beverage any time, to add sparkle to any meal, to smarten your entertaining... Make your own taste test to choose your favorite, choosing from Roma Wine's many different wine types. When you learn their modest cost here in America, with no import duty to pay, no expensive shipping charges to absorb, you'll know why we say Roma Wines are for your daily enjoyment. I'll spell out the name for you. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. 
And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Faye Beta, Ralph Morgan, and Dane Clark in Life Ends at Midnight, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Yes, I, I do think I'll have another cup, if you don't mind, Mrs. Bates. Now, Mr. Charmer, suppose you look at it this way. You've been paying one buck a week for how many years now? Hmm, I'd say 20 years would be a conservative estimate. All right, 20 years. Now, let's see, that's uh, 50 bucks a year. Say, that's uh, 1,000 bucks you paid in, no? Yes, 1,000 bucks. This coffee cake, Mrs. Bates, is excellent. You like it? I made it yesterday Forget when I... the coffee cake. Now, uh, let's uh, figure percentage. How many more years do you figure to live? Walter. Oh, that's well, all right, Mrs. Bates. After all, I'm an old man, and at my age, one rather, well, comes to terms with death. It's like the end of a long, busy day. Life ends at midnight, and a new day begins. Yes, Walter, I, I think you're on the verge of making a very profound observation. Yeah, you see? My policy is for $2,500. And in the days that are left to me, I certainly will not be required to pay in as much as I have already paid That's out. That's the exact point. And if you drop it now, will you get anything back? No. You got a straight life with no cash in value. If you drop the policy now, the insurance company is the winner. But say you live another couple of years. You pay a couple of hundred more. And you leave the 2500 to somebody. Now... Which is a smart thing, I leave it to you. Yes, I, I should like to think that when I'm gone, I've left something behind for someone. Mr. Chalmers? Oh, yes, I'll always remember him for this. It's nice to live on in somebody's memory for a little while after we're dead. But A, I have no one in this world. And B, I must be very, very frank and tell you that I can no longer afford to pay even the dollar a week. You see, I live on a That's few... a problem of the most minor importance for anybody who invests in you now a buck a week would be guilt-edged. I mean, for instance, well, take my mother here. Now, suppose you made her the beneficiary. Now, suppose she continued to pay the buck a week. Who can lose on such a deal? Who can lose? Nobody. You get the point? Oh, no, no, I, I couldn't. Why? Why, it's... It... Why not? It's simple, huh? No, well, no, Mr. Chalmers, no, you mustn't. Let Mr. Chalmers aside. How is the Chalmers? It makes good sense, no? It makes everybody happy, no? But we're practically strangers. We just... What do you mean, strangers? Who's a stranger in this world? We're just little people trying to make each other happy. Huh, Mr. Chalmers? Now, Mr. Chalmers here can die feeling he didn't waste a buck a week for 20 years, and you'll know he'll live in your memory. That's what he wants. Now, why shouldn't he have it? Ain't every man entitled to at least live in somebody's memory? Yes, but Mr. Chalmers doesn't have to do that. I'll think about him anyway. I, I promise I will... He, he don't Let have... him say something. You're always mounting. Now, what do you say, Mr. Chalmers? Oh, that must be the little man with the tiny mustache. I'll tell him I'm keeping the policy and changing the beneficiary. Oh, uh, could you let me have the loan of a dollar, Mr. Bates? <laughs> Up, will you? The old man's coming home in a minute or two. He takes a snap about this time. I want this ready for him. Oh, relax, sonny. Relax. I can't finish this job today. What are you giving me? It'll take a joint and another length of pie. Oh, fix it up. You're a good plumber. You can fix it up for now. Man, the room's pretty small. Oh. Why do you want the heater so close to the bed for him? Like I told you, he's got rheumatism. He needs plenty of heat. Well, I can run a rubber extension, but with gas, I don't like it. Okay, so with gas, you don't like it, but with gas, we gotta run this heater. The old man's got rheumatics. He can take plenty of gas. Huh? Uh, the heat, I mean. He needs plenty. Hey, what are you doing now? Tightening this joint. Look, it's tight enough. Here's your three bucks and... Okay. Okay, you're the boss. Bring your tools the next time. There won't be any next time, Sonny. What do you give me now? You can get somebody else to do your dirty work after this. So long, Skippy. Skippy? <laughs> Well, oh, come on, Skippy. Pull yourself together. We got work to do. What? 
Uh, hiya, Pop. Well, this is a pleasant surprise. Uh, yeah, this used to be my room. The steam don't come up here so good, so I talked the old lady into fixing this up for you. Well, that was very thoughtful of you, Walter. Thanks. I stuffed up the cracks in the window, too. Zero weather. It gets plenty of drafty in this room. You thought of everything, didn't you, Walter? Huh? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it ought to work out just fine. It'll do the job, I think. I, uh... I'm going to take a little nap before dinner. Uh, do you think the heat... Uh, uh, just leave it on. I'll look in after a bit to see if it's okay. Well, now, you needn't go to all that trouble. No, it's no trouble at all, Mr. Chalmers. When I do a thing, I like to do it right. Oh. Well, who's there? Is that you, Walter? Yeah, go on back to sleep, Pop. Oh. I'm just turning the heater off. It's getting stuffy in here. Oh, you're a good, considerate boy, Walter. Go oh, on, skip it. Go on, go on back to sleep. Walk so fast, Walter. My feet are hurting me again. You can buy new shoes tomorrow. I'd like to know what with. Maybe you'll have dough tomorrow. Maybe we'll both have some dough. If a miracle happened. Eh, maybe miracles do happen. Maybe if you're smart. Where are you taking me to, Walter? Nowhere in particular. I thought we'd stroll around the old neighborhood. You know, like old times. Well, that's a nice idea, Walter. But my well, feet... Hello, Mrs. Bates. Good evening, Officer Flanagan. This is my son, Walter. He's just here from Pittsburgh. Well, glad to know you. How's business, copper? Oh, much the same. Vagrancy, petty larceny, once in a while, suicide. Suicide? Yeah, that's what they start out to do, but it's harder to get bumped off than most people think. Huh? Case just last week over in the next precinct. Dame turned on the gas in her room and lay down on the bed. What happened? Nothing. They always bungle somewhere, amateurs. Gas petered out. She forgot to put a quarter in the meter. Ah, seven o'clock. Uh, I got a call in. Well, good night, Mr. Good, Bates. Good night, officer. Nice to meet you, Walter. Ma. Yes, Walter. When did you put a quarter in the meter at home? Why, well, I, I don't remember. Goodness, I'd better get some change. Never mind a change. Come on. Walter, why did you ask about the gas meter? What do you think? Walter, you didn't. That isn't why you put the heater in, Mr. Chalmers. What do you think? I don't think anything. I just pray, pray that quarter ran Save out before. Save your prayers. Of course, if that didn't work, I'll try another way. Either that old clerk is dead before midnight or I spent ten years in stir. He's going to be dead before midnight, see? And if you try to make any trouble, you'll be pushing daisies right along with him. Stop sniffling. We're going in there now. Now, look, if it took, scream your head off or I'll give you a reason to scream. I can smell it. Ah, uh, come on. <laughs> oh, I... Oh, well, good evening, Walter. Mrs. Bates. I was just on my way out. Oh, Mr. Chalmers, you're all right. You're all right. Of course he's all right. What's eating you? I have a slight headache, it's true. But a brisk walk in the open air will cure that, I'm sure. Hey! Hey, will you look at this? What is it, Walter? Oh, well, this hose on a heater. Huh. Got unhitched. No wonder you got a headache. I thought I smelled gas. Boy, it's lucky for you, Ma forgot to put a quarter in the meter. Providence works in strange ways, doesn't it, Walter? Well, I must be getting on. I'll be coming home rather late, Mrs. Bates, so I'll just let myself in. Uh, how late? Well, I, I thought I'd stop at the neighborhood picture house for dinner. That'll be around nine o'clock. So I imagine I won't be home much before 11. Mr. Chalmers, there's something I want to... Yes, Mrs. Bates. Walter's a good boy at heart, you know, but... He's been in some trouble lately, and... Is there anything I can do to help, Walter? Yeah, plenty. I'll tell you all about it when you get up. You get back. Come on, you better run along now, Mr. Chalmers. You don't want to be late for that picture. Yes, yes, of course. Well, good night, Mrs. Bates. Mr. Chalmers, I... Good night, Mr. Chalmers. Yes, good night. Oh, Walter, I... Walter! Walter, no! No, no, my book, no! You were going to tell him, weren't you? Walter! You would like to send me to the chair, wouldn't you? No! Can you struck me, Walter? You 
you struck your own mother. I ought to have messed up your sad monkey face for good. Oh, it's no, your fault I pulled this up in the first place. Why didn't you remember to put a quarter on that meter? Why didn't you? I'm glad I forgot. He wouldn't be alive. Ah, I shouldn't have messed around with gas trying to spare your feelings, making you look like an accident. Oh, no. The thanks I get for it. She wants to blab the whole oh, thing. No. Turn me in, my own mother. No, no, Walter. No, no, that's not true. Why, you... Oh, don't strike me again, Walter. I can't stand okay. it. Okay. Maybe now you'll cooperate. Now, look, let's put it this way. It's either you or him. If it's you, I don't care whether they get me or not. Are you listening? Oh, yes, yes, Walter. Okay, now, like I said... I got very little time to get this thing done. I ought to have done it neat and clean in the first place, like I said. He's old and weak. You just push him over on a bed, hold a pillow over his face for a few minutes, and the job's done. Nobody will ask any questions, a guy that old. Well, for the last time, I'm begging. Okay, make sure it's for the last time. Remember, it's you or him, like I said. What are you going to do? Now, look. I'll be waiting in his room when he comes home. I'm shot anyway, so I'll lay down and get 40 winks. You wait up for him. Tell him I left to catch a train. That's in case he suspects anything. When he comes to his room, I'll take care of the rest of it. How do you know I won't warn him? Because it's him or you, like I told you. I don't think you'll warn Mr. Chalmers. And don't try to stall him when he comes in. He's got to be dead by midnight. Or else... Mr. Chalmers. Evening, Joe. I'll have the late edition of the Daily News as usual. Oh, I saved one out for you, Mr. Chalmers. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, Joe. Good night. Where does the oh, 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 by the way, Joe, I, I, I almost forgot. Can you give me the change of a dollar? Oh, sure, Mr. Chalmers. Yes, here you are. Fifty, seventy-five, eighty-five, ninety, and one dollar. Well, thank you. I just happened to think of something I need change for. A little good deed for a friend of mine. Thomas. Well, I didn't think you'd be up so late, Mrs. Bates. I waited up especially. I wanted to talk to you about Walter. Mrs. Bates, your eye, it's all discolored. Yes, I... The light burned out in the bathroom, and when I went to replace it in the dark, that is, I bumped into the door. Now, I would have thought Walter would have done that for oh, you. Oh, no, Walter didn't... I mean... Walter's left already. He had to catch the 12.20 for Pittsburgh, you know. But it's only 11 now, the clock. Perhaps he had some things to do on the way, I mean. Of course. Well, I'm afraid I must be getting on to bed. No, not just yet. I mean, won't you sit down for a minute and have a cup of tea with me? Well, I'd like to, but tea keeps me awake, Mrs. Bates. I'll be getting long to my room now, if you don't mind. No. No, don't go into that room, Mr. Chalmers. Why, Mrs. Bates, whatever's the trouble... My son, Walter, there's something I must tell you. Forgive me, Mrs. Bates, but I'm an old man and I need my rest. If it could possibly wait until morning... No, 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 it, it can't wait until morning. It's got to be told before midnight. What was that? It sounds like someone moving about in the back of the house. It, one of the shutters. It's loose. The wind. Oh, you were saying, Mrs. Bates? Nothing. I can't tell you, after all. I'm afraid. I'm afraid to tell it. Afraid. There, there, Mrs. Bates. Perhaps in the morning. Try to get some rest. You're, you're going in there now? I think that will be the best thing to do all the way around. Don't you, Mrs. Bates? Good night. No. No, wait. Mrs. Bates, I... What is it, Mrs. Bates? That smell. Gas. Walter. Walter. Walter! Why don't you lie down for a few minutes, Mrs. Bates? 
I'll call you when the ambulance arrives. Listen. It's striking twelve. Dead before midnight. That's what he said. Dead before midnight. Poor lad. Fell asleep. If only I hadn't remembered to go back for that change. You did it. <laughs> you put the quarter in the meter. That's what turned on the gas that killed him. Well, you mentioned the gas having gone off and forgetting to put a quarter in the meter. So on the way to the picture house, I just went around to the back entry and dropped the coin. I suppose I should have remembered about the connection being loose on the heater in my room. But I wanted to surprise you with my good deed. I didn't mean to do anything wrong, Mrs. Bates. Truly, I didn't. No. You didn't do anything wrong, Mr. Chalmers. You didn't do anything wrong. And so closes Life Ends at Midnight, starring Faye Bainter, Ralph Morgan, and Dane Clark. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Miss Bainter appeared by courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Madame Curie. Dane Clark is currently being seen in the Warner Brothers production, Destination Tokyo. Before Ralph Morgan returns to our microphone, let me give you a suggestion. A suggestion you will find can add to the success of your next dinner party at home. At one end of the dining table, place a bottle of Roma Wines Not Sweet, Not Dry Burgundy. At the other table end, place a bottle of Roma Wines Delicately Delicious Sauterne. Then, let each of your guests select the Roma wine to his liking. You'll know that whatever the individual choice of a guest, both of these Roma California wines will delight by their superb quality, the quality that has made Roma wines America's largest selling wines. Whichever of Roma wine's many different California wine types you choose at your dealers, the small purchase price he asks will surprise and delight you, while the superb quality of these good Roma wines will win your full accord with the judgment of wine experts of many lands that Roma wines are truly magnificent. Let me repeat the name. R-O-M-A. Roma wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Ralph Morgan. First, I'm sure I speak for all of us, Miss Bainter, Mr. Clark, and myself, in saying how much we've enjoyed appearing on Suspense this evening. We'll all be listening, as we hope you will, next week when Miss Agnes Moorhead is your star in one of the most talked-about plays ever to be presented in this, this series, called Sorry, Wrong Number. And now one more word. Here's something our fighting men may never forget. The price of victory is sacrifice. You help bring the victory nearer when you make the sacrifices that make it possible for you to buy more war bonds. Thank you. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Don't forget then next Monday for Agnes Moorhead in... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense, tonight we present Menace in Wax by John Dixon Carr.
During the French Revolution of 1793, a Swiss girl copied in wax the severed heads of those who had just been guillotined. She married a Frenchman named Toussaint and came to London, and she founded Madame Toussaint's Waxwork. There it is, still in Marylebone Road, near Baker Street Station. Not the original building. That was destroyed by fire. But it remained untouched when a darker shadow than revolution came to England. And they plastered high explosives all along that road and hit the cinema next door. We are going to London under the bomber's moon. Late one night in March of 1941, a young man hurried up to the great glass doors of Madame Toussaint's. Hey, open up there. Isn't there a night watchman around this place? There is, Governor, and I'm him. Now, what do you want at this hour of the night? My name is Rogers. I'm from the Daily Record. Oh. If you let me get inside, I'll show you my press card. Didn't you get any orders about me? Well, maybe I have at that. Oh, you're the bloke who wants to see the Chamber of Horrors. That's right. <laughs> All right, you may as well come in. My paper got a tip. There's something funny going on around here. Something funny going on here? Yeah, that's a good one. The raid's not very heavy tonight, is it? No, they're going over. You ain't heard where, Governor? We got a teletype flash that there was the Midlands. Lord Lummy, and I've got a sister in Birmingham. Oh, why can't she come and stop in a nice, safe place like London? There's the Regent Park guns opening up again. Like your teeth rattle and shakes the hats off the dummies' heads. You know, this chamber of ours is getting to be popular tonight. You mean there's been somebody here before me? Yes. A woman? That's right, Governor. About five feet, two inches tall, very pretty. If you like him, brunette, and big-eyed, and a phony French accent. No, Governor, no. This was only an old lady that lost her handbag. Oh, thank the Lord for that, anyway. Now then, what is going on around here? Well, I don't know, Governor. You'll have to ask Pearson about that. Who's Pearson? Oh, he's the bloke that's the watchman down there. He's old, and he imagined things. He phoned your paper. <laughs> have you got an electric torch? Yes. Then go straight on through the marble hall and down the stairs on your left. And don't speak to the policeman, because he's wax. <laughs> yes, that's the way, Governor. That's the way to the Chamber of Horrors. Thank you. Pearson. Hello, Pearson. Pearson. Uh, yes, sir. Huh? You're looking for me. Oh, uh... Gee, I didn't see you there. I must have thought you were one of these wax dummies. Uh, ugly dim light, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Rogers is my name. I'm from the Daily Record. Oh, yes. I'm glad you came over. I phoned your paper myself. And maybe I'm just imagining things, but... Uh... Oh, I don't blame you. This place would make anybody nervous, especially during an air raid. Uh, well, sir, it's all right as long as you don't get to imagine they're watching you. Oh, and do you? Oh, yes. Sometimes. That's the gambling group in the center there. Uh-huh. What's that thing over there? That's the famous guillotine. Oh, wait a minute, old boy. You're not trying to tell me that's the original guillotine. No, uh, that was burnt in the fire. Madame Toussaint bought it from Sanson, the executioner. Let me tell you something, Mr. Rogers. What? Years ago... This is straight. A young French woman came in here. There was nobody else in the place. She thought it would be great fun to say she'd put her neck in the same guillotine as Marie Antoinette. So she climbed up on that platform. She snapped the little wooden collar down round her neck, shutting herself in. All of a sudden, she realized she didn't know which spring controlled the collar and which spring controlled the knife. Oh, good Lord, she didn't. No. But they say she went crazy. They say she screamed and screamed. What's that? I'm sorry. 
Sorry. I didn't mean to scare you, but sweet mama, I'm so scared myself, I cannot help it. Susie. Oh, no, 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 not Susie. Susie, you make it so it rhyme with floozy. That is not nice. Why, you little devil. I ought to turn you across my knee... What are you doing here? And will you forget that French accent? You're driving me crazy. Uh, you know this young lady, sir? Do I? She works for my paper. She's haunting me. Oh, Bert, that's not nice. I like the way I talk. I only try to give you ideas. That's just what I mean. Now, take your arms from around my neck. Uh, she's French, sir. Her mother came from New York, like I did. She's got some funny ideas, accents, and disguises. So, I dress up as an old lady, and I come along, too. That is clever, no? Definitely No. But I go into what I think is the lady's room, and there is Jack the Ripper. I'm so scared, I almost kick the ghost. Whatever else you do, miss, for the love of heaven, put out that cigarette. It is not permitted? It is what they are most afraid of in this place. Fire. If you vouch for this young lady, Mr. Rogers... I don't vouch for anybody. But go on now. What's all the mystery here at Madame Tussauds? You see the group over there? It's called the Gamblers. That three men and a woman in 18th century costume sitting around a table playing cards? Yes. And about once a week, when the lights are out... Yes? Those dummies do play cards. Is this a publicity trick of some kind? Oh, no, sir. Then what's the game? I'm not crazy. I know they don't actually do it, sir. What I want to know is... Who changes the cards round in their hands? And why? Well, could anybody? Anybody from the outside, I mean, get in to change the cards? Oh, yes. Uh, there's a back door. But why would anyone want to break in here just to change those cards around? Mon cher Ben, écoutez. Listen, I have made a discovery. Listen, if you're going to talk, speak English. Or better yet, just keep still. But I have made a discovery. This card game... What about it? It is crooked. Here is a man which has two deuces of hearts in the same hand. Listen, Susie, I don't give a... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's have a look at those cards. I give you ideas, yes? Susie, for once you're right. And look here. Two of these players have all the clubs and hearts. The other two have all the diamonds and spades. Susie, how many letters in the alphabet? Twenty-six, no? And twice twenty-six is... Fifty-two. The number of cards in a pack. Give me a pencil, Susie, quick. The War Office, Whitehall. MI5, Headquarters of Military Intelligence. There next morning in the map room, used as an office by Colonel Warrender. Mr. Rogers, I'm a busy man. I appreciate I... that, Colonel Warrender. Well, anyhow, sit down. Thank you, sir. Now, what's all this? These cards you claim form a code, is that it? Yes, sir. Now, look, sir. Let each letter of the alphabet represent a card in clubs and hearts. That's 26. And then? And then when you get to the middle of the message, switch the alphabet over to diamonds and spades. Then you won't keep on repeating. Now, will you read what I've got written on this piece of paper? Jack of diamonds, Q, three of clubs, F. Well, that doesn't seem to mean much. Oh, never mind the cards, Colonel. Just read the letters. Q, F, A, C, T, O, R, Y. Yes, sir. Q factory. Go on. Uh, oh, just a moment. What is that infernal noise? Johnson Burroughs. Uh, don't bother what? with that, sir. Just read the message, please. Oh. Q factory. 10 p.m., 15th. Today's the 15th of March, Colonel. Oh. All preparations made. Use dive bombers. I see. Uh, this message was left openly. So openly that nobody ever noticed it. Yes, the trick's been tried before. No contacts, no gatherings, no letters that might be intercepted. A whole spy ring could walk through that wax museum and read the message without being seen. You newspaper men trying to teach me my job? Oh, I'm sorry, sir, I only... No, no, go on. Well, don't you see? Three or four little boats with portable wireless sets go down the Thames estuary. When they're beyond pursuit, they send that message by radio. Somebody listens. And it's no secret in Fleet Street, sir, that Q Factory is out in the wilds of Gleibyshire. Uh, it's no secret anywhere. And that we're making the Shaftesbury bomber out there. So tonight, unless we do something about it, they're coming over and bomb Q Factory to blazes. Uh, that's impossible. Why? Or can't you tell me? I can tell you this much. Yes, sir? Q Factory is so well hidden that even our own pilots can't find it from the air. That's one objection to this message. 
Any other objection? Yes, this talk about dive bombers. Dive bombers in a night attack? What's the good of a dive bomber if he can't see its objective? Well, suppose somebody showed a light. He'd be shot dead as soon as he showed it. Every inch of country for a quarter of a mile round the factory. A quarter of a mile, Mr. Rogers, is patrolled day and night. Well, just the same. They're going to have a try at it, sir. How? I don't know how. Then if you'll excuse me, Mr. Rogers... Well, listen, I... Colonel Warner. Will you give me a pass to go down there to the factory? Certainly not. No one's permitted to go there except the workers. How is the place defended? There's a night fighter station nearby... And several batteries of four 3.7 guns. Then give me a pass to the fighter station or to the gun post. That's a legitimate newspaper request. Well, I, I might manage a pass to one of the gun posts, yes. Then you'll do it. Well, what on earth is that infernal row? It sounds like somebody locked up in a coat cupboard. Yes, as a matter of fact, Colonel, it is somebody locked up in a coat cupboard. A young lady, so-called. A young lady? Who locked her up? I did. And just what the devil do you mean, sir, locking up people in coat cupboards in the war office? Well, she's a bit excitable, Colonel. I thought that uh, she'd better not see you. Oh, so thanks for the consideration. Uh, there's just one other favor I'd like to ask. As well? If she asks you for a pass, don't give it to her. Don't give it to her under any circumstances. Well, what's her name? Susie Dubois. <laughs> You're rather too late for that, young man. Uh, the public relations office granted her a pass two hours ago. What? Oh, a woman to an anti-aircraft battery? Uh, this is what we call a mixed battery. Women on the guns as well as men. She said it would make a good human interest story for the press. I, mm. I must say, I agree with her. Uh, uh, one moment, Mr. Rogers, before you go. Yes, sir. That gun post is fully two miles from the factory. You can go there, but if you take one step further, you'll be shot on sight by our guards. I warn you. I'll be careful, Colonel. I'll be careful. Somewhere in the west country, a yellow moon shines over bare trees. A white mist moving clings to the ground. Susie, are you sure we're on the right road? Ah, oh, mon cher, they have taken away all the signposts in case there is an invasion. I know that. But I follow the map. The map cannot be wrong. We've been driving for hours. Must be... Yes, it is. Nearly half past nine. Half an hour to go. Trees, trees, and still more trees. Look. There's a break in the trees ahead. There will be open country in a minute. Yeah. That's funny. Look how deep the leaves are here on the road. But one thing I tell you, just between you and me and the bedposts, Gate post, Susie. The term is between you and me and the gate post. And speak English. I am speaking English very well, thank you. I do not need your help to be pure. All right, all right. Now, this map. Well, what about it? It say we should go through a lot of villages. Mitford, Archardine, and Saffron Weville. I have not seen any villages. Did you say Mitford? Oui, monsieur. Susie, let me have a look at that map. Come on, come on, hand it over. But what is wrong? It is a perfectly good map. Yes, Susie. It's a fine map. It's an excellent map. Only it's a map of the wrong county. I have made a mistake. No? I don't even believe you can read. This is a map of Barsetshire. We should be somewhere in Glebeshire. Now, where in the devil are we? We're at the entrance to some kind of clearing with leaves. Oh. Hello there. What was that? Hello there. Somebody calling us. And if we're in Forbidden Area... I see him now. Where? Behind us. He came out of a white cottage back there. He's a big, heavy man. With a mustache. Never mind the mustache. He's wearing some kind of a uniform and he's got a rifle. You think he plug us? No? I think it is not unlikely. Get out those war office passes of ours. Wait. Good evening, my friends. Uh, good evening. Can you tell me... No, we don't mean any harm. Uh, 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 Can you tell me what time it is? Oh, what time it is? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, uh, 28 and a half minutes past nine. Thank you. I will keep you covered while I set my watch. Yeah. My next question is, would you like me to shoot you both? No. Listen, Mr., uh, Mr. McAllister. Captain. Captain McAllister. That's right. right. Captain, 
this girl, uh, she's been reading the wrong map. You see, we don't even know where we are. You're in Hollywood Forest, my friend. Hollywood Forest? Is that good or bad? And you don't know what's just beyond the edge of this clearing? No. There's a big open space of a quarter of a mile. In the middle of that open space... Q Factory. We're right on top of it. Then you have heard of Q Factory, my friend. Captain McAllister, we're from the war office, and we've got passes to prove it. Let's see the passes. We were trying to find gun sight number... Uh, I've forgotten the number, but it's here on that card. You've passed the gun sight. Two miles back up the road. All right. Here are your passes. What are you going to do to us? Uh, I'm not in the regular army. You can thank your stars I'm not. I'm forestry preservation. Oh. You are not going to chuck us in the cooler, even? <laughs> no. Now turn that car on, get back along this road as fast as you can. If they fire at you, as they probably will... Oh, I wish I am home. Pray no, Mao, I wish I am home. Well, then hope for the best. My watch had stopped and you did me a good turn. Now hurry along. Hurry. Sight of heavy ACAC battery. Four 3.7 guns against a moon growing clear white. White as the concrete emplacements. Sealed against light where the crews, men and women, sitting, waiting, waiting, waiting. Well, sir, uh, glad to have you both here. But this idea of yours about dive bombers attacking a blacked out factory in the uh, middle of a forest is uh, rather fantastic, don't you think? Well, I admit it doesn't make much sense, Captain Bronson, but I have a hunch that I'm right. Well, glad you and Miss Susie drove out. Don't see many strangers. Frightfully boring. Nice country, of course. Good air and everything, but dull. Dull as ditch water. What's that? Only some of the lads and lasses inside. Like to uh, walk along the emplacement here? Oh, is that allowed? Oh, certainly, old boy. Why not? Bright moon tonight, isn't it? Yes, bomber's moon. We, uh... We nearly get shot on our way here. Quiet, Susan. We're not supposed to have been there. If I nearly get shot, I am going to say I nearly get shot. It was a man which is called, uh, uh McAllister. Oh, old Mac. Uh, very decent sort, Mac. He's a, a tree doctor. A what? Tree doctor. Got to have wood, you know. But trees start to die. Mac goes round the edge of the clearing and smears him with stuff to keep him well. Uh, how did you come to meet him? Well, the fact is, uh... We nearly got as far as the factory tonight. Oh, then you were lucky to get back alive. There weren't any barrage balloons over the factory, I noticed. Well, hardly, old boy. They wouldn't advertise, would they? With balloons in open country? And if the Germans did use dive bombers? Oh, they're not coming, old boy. Just make up your mind to that. I wonder if you'll say so at 10 o'clock. But it is 10 o'clock. It's, uh, well, it's just 10 now. Well, it can't be. We drove here like blazes. It was only half past nine then. Well, then your watch must be very slow, old boy. No, I'm afraid you're wrong. I've never seen it quieter. Cold tonight, very dry for March. Look all around you. Moonlight, open country, not a sign of life in it. Quiet, peaceful, and silent as the great. What was that? By George, I think we've got some visitors. I think we're going to see some fun. Enemy planes approaching south southwest. Action stations. Enemy planes approaching south southwest. Now, do you believe me? Better stand back, old boy. Operation crew's coming on. I said, now do you believe me? I want you to watch these girls work. They do everything, you know, except actually fire the guns. Now, 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 keep your hair on, old boy. Susie, he still can't see it. Oh, they'll only be going over. You think so? Oh, yes. We sometimes get a crack at them when they're making for Bristol. Standing by for action. Standing by. Listen. I have heard that noise a thousand times. But every time I hear it, I get sick. Mm -hmm. They're flying ruddy low, you know. Just what I was thinking. Spotter! Spotter! Any identification? Yonkers, 88. Dive bombers. Height, 5,200. Now, 
look here, you two newspaper people. Yes, sir? There might be things popping, you know, can't tell. I'd like to get below. Oh, no, thanks. I don't like this, Bert, but I'll stay too. Range finder. Range finder. On target. Look here, you two. Those war office passes you gave me, uh, I'm not supposed to keep them. No, I'd better give them back, just in case. Predictor. Predictor. On target. Here we go, ladies and gents. Fire. Quarters message, sir. Fire. Yes, Corporal. Hold the fire. Night fighters taking off. Hold fire. Night fighters taking off. Hold fire. Message understood. What is the matter with them? With who? Those barge planes. They're still a good way off, but they don't come any closer. Hmm. Must be going over after all. They're circling. I think they're waiting for a signal. Anyhow, here are your war office passes. You. Well, you seem to have got them all smeared with oil. Oil? That is all right, Monsieur. When we get them back from Captain McAllister, they have oil on them. I think maybe you dropped them on the leaves, because there's oil on the tires of the car, too. Then I think how always in this we meet things that burn. At Madame Tussauds last night, they would not let me smoke a cigarette in case of fire. Fire? That set fire. What's the matter with you, old boy? Why did that fella, way out at the end of nowhere, want to know what time it was? Are you scatty? McAllister, you told me so yourself. He goes around the edges of the clearing and smears the trees with stuff to keep them well. Well, what about it? Suppose it was crude oil. Suppose between each tree he laid an invisible fuse of dead leaves soaked in oil. I, uh, I don't understand. In 30 seconds, a complete square of fire runs around the limits of the factory grounds. That draws the bombers in. Then as the flames blaze higher, they've got enough light to dive on their target. Night fighters are letting loose. Bronson, I see it all now. Come on. We've got to get to that tree, Dr. McAllister. It's a matter of minutes. Susie, is Bronson following in the car behind us? Yes. He's following and men with rifles. We've got to get to McAllister's cottage. This McAllister... I'll bet you ten to one. The real McAllister is either dead or tied up in that cottage. The fellow we saw was an imposter. Look out, Susie. Keep your head down. Oh, those fighters. They will chew up every younger in the place. They have not got the chance of a snowshoe in him. No, Susie, not a snowshoe in heaven. You mean a... I know you are English at a time like this. What I cannot understand... Look out. Don't see why he hasn't set his signal off. What is delaying him? Why don't he strike a match when the bombers come over? Because he's a good Nazi. A good Nazi? My watch was slow, don't you remember? And I gave him the wrong time. He had orders to strike his match at 10 o'clock, and he'll not do it until 10 o'clock if there are 500 planes instead of 20. Bert, I see him. Where? Far up the road. He's running. Yeah. Yeah, that's him. Think we can reach him before he gets to the clearing? Not the chance of a snowshoe in heaven. Signal Brunson to pass us. A long shot with a Bert, rifle might... Bert, one of the Yonkers is hit. Huh? He's right over us. That's not all. He's unloading his bombs. The whole stick's coming straight down our direction. Keep your head down. Come on, please. Put your arm, baby. This is a dirt road. The bomb sank too deeply before it exploded. We didn't catch the blast. Come on, Susie. McAllister was just ahead of us. Come on, let's get out. We can't drive any farther. This road is full of bomb craters. Wait a minute, Susie. There's McAllister. He... He is dead. Yes, Susie. Killed by a Nazi bomb. Look, on the ground. What are those two white cards? Oh. <laughs> They're all smeared with oil. They must have fallen out of McAllister's pocket just before he got hit. Let's see. <laughs> what do you know? What are the cards, Bert? 
two tickets for Madame Tussaud's waxworks. I'm afraid our friend's never going to get to use them. Uh Not the chance of a snowshoe in heaven. And so ends Menace in Wax. Tonight's story of Suspense. Columbia presents these stories of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next Tuesday, there'll be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. William Spear, the producer. John Dietz, the director. Bernard Herman, the composer, conductor. John Dixon Carr, the author. Our collaborators on... Suspense. Here is a message of vital importance to every person who drives an automobile in America. There is wide misunderstanding about gasoline and rubber, and the government wants the following facts brought to everyone's attention. Actually, there is no scarcity of gasoline except in some parts of the East. But nowhere in the country is there enough rubber for military and civilian use. Starting two weeks from today, December 1st, mileage rationing goes into effect. This means that no car owner anywhere in the United States will be able to buy gasoline without a mileage rationing book. The purpose is to conserve the rubber we have by eliminating all unnecessary driving. When we think of the tremendous distances our mechanized army is traveling in North Africa and the long road to victory that still lies ahead, this extra effort on our part is slight indeed. Remember, everybody is going to have mileage rationing, so why not be prepared? The best way each of us can save rubber is by sharing our car with others. Let one car do the work for two or three. So why not arrange with the neighbors tonight and start sharing the car tomorrow? It's the one real important contribution that every automobile driver can make. Don't be a lone rider. Share your car and do your share for victory. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Pen. This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Heading our starring Hollywood cast this evening is Mr. Paul Lucas, and with him are Miss Heather Angel and Mr. Bramwell Fletcher. Story by John Dixon Carr, dealing with strange, very strange happenings in a London curio shop and called Mr. Markham, Antique Dealer, is tonight's tale of suspense. If you've been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution till the last possible moment. And so, with the performances of Heather Angel, Bramwell Fletcher, of Paul Lucas as Mr. Markham, antique dealer, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! This is the story of a man who commits murder and gets away with it. Does the idea shock you? Do you believe that justice must always be done? But let's be honest with ourselves. You and I needn't be cynics to know that justice is very seldom done. Innocence flinches. Guilt is childlike and bland. Innocence is imposed upon. Guilt can 
must encompass all things, even a successful murder. And I know this because I was the murderer, you say? <laughs> oh, no. Inquire at Scotland Yard. I was the victim. In Bond Street, not far from Piccadilly, there used to be an establishment, which in a less fashionable part of town would have been called a shop. On the windows, in letters in, as discreet as a visiting card, were the words Charles Markham, antique dealer. Such a delightful fellow, Markham. Such a character. Thirty years ago, yes, as long as that, this antique shop was a dingy place, despite deep carpets and crystal chandeliers. It rustled with the ticking of a hundred clocks. It was shadowed by damascened armor and the loom of tall tapestries. And late one summer night, when the shutters were long closed on those windows, a four-wheeler drew up before the door in the gas-lit street. That's all, Cabby. You needn't wait. Very good, miss. Good night. Good night. He must be here. He must be. I won't go back to that place. I'll kill myself first. Oh, look here, old man. You needn't be... Oh, I beg your pardon. And I beg yours. I'm... I'm not the person you were expecting, am I? No, madam. As a matter of fact, I was expecting a police officer. A police officer? Oh, merely an old friend who often drops in for a talk and a drink. You are Mr. Markham, aren't you? Yes, my name is Markham. Can I be of any service to you? I want to come in. I... I... Uh, I want to buy a present for somebody. Now, really, madam, this is hardly the time. Yes, I... I know it's late, but... It's nearly one o'clock, madam. Surely tomorrow morning will be... That'll be too late. This is a special occasion. It's... It's uh, a birthday present. That's it. A birthday present. I've got to deliver it before breakfast. And uh, Sir George Lytle says this is the only place in London to buy antiques. Oh, Sir George flatters me. Won't you let me come in? Just for five minutes. Well, under the circumstances, madam, I think it might be managed. Now, one moment while I put some lights on. No, please. That one little light will be enough. But you won't be able to see anything. That doesn't matter. I... I'll trust to your judgment. Just as you like. This way, madam. What's that? That noise? Oh, you mean the clocks, madam? <laughs> there are more than a hundred clocks in this room. I'm very fond of them. Don't they get on your nerves? Ticking away together like a nightmare? Striking the hours together? They don't strike together, madam. When the hour approaches, you will hear a musical din that lasts for some time. Might I interest you perhaps in a clock? No. I hate them. <laughs> now, all the same, this grandfather clock might amuse you. What about it? Observe the signature. Johannes Carver, Londini, Facet A.D., 1752. Uh, you could see better, madam, if you raise that veil. I'll keep my veil down, thanks. Uh, just as you please. But look at the clock. I open the glass face like this. Then I push the second hand forward like this and... that voice. Only the clock, madam. Nothing more. The clock spoke. <laughs> Clever, isn't it? The device of old John Carver. Anticipating Mr. Edison's gramophone by more than a hundred years. Oh, but you don't like clocks. No. Uh, may I ask whether the present is for a lady or a gentleman? It's uh, for a man. Oh, has he some knowledge of antiques? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean... Uh, furniture, perhaps. Porcelain, bronzes, tapestries, weapons... He might be very much interested in weapons. Uh, then yes. I imagine his name is Mr. Ronald Gilbert. Now, will you tell me, Miss Ray, why you really came here tonight? So you know who I am. Naturally. You are Miss Judith Ray. And why did you come here? I wanted to see what sort of a man you actually were. Oh, and have you found out? No, but... But I won't go back to prison. I won't. As you will. But since it's to be a... Business conference, Miss Ray. And I imagine it is. Yes. Well, then suppose we go into my office, here at the back of the shop. Will you precede me? Thank you. 
Oh, you must excuse the dust covers I've put on the chairs here. I'm leaving for a holiday tomorrow, and the shop will be closed. When I return next week, Miss Ray, I shall expect the amount requested. In cash, of course. But I can't raise 2,000 pounds. You ought to know that. Well, your fiancé could raise the money, I imagine. Ron? Do you think I'd have Ron know where I've been? Or what I've been? It's better than having his father learn it, surely. Now, sit down, Miss Ray. I'd rather stand, thank you. <laughs> now, that's a very foolish gesture. But the ladies will do it. They think it gives them dignity and shows the disdain of the poor blackmailer. You see, I make no bones about it. I am a blackmailer. You seem rather proud of yourself. Why not? I am the one person in England, perhaps in the world, who has made it a large-scale business. Congratulations. <laughs> and what is all life but, but blackmail? The child says, if you don't give me that, I'll scream. The grown woman says, if you go on behaving like this, I will leave you. Your sex, Miss Ray, are blackmailers from the cradle. You know, Charles Markham, I wonder... Yes? I wonder if anybody's ever hurt you very much. Hurt me? What do you mean? When you talk about the world and people in general, your face goes white under the eyes. You pick up that letter opener from the desk... Mm, not a letter opener, please, Miss Ray. A Medici dagger. 16th century work. It isn't the money that really interests you. I it? don't understand. You hate the world. You just want to torture people. But you think you've been tortured, isn't that so? This is a very sharp dagger, Miss Ray. If I throw it down on the desk, it sticks. Like isn't, that. Isn't it so, Charles Markham? My motives, Miss Ray, aren't in question. I wonder... Whereas your motives are. Now, let me see. Ten years ago, in 1903, a certain girl called Letty Wilson, your real name, I believe, fell in love with a rather contemptible underworld character named Arthur Aker. Please! No humiliation was too great for her. She worked for him, lied for him, stole for him. I was only 18. I didn't know what I was now, doing. this girl, for a very shabby theft, was sentenced to three years' hard labor at Holloway Prison. Five months later, she escapes from prison and disappears. All these years afterwards, she appears in the West End as Miss Judy Trey, fashionable milliner. Haven't I made up for it? Haven't I? No. For one mistake. After ten years. It's the way of the world, my dear. I didn't create it. And I'm forgetting the best part of the comedy. This paragon of virtue next falls in love with Mr. Ronald Gilbert, son of Major General Sir Edmund Gilbert. Such a respectable family, too. Stop it, please! Then, shall we say, 2,000 pounds? Suppose I did raise the money. I don't know how, but suppose I did raise it. Well? What guarantee would I have that you wouldn't ask for still more money? I probably shall ask for more money, Miss Ray. Well, that's my privilege as a blackmailer. Then, then I'm never going to be free of you. Is that it? Well, frankly, that's it. Ah, unless I kill you, of course. What if I did kill you? <laughs> People have threatened it before, but they haven't meant it. Maybe I mean it. Well, we can easily test you out. There's a sharp knife stuck in the desk in front of you. I'm going to get up and deliberately turn my back on you. Like this. Be careful, Charles Markham. As a student of human nature, I'm curious. How much will you risk to keep this secret? Have you the courage to kill and risk hanging? Yes. I think I have. <laughs> what was that? Now, aren't you glad you held back at the last moment, Miss Ray? I said, what was that? That, my dear, was the front doorbell. Probably my friend, Inspector Ross, from Bigmore Street Police Station. Come in, old man. Come on in. Make yourself comfortable. I'll be with you in a moment. You wanted me to attack you, didn't you? No, I was merely curious. And in any case, Miss Ray, it would be useless to kill me. Useless? Why? Because I shouldn't die. Don't talk rot. Oh, it's quite true. A man in my position must take uh, certain precautions. If you killed me, I should be back to haunt you within half an hour. And I don't happen to be joking. Come in. Now, look here, Martha. I... Good Lord, Judy. Ron. Mr. Ronald Gilbert, as I live. Ron, what are you doing here? He hasn't got anything against you, has he? Speak up, Mr. Gilbert. Have I? The fact is, Judith, I... I... <laughs> look at him, Miss Ray. See how he changes color and twists his mustache and altogether resembles a boy caught in his mother's gem cupboard. Perfect picture of a gentleman being a gentleman. Look here, Markham. 
I'm not very clever. You can always make a fool of me when you start talking. So let's stop talking. I brought the money. What money? Oh, merely my fee for keeping quiet about you. So you went to Ron, too. You told him about it. Naturally. If possible, always sell your wares in two markets. How much money? Never mind you this. I hoped I could do this without your knowing. How much money? Three thousand. It's all I could raise. Has he... Has he told you who I am? And what I've been? Look here, Judith. Who the devil cares who you are or what you've been? I happen to be in love with you. I... Never mind. Let's get out of here. Ron, it's no good. He'll only come back for more money. I know that, but what else can we do? Nothing, I'm afraid. Well, what's that knife doing there stuck in the desk? Nothing dangerous, I assure you. No? Merely a curio. I pick it up like this, I flip it down like this. And pick it up again. Miss Ray was very much interested in the dagger. Now, may I have that envelope with the money, please? There you are. Take it. Thank you. As I explained to Miss Ray, I'm leaving tomorrow for a holiday. Hence the general disarray and the dust covers on the chairs. But before my departure, I'm glad we could settle this affair, as you would say, like gentlemen. Before we clear out of here, Markham, there's just one favor I'd like to ask. Well, of course, old men, ask away. This is your job, I suppose. You can't help being what you are, but never again, as long as you live... Well? Never even say the word, gentlemen. Be careful, Ron. Look at his face. Tell me, Mr. Gilbert, how much money is in this envelope? You heard what I said, 3,000 pounds. Then take it back, my friend. I find we can't strike a bargain after all. What do you mean? Just what I say. Here is your money. You will now oblige me, both you and Miss Ray, by leaving my shop. What? What are you going to do? Tomorrow morning, perhaps even tonight, I'm going to get in touch with the police. And I shall tell them where they can find Letty Wilson, alias Judith Ray. You can't do that, Markham. Oh, yes, he can. You hit him where it hurts. Three thousand pounds, my friend, is not enough compensation for the way you talk. There is a way through the shop. Shall I escort you to the front door? No. Oh, so you prefer to stay here and make a fool of yourself? You're not going to tell the police, Markham. I promise you that. And how are you going to stop me? With this. Run! Put that gun away. It's a funny thing, Judith. I felt a bit of a fool, you know, bringing this revolver along. But now I've got a use for it. Oh, yes, I've got a use for it. Hmm. Maybe the best thing would be to go into the street now and call a policeman. You will never get into the street, Martin. Are you following me into the shop? Yes. So both of you, it appears, came here under false pretenses. You said you wanted to pay me some money. The money's still here, but you've lost your chance to and get it. And your our dear Judith said she wanted to buy a present for you. I showed her this grandfather clock here, this talking clock. Don't go a step beyond that clock, Markham. I warn you. Nonsense, old man. You wouldn't dare shoot. Wouldn't I? No, and I'll call your bluff. One step. Two steps. Run! I know your whole silly tribe, my friend. You wouldn't risk it. No, you wouldn't. What's happening to me? Don't try and grab out of the clock, Markham. It won't save you. You wouldn't risk your life, you... Wouldn't risk your family position, you. You wouldn't. Do it. I had to do it, Judy. Don't you see? I had to do it. Did you? Is he? Oh yes, yes, he's done for. I tell you, I had to do it. Shh! Keep your voice down. Why? That shot sounded like the crack of doom. I wonder if anybody in the street heard it. You mean the police? Yes, Ron. What in heaven's name are we going to do? Steady, steady. We'll find a way out. Maybe he's not dead, Ron. Go and look at him. He's dead, all right. Please, Ron. Go and look at him. Well? Shot through the heart. The bullet went clean through him and smashed the face of the grandfather clock. That's all I can see in this dim light. This isn't happening to us. It... It can't be I've happening. I've got to think, but it's hard to think. You see, Judith, I'm not in a rage any longer. I'm just numb and, and a little bit scared. You're not going to give yourself up. And have this whole thing made public? Not likely. Wait a minute. There may be a way out. What way? He said he was going for a holiday. Remember? Well, suppose he did. That gives us time. It means his absence won't be noticed. The shop will be closed. Nobody will come here for days. And certainly nobody will come here tonight. And... What's that? Police officer. I forgot the police officer. What police officer? A friend of Markham's. Inspector somebody or other from Wigmore Street. 
He's inspected here tonight. Then, then we're finished. No, Ronnie. We're not finished. He can't see anything out there. The shutters are down and the door's covered. Could you... Could you pick Markham up and carry him? Yes, yes, I could. Why? There must be a back way out of the shop, probably in the office. Hurry, Ron. I don't like to touch him. Hurry, Ron, please. He's as heavy as a sack of meal. He seems to be looking straight at me. I know. Everything here seems to have eyes and move a little in the shadow. Didn't you see the expression in Markham's eyes just before you... No, no, I, I didn't. He seemed to be looking behind us or beyond us. I don't know how to describe it. And he said something, too, that scared me. He's, he said he couldn't die. He's... He said... Close the door, quick. This police officer, Judith, he can't get into the shop, can he? Of course he can. The front door isn't locked. That's true. What's wrong with me, Judith? I came in there that way myself. And there's no time to lock the front door now. Our only hope is through the back way. I thought I'd seen a back door and... Ah, there it is. Just a minute. I've, I've killed a man. That means I'm a murderer. A fraction of a second. One tick of a clock in there. And you change from an ordinary happy person into... Into what I... Well, Judith, well? I'm sorry, Ron. The door's locked. Isn't there a key? No. Maybe in his pockets on a key ring. There isn't time, Ron. I think I... I heard the front door open. Our visitor's coming in. I've got it. The dust covers. What? Those white cloths that, that cover, that fit over the chairs. Look at them. What on earth are you talking about? We used to play a game when we were kids. Somebody sits in a big chair. You know, you, you, you fit the dust cover over him and, and nobody can tell he's sitting there. Don't you see, Judith? That's how we can hide Markham's body. It might work if there's time. There's got to be time. Take the big cover off that chair, the wing chair. All right. Maybe there's a chance. I'll fit him into it. Arms along the chair arms. Feet pushed back. Now... Put the cover back again and, and pull it round down his feet. Don't let it touch his chest. The blood will show through. There, that's got it. You can't see anything now, can you? No, but, Ron. Well? What did you do with the gun? The gun? The gun you shot Markham with. Oh, well, Judith, I put it down on the floor when I picked up his body. Out in the other room? Yes, yes, I'm afraid so. Uh, and it's too late now, Judith. The police are here. What are you going to say? I, I don't know. Trust your wits and try and brazen it out. Yes? Come in. Good evening, Miss Ray. And good evening, Mr. Gilbert. Charles Markham. Your Charles Markham. Correct, Miss Ray. But why should that surprise you? Why do you look as though you were seeing a ghost? Because we are seeing a ghost. If you're Charles Markham, whose body is... Judith, be careful. Body, Miss Ray. Did you say body? Miss Ray's upset. She doesn't know what she's talking about. If you killed me, I should be back to haunt you within half an hour. That's what he said. I tell you, Miss Ray isn't herself. She, she, she had bad news today. A relative of hers died. I, I, I've been trying to make her feel better. Indeed. Do you think uh, it would make her feel better to bring her here? I, I don't understand. My dear sir, you are very welcome. But the situation is surely a little odd. I come in here and find you two looking as guilty as a pair of murderers if in my private office in the middle of the night. There's nothing odd about that. I, I wanted to buy Judith something. At one o'clock in the morning? Yes. Why not? Well, may I ask how you managed to get in? The front door was open. We just walked in. If you wish to buy something, why not stay in the showroom? Why come to my office? Well, hang it all. You don't think I, we, we wanted to steal anything, do you? Well, that thought did occur to me. You see, there was nobody else here. There's nobody here, Mr. Markham. Not a living soul. Then you didn't meet, by any chance, my brother? Your... your brother? Yes, my brother Robert. You couldn't have mistaken him if you had seen him. He looks so much like me that few people can tell us apart. Oh, so that's it. Poor Robert often deputizes for me. He's learned to act like me, think like me, and talk like me. But he doesn't like the work very much. Of course, you know what my work really is. Is, is this part of the game? Are you, are you trying to play cat and mouse? Robert is an idealist. He thinks, poor fellow, that my profession is beneath contempt. But he acts the part and acts it well because I pay him. And I find it useful to have a double who will run risks for me. What have you done with his body? We, we haven't done anything with him. If you've killed Robert, my friend, you've committed a totally useless murder. You don't see him here, do you? 
No, but I see his handiwork. Meaning what? I've warned him many times about throwing a knife down on a polished desktop. Those scratches on the desk are fresh scratches. Of course, if you give me your word of honor that he's not here... Of course, he's not here. Well, in that case, all we can do is sit down and make ourselves comfortable. Will you sit there, Mr. Gilbert? And you, Miss Ray, uh, in that wing chair by the window. What's wrong, Miss Ray? Why don't you sit down? Because I... I prefer to stand, thank you. Then perhaps you won't mind if I sit in the wing chair... It's a very comfortable one. My brother always don't, says... Don't sit down there for the long... Oh. <laughs> so that's it. Yes. That's it. It is rather a thick chair. I press against the dust cover and blood comes through. I lift the bottom of the dust cover and... What's the use of going on with this? I killed him. You admit that? Yes, I admit it. But Judith had nothing to do with this. I swear she hadn't. My telephone, you notice, is against the wall. I shall have to turn my back to you when I ring. Ring? Where? Bigmore Street Police Station. Oh, no. Give him a chance. Please give him a chance. Hello? Hello, operator. I want Regent 0586. I yes, won't sir. let them take Regent you on. I won't. It's no good, Judith. I killed a man. I meant to kill him. That's all there is to it. A very sensible attitude, my friend. And if the lady has any idea of flying at me with that knife, just notice what I've got here. A 32 revolver. One chamber fired. Picked up of the floor in that room where... Hello? Uh, Hello, Wickmore Street Police Station. For the last time, Hello? Mr. Markham, won't you give him a chance? Be quiet, Miss Ray. May I speak to Inspector Ross, please? Inspector Ross speaking. Now, isn't that Mr. Markham? Got it in one, Inspector. Uh, Charles Markham here. I understand you were going to drop in and see me tonight. Uh, I intended to, Mr. Markham, but I'm afraid I can't make it now. Oh, why not? Anything wrong? Only a robbery in Davies Street, but it's likely to be a long job. Sorry I can't get there. Well, that's perfectly all right, Inspector, because actually I rang up to make sure you wouldn't come here tonight. You see, I've got a lot of work to do, and I'm leaving for Eastbourne early tomorrow morning. Let's make it some other time, shall we? Oh, glad you, Mr. Markham. No crimes being committed up your way, I suppose? No, Inspector. It's as quiet as the grave. I've never known a more peaceful night. Goodbye. Why did you do that? Now, please, don't excite yourself, Miss Ray. Didn't you hear what I told the inspector? Yes, but... Is this some more trickery? Trickery? How can it be? I don't know. That's what I'm asking you. I should call it generous when I let my poor brother's death go unavenged. You're not doing this without a reason. Naturally not. But has it occurred to you, either of you, that it... I might not want my business dealings revealed in court. What are you driving at? And has it also occurred to you that a man's double, who looks exactly like him, and shares all his secrets, may become a danger rather than an asset? He knows too much. He wants too much, and so... I think I understand. You're glad he's dead. Not glad, my dear. You shocked my brotherly feelings, but definitely relieved. Look here, you can't get away with this. Get away with it, sir? Aren't you forgetting that you are the murderer? Then what are you going to do? Well, it is very simple. We three, in an unholy partnership, will dispose of Robert's body. Or would you rather hang? He's got us, Ron. There's no other way. But how can we dispose of the body? This seems worse than killing him. It's filthy, cold-blooded... Practical necessity. And as for disposing of the body, nothing is easier. We shall simply gather the... And so, as I said before, this is the story of a man who commits murder and gets away with it. Now, Ronald Gilbert looks back across the years and is still firmly convinced of his own guilt. But, of course, Gilbert never shot anybody. I was the man who committed the murder. Don't you remember? The bullet that killed my brother is supposed to have passed through his body and smashed the face of the grandfather clock. But that's an impossibility. The face of a grandfather clock is much higher than the heart of a man. You see, two shots were fired at the very same instant. Gilbert missed and smashed the clock face. I fired from the door of the office and did not miss. That was why my brother looked past those two. I went out by the back door, locked it, and reappeared at the front afterwards. It was not Robert Markham who died. I am Robert Markham. It was Charles who died that night. 
And I killed him to stop forever the wholesale blackmail that was poisoning the lives and blasting the hearts of a thousand half-crazed people. His records are destroyed, his correspondence I burned. He is dead and gone. I have assumed his name and identity ever since. I committed a murder. And yet, if you sat on a jury, dare you say that you would condemn me? Come now, would you? And so closes Mr. Markham, Antique Dealer, starring Paul Lucas with Heather Angel and Bramwell Fletcher. Tonight's tale of Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday, when we will have the pleasure of bringing you Mr. Charles Lawton and Miss Elsa Lanchester will star in one of the most famous and suspenseful of Agatha Christie's thrillers, The ABC Murders. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, with Ted Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin and Lucian Morrowick, conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wines present Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud, your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you Miss Michelle Morgan, Mr. Philip Dorn, and Mr. George Coloris in a suspense play dealing with a painting of a beautiful woman and with a lover and a husband and with an assassination for which only the death of one of these three could atone. And so with Portrait Without a Face... And with the performances of Michel Morgan as Colette, of Philip Dorn as the artist Paul Degel, and of George Coloris as Charles Gaveau, we again hope to keep you in suspense. It was just twilight as she came out of the cathedral on Fifth Avenue and stood for a moment on the north steps. She looked across 51st Street at the discreet gray building with the discreet bronze sign saying Fernet Gallery of Modern Art. A richly dressed couple came out of the gallery and the doorman called a taxi. Surely it was safe now. The crowds must be gone. She hurried across the street. Good evening. The gallery's still open for a few minutes, isn't it? Well, I'm sorry, miss. It's just closing up now. Oh, you can't be. I've come all the way from Boston, and I... Well, I... I'm sorry, miss. We're half an hour past close, and now we open again at 11 tomorrow. 11? But I can't possibly wait over... Do you think five dollars would... No, miss. I could even go as high as ten. No, miss. I could even go as high no, as... No, miss. Oh, but there's a picture on exhibit that I must see... I'd stay only a moment. I must see it, really. It's called... A... I know, miss. It's called Portrait Without a Face. Half of New York was in to see it today, and the other half will be in tomorrow. And if you'll excuse me now... Wait a moment, please. Have... Have you seen the picture? Me? What did I be doing looking at pictures? Waste of time. But I can tell you this. Sure got people talking. One of those critics was in here this morning, and you... 
Hey, hold on, miss. Maybe you can't go in after all. You see that man coming down from Madison Avenue? That's Paul DeGel, the artist who painted the picture. Now, maybe if you would ask him... I... DeGel? Oh, no. No, thank you. I've changed my mind. I'll... I'll come back some other time. Taxi! Taxi! Some women like to drive you crazy. Evening, Mr. DeGel. Hello, John. How are you? Thank you. Fine. Is the exhibit driving people away? <laughs> that woman seemed to be in an awful hurry. Huh? <laughs> she was trying to get in, sir. In fact, she offered me five dollars if I... She offered me five dollars if I'd let her in, and then she raised it to ten. And wait, I'd... wait. She offered you money? Did she want to see portrait without a face? Well, that and nothing else, sir. She was pretty insistent about it, too. She must have known about your work in France, Mr. DeGel. Had quite a foreign accent. A foreign I... accent, you said. John, is Mr. Fournier? Well, yes, sir, he is. He's in the back. There, there's some men with him. Good. I want to see those men. I want to see them immediately. <laughs> Gentlemen, Paul. Gentlemen, the woman we were looking for was here tonight. Really? Paul. Yes, I'm sure of it. I missed her only by a moment. With every brush stroke I made on this canvas, I knew I was bringing her into our hands. I knew she would have to see that portrait. She had to know how much I knew. I know, gentlemen, she will be back. Paul. Yes, Henry. Will you still have the courage to finish the job when the time comes? When the time comes, I'll kill with as little conscience as I would shoot down the Nazis who have taken France. That portrait is without a face, gentlemen, because I couldn't see her face. But she will return and supply that feature. Then we will know her for what she is. She will be back. I'll stake my life on it. Tonight, for suspense, Roma Wines bring you as stars Michelle Morgan and Philip Dorn with George Coloris. You have heard them in the prologue of Louis Pelletier's story, Portrait Without a Face, which is tonight's adventure in suspense. During this intermission of tonight's suspense drama presented by Roma Wines, let us picture a scene in the fashionable restaurant El Patio in Havana, Cuba. From the next table, we hear a Cuban judge of fine wines describe in glowing terms the wonderful climate and soil of our own California. When his American guest points out that his Cuban host has never been to the United States, the Cuban answers, It is true, I've never visited your California, but from only such perfect wine country could come sherry of such superb quality as we have enjoyed. Roma, California sherry. Yes, by their example, wine connoisseurs of many other lands tell you that in Roma wines are all the great qualities that must be present in a wine for great enjoyment. It's for this reason these wine experts of other lands import Roma wines from great distances to be enjoyed as a rare luxury. But for you, this luxury of other lands becomes a daily pleasure because you can enjoy any of Roma wines' many different taste-appealing wine types without additional charge for import duties and expensive shipment from great distance. These two great Roma wine features, superb quality and small cost, have made Roma wines America's largest selling wines. Why put off another day your enjoyment of this splendid quality, such thrilling taste appeal? I'll spell out the name for you. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Michelle Morgan, Philip Dorn, and George Coloris in Portrait Without a Face, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Where have you been, Colette? For a walk, Charles, along 50, haven't you? I needed a breath of air. You're lying. You're at the Ferney Gallery. Then I'm lying. I was at the Ferney Gallery. You fool. 
I told you that they'd kill you once they're sure. Yes, you told me, Charles. I'm going to bed. Did you see the picture? I'm going to bed, Charles. Answer my question. No, I didn't see it. What, the gallery was closed? Yes. Ah, that's good. Good. Uh, well, drink? No, thank you. You don't mind if I do? I haven't minded what you do since the second week of our marriage, Charles. Really? Oh, that distresses me. Well, Colette. Yes? Before you go to bed, there's something here I want you to read. What is it, Charles? This art magazine, my dear, that just came on the newsstands today it contains a charming series of reviews of the exhibit at the Ferney Gallery. René Lautrec, the French critic, has done a little piece on the picture that you are so anxious to see. He heads his review, The Murderers. Read it. Please, Read Charles. Read it. It'll satisfy your curiosity once and for all. Begin here. This portrait. This portrait without a face is no ordinary canvas. This is a portrait of a crime. A crime etched on the mind of a man who must have been there to see it happen. One cannot describe the portrait in words. Only in action. This way. The artist is sitting in a darkened room. Resting from the noise of a party upstairs in the big house. Yes, the reception for General Vauban, Paris, 1939. Go on. The artist... The artist is resting in the darkened room. Suddenly, there are two shots. The sliding doors to the library open. Standing in the doorway is the silhouette of a woman in evening dress. Charles, I can't... Give it to me. The woman's back is towards the artist. He doesn't see her face. At the woman's feet is a hand outstretched. The hand of a dead man. Who is the man, Colette? Vauban. General Vauban's dead. All this happens in an instant. The picture is photographed on the brain of the artist. A woman in evening dress standing in a doorway, her back turned. That is... Portrait without a face. <laughs> Colette, it's time to move boldly. Paul de Gelles will have to be put out of the way now. He knows enough to be dangerous. I suppose it's somewhat of a pity to eliminate such a promising young artist. He might have gone places. <laughs> However, tomorrow morning, you will telephone Paul de Gelles at his apartment. You will tell him you saw his name in the art magazine. You will ask him where he's been all these years. You will say that you must see him. Your voice... And uh, it will tremble just a little. Will convey a message he's been waiting to hear all these years. You love him. After all these years, you still love him. Hello? Yes. This is Paul Dugel. Colette, Colette, darling, where are you? Where are you? Yes, yes, naturally, every day, every moment, of course, anywhere you see. Then, the Carlton? The Carlton, what time? One or two? Two. Then, at two o'clock, dear, till then... Yes, till then. I'm so happy, Colette. Goodbye. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, Paul. Oh, that was very convincing, my dear. So much sentiment in your voice. See that it doesn't affect your actions. It's your life or his, Colette. So you've told me. Well, remember it. Stand up. Let me have a look at you. Oh, yes. Oh, you're... You're crying, Colette. How touching. The lovers parted. The lovers reunited. April in Paris. Chestnuts in blossom. Charles, please. <laughs> Wouldn't he love to know you married me? Me, of all people. And how I'd love to see you two meet. Colette, what will you say to him? What can you say, Colette? What can I say, Paul? Nothing for a moment. Just let me look at you. Order now? No, no, not yet. Not just yet. Y yes, wait. Uh, bring us... Bring us two sherrys, will you? Uh, thank you, monsieur. I'm changed, Paul. You can see that. A little. A deepness around the eyes, perhaps. You've been unhappy, Colette. Yes. I wrote to you almost every day for a year. I couldn't answer, Paul. Colette, why did you run away? Oh, you mustn't ask me. Was there anyone? No. No one in my heart. 
No one ever to fill your place. I thought when you didn't come back that... Oh, darling. You were right to think anything of me. I thought of Charles Gavot. I remembered how insane he was about oh, you. please, Paul, don't talk about Charles. I thought if you ever married Cavour, then... I'm sorry. There's so much I don't know about your life. Four years. Oh, I knew everything about you. <laughs> Press notices. I wanted to be a success for you, Colette. I followed everything you did. The prison camp, I remember that. When you escaped to this country, your, your first exhibit here... Hmm. I have all the clippings. Oh, I was so happy for you, Paul. I was so glad they believed in you as I did. Yes, you have been good to me in this country. Very good to me. More than I deserve. No, not more. Only you're just you. I know. I've read the reviews of the exhibit at the Ferney Gallery. Yes, they seem to like that. Paul, I want to see that exhibit. Of course, Colette. Any time. No, not any time. I want you to show it to me tonight. Tonight? Please, Paul. After after the crowds have gone from the gallery, my first look at your work in so many years, I don't want to share it with anyone. I just want there to be you and I. Well, then that's how you shall have it. Darling, of course, I want you to see it. I want you to see every piece in the exhibit. There is one uh, that has attracted considerable attention. Portrait without a face. Oh. Oh, yes. I read about that one. There is much of my life in that painting, Colette. Certainly much of the past four years. But your work on it, it has been so worthwhile. No, no, not entirely. Not just yet. Colette, do you remember the death of Jean of Aubin? Aubin? That was some time in 1940, wasn't it? 1939, the year you left Paris. Oh, yes, that's right. As you recall, Vauban was our greatest advocate of air power. There were people in Paris who hated Vauban and wanted him out, out of the way. Your friend Charles Caveau and his newspapers were the general's bitterest enemies. And do you know a curious thing, Colette? What, Paul? Some of the best people in France were duped by Caveau's newspapers into believing that Vauban was an arch-criminal. Yes, yes, I remember. Briefly, some deluded woman fancied herself a modern Joan of Arc and killed Vauban, thinking she was saving her country. A woman? But they say the crime was never solved. It wasn't, but it will be, I think, uh, very soon. Yes, I'm sure that... <laughs> Forgive me, darling. I hadn't meant to burden you with this. Oh, it is yourself you must not burden, Paul. You have given this matter much of your life. Much of your thought, haven't you? All of my thought, Colette. When I wasn't thinking of you. <laughs> or painting. Painting? When I was painting, I thought of you most. I think that in every picture there was something of you. Sometimes the light on your hair. Sometimes the way you hold your hand. Even in... In portrait without a face? Is there something of me in that one? In, uh, in that one? Uh, uh, two sherries, monsieur. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, Colette. I think that even in that one there's something of you. And it's very strange because you... Uh, well, anyway, tonight... Uh, tonight you'll see for yourself. To you, darling. To our reunion, Paul. <laughs> To our reunion. That's what she said, gentlemen. To our reunion. You are sure, Paul, that she does not suspect? Positive. She is utterly convinced that I am as blindly infatuated with her as ever. She is convinced that in my blindness I shall step out upon the stage she has set for me. We shall see who has set the stage. We shall see who portrays the victim. It will take courage, Paul. Perhaps. There are not many who have your kind of courage. No. There are not many who have my kind of hate. Or who have waited so long to spend it. But have no fear, gentlemen. You will see that I do not fail. You will be with me tonight. All of you. With you? I do not understand. I should have said you will be present in the wings just off the stage. It's just ten now. In less than an hour, my guest will arrive. 
Before long, you will come into this room to see the portrait. The room will be quite dark. You will be in the background. There will be no way to recognize the Time. Are you ready? Yes. Wait, which purse are you carrying? That black one on the table. Hand it to me. Good. Just the right size. Oh, don't look so wide-eyed and innocent. You seen a pistol loaded before? Charles, Glad. couldn't we? Perhaps it would be best for me to have a look in on you and Degel this evening. Oh, please, Charles. How do I know that you'll do what you're told? Well, you said it was his life or mine. But you're a sentimental fool. You might... Re- I'll do what I'm told. Very well. Remember, I'll be waiting across the street on the cathedral steps. I'll give you till 11 o'clock. If you're not out at 11... I'll be out. Yes. Yes, you'd better be. Ready to fire. Here's your purse. The pistol, you see? On top. Watch out when you pay the cab fare. Yes, Charles. I'll be waiting for you on the cathedral steps. And you have till 11 o'clock. <laughs> Do you remember this picture, Colette? Oh, Paul, of course. That was the summer we were at Nice. Lovely summer, wasn't it? Oh, so lovely. You see the fishing boat? L'Hirondelle? <laughs> remember her? <laughs> oh, too well. She made me seasick once. But it was a beautiful summer, Paul. Wonderful summer. Yes. Yes, it was. Well, that's all of the Paris pictures. Now, uh... Now I guess you would like to see the... The portrait. Yes. Now I'd like to see it. It's in the next room. They have given it in uh, a room by itself. Oh. Take my hand, Colette. I've kept the lights out in there. I want you to sit on the bench, then I'll turn the lights on. And you will see the picture as as I saw it. I mean, in my mind's eye. Yes, Paul. This way. No, careful. Two steps down. You are trembling, Colette. I've always been afraid of the dark. Here's the bench. Sit here. No, 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 no. Sit here. You are in front of the picture now. I'm going to turn on the light. Hurry, Paul. I don't like this. I just want to give you the full effect of it. Are you watching? Straight ahead. Yes, Paul. So, may I present then my portrait without a face? Oh, Paul! I thought you would find it effective. Now we'll put aside pretense. You know who that woman is. She is Colette, standing in the doorway of General Vauban's library. The hand of the dead man at her feet is the hand of General Vauban, my friend. The blood on the floor is the blood of Vauban. The blood that is touching the evening slipper of Colette. Stop it, Paul, stop it! I've waited a long time for you, Colette, four years. I said then that I would make someone pay for the murder of General Vauban. We have a committee, Colette. We formed it back there in Paris in the dark days, just before the war broke out. The committee knows everything about the people who planned the death of Vauban. The committee knows who did the murder itself. Settling with that person has been my special assignment. I have been your special assignment. Your special prize. Is that what you mean? That's what I mean. Oh, I don't care, really. Not now. You cared enough to want to fight back. You came here armed. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't open your purse. I took the trouble to remove the pistol while you were taking off your coat. No, no, not, not this one in my right hand. That's mine. This one. This pistol here. It is yours, isn't it? Yes. French make. Did Charles give it to you? Charles? Yes, Charles. I knew you married Charles. I found it out just before I lost track of you two years ago. I knew you married Charles, and I knew why. And you told me this afternoon... Yes, I made you believe that I didn't know about Charles. I want you to come up here to the gallery. I knew you had to come here to find out how much I knew. Charles was right. He said it was your life or mine. He's very clever, Charles. Do you remember when you first met him? And I warned you away? I remember. You were impressed by Charles and his politically wise friends. But you didn't know that Charles had sold out his country. I didn't know. You were duped him to believing that Vauban was a traitor. Charles dominated your mind. He controlled you as an hypnotist. They needed someone to murder Vauban, so 
You were chosen. You were to be the savior of France. <laughs> you exulted in the role and you believed it. Yes, up to the very last. Up to the last moment. Then I didn't see how I could go through with it. I couldn't bear the thought of, of killing a man. You're lying, Colette. No, Paul, no, listen to me. I stood there looking at Bobin, the pistol in my hand. He looked up. He started walking toward me, telling me to give him the pistol. I felt dizzy. Oh, I wanted to run away to... But I... I raised the pistol. There were two shots. And he fell at my feet. I dropped the gun. Then you opened the library door to escape. Yes. I ran out on the terrace and through the garden. I ran blindly and fell. Then I felt a strong pair of arms lift me up. Charles was there. You told him you had killed Faubin. Yes, I begged him to, be, to take me away to... I needed someone desperately. He promised me to take me out of France and let me forget. Oh, Paul. Paul, turn out the light on that horrible picture, please. The light stays on, Colette. I want you to keep looking at the picture. That picture was painted for a purpose. And now the purpose is going to be fulfilled. Paul, will you believe that I didn't want to kill Bobert? Four years I've waited, Colette. Now it works out according to plan. I didn't want to kill a man. I didn't want to go away with Charles, but I was in too deep. Paul. Paul, listen to me. I've loved you, always. You must know that. After tonight? After you're coming here to kill me? Open my gun, Paul. Open it up. You'll see that it's empty. I took the shells out on my way here. Oh, why don't you do it, Paul? It's true. I knew I couldn't go through with it. Not this time. Not with you. Paul. It's too late, Colette. Paul. Keep sitting on the bench, Colette. Keep looking at the picture. Don't move. I won't. I won't, but you must believe me. Paul! Paul, wait! Just look at the picture, Colette. The picture. Listen. Please listen. I'm telling the truth, Paul. My gun wasn't loaded. Listen, Paul! For you, Dejel. And you, monsieur. Paul, are you all right? Oh. Yes, yes. I'm all right, gentlemen. Gentlemen, may I present the late Monsieur Charles Caveau. Four years. Four years of painting and planning and waiting. Paul, take me out of here. Yes, darling. Colette, I'm sorry I had to do this to you. It was the only way to find him. I knew he was here to kill again. Both of us. Charles? Charles killed Vaubin. I picked up the pistol you dropped at night, Colette. It had never been fired. Charles was never certain you would have the nerve to go through with it. At the last moment, he took a hand himself. The shots that killed Vaubin were fired from the terrace. In your terror, you believe that you died, did it. Charles let you believe it all these years. Oh, Paul. I knew he would follow you here tonight. I left the door open for him. He came downstairs when we entered his room. He could hear us talking. I wanted him to hear. I needed time, time, Colette. Colette, I'm sorry. That was the only way to meet him face to face. Oh, Paul. Don't ever leave me. Never, never leave me. Never, Colette. We are together now. For always. But before we go, there's one thing left. You see this knife? For us, that is the end of Portrait Without a Face. And so closes Portrait Without a Face, starring Michelle Morgan, Philip Dorn, and George Coloris. Tonight's tale of Suspense. 
Miss Morgan is currently being seen in Warner Brothers' Passage to Marseille. Mr. Dorn appeared through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, producers of Madame Curie. You know, if we could bring to this microphone a man typical of all Roma wine dealers, this is what he might tell you. I sell a lot of the good Roma wines. They are, you know, America's largest selling wines. My Roma wine customers, I've noticed, are sociable people who enjoy entertaining friends. Talking with me, they give a lot of credit for the success of their entertaining to the enjoyable Roma wines they serve. They're thrifty people, too, these buyers of Roma wines. What else could offer so much enjoyment for so little cost? Only pennies a glass by actual check. Now, that doesn't leave much for me to add, except this, perhaps. If you are not already one of the millions enjoying Roma wines regularly, make your own taste test of any of Roma wines' many different taste-delighting California wine types, such as the delicious, tangy Roma Sherry, or the hearty Roma Burgundy, or the sweeter, heavier Roma Port, and discover for yourself why Roma wines are winning international praise. Voiced in this phrase, Roma wines are truly magnificent. Let me repeat the name. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Don't forget, then, next Thursday for Alan Ladd in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. With us in Hollywood tonight as star is Mr. Gene Lockhart, whose remarkable characterizations on the screen have won him a notable following with American audiences. It is with rueful satisfaction, but with satisfaction nonetheless, that the genial Mr. Lockhart contemplates his reputation. Because of his cinematic misdoings, his numberless treacheries, betrayals, and cowardly villainies, he is one of the most hated men in the country today. Our story this evening by John Shaw is called Statement of Employee Henry Wilson. And so with the performance of Gene Lockhart as he relates and relives the events of the climactic moment in Henry Wilson's life, we again hope to keep you in suspense. I was aware that I was trembling. I tried walking slowly back and forth in front of the desk. But even in motion, my knees felt weak and my whole body shook. Why was it always I who trembled and never this pompous insect sitting in front of me? His voice was cool and mocking. His voice was clear and hard. Well, I sympathize with you, of course, Wilson. But the error must be brought to Mr. Larkin's attention. There is quite a big mistake there, quite a costly mistake. Mr. Larkin must know. He wouldn't cover it up. I knew that. Two years ago, this man had come with the firm. For eight years before that, I had worked there, enjoying the work, liking the people. And then he had come there. Have you... Have you ever stood quietly by and watched someone rob your house and steal your pocketbook? I was helpless. He was ambitious. He was clever. He was fluent. And as of tonight, I was his subordinate. Two years against ten years. Around the office, I had a reputation of being casual and carefree. But I hated this man. Every inch of me hated this man. And it was not a new hatred. Of course, there is no question of your honesty. 
His voice was patronizing. The patient teacher and the unruly pupil. I hated him. He smiled up at me and waved his hand in dismissal. He almost brushed a small iron vase off the top of the desk with the gesture. I... I had seen that vase so often, but I had never seen it out of the eyes that I was looking at it with now. Good night, Wilson. Good night, I said. Good night, clever boy. I walked out into the corridor and rang for the elevator. A ah, terrible night, ain't it, Mr. Wilson? I heard the boy yes, talking sir, like he was yelling too. at me from some distant these mountain. He was talking and I was answering. But what either one of us was saying, I didn't know. I was thinking of, of something else. I looked at my watch as I stepped out of the car. It was 11.30 already. I mentioned it. You've had a long day today, Mr. Wilson. Those were the first words of the boy that I heard. Heard clearly. Very clearly. Uh, yes, I told him. Oh, plenty of overtime this week. I stood and looked at him for a moment. Uh, Mr. Dodds is still in the office. You, you might drop in and see if he wants anything. I think he'd be very grateful. I will, sir. I certainly will. It'll help to pass the time, sir. I don't like to complain, but these nights pass awful slow sometimes. Uh, yes. Uh, go up and see if he wants anything. Go up and see. I walked out of the lobby and came back into the building again when the boy had gotten into the elevator. Four flights up. I took the stairs slowly. I was in no rush. I must let the boy get out of the room first. He said the nights passed slowly. This one wouldn't, and yet there would be an eternity compressed in it. When I got to the fourth floor, I stood at the top of the stairs and watched the door to Dodd's office. The elevator was parked at the floor, so I knew the boy was in the room. A short while later, he came out, and I crouched back in the shadows until he'd gone down in the car. And then I walked into the room, not in a crouch or moving my feet so that no sound would wake the stillness, but casually, honestly. There was a small waiting room for Mr. Dodd's office. In two years, he had a waiting room. In ten, I had none. I felt like laughing at the symbolism of that fact. Who's there? I called out my name and entered his office. Yes, what is it, Wilson? He was still sitting down. And the iron vase was still alongside of him, very close to him. I started to talk. I don't know what about business, things in general, I've quite forgotten. I reached across and picked up the iron vase casually, very casually. But his eyes went wild suddenly, and he jumped. And I hit him square on the top of the head with the vase. It wasn't a very good shot. I had no leverage. But he started to slump back in the chair. I hit him again, hard, and again and again. And a red streak ran across his forehead and he lay still. I put my hand against his heart. For a moment, there was a soft beating, and then I could feel nothing. I was very calm and very warm. I was calmer than I'd ever been before. I wiped off the vase and put it back onto the desk. I ran through the papers that Dodds had been looking at until I found the one paper I was looking for. I ripped it into little bits and I put the pieces into my pocket. Outside the building, my first act would be to scatter the pieces. I'd cover my mistake myself. I moved slowly back to the door. I wiped the doorknob and looked once around the room before I opened the door and stepped out into the waiting room. And then... Going home, Mr. Wilson? I stood there, afraid to turn, afraid to think. I slammed the door shut behind me and stood in front of it. Are you all right, Mr. Wilson? I tried to talk, but the words got caught somewhere in my throat. It was the sweeper, Tom Higby, the night sweeper. I almost fainted. Everything had been set so nicely. I'd left the building. The elevator boy had come up and found Dodds in good health. Someone had stolen him later and killed him. That would be the elevator boy's story. If suspicion attached to anyone, it would be to the boy. I had left the building. I had left the building, but... But now, this... Are you all right, Mr. Wilson? I'm fine, Tom. A bit of a cold, that's all. A weakens one. Uh, how are the wife and kids? Fine, fine. The shock was wearing off. Uh, Mr. Dodds is in his room now, Tom. Working very late tonight. You'd better 
you know, let his office go for this once. Well, if you say so, Mr. Wilson. I could give it a quick brush, though, sir. I wouldn't disturb him none. I stood firm in front of the door. For a moment, I wondered if he'd seen anything when I'd come out of the room. It was possible. He could have looked over my shoulder. Ah, uh, no. No, he hadn't seen anything. He began to sweep the sitting room, and I stood and watched him. I couldn't let him get out of here. I'd go to the chair if he told me about being there. And I couldn't kill him, too. Oh, what a quick step it had been back to normal. I was nervous again, and I felt a sickness at the bottom of my stomach. I tried to talk, to talk, and I, I, I sounded stupid. Tom looked at me. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have to touch him. It, it would be his word against mine, and I had left the building. I opened the door quickly and went back into Dodd's office. I tried to keep my eyes away from, from that thing at the desk. I remember that, that he'd kept a bottle in one of the doors, and I took it and brought it out to the sitting room with me. Oh, Tom, Mr. Dodds has a birthday tomorrow, and he wonders if you'll drink his health with me. Well, I don't think you better take any tonight. It's... Mr. Dodds has a birthday. Sometime tomorrow he'll be a day old in the next world. Tom was famous for his liquor habits, but he hesitated. Well, now... I, I poured the drinks. I don't think you better have... Up with it, Tom, and down with it. And here's to Mr. Dodds. Well, <laughs> all right, his kindness. <laughs> he drank one. He drank another. He drank a third. And still I poured them into him. He got talkative and grew very gay. But he didn't pass out. I looked at my watch. It was almost half past twelve. One whole hour I'd wasted with him. I could stand no more. He was drunk. Any test would show that. His story tomorrow would be listed as a drunkard's babble. I had left the building an hour ago. I couldn't afford to waste any more time. I walked behind him, and he was laughing. And I hit him as hard as I could on the back of the neck. He pitched forward off the chair onto the floor. I dragged him into Dodd's office. And I lifted him into the chair facing Dodd's. I brought the bottle in from the sitting room and put it on the desk in front of Dodd's. I took the iron vase and curled Tom's hands around it for the fingerprints. And I dropped it at his feet. A bottle, a fight, a killing... I was sweating. I went out into the sitting room again and almost fell to my knees. I was frightened. I had to get out of here. I got to the lobby and looked out of the shadows at the elevator. The boy was sitting on a chair outside the car, and he seemed asleep. I came out of the darkness and went quickly towards the street and began to walk rapidly. I wanted to get somewhere out of the world. Oh, would I ever sleep again? <laughs> we, we murderers are not supposed to, and I wanted to rest. Ah, I had a sudden idea. I went into a cafeteria and used the telephone. I called the building and got the elevator boy on the phone. Hello there. Hello, Jim. Oh, uh, this is Mr. W Mr. Wilson, Jim. Uh, has Mr. Dodds left yet? The voice that answered me was sleepy and the words were hard to make out. But I knew all the answers. Well, listen closely, Jim. Will you tell him that the address of the place we were talking about is uh, 144 Gray Street? Yes, one for... Uh, yes, that's right. Oh, he'll know what I mean. Will you go up and tell him now, Jim? All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Jim. I was sure the sweeper would be discovered in the room with Dodds. The address was a Turkish bath. It was logical. A man working all night might want to go to a Turkish bath afterwards. Uh, Jim, Jim would walk in now... And heaven only knew what came next. The sweeper would be caught like a rat in a trap, drunk, and with a murdered man sitting across from him. I walked home through streets that crushed me in their shadows, between walls that whispered at me as I passed. I sat up in my room for hours, listening to the sounds Manhattan makes in the night. And finally, finally I fell asleep. And I sat, and I slept, and I dreamed until sunrise. I woke with a start. I was shaking like some miserable wet cur. I took a drink and tried breathing deeply. Somewhere I'd, I'd read that deep breathing killed the, that scared feeling. What in places was I frightened about? I was safe. I was completely safe. But when I left the house, I was still shaking. I walked all around the block that the building was on before I went inside. It looked like any other morning. On the floor where my office was, I... 
I saw a policeman, and then another, and then my world was surrounded by a ring of police and plain clothes men. I must watch my nerves. I must move carefully, very carefully. None of them paid any more attention to me than they did to any of the others. They assembled all of us in the president's office, and then one of them, a sharp, alert young man, began to talk. Last night, please. Last night, an attempt was made on the life of one of your associates, Mr. Charles Dodds. A murmur ran around the room. I was talking with the rest, being surprised with the rest. But what did he... What did he mean, an attempt? Dodds had been dead. Or... Or had he... Fortunately, however, the attack was not successful. <sighs> and Mr. Dodds has supplied us with some rather unbelievable information. Oh... Information which I, I tried to hold myself. I felt faint suddenly. And then something happened inside me, and I did not break. It was a trick. It was a trick, I was sure of it. The detective stared at us, running his eyes across our faces, across my face, searching, staring. And then he he shrugged his shoulders. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Dodds was killed. <sighs> and another man you might know also died last night. Mr. Thomas Higby, the night sweeper. Oh. Higby? Dead, too? Again, that rustle of voices, that droning conversation that I was part of. Some of them had known Higby, liked him. I hadn't meant to kill him. Could there be some mistake? I wanted to ask one of these men, was there some mistake? I, I hadn't meant to kill him. Mr. Dodds was clubbed to death. The night sweeper died of a heart attack. Nothing more is known as yet about what happened here last night. You must all consider yourselves at the disposal of the police. Until you're told otherwise. Now, if you... Blast them. Why didn't they say something? They were lying to these people. Nothing more was known. That's nonsense. Why, it was all there for them to see. It told its own story. Higby had killed Dodds. Poor, harmless little Higby had killed that big, famous executive. And now... Mr. Wilson, uh, will you come this way, please? Just a little routine questioning, that's all. Everybody here will have to undergo it. Uh, uh, I must watch myself. I must go very slowly. Uh, sit here, won't you, Mr. Wilson? Now, uh, do you remember what time you left the office last night? Yes, yes, it was 11.30. I, I remember mentioning it to the elevator boy. Uh-huh. And what time did you get home? Oh, somewhere about uh, half past 12, I guess. Yes, j just about that time. Is there anybody who would swear to that? Well, the, the elevator boy... Well, I don't mean that. Is there anyone who saw you go into your house at 12.30? I, I hardly think so. At that time, the, the streets aren't too well populated, you know, officer. And, and I live in a house where people mind their own business. I, I really don't know anybody in the house. And I doubt if anybody saw me go into it. But you can check with the elevator boy, though, as to my going home at 11.30. Because... Yes, uh, we have already. You weren't on the best of terms with Dodds, were you, Wilson? Oh, I, I was fond of him. Uh, but I don't know what right you have to say a thing like that. Well, he kind of did you out of a job around here, didn't he? Oh, he, he, he was a smart man. Mr. Dodds was an exceptionally smart man. It was not at all a disgrace to lose a position to him. When I left him last night, he was in excellent health. And if I killed a man every time I had a job taken away from me, I'd, I'd have quite a long line of victims behind me. Of course, I, I'm just joking, you know. You made a phone call to him last night, didn't you? Uh, yes, to, to the elevator boy. I remember uh, suggesting that uh, he go to a Turkish bath after he'd finished work to sort of tone up. Uh, they're very good, you know. And I mentioned that I knew a very good one that I could recommend. And then when he asked me the name of it, I, I couldn't think of the address of the place. And I, I thought of it later, though, and I phoned the building. Where'd you phone from? Uh, from? From a little place in the neighborhood. And about what time did you phone? Well, it was about 12.25, I guess. I was getting a little mixed up. It couldn't have been then. I was still in the building at 12.30. Ah, they were confusing me. You called at exactly 12.55. So you must have miscalculated the time of your arrival at home. However, that isn't important. None of us is expected to time ourselves from place to place, are we? When we find too good an alibi, we get kind of suspicious. <laughs> well, I don't think we'll have to bother you anymore, Mr. Wilson. Thank you. He asked me to send somebody in to see him as I went out. I, I forget who it was. I, I was thinking very hard. I went into my office and sat down. 
<laughs> so easy. Was it possible the whole thing was over? And so easily? Hello there, Wilson. Very sad, this business. Very sad. Oh, uh, good morning, Mr. Larkin. But we must go on. Mr. Dodds would want it that way. Uh, yes, sir, he would. It's a responsible job he had, Wilson. But you've been with us long enough to know that. Uh, yes, sir. Do you think you can handle it? Well, sir, I... I th yes, sir, I think I can. Good. Get your stuff together and take over Dodd's old office. You deserve this, Wilson. And I'm sure you'll reward our confidence in you. Well, thank you very much, sir. Of course, I hardly expected... On second thought, I think you'd better go into his office right away. And sort of straighten out some of the things on his desk. I'll have one of the boys bring your things in later. Very well, sir. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Uh, the fat, pompous pig. Why hadn't he said those things before last night? They were all in a spot now. They needed poor, stupid Wilson. They needed me to get them out of a hole. The further the thing went, the funnier it got. Books were wrong about virtue and good counting for anything. To get ahead, you either married the boss's daughter or killed the boss. I took a pencil and a small notebook and went out into the corridor. I stood for a moment outside Dodd's office, just like last night. And then I pushed the door open, slowly. The sitting room. And then the door to the office. I opened it and walked inside. I heard the door close softly behind me. And I stood there, smelling the death in the air. And then... And then... I saw it. I saw it. I tried to yell. But I couldn't get the words out. There. There in front of me, sitting in the chair, where I'd propped him last night, was Tom Higby. His eyes open, his expression blank and staring. And at his feet was the bottle and the vase. The same bottle, the same vase... Dodds was all that was missing. I turned and I bolted into the hall. Higby. Oh, what's the matter, Wilson? You look like you'd seen a ghost. In the office. In the office. Higby. Higby? Why, Higby's dead, man. What's the matter? Uh, Mr. Larkin. Where's Mr. Larkin? Why, here I am, Wilson. What's the matter? In the office. In the office. What? Why, nothing's the matter in here. I don't... I walked in after him. There was nothing there. Nothing. No Higby. No bottle. No vase. But I saw them. I saw them. Oh, was I going crazy? Was I beginning to go mad? I felt Larkin's pat on my shoulder. He murmured something about everybody being a little touchy, a little jumpy. And then he left. And I was alone in the room. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. I stood. I stared at the desk and at the chair. No one was there. No one could have been there. I must watch myself. Uh, what? Oh, oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, uh, not at all. I seem to be in the wrong room. I'm Mrs. Charles Dodds. Oh. I'm looking for that young detective. He doesn't seem to be out here. Well, I believe he's in the end room uh, questioning the employees. Oh, then I don't suppose he'll be able to see me for a little while. Do you mind if I wait here for you? Well, I... Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, excuse me for a second. Uh, Charlie, will you tell the detective that Mrs. Dodds is waiting for him in... in my new office? Uh, oh, you've already seated yourself. I, I was going to suggest that perhaps uh, this seat might... She was sitting in his chair. There was blood in that chair. This is quite all right, thank you. Charles would have liked to see the way everybody's taking his death. Everyone is so kind to me. Mr. Dodds was a fine man, a fine man. You're Mr. Wilson, aren't you? He used to talk about you, thought you were a very bright person. He seemed very fond of you. I... I, I don't know how I'll be able to go on without Mrs. him. Mr. Dodds, you, you mustn't, you, you mustn't. I'm sorry. He wouldn't like to see me carrying on like this, would he? We were going to buy a home in Westchester this summer. Did he ever tell you that? Yes. Just outside Yonkers. We have two lovely little ones. Toby and little Mary. He loved the New York State countryside. We talked so much about it. On. Plans... On she rambled. He liked this. He didn't like that. The children. The children. Toby and little Mary. Toby and little Mary. She was driving me crazy. Stop it. I wanted to yell. Get out of here and leave me in peace. Get out of here, you witch. Get out. Get out! Mrs. Dodds, Detective Lewis would like to see you now. Thank you for everything, Mr. Wilson. And goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye and get out and leave me alone. 
I hadn't meant to do anything like that. I hadn't wanted to do any of the things I was doing. All I'd wanted to do was to kill Dodds. All these other things, they weren't mine. I hadn't killed Higby. He, he can't haunt me. His wife can't cry at me. Heart attack. That's it. Higby died of a heart attack. I beg your pardon, sir. Have you seen Mrs. Higby? The detective's looking for her. How would I see her? Am I everybody's guardian? How can anybody get lost in this office? Sorry, sir. Mrs. Higby? Mrs. Higby? Uh, stop it, you Mrs. fool. Mrs. Higby! You howling idiot. Can't you be looked for quietly? You will drag Higby from his grave with your yelling. Two widows. What? You manufacture widows, don't you, Mr. Wilson? Uh, widows and orphans. Uh, Tell me, Mr. Wilson, is it your life's work or is it just a hobby with you? Tell me, Mr. Wilson. Who is that? Who is that talking? Do they think they can make a fool of me? Ah, uh, uh, the office communication. Uh, it's off. Oh, stop it, Mr. Wilson. You'll go balmy. Oh. You've committed the perfect crime. Don't go crazy and spoil it. No. Perfection is instinctive with you, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Not a plan that you make. Spontaneous perfection. Yes, yes. There aren't many could do that. Go on. Vo go on. Voices can't frighten me. They deserve to die. And that's why they're dead. Thou shalt not kill, Mr. Wilson. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Not Higby. I didn't kill him. His heart stopped. Do you hear me? That's all. I didn't kill him. Kill, now you voices Wilson. stop. Do you hear me? Stop it, I command. Stop it. Is there something, uh, something wrong, Mr. Wilson? What do you mean, is there something wrong? Do you hear them, too? Well, you mustn't listen. They lie. Do you hear me? They lie. Now get out. Get out. Get out. You must talk only to me. Do you understand me? Only to me. Not to these others. Don't say anything to them. Only to me. Only to me. Uh, well, what do you want? Well, I don't know. Uh, you think they'll say something bad about me, don't you? So you can carry me off to jail. That's what you're waiting for, isn't it? Well, you're going to be disappointed. You see, they're quiet. What's quiet? Yeah, who's quiet? Ah, uh, you think I'm going to tell you. They won't say anything unless I tell them to, and I'm not going to tell them to say anything, not one little word. Last night, last night you wanted to know all about last night, huh? when you asked them, but they won't tell you. Look at the expression on that face. Oh, uh, look at him, Lieutenant. They were there. They saw me hit him, but they won't say anything. They were there, but they won't tell you a thing, not one little word, not a He's single a thing. gibbering idiot. Because oh, I'm not going to let I shouldn't him. let you they monkey around. No. We could have gotten it out of him some other way. You and your psychology. You know, you should leave that stuff in colleges. Well, all I did was plant Higby in the office and route Mrs. Dodds in here and talked into the ventilating system. Yeah, those voices had me creepy, too. Well, incidentally, Dodds was single. What? That girl's my fiancée. She's an actress. Well, for... Well, why did you tell him Higby was dead? No, maybe you better not explain. Psychology, huh? Well, yeah, what are we going to do with the confession now? We should have pinched him the moment he walked in here. Maybe I'm lucky I never went to college. There's no use you waiting here. They won't tell you anything. They're mine, all mine. I tell them what to say. All right, get the wagon up here. I'm not going to walk this thing through the streets. I won't say a word. Henry Wilson, it's the judgment of this court that you be sent to the Hillview Mental Home and be kept there in close confinement until... Uh -huh. On the voice went. I had stopped listening to voices, all but the ones that I couldn't help hearing. But... But I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. I tell people that, and they look at me queerly. The stupid fools. The guards here have spread the lies that, that I have fits. <laughs> lies. Lies, I tell you. They say, every night when the moon comes up, I have fits. Loud, roaring fits. Well, they lie. Because it's then that I hear the voices. I hear Dodds and his wife and Toby and little Mary. And I sit quietly and I listen to them. <laughs> Do you think I can have a fit in front of them? Do you know? No, I, I'd be ashamed. I tell you, I'm not crazy. And they lie when they tell you that. They lie, all of them. They lie. And they're lies. 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 And so closes Statement of Employee Henry Wilson, starring Gene Lockhart. Tonight's tale of Suspense.
This is the man in black who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week, same time, when our two distinguished stars will be Margot and Philip Dorn. They will appear in a suspense play by John Dixon Carr, entitled Cabin B-13. The producer and director of suspense is William Spear, who with Lud Gluskin and Lucian Morrowick, conductor and composer, and John Shaw, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. Suspense fans, please note that this program will shortly move to a different day of the week. Suspense will come to listeners in Eastern and Central time zones on Thursdays, beginning December 2nd, and to Mountain and Pacific time zone listeners on Mondays, beginning December the 6th. Now remember Thursdays, beginning December the 2nd, in Eastern and Central time zones, and Mondays, beginning December 6th, in the Pacific and Mountain time zones for Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Roma Wines present... Suspense! Tonight, The Bluebeard of Balak, starring Merle Oberon. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you... Suspense! This is the man in black here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, who tonight from Hollywood bring you a star, Miss Merle Oberon, and a suspense play inspired by an actual recent news item from occupied France. And so, with the blue beard of Belloc and with the performance of Merle Oberon, we again hope to keep you in suspense. All right, get back, stay back there. Back up the wall. How, uh, how many were there this time? One. They found most of it. And? It was a soldier, a German. I heard it was an officer. Stay back. Back there. Come on. But, uh, they're still digging? Yes. What officer was it, did they say? They Back think it was wall. Captain Muller. You know, the doctor. They think. They don't know. They're looking for his head. One, two, two three, four. Ah, is it enough? Five. How about this? Of course, they found the body. Identify the body. Why don't they identify him? Identify him? The blue beard. Why, they find out who he is. Listen, listen. Achtung, achtung. Villages of Belac, Saint-Jean, Bralagnon, Flumé. Achtung. This morning's victim of the blue beard of Belac is identified as Captain Franz Müller, oh. medical officer attached to the staff of Colonel Strelitz. Oh, an officer. For the first this time, the blue no. bear himself has been seen, and a description has been provided. Monsieur, He's described Monsieur, as being of medium... Yes. I must speak with Colonel Strelitz. Is he here? I have information. Information about what? About the blue beard. Is the colonel here? He's in the staff car. Over there. Please take me to him. I must see him. And uh, who are you? Cecile Combray. Madame Combray. I live on the road to Flomé, just outside the village. Well, uh, all right, come along, madam. Is that the colonel, sitting in the back of the car? Yes. Now you wait here. I'll see. Overstrated, Corporal Brecht. Corporal. Over. Das ist eine Frau von dem Dorf hier, eine Madame Combray. 
Sie hat angeblich Informationen über den Blaubart. Naja, wieder so ein hysterisches Frauenzimmer, Herr Oberst. Was kann man da machen, Kreuzer? Sie haben eine Möglichkeit. Wo ist sie? Dort drüben, Herr Oberst. Ich habe mir gesagt, sie soll warten. Ordnung. Frau Herr, komm. Jawohl, Herr Oberst. The Colonel will see you, Madame. Oh, thank you. Das ist Madame Combré, Herr Oberst. Madame? This is my aide, Lieutenant Kreuzer. It was kind of you to let me speak with you, monsieur. Kind? Naturally, madame. When we were told you have information about the bluebird. Yes, I we have. You can't overlook anything. Now that he's killed one of my own officers. I know, I know. And I, I am next. So? Hmm. The bluebird is going to kill me. He's going to kill me tonight unless you help me. Unless you come home with me and stop him. This is your information? Yes. Why, every woman in Belak believes she is next on the Bluebeard's list. But I know. Madame, the Colonel's time is valuable. We thought you had real information. You don't expect us simply because you hysterically believe... No, that... no, please. I know Colonel Strelitz. How can you know? Because, monsieur. Because the Bluebeard is... is my husband. Why? Your husband is... Dr. Pierre Combre. Yes. He's the man you're looking for. I, I've known it for a long time. He is the Bluebeard. Tonight for Suspense, Robo Wines are bringing you a star, Miss Merle Oberon, whom you have heard in the prologue to The Bluebeard of Belloc by Sylvia Richards. Tonight's tale of Suspense. In many foreign lands, wherever wine connoisseurs gather, they enthusiastically praise the distinguished character of Roma wines. Such praise of Roma wines in foreign lands can only mean that they are truly magnificent in quality. Roma wines' excellence is due to a unique combination of California's perfect soil and climate, from whence come the choice Roma wine grapes, plus age-old winemaking skill and modern knowledge. These combine to make Roma constant in quality, uniformly fine, unexcelled in value. Tomorrow, discover for yourself the delightful Roma taste and goodness enjoyed by more Americans than any other wine. Simply serve as an appetizer before dinner a cool glass of golden nut-like Roma California sherry. Then on the table, place a bottle of cool, hearty Roma Burgundy. You'll be pleasantly surprised at the extra delight it adds to your meal, how it will win new compliments from family or guests. Yet, the cost is only pennies a glassful. Get Roma wines tomorrow. If your dealer is temporarily out of Roma, please try again soon. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma wines. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our sound stage Miss Merle Oberon as Madame Cecile Combre in the Bluebeard of Belloc, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Eleven o'clock. He'll be here in an hour. And if you had not come here with me... You have nothing to fear, madame. The house is well guarded. But won't the guards frighten him away? The instructions are to let him through. They will come in only when we have him trapped. And we are armed. Yes, and he does not carry a gun. You know, he uses a knife. Madame Combre, why didn't you come to us before if you knew your husband was a blue beard? First, I wasn't sure. Then... When I was sure, well, he was still my husband. Then why now? Because now he will kill me, and I'm afraid. I knew when he went away with the body of Captain Miller yesterday. Oh, so you saw the captain? Yes, I saw it. And when Pierre looked at me, I knew he'd kill me. Tonight. Yes, he may try. It's been weeks of fear, and the night, the endless nights. Have you been married long, madame? Long? No, less than a year. You aren't French, are you? No, no, I'm English. 
I spent a summer in Flomay about four years ago, and I liked it, so I stayed. I taught English in the village school there. Dr. Combray? About a year ago, there was an epidemic in Flomay, and he, Pierre, came there to help. He seemed to me when I met him to be very kind, a very noble man. Of course, I didn't know him well, but when he asked me to marry him, I was very happy. The morning after we were married, he brought me here to Belac, to this house which had been his family's for many generations. It was a beautiful morning, early spring. We came, as you did tonight, up the hill, past the summer house, to the front door. Well, here it is, Madame Combray. <laughs> Come, I'll carry you over the threshold. Oh, careful, Pierre. Don't drop me. No chance of that. Now... This is the hall. Shall I carry you on from room to room? Oh, Pierre, no. <laughs> Put me down. Very well. Ah, come this way. Now, here is the parlor. Oh. Hello, Captain Muller. Good morning, Doctor. I've been waiting. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. <laughs> They said you'd be back this morning, uh, the people down the road. Yes, I was held up by my wedding. Your wedding? Oh, I'm sorry. Cecile, this is Captain Muller, the medical officer in charge with Colonel Strelitz. Captain, uh, my wife, Cecile. How do you do here, Muller? Well, doctor, <laughs> I congratulate you. I see even an epidemic can be useful. That's one way of looking at it. Uh, so what's up, Muller? Oh, uh... Oh, 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 I wanted you to come in tomorrow to help with the vaccinations. About uh, 150 are going out and we need help. The last lot carried typhoid. I'd be glad to help. What time? Well, they are leaving at noon. Uh, if you're there at 8 o'clock, we'll have enough time. I'll be there. Very well, Doctor. Madame, tomorrow then. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. Ah, now we will go on with our tour. Follow me. Pierre, who's to be vaccinated tomorrow? All labor draftees being sent to Germany. Uh, this is the kitchen. The stairs go up from here. What's upstairs? Well, off that first landing there are several bedrooms, mine and others, and on the floor above still more. Before the war, there were servants. And this is a pantry? Yes. And this door, where does it... Why, it's locked. What is it? Oh, that is an old wine cellar. It's not used. A cellar? Do you have a key? Uh, there's nothing down there, Cecile, that would interest you. Oh, but I'd like to see. We might be able to grow mushrooms No, or... Cecile, it can't be used. Let's look. Where's the key, Cecile. Pierre? Yes? That door must stay locked. But, Pierre... You understand? Yes, but... But why? No matter what happens, you must never try to go down there. Never. You see, monsieur, it was a small thing. Just a room I must not enter. He told me the room was used for his experiments, and I believed him. I was in love. But there were other things, and they added up to fear. Just the taste of fear. A shadow so light, I... I didn't know it was there. There was, first of all, the gossip I heard in the village when I went to market. Oh, good morning, Madame Combray. You're late today. Pierre worked late last night. Is there any milk, Madame Bourget? Oh, can let you have a little time. Oh, if that's all. Uh, does the doctor work often at night? Quite often, in his laboratory. Uh, I could not bear a man who potted around after dark. But it's his profession. Maybe, but I would not sleep a wink, not with this blue beard around. No, I like a man who is steady, so I know what he's up to. Oh, how can you bear to live in that big, depressing house? Oh, but I love it. Well, you're young. I suppose it's romantic to you. It's no place for a woman to be alone. The first Madame Combray, you know... She died there. Yes, Pierre told me. But I know he did everything he could. Oh, yes? It was very sudden. Typhoid can be very sudden. Yes, his certificate said typhoid. That's why your coffin was sealed. Oh. Hey, Jean! Jean, what is it? What is it? What's happened? Everyone's running. There's an announcement, madame. They know who one of them is. One? Of whom? There were three last night. One of them was a man. Three? Why, why the bluebeard, he killed three in one night. Cut them to bits. Oh, 
How terrible. All sliced up and scattered around, Madame Cambray. You should have seen. Oh, no. Where, where were they? In the meadow north of the church. Why, that's near your house. The meadow? Yes, Madame Cambray. If you had been awake, you would have heard him. You or the doctor. <laughs> Yes, if I'd been awake, I would have heard. And one night, I was awake. My husband and I had gone to bed early, and I slept well. I'd worked in the garden most of the afternoon. But shortly after 11, something, some sound woke me. It may have been only an owl screech. I lay in the dark and listened. I didn't hear it again. Then I heard another sound. And I saw there was a little moonlight, that my husband was out of bed and that he was dressing. Pierre. Oh, did I wake you? Pierre, what is it? Nothing, Cecile. Go back to sleep. Is, is someone ill? Did someone come for you? I have to go out. Go back to sleep, Cecile. I won't be long. Something woke me. I heard a sound. I'm sorry. Did someone come for you? Was it Captain Muller? No. Who is it, Pierre? Who's it? No one you know. Where are you going, Pierre? Do you have to go far? Go back to sleep. I won't be long. But, but Pierre... I'm sorry I woke you. You didn't. I'm sure I heard a... Cecile, it's best that you go back to sleep. I just wondered. It's best for you. Good night, Cecile. He went away, Colonel Stravitz, and I lay there in my bed, rigid, listening to his steps down the dark stairs into this kitchen. I heard the front door open and close. Then he went down the gravel path in the moonlight. I waited. It seemed long, yet it was only a little time... That clock there, I could hear the, through the floor, chime the quarter, then the half. When I heard him, it was not yet midnight, and he came slowly, climbing the hill. I slipped out of bed and went down the stairs to the landing there, from where I could watch him come into the kitchen. But when he came into the kitchen, I could not speak, for he was not alone. Over his shoulders, he carried a body. A man, I think. And he was stooped under his horrible burden. He crossed the kitchen without looking up and did not hear what I was sure he must hear, the pounding of my heart. He took a key from his pocket, holding the body with one hand, unlocked that door to the wine cellar and went into its awful blackness. Then I was back in my room. I don't remember how I got there, cold and shaking in my bed. When I heard... Oh, monsieur, it was pitiful. I heard rising from the depths of the house from where he had gone. The scream of a man in fearful agony. Cecile. Yes. Yes, Pierre. You are still awake. No, Pierre, I... I told you could go back to sleep. I was, Pierre, I did. But you are awake now. Something... I heard something. Yes, you heard it must have been you opening the door. Oh. You came in suddenly. You must have... Yes, yes, I think I did. Well, we'll go to sleep now. Yes, we'll go to sleep. Pierre? Yes. Was someone ill? Yes. Who was it, Pierre? Did you have to go far? We'll go to sleep now, Cecile. What, what time is it? Time? It's just past midnight. Midnight was usually the hour, his hour. He always came back soon after. And the following day, there were always the announcements on the loudspeakers in the village. Bodies, pieces of bodies. It was the day when he and your men found Odette. It was so horrible for me, because she was so beautiful and still only a child. And you remember the body was yet warm. So the whistles were blown, calling all the village to the church square. Because the bluebeard might still carry his knife or have blood on him. Or he might not get there and be known because he was missing. I was in the village and I ran to the square with the mayor. And we stood in line with the others. Everyone was there. Everyone except Pierre. What terror I felt. Monsieur, when you began to call the names. Felix Armand. Yeah. Paul Arden. Yeah. 
Uh, Madame Combre, are you ill? It's, it's just the sun. It's so warm, yet I feel chilly. You're very pale. Uh, here. Why, I don't see Pierre. Here, here. Oh, he's, he's probably with Captain Muller. He'll be here. Pierre Combre. Here, 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 I'm here. Don't look at me like that, you'll attract notice. You're out of breath. Where were you, Pierre? Does it matter I'm here? But your hands, your clothes, they're wet. So you see, I still did not know. And I needed to be sure. I could not live unless I was sure. So I stole the key, the key to the cellar. Yes, it was that easy. While he slept, and the next day he went to the village with Captain Muller and left me alone with the answer in my hand. I opened the door and went down those steps, carrying a candle. We will go down there in a moment, Colonel Strelitz, to wait for him. And you will see there is a little room, bare and damp by the candle's light. I saw there was something on the table. It was his case, filled with knives, surgical instruments, not strange for a doctor. There was blood on them, fresh blood. And there was more on the table, on the floor, and much blood on a sheet which I found thrown into the corner. I found the strength to get out and to lock the door again. I put the key back that night. So again, I did not know. I did not really know until yesterday. I was sewing in the front parlor. And Pierre was walking up and down because he had an appointment with Captain Muller. And the captain was late. The devil, what's keeping Muller? Perhaps he got orders. More soldiers came into Belac yesterday. Many more. Yes, I know, but that shouldn't keep him. There's something going on. They're getting ready for something. Yes, but why would Muller... Do sit down, Pierre. Your walking makes me nervous. I've spoiled the seam and have to rip it out. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Some of the soldiers were searching houses yesterday. I don't know what they were looking for. Did they come here? Oh, no. At least not while I was here. I was in the village most of the afternoon. That's when I saw the soldiers. And there's nothing here to look for. Is there, Pierre? That's it. Of course. Why didn't I think he's down there? Pierre, where, where are you going? I'm going down to my cellar, Cecile. I have work. Pierre, no. Not the captain. Yes, the captain and Cecile. I don't want to be disturbed. <laughs> And then I knew he was going to kill Captain Muller. He was going to kill a German soldier. Worse, an officer. I knew then, Colonel Strelitz, that if he would go that far, he was no longer a man I could even attempt to reason with. His insane urge to kill might turn on anyone. Even me. I had to stop him. Oh! Cecile! Cecile, what are you doing? You can't come down here. You... you killed him. Cecile, now I'll have to. But I wasn't ready. It's not time. Captain Muller, they'll track you down. You... you can't get Cecile, away. Cecile, be quiet. I warned you. I told you not to. Murder. You did it. You killed him and the others. Cecile, I told you. What will you do now? Do? What do you think I'll have to do? Now, now you know too. And in a few minutes he'll come. And then it'll all be over. It's almost midnight. That's a remarkable story, madame. So he made no attempt to harm you last night? No, Colonel Strelitz. It wasn't time. Not time? He kills only when he feels the need. And he'd already killed one. So the need was gone. And it was daylight. He left then? Yes. I haven't seen him since. He looked at me. It was a terrible look. And he went. And I knew by the look that I would be the next. Tonight. And Captain Muller? He... He took the captain's body with him. Come, we must go down to the cellar now, before midnight. Very well. Lieutenant, will you bring the lamp? Yes, I'll bring it. You see, it's unlocked, as he left it. 
close the door behind you, Colonel. Very well. Careful. The last step. Another door. Oh, it is small and damp. Is, uh, is that the table where he... Yes. Set the lamp there, Lieutenant. You can see the stairs. They're quite dry by now. Uh-huh, uh-huh, I see. And on the floor. Sit down, monsieur. There, where you can watch the door. I, I will stand here at the back if you don't mind. You're right. It's safest for you. Listen. I heard the clock strike. And, uh, yes, listen. It's the door. Have you your guns? Quiet. Yes, but we want to take him alive. You can. He's coming down. Cecile, are you there? Put your hands up, Dr. Hombre. Ah, visitors. Well done, Cecile. Scarcely visitors, Doctor. A bit more unpleasant for you. Now, if you'll... Put your hands up, Colonel Strelitz. You too, Lieutenant. Madame Combray. I... Yes, I too had a gun. But your husband, he's... He's a... The bluebeard? I'll take your gun, Colonel, and yours. Mm -hmm. No, Colonel, I am no bluebeard, as you knew very well. It was clever of you to plant the mutilated bodies of your victims to drive me into the open. To create this legend of a bluebeard to make the people of Belak suspect all men who work at night, as I do. To make the village distrust me, their leader. But Madame Combray, you saw Captain Muller, saw his body. The captain? Yes. Pierre killed Captain Muller. He was his one victim because the captain was suspicious and pried a little too far into this room. Pierre had to kill him because he was... He saw our radio station behind that wall. Open it, Pierre, and let the colonel see. You see... The wall opens easily, and behind it is the nerve center for Belak, for our underground army. Army? Sneaks and cowards who set their women to lie. I lied? What else? You said that he carried in a body, that there was a scream in the night, that there was a body. All true, Colonel. Yes, I carried home a man wounded by your soldiers, and I removed the bullet without anesthesia, for we French have no such luxuries. So the blood of that patriot is mixed on the table with that of the late Captain Muller. Don't you know it's hopeless for you? Hopeless? Colonel, surely you know that our armies are in France, Americans, English, and our underground army which surrounds you? But this house is surrounded by my men! It was, you mean, Colonel. Are you still there, Mr. Porter? Porter? Yeah, what do you say, Doc? Everything quiet? Quiet as a tomb, Doc. All things down there. Who is that? We have what you call a couple of rats, Mr. Porter. Then we are finished. Okay. That is Mr. Porter. As you heard, he is an American. An American? You? He is commanding a large number of parachutists who just an hour ago dropped into our meadow. Oh. And who a few minutes ago very quietly killed the guards you mentioned. Killed? My God. Yes, and since you were here in the cellar, unfortunately, you could not hear. But now, Pierre, you have your work to finish. Your work? I have orders from my army to kill you and the lieutenant to secure this advance for our allies. So with Cecile's help, I set this little trap. Oh, listen to me. You won't... Cecile, go... do you want to share the honor? No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. And so closes The Bluebeard of Belloc, starring Merle Oberon. Tonight's study in... Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Have you discovered how much good wine adds to the enjoyment of food? How Roma wine makes even the simplest, most inexpensive meals really exciting events? Well, all you need do is place on the table with the meal... A cool bottle of hearty Roma California Burgundy. Serve it in any kind of glass. You will find it delicious with any food. And if you are entertaining guests, you will find Roma wine just the gracious, festive note that makes any dinner party or get-together a happy, compliment-arousing occasion. And remember, Roma wines cost you only pennies a glassful. 
So any home can afford the pleasure they add to everyday living, to entertaining. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. Merle Oberon is soon to be seen in the Columbia Technicolor production, A Song to Remember. Next Thursday, ladies and gentlemen, same time, you will hear Mr. Gene Kelly as star of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.